Good evening. This is Peter Tobin introducing Lux Radio Theatre. Tonight and every Monday night at this time, Lux Radio Theatre presents for your entertainment the finest in radio drama. This week we bring you The Man Upstairs by Patrick Hamilton. Studious gentle George Longford was grateful to his friend Charles Waterbury for the loan of a furnished flat that he hoped would allow him to spend a quiet evening working on his dictionary. His hopes were not to be realized. A ring on the front door bell and the pleasant tranquil scene soon becomes charged with an atmosphere of violence, brutality and intimidation. Who was the strange Mr Armstrong who appeared framed in the doorway? And why, once he was admitted, did he begin to adopt such a sinister, menacing attitude? It is from this moment on that Patrick Hamilton's brilliant radio play begins to make your nerves tingle with excitement and apprehension, and reaches a climax that is as shattering as it is unexpected. The Man Upstairs has been produced for Lux Radio Theatre by Michael Silver. in the North Sea will not be welcomed by the North Sea. The North Sea dislikes belts of any kind. As a consequence, the further outlook is absolutely foul for everybody. One, two, three, four, five, six. How are we doing, George? Can you help me down there? Couldn't be better. Clear as a bell. So that's that little technical confusion cleared up. What's the time, George? About 7.25, I make it. 7.25? in a hurry. What for? I've got to meet Miss Caroline Audley at the Lord Hood Shepherd's Market at 7.30. You're coming too. I'm not, you know. You are, you know. Uh, no, old boy, I, I really do want a quiet evening. Oh, can't you step out for once? No, honestly, Charles, I know a guest ought to do what he's asked, especially when he's only just in the flat beneath you, but we're old chums. And, and anyway, as I'm a guest in a furnished flat belonging to you, I'll jolly well be a guest in your furnished flat and stay put there, see? <laughs> All right. And I'll bet it's all that enormous dictionary of yours at the bottom of it. You can't leave the thing alone, can you? Well, I, I do look at it a good deal. What do you mean, look at it a good deal? You're in love with the thing. <laughs> well, so long, George. It's the usual time tomorrow, okay? Yes, usual arrangement. Goodbye, Charles. Goodbye. Can you hear me up there? Hello, George? Charles, I was wrong about the time. It's pretty nearly a quarter to eight. My wristwatch is crazy. I just thought I'd tell you. Hmm, that means I'm going to be late. Goodbye. Goodbye, Charles. <sighs> oh, no. I wonder who that is. Uh, Mr. Longford? You are Mr. Longford, aren't you? Uh, my name's Armstrong. May I come in? Yes, of course. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Won't you come and warm yourself by the fire? Ah, yes, uh, I'm glad I found you in. Oh, why? Is it important? No, not particularly. In fact, it's not important at all, really, if you come to think about it. If it's not important, what is it, Mr. Armstrong? I mean, what can I do for you? Well, it's not really so much a question of what you can do for me. It's really more a question of what I can do for you. Or perhaps to you, Mr. Longford. You know, I'm awfully sorry, Mr. Armstrong, but I don't quite get it. Do you mean you've come round here to do something to me? It sounds rather frightening. You haven't come round here to murder me or beat me up or anything like that, have you? I mean, what have you come round for? Oh, nothing. Nothing at all, really. Just to look at you, I suppose. You know, this is all terribly mysterious. Couldn't you tell me what you're really here for? I hate mysteries, don't you? No, no. I, I love them, as a matter of fact. Well, I, I like them in books and plays, but there they're solved, aren't they? You see, I don't even know who you are. Have I met you somewhere before? No. No, you've never met me. But I have met you, Mr. Longford. That only makes the mystery deeper, doesn't it? Uh, well, perhaps I used a slightly wrong expression. I should have said, to be entirely correct, I've seen you, but you haven't seen me. You follow me? Yes. 
And where was this? Oh, quite near here. Very near, in fact. Oh, yes? Uh, where? Just round in Shepherd's Market. Well, that's certainly very near. But, but what part of Shepherd's Market? In a house or in the street or what? In a house. Oh, that's funny. I don't know that I've ever been in a house in Shepherd's Market. I don't lead much of a social life, you know. What sort of house? Oh, a very unusual sort of house. Ah, sandwiches. I say, those are my sandwiches, you know. Yes, I'm... I'm aware of that. You know, Mr. Armstrong, you seem to be behaving rather strangely. Yes, perhaps I do. But there you are. I mean, one must take it or leave it. Mustn't one? Yes, apparently one must. Uh, however, we were talking about the house where you saw me, and uh, I didn't see you. You said, I think, that it was a very unusual sort of house. Quite correct, yes. Uh, then will you please tell me what house? This is getting extremely tiresome, you know. Certainly I will. But don't get angry, Mr. Norfolk. Well, what about this unusual house? Well, what I should have said is that it's not a private house. That's all that's unusual about it. Not a private house? What could that be, then? A public house, Mr. Longford. That's simple enough, isn't it? A public house? Ah, the Black Miller. Yes, yes it is. You know, Mr. Armstrong, I don't want to be difficult in any way, but, but why couldn't you have said straight out that you'd seen me in the Black Miller? Why you've had to go all that roundabout way of telling me, I simply don't understand. Oh, well, I suppose I'm naturally a roundabout sort of man, I... Sorry if I puzzled you. No, not at all. But now it's all over. Can't we come to the point? What point, exactly? Well, I mean, why are you here? Is it important or not? I mean, what does it matter if you saw me and I didn't see you round at the Black Miller? Well, I'll explain. Shall I? Please. I will. Don't hurry me. You see, it's not so much a question of my seeing you. It's a question of the person I saw you with. Oh, who was that? Oh very important person, to me at any rate. Yes, but who? Who was he? He or she. Oh, you, you mean a girl or a woman? I do, yes, a girl. I see. Oh, now let me think. What girls have I met in the Black Miller? Oh, I can't think of any at the moment. Oh, yes, I can, though. There's a girl I talk to a lot. Yes, I know you do, yes. <laughs> yes, that's right. We're great chums. What about it? Do you know her name? Yes, Brenda something. I just call her Brenda. She calls me George. And what is your opinion of her? I think she's extraordinarily nice. In fact, I hope I'm going to run into her again. Extremely nice and extremely intelligent. And anything else? In what way? Well, didn't she strike you as being extremely beautiful? Well, now I come to think of it, I'd say she was. <laughs> Very pretty. A beautiful, actually, was the word I used. Very well. Beautiful, probably. And perhaps something more than extremely beautiful? More than extremely beautiful? That's asking a lot. What could that be? Extremely innocent, Mr. Longford. Innocent? Well, you know, I don't know about these things. You can't recognize an innocent look when you see one, Mr. Longford? I don't know. Perhaps I could. It just never struck me with Brenda, whatever her name is. Really? How odd. Tell me, Mr. Armstrong, something's just come across my mind. Two things, in fact. Yes? What are they? Well, you don't think there's anything between this very nice girl and me, do you? Because I can assure you there isn't, you know. And the other thing which crossed your mind? Well, I was wondering, to use the same expression, whether there's anything between you and her. You see... Uh, yes, go on. Well, that would account for a lot, wouldn't it? For what? Well, for your rather... Your rather strange attitude ever since you've been here. How strange? Just strange. Slightly hostile. I might almost say menacing at moments. I mean, if you were in love with her or something, then that might account for it. Are you in love with her? I should be guilty of a great crime if I were, Mr. Longford. The innocent girl in question is my sister. As you seem not to know it, I may tell you that her surname is Armstrong. Oh, I see. And I see you use the word innocent again, and that, uh, as her brother, you might have a suspicion of some sort. Explain yourself. Well, you might in some way suspect that someone is attempting to deprive her of her innocence, uh, and more than that... What more? That it's I who am attempting, or have attempted, to do the depriving. And if that's so, may I hear and now assure you you're mistaken? Oh, yes, you can assure me, yes. That sounds as though you doubt my word. 
So may I here and now repeat that nothing of the sort has taken place or will take place. And if that's all you've come round to talk to me about, the conversation can close here. I wanted a quiet evening. Don't you think it would be better if you had a quiet evening too and went home? I mean, it's all so silly, isn't it? You know, I think I will change my mind and join you in a drink after all. Oh, all right, certainly. I'll get you one. No, no, no. no. What? I'll get it myself. Whiskey here? Oh, yes. Uh, yes, indeed. And so that's excellent. Yes, this is what I need. Mr. Armstrong. Yes? Do you know that good whiskey is very expensive these days? Oh, yes. And do you know that that whiskey belongs to me? Of course. Who else would it belong to? Unless you'd stolen it. Unless you deprived someone else of it. Unless you were, after all, a depriver, Mr. Longford. Oh, dear. Now you seem to be harping back to that. What are you talking about, Mr. Longford? You're one ahead of me. Your sister. I gather you're reverting to that matter. Now, what on earth should make you think that? You used the words deprived, Mr. Armstrong. Depriver. A moment ago, that word was used in connection with your sister. Ah, yes, delicious. No, no, you're imagining things, Mr. Longford. Why shouldn't I use the word deprived twice? It's a very nice word. Mr. Armstrong. Yes? Would you like to finish off that drink as soon as possible and then go home? Well, I shall certainly finish off the drink if I may. Why, what a good-looking little man you are. I'm not surprised at the girls falling for you. Yes, a remarkably good-looking little man. Little, of course, is the operative word. Yeah, Mr. Armstrong, do you know I don't like having my cheeks pinched? A cheek, Mr. Longford, not cheeks. Uh, I mean, let us be precise. I, I only pinched one of your cheeks. And why should you resent it? It's a sign of affection. Napoleon used to pinch his soldiers' cheeks, you know. Mr. Armstrong, have you come round here just to talk about Napoleon? Uh, what more interesting topic could there be? I mean, what is wrong with an interesting and disinterested and... Peaceful conversation. <clears throat> Let's have a peaceful conversation. Why don't you have another drink? Are you interested in cricket, Mr. Longford? Yes, very. Are you? Oh, yes, I am. Tell me, what is your view of the test matches between this country and the continent of Australia? Well, lately, we seem to have been putting up a pretty good show, it seems to me. You say we... That means England, of course. Yes, of course. Yes, naturally. But it sounds a little funny to me. You see, I am Australian, and think of it the other way round. I think of Australia as we. Oh, I see. You don't speak like an Australian. Well, in point of fact, I'm not Australian, technically. It's just that I was born there, and I've spent most of my life here. I think of myself that way. Oh, yes? Well, here's your very good health. Of course, the last two tests have been played under freak conditions, haven't they? And yet I like freak conditions in cricket. It's so much more exciting. I wish they'd make the conditions even more freak. I'm not sure you're not right. What alterations would you personally make? Have you any ideas in mind? Yes, I have. One in particular. I feel very strongly about it. Oh, yes? What's that? Well, why not alter the light, for instance? The light? How on earth could you do that? That's a question of luck, isn't it? How could you arrange the light in a cricket match? Well, why not, uh, for instance... Have it all played underneath the moon. The what? The moon. Well, I must say that's an original idea. I'm an original man, Mr. Longford. I mean, how would you see? Oh, not at all difficult. It's very easy when the moon is really bright and the night's clear. Then, if necessary, you could have the ball painted white. Uh, then you could have white stumps and white balls and white scoring boards with the figures in black and, and so on and so forth. Well, if, if it comes to that, one might have all the spectators painted it white, mightn't one? Oh, you know, that's not at all a bad idea. It never struck me. I, uh, I have an impression, however, that you're not taking me seriously. Why? Mr. Armstrong. Mr. Longford. Tell me something. You said you were a very peaceful man. No one more so. Uh, go on. Well, it's, it's rather hard to put... But have you been suffering from any sort of nervous upset lately? I mean, something you might see a doctor about. Uh, something which just required rest. I mean, oughtn't you to go home and have a good rest now? Oh, I, 
I see what you mean. You're, you're suggesting that I'm out of my mind, aren't you? No, but I think you may be, purely for the time being, a little upset. In other words, raving mad. I don't mince matters, Mr. Longford. I know every thought that goes on in your head. And I can assure you that I'm certainly not a madman. I'm afraid you took my perhaps rather silly little joke about playing cricket under the moon quite seriously. Oh, was it a joke? I'm sorry. I, I'm losing my sense of humor, I'm afraid. You certainly are. And I can promise you that in addition to being sane generally, I've never been saner in my life than at this moment. Perhaps a little too sane and shrewd for you. About what? My sister. Oh, dear. Have we got to go back to that again? Uh, no, not just at the moment. At the moment, we're just conversing, aren't we? I like conversing with you. It's useful, too. It, it enables me to go on looking at you, to sum you up. Listen to me, Mr. Armstrong. I do not like strangers coming into my flat to look at me and to sum me up. I still do not know whether you are a maniac or whether you really have something to say to me. If you have, will you please say it quickly and then clear out? If you don't, I shall have to take other measures. And what would they be, pray? I shall telephone for the police and have you slung out. They come very quickly nowadays, you know. Yes, but you strike a major difficulty there, don't you? What? How would you get to the telephone? And if you should manage to scramble to it in time, how would you manage to dial 999? before being beaten to a pulp by your present guest. Very well, Mr. Armstrong. There's another more peaceful alternative. I'll just leave you to it. I shall walk out to my flat and let you stew in your own juice. Yes, but how would you get to the door? I may be large, but I'm remarkably quick, you know. And now, Mr. Longford, the session will continue as before. No, on second thoughts, not quite as before. You can get me, my dear good-looking man, another whiskey. Uh, come along now, here's the glass. I will not get you another whiskey. You heard my words. You heard mine. Very well, I'll get it myself. It really doesn't matter. You will not go near that sideboard. Sit down, Mr. Longford. I will do nothing of the sort. I said sit down, Mr. Longford. Sit down on that chair, that one. I'll die before I do that, Mr. Armstrong. Yes, that is exactly what you may do. Now sit down on that chair. Sit down on that chair! I said I'd... Hello. That's the bell, isn't it? Yes. So it seems... I wonder who it could be. Yes. Yes, I wonder. I... I have a guess, though. Shall I go and answer it? Yes. Perhaps you'd better. boy was in here, Mr. Longford. So he was. He's probably gone through that door. It leads to the kitchen. You're Mrs. Armstrong, I take it. Yes, but please don't let's bother about names at the moment, Mr. Longford. Cyrus? 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 My son, come out from the kitchen. Don't pretend to yourself that you can hide from me. If you don't obey me, you know what will happen to you. Now come out to your mother. I shall give you 15 seconds. I'm beginning to count. One, two, three, four. Ah, there you are at last. Don't stand like that. Hold yourself up. Yes, mother. Now put your hands behind your back. Yes, Mother. What are you doing here? I... I don't know, Mother. Don't tell me you don't know. What are you doing here? I came to see Mr. Longford. Didn't I tell you to stay in your room tonight until I came back? Yes, Mother. Then why didn't you? I... I don't know, Mother. Hold yourself up. Yes, Mother. And when you go to your room, 
you will do your usual exercises. Only tonight, you will do them six times. Thoroughly. Do you understand? Thoroughly. Yes. Yes, I understand, Mother. Very well. You may go now. But first of all, you will apologize to Mr. Longford. How do I apologize, Mother? Look at him straight in the eyes and say, I'm sorry, Mr. Longford. I'm sorry, Mr. Longford. That's quite all right. Good. Very well. Now go. And on the way, you are not to look back. Not once. You understand? Yes, Mother. Very well. Go on. Quickly. I shall come to your room later tonight. If you've obeyed me in every particular, you may be forgiven. Now go. Well, that was one of the most remarkable... One moment. All right, he's gone. Now, Mr. Longford, do you mind just for a minute if they have all the lights out in here? The lights out? Yes. Well, you know, it seems to me that I'm in a sort of madhouse. Must we have all the lights out? Yes, you are in a sort of madhouse, Mr. Longford, and a very dangerous one. And I am here to save you from it, to save everybody concerned. I'll explain everything in a minute. But in the meantime, will you do as I ask? And quickly, will you? Very well. You see, I am the only one who can control him. I am the only one who knows his mind, and I must use my own methods. You see, I want to watch him from the window without him seeing me, to see if he obeys me and does not look back as I told him. And if he does look back and sees me watching... You'll think I'm afraid, and I might lose half the battle. I have to make him think that I think he obeys me absolutely without question. Yes. There he goes. Yes. It's all right. I can tell by his walk. Come here and watch him. You see? He's like a soldier on parade. There. Yes. That's all right. You can put on the light again now, will you? Now, Mrs. Armstrong, could you explain? Could you explain all this? It's all very confusing, you know. One moment, Mr. Longford. I, I'm not feeling very well. I'm feeling faint. You, you don't know what a strain it is. You feel worse when it's just over. Yes, I, I understand. I'm sorry. Now, come and sit down by the fire, won't you? You can explain later. Thank you. It's only the shock. Only the strainer. Are you, are you all right in a moment? I'll get you a drink. A little brandy. Thank you, Mr. Harford. A very small one. Good. Fine. What did he do and talk to you about, Mr. Harford? Oh, a lot of things. Did he talk about the moon? Why, yes, he did, as a matter of fact. How do you know? I'll explain later. And did he talk about his sister? Yes, he talked a lot about her. Yes, so I thought. Oh, thank you. I'm quite myself again now. Good. I can't say that I am. You know, I'm, I'm a bit shaken still, I must say. Now, Mrs. Armstrong, do you feel up to explaining? Yes, Mr. Longford. May I ask you a question? After what you've just been through, it may seem a nonsensical one, as nonsensical as anything he said, but it isn't, and I must ask it. Yes. Mr. Longford, do you believe in the moon? I'm awfully sorry, but I don't follow you, Mrs. Armstrong. The moon? Believe in it? Of course I do. It's just there. It exists. No. I don't really mean that. I mean its powers. You see, unless you do, I can't really begin to explain. I mean, it affects the tides and all that, doesn't it? Yes. But it's other powers, Mr. Longford. It's other, much more dreadful powers. It's powers on the mind. Mr. Longford, do you believe in the moon? Oh, say you believe in it. 
Mr. Longford, say you believe in the moon. Say you believe in the moon. Oh, oh, oh. oh Mr. Longford, I'm ashamed of myself. I never dreamt I could break down in that way. I was taught never to break down, ever. Well, everybody has to break down sometime, don't they? It's a very normal thing. Not in my family. We were what people used to call a family of soldiers. However, I mustn't talk of the past. We are in the present, and a very real and urgent present for both of us. Yes. You said you were going to explain. Just tell me quietly, in, in your own time. He talked of his sister? Yes. And her innocence? Yes. And did he mention... Napoleon? Why, yes, he did. And then he talked about the moon. Yes. <sighs> Tell me, Mr. Longford, do you know anything about psychiatry? What do you mean? Freud, Jung, all that? Do you know it's an established fact that certain people are affected sometimes in a violent and dangerous way by certain phases of the moon? No, I wouldn't say established. I should say it's quite likely, but not a certainty. I know it's a fact. I have reason to know. Mr. Longford, do you know what psychiatrists call a fixation? Why, yes, a, a fixed idea. I need a fix. It's a form of mania. Yes, it is. And sometimes extremely dangerous to another person. Yes, I suppose. Yes, do go on. This is what is not easy for me to say to you, Mr. Longford. Never mind, go on. My son has a fixation, Mr. Longford, a very violent and dangerous one. And what's it about? About yourself, Mr. Longford. Oh, I must say that's not frightfully pleasant news, is it? No, and I'm afraid that's not the worst. Really? Tell me, what form does his fixation take? He thinks you've stolen something, Mr. Longford. So I rather gathered. It's all getting clearer now. In other words, Mrs. Armstrong... We must put things bluntly, mustn't we? In other words, your son's completely out of his mind and thinks I've robbed your daughter of her innocence. No, no, he's not out of his mind, he's not. It's only the moon, don't you see? Now, please, don't get upset again, Mrs. Armstrong. It's, it's really for me to be upset. You've just said that you haven't told me the worst. The moon is everything. These phases come in cycles every seven years. Normally, he's harmless, good. I know his history, you see. Very well, then. Tell me his history, Mrs. Armstrong. Cyrus was born in Australia, Mr. Longford, one of twins. I'll tell you about the other boy, Harry, later. He is absolutely normal, thank heavens. But Cyrus... Yes? It began when he was eight. He was an enormous boy. Even at that age, you'd hardly believe his size... It was freakish. And what happened when he was eight? There was an episode, Mr. Longford. Oh, yes? An episode with an animal of atrocious cruelty, a cat. I can't go into it. My husband beat him for it, beat him fearfully. It was a mistake. Such things cannot be treated that way. Then, for seven years, he was normal. A good, gentle boy. But then... He began to talk of the moon again, to go out and look at it for hours, and oh, I can hardly bear to speak of it. Do try, Mrs. Armstrong. There was another episode. We had to move from Sydney. Then he was normal again, utterly normal, until the age of 22. And then there was another episode, as you call it? There was. Oh, yes, indeed there was. And then? Normal again, until he was 29. Then he began to talk of the moon again. And this time, it was definitely connected in his mind with his sister. It was only then that I began to realize that there was some connection between these incidents and the moon. To realize that they took place every seven years. Well, that is all, really. Then he joined the commandos. He has a record of great bravery and distinction. And now, he is 36. And 29 from 36 leaves seven. Yes. Every seven years, you say? Yes. 
This is a funny thing to happen to anybody trying to have a really peaceful evening by himself, isn't it? It's horrible, Mr. Longford. It's horrible. Yet, Mrs. Armstrong? Yes. You spoke of certain episodes. What sort of episodes? What does he do? Oh, no. Please don't make me go into that. But, Mrs. Armstrong, after all, it, it's not fair to me, is it? I mean, the unknown's worse than the known, isn't it? Does your son carry a revolver or anything? No, no. It's much more horrible than that, Mr. Longford. Your son was a commander? He was, yes. That means an expert in unarmed combat? Yes, Mr. Longford. An extreme and excruciating expert. Will you leave it at that? Mrs. Armstrong, are you trying to be cruel? All this dreadful hinting... Mr. Longford, let me put it this way. You are in danger of awful disfigurement. Disfigurement which will cause you physical agony, such as few men on this earth have ever had to suffer, and which will leave you with no further desire to live. Now, will you let that suffice? Oh, well, uh, I suppose I'll have to. You've made things fairly plain on the whole, I think. Have you consulted a doctor or the police about your son's condition? No, I haven't. But why not? That seems rather unfair to society at large and to me in particular. Oh, Mr. Longford, I have a thousand excuses. I'm his mother, and I deceived myself after each incident that he was mentally well. I see. Seems as though I'm rather up against it, doesn't it? You must go away, Mr. Longford. Now, you must go where he can never find you. It'll only be for three months. You must hide. You must go tonight. But, Mrs. Armstrong, this is fantastic. There must be some other alternative. Yes. Actually, there's one other. Oh, but that's not worth discussing. The plain thing is for you to pack your things down and go. But the whole thing's ridiculous. First of all, I haven't enough money. And I can't suddenly throw up my business and take three months' holiday. Mr. Longford... Wouldn't it be better to risk your business than take this dreadful risk? I see. Now, let's try and take things a little more easily. We got panicky. But I think I'm a little calmer now. It seems to me that there are a lot of ways out, apart from the one you suggest. I have three in mind, actually. Firstly, if he cares to assault me in any way, it's not quite impossible that I could defend myself, is it? I, too, was in the army, you know. No, you couldn't, Mr. Longford. He has been very expertly trained. Yes, a commando. I appreciate the difficulty. Very well, then. I have friends. I could go and stay with them, couldn't I? And what about when you were out in the streets, alone? You have to go to your work. But surely he wouldn't do anything to me in public, Mrs. Armstrong. Oh, yes, he could. He's as quick as lightning, though he may not look it. But suppose I got friends to escort me in the street. Utterly useless, utterly. You don't know the things he's done. You know, if you'd only tell me what he does, all this would be so much more simple, wouldn't it? He has many methods, Mr. Longford. Among other things, he can strike from a distance. He can throw. What do you mean? Boomerangs or something? And your third and last alternative, Mr. Longford. Do you mean boomerangs? No, go on. Your last alternative. Why... The simplest of the lot. And it's for you to do. What is it? Ring up the police, Mrs. Armstrong. Now. Ring them up and tell them the entire story. Oh, no, Mr. Longford. The police are no good. They could not prevent your disfigurement. What do you mean, the police are no good? I've got to have protection, and that is what the police are for, isn't it? Come to think of it, I can ring the police myself. No. Why? The police are practical men. The police do not believe in the moon. Besides, I am a mother, Mr. Longford, and my unhappy boy, cursed by the moon, is not going to end his last few years in any sort of dark prison. If you telephone the police, I should deny everything. His last few years, you said? Yes. Why? Do you imagine he's going to die before long? I know he is. How? My son, strong as he is, suffers with his heart, Mr. Longford, fatally. He cannot possibly live for him. More than another three years. You seem to have an answer for everything, haven't you, Mrs. Armstrong? Yes, it seems that I have. There's only one course. You must go. Go now. But Mrs. Armstrong, I can't. I told you. Even if I had the money to go away for three months, even if I used up all my savings, I can't give up my job here. You have savings? Why, yes, of a very modest sort. Oh, that's the telephone. I know. But why are you so frightened, Mrs. Armstrong? It may be Brenda. It must be her. Why must... Let's go and see, anyway. Hello? What? No, it isn't. Who do you want? No, my name's Longford. That's quite all right. Thank you. 
There you are. It was only a wrong number. No need for panic. I'm sorry. I had an awful feeling with Brenda and that he'd broken out. Well, you were wrong, weren't you? Yes, I'm sorry. Now, where were we? We were talking about my savings, as a matter of fact. You asked if I had any. Oh, yes, that was it. And why did you ask? Oh, nothing. Some while back, you know, you said there was one other alternative of some sort. Was that alternative connected with my savings? Mr. Longford, there are certain things to which I shall not descend. Mrs. Armstrong, please. Very well. You must have it. Yes? Mr. Longford, you said you had modest savings. How modest are they? Oh, very much so. Yes, but what does that mean? Mrs. Armstrong, shall I tell you exactly how much I've got in the bank at the moment? Oh, no, I, I didn't mean to bring the subject up. Yes, you did, indirectly. And I'm glad you did. So shall I tell you? Very well, Mr. Longford, if you insist. How much money exactly have you got in the bank at this moment? Six hundred and forty pounds. <gasps> you, you have all that. I thought you said you were an extremely poor man. You see, I have little more than what I stand up in. What you do stand up in doesn't look too bad to me. Thank you for the compliment, Mr. Longford. Well, now I've told you the amount of my savings, what about it? Mr. Longford, six hundred and forty pounds. What are you so excited oh. about, Mrs. Armstrong? Do you mean that that amount of money means that you see a way out of all no, this? No, no, not at all. Nothing like it. But two hundred and eighty pounds, that's all that's needed. No, less than that, much less. My other son, Harry, his twin brother, can manage 70. Now, how much does that make? 210. Yes, not a penny more. Now, listen, Mr. Longford. We have a passage for Cyrus and myself to Australia. My son, Harry, is in shipping and has arranged it. We only wanted the money. A passage for the day after tomorrow, Mr. Longford. Actually, Harry comes back from Liverpool tonight. In fact, he should be back by now. Now, listen... I can get Cyrus, my poor sick boy, away by the night train tomorrow. You'll be free, Mr. Longford, forever. He'll go, you see. He keeps on saying that he has to see the moon again as it rises over Sydney. It's his poor brain. Mr. Longford, this is the way out. Two hundred and ten pounds only to lend, Mr. Longford. You'll get it back. I'll work my fingers to the bone to give it back to you and... And you're free from this terrible menace. Oh, who's that? I know who it is, all right. He always knocks like that. Oh, dear. Must you let anyone in now? Can't you pretend you're not at home? No, it's all right. It's only my friend, the one who's lent me this flat. I'll see what he wants. I'm coming. Oh, I, I'm frightfully sorry. I didn't know you were sort of... Uh, well, am I interrupting you? I won't be half a moment. No, not a bit. Uh, this is Mrs. Armstrong. Sir Charles Waterbury. I did too. I was telling you about him, wasn't I, Mrs. Yes, Armstrong? yes, you were. Uh, Caroline and I are going away tonight. We've suddenly decided to take a car down to Maidenhead and hit it up for a bit. <laughs> So you won't be seeing me tomorrow after all, all right? Oh, how long are you going for? Oh, about four days. Four days? Yes. What's the matter? Don't tell me you're going to miss me. You who spend your whole life dodging people. No, I, I just didn't realize you were going away all that time, that's all. Well, neither did I until about ten minutes ago. Well, I must fly. Well, goodbye, Mrs. Armstrong. Sorry our meeting's been so short. Goodbye, Sir Charles. Uh, goodbye, George. See you around Tuesday next week. Charles? Yes? No, it's nothing important. You go off and enjoy yourself. Well, goodbye all. Goodbye, Sir Charles. Mr. Longford? Yes? Why did you call Sir Charles back just then? It was an impulse to confide in him. Now I sort of feel my last prop's gone. But, Mr. Longford, didn't I tell you that help of that sort was of no use whatsoever? Yes, I'm sorry. You shouldn't have done that, you know, Mr. Longford. It looks as though you don't trust me. Mr. Longford, look at me, will you? Do you trust me? Oh, say you do. Mrs. Armstrong, I not only trust you, I'm going to prove it in a very concrete way. 
How soon do you want the money? To tell the truth, Mrs. Armstrong, I want to get this over pretty quickly. I'm afraid it sounds a rather harsh thing to say, but the sooner I see the last of you, the better. And I could give you the money tonight. But I don't want it tonight, Mr. Longford. You've got to see my son Harry first. In any case, you've got to have some sort of security in writing. Could you see him tomorrow morning? Couldn't I see him tonight? Yes, I suppose so, but I don't know if he's back. Well, couldn't we find out? Huh? Do you mean I should go around now? <gasps> That's Brenda. I know it is this time. Shall I answer it? But, Mrs. Armstrong, it might easily be someone... No, want... no, I have a feeling. I know these things. Very well, you answer it, Mrs. Armstrong. Yes? Oh, Brenda, dear. Brenda? Yes. Brenda, what are you saying? Yes, go on. Yes, yes. I know, my dear. Yes. I see. I see. Now, Brenda, keep your head and listen to me. It'll be all right. It'll take him four minutes to get to Brook Street. I shall be there to intercept him and send him back. Have absolutely no fear. Do you understand? Now, we must bring off. Every moment counts. Yes, goodbye, darling, goodbye. <coughs> It has happened. What? He's disobeyed me. I've lost my authority. He's broken out. He's on his way round here now. So, so he's on his way... Now! Right? There's no time to lose, Mr. Longford. We're both in great danger. I must go and intercept him. Mr. Longford, will you do exactly as I say, please? Why, yes, of course. Very well. Bolt the front door and lock that one. It has a lock, hasn't it? Yes. And that one? Yes. Very well. Now, Mr. Longford... Do not go near the window. Go nowhere near the window. And keep your lights low. Once he's safely home, I shall come back and ring in a special way. I shall give three rings, then silence, then three rings again. You follow? Yes. Three rings, then a the silence, then three. That's it. We're too late. That was in the kitchen. Your kitchen window? Tell me. Is it possible to climb up from the street to your kitchen? By the drain pipe? No. Good. Now to think quickly. He'll be lurking in the doorway. I'll find him, have no fear. I'll find him and send him back. You do just what I said before. Barricade yourself. I shall return in ten minutes if all goes well. Now I must go. But he may be outside your front door by now. So lock this door when I've left. You understand? Yes. Is that you, Charles? Yes, my boy, it is. I thought you'd gone to Maidenhead. Never mind about that. You're a very silly boy, you know. What do you mean? You forgot to switch off when we were talking earlier tonight. Did I? You laid yourself open to being eavesdrop upon from here. I think you're going to be very grateful. Oh, I'm in a pretty blue funk, I can tell you. Wouldn't you be, Charles? Yes, I certainly would. Well? I mean, I would, if I really believed in it. What do you mean? Did it never occur to you during the evening that there was something bogus about it all? Well, well, perhaps just once or twice. Oh, when? When she first began to mention money. And I didn't like the family of soldiers. No, I didn't like that either. He's pretty convincing. Yes, I could hear that. That's why I couldn't resist coming down to have a look at her. I've read about them and this very ugly blackmailing trick they work. If my memory's right, they've done a lot of it and they're wanted for it. Mind you, I'm only working from a hunch, but I've been working very hard on it. Oh? What have you been doing? Bringing up all my high-up friends in the police. Hello? She's back early. I'll... Now, look, I'll telephone you. I'll pretend I'm drunk, and you pretend you can't get rid of me, and I'll really be giving you your instructions. Got it? Right. Yeah, it's getting impression. Now, you'd better go. Goodbye, and good luck. Oh, Mr. Longford, this is Cyrus's twin brother, Harry. Hello there. Everything's all right now. There's no immediate danger. He's gone into one of his sleeps. It's as though he's almost dead, isn't it, Harry? It certainly is. So he's in one of those again, eh? Yes. So we're safe now for six hours at least, if not more. Oh, Mr. Longford, whichever you choose, thank you. But whichever you decide, thank you truly and deeply from the depth of a very unhappy woman's heart. Goodbye. I... I can't trust myself to speak anymore. I'm leaving. Oh, no, 
Let me, just in case. He must know you're here. Just in case. May I? Yes, of course, if you think so. Yes? Yes, he is. Who is it, please? Yes, just a moment, please. Just a moment. It's a Mr. Farquharson. Farquharson? Oh, oh, yes. Uh, hello. Hello, Ronnie. Yes. Yes, all right. Go ahead. Yes. Look here, Ronnie. Where have you been tonight? You sound as if you had a few... Shall we go, Mr. Lovell? No, no. No, you can't come round here. I'm busy. I'll be seeing you tomorrow. What? Look, I'm going to ring off. Yes, I know you could get round here in three minutes, but... What? Now you go home and sleep it off. Goodbye. Oh, would you believe it? On top of it all... That was my partner. It's about business. What? Not money trouble again? No, no, not that. But it means that I've got to sit up all night and work out figures. It's got to be quick, quick. Oh, this on top of everything, this. Now, listen, I'm just about done in tonight. I'm afraid my nerve's going gone. I'm going to give you the money now. I have it in cash. Oh, but, Mr. Longford, we no, don't... No, please. Let me have my way, please. For once, tonight. I can get the money in a moment. It's in this drawer over here. Here now. There you are. Now, will you go away and take him to Sydney or wherever it is and promise you'll never come back? Never. Go on, promise. Oh, I don't take on so, Mr. Longford. Never mind. But will you promise? Will you promise? Oh, yes, of course. Come along now, Harry. Goodbye, Mr. Longford. You're all right, aren't you? I hate to see you looking like that. You're not ill, are you? Oh, we can't help you in any way, can we? In one way, perhaps you can. Yes, yes, anything. What can we do? Oh, just listen to something. Yes. What do you want to say? No, I don't mean listen to me. Not you? Who then? Yourself, Mrs. Armstrong. Your earlier self. When you were about an hour younger and speaking to these four walls. I don't follow you. Or Mr. rather, Long. eight walls, to be precise. Eight walls and one person and one thing. Above all, a thing. Shall we listen? Yes, do let's. All right, Charles. Is it okay? Yes, here we are. Just a sec. Right, here we go. Listen, here we are. With a cat. I can't go into it. My oh. husband beat him for it. Beat him fiercely. It was a mistake. Oh. Such things cannot be treated that way. Then, for seven years, he was utterly normal oh. again. What a good, what? sweet, gentle boy. But then, when the seven years had passed, he began to talk of the moon again. No! Go Will on. you stop that noise? Uh, Will you stop it? Oh, Who is up there? I can hardly speak of it. Oh, surely you know, Mrs. Armstrong. I'm just the man upstairs. We've met, don't you remember? But I didn't go to Maidenhead. I stayed and got down every word you said. All right, I'll tell them, Charles. He telephoned the police. The police? Do something, Jim! Sigh! Do something, Jim! The gate's up anyway, so do something! Oh, yes, fair. That's not a bad idea. Well, I may not be the big commando, but I'm certainly big enough for this little gentleman, I fancy. Hello, what goes on down there? A great deal, Sir Charles, and the door's locked, and there's nothing you can do about it. Go on, sigh, do something to him. Tear him to little pieces. Yes, yes, I... I like the idea of that. You won't get anywhere that way, you know, either of you. It'll only make things worse. In fact... Shut I... up there! Go on, sir. Yes, don't hurry me. It's just a question of what it's going to be. Now, come here, Mr. Longford. I said, come here, Mr. Longford. I said, come here! So, you've uh, obeyed me, I see. Yes, only too glad to obey you. So Harry and his twin are one and the same person. Right, Cyrus? Don't call me Cyrus. Cyrus. The commando who wasn't one. You know, Cyrus, when I thought you were one, I was afraid of you. But now I've got to grips with the real Cyrus. I'm not a bit frightened. Cyrus is a very large man, but he was not a commando. Whereas George Longford, never actually a commando, learned a lot about judo. No! You did strike it unlucky tonight, didn't you, Cyrus? Are you enjoying this? Oh, I imagine not. Very well. When I release you, you will obey me and go and sit down in the chair by the fire. 
Very well. Oh. You may go. No, I said the armchair by the fire and put my money back on the table. Well done, George. I thought you could do that. Well, that seems to be the end of the evening, doesn't it? No, Charles. That's the funny thing. It's it's not quite. Come here, Mrs. Armstrong. I said, come here, Mrs. Armstrong. What are you doing, George? I'm doing a lot, Charles. To Mrs. Armstrong, who recently so strongly advocated something being done to me. In fact, Charles, I'm going to rob Mrs. Armstrong of her facial charms. <gasps> her somewhat maturing facial charms. I'm sure that one who comes from a family of soldiers can enjoy such a thing. Oh. Now, Mrs. Armstrong, close your eyes oh. uh. and put back your head. I'm now going to start counting. And I may tell you that every number after three will be an added disfigurement. Your own uh. words, Mrs. Armstrong, oh. to your face. Now, one, two... Help me! Sigh! Help me! He's only bluffy. He's not the type. But that's just what I am, Cyrus, as I shall now demonstrate. Now, Mrs. Armstrong, the operation begins. Oh. You come, never forget it, from a family of soldiers. Now keep oh. quite still, please. What are you going to do to my face? What are you doing? Sigh! What has he done? Tell me! Tell me! Nothing. I told you he was only bluffing. I don't know why you yelled. I don't know what he was using on you. I was using H2O, Cyrus. Water. Iced. Your charming colleague seems to have got the impression that I was using a knife. Charles? Are you still listening up there? Did I fool you too? Yes. You did, George. As she'll probably only get about 11 years in prison, I thought I'd give her about 11 seconds of real torture. You see, just as ice is the same as a knife with your eyes shut, Mrs. Armstrong... So fear is the same as hell. Oh. Please. All right, sir. We'll take care of him. Come on, man. Take care of him. Take care of him. I'll get him. I'll get you. Charles? I didn't know you were quite like that, George. Didn't you? And I don't regret it for a moment. Yes, so I gather. Well, well, all this has rather spoiled your quiet evening, hasn't it? No, just interrupted it. I hope I'm going to have it now. Now, where's my dictionary? Perhaps a little music on the radio. All right, George. I'm off. Goodbye. See you tomorrow. Goodbye, old boy, and uh, thank you. Not at all. Goodbye. Tonight's presentation of The Man Upstairs. You heard Bruce Miller as George Longford. Cyrus Armstrong was played by Donald Monat, and Marjorie Gordon took the part of his mother. Stuart Brown was Sir Charles Waterbury. The Man Upstairs by Patrick Hamilton was produced for Lux Radio Theatre by Michael Silver. <laughs> From Hollywood, California, the Lux Radio Theater presents Janet Gaynor and George Brent in Mrs. Moonlight. Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater comes to you with the good wishes of the makers of Lux Flakes. It's made possible because you buy Lux Flakes so regularly. This year, more than ever, you need Lux because it's a luxable year. Stores are full of the new cotton, smart and crisp as iceberg lettuce, rayons and silks and many new textures. They'll all stay new looking longer with Lux. Give them the safe care you give your underthings and stockings. Just one washing failure may wreck a clothes budget, you know. Let me put it this way. It pays in dollars 
and it costs only a few cents to use Lux for everything safe in water. Remember, a little goes so far. Lux is thrifty. It's a different type of play we bring you tonight, a most unusual romance of a girl who wished she might never grow old and whose wish came true. Janet Gaynor and George Brent are the stars of Mrs. Moonlight. Louis Silvers directs our orchestra, and Dr. Walter B. Pitkin, author of the famous bestseller, Life Begins at 40, is our special guest. And now, the producer of the Lux Radio Theater. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. I want to join with Melville Ruick in thanking you for your loyal support. You who listen to this program are partners in the Lux Radio Theater. It's for your pleasure that we produce these plays. It's your preference that helps select them, and your purchases of Lux that make this theater possible. Traveling across the country in connection with the opening of Union Pacific, I met a woman who asked me what she could do to express her thanks for the pleasant evenings that this theater had brought her. I told her the best way to show her appreciation was to buy the products behind the Lux Radio Theater, Lux Toilet Soap, and Lux Flakes. Those women in our audience who are not already using these splendid products, and I, I assume there are only a few, will thank me for suggesting their use. And we thank each and every one of you for your loyalty, which makes this theater possible. Some 400 years ago, in a newfound land called Florida, a Spanish explorer, Ponce de Leon, gave up his life on the altar of an age-old quest, the secret of eternal youth. And I doubt if there's anyone in our audience tonight who at some time or other hasn't wondered if there really was some fountain of everlasting youth. This idea has captured man's hope and imagination again and again. Tonight's play, Mrs. Moonlight, is the drama of a woman who finds that secret, a woman who never grows old. But what results from this, the events of our play will tell you. A play starring Janet Gaynor and George Brent, who in real life found the end of their quests here in Hollywood. Miss Gaynor is one of that select company of stars who were once Hollywood extras, an achievement not often duplicated. For the odds against the extra are 10,000 to one, unless that extra has the talent and determination of a Janet Gaynor. When an Irishman arrives in Hollywood, he can't come with a better background than the University of Dublin and that city's famous Abbey Theatre. George Brent, like the romantic ideal of his countrymen, has followed a quest of adventure as a sailor, diamond miner, stoker, blacksmith, sheep herder, and vagabond, a trail that led eventually to Hollywood. He appears through the courtesy of Warner Brothers Studio and is currently starring in The Rains Came for 20th Century Fox. Tonight he plays Tom Moonlight, and Janet Gaynor is Sarah, as the Lux Radio Theater presents our adaptation of a great Broadway success, Mrs. Moonlight. Midsummer night in England. The year is 1881, almost 60 years ago. In a tiny garden facing on the moors, a lovely young girl stands in a dress of shimmering white. Her face is lifted toward the full round moon, and her eyes are bright and shining, for tomorrow is her wedding day. But a dark cloud steals across the moon's face, and from the west comes the deep rumble of thunder. The girl turns, hearing a step in the shadows behind her. Edith? Edith, is that you? Yes. Whatever are you doing out here at this time of night, Sarah? Looking at the moon and thinking how happy I am. Oh, it's going to rain. Only a summer shower. I don't like it. There's a queer feeling in the air tonight. Have you felt it too? It'll be too bad if it rains tomorrow. Oh, it won't. It couldn't. You mustn't tempt Providence, Sarah. <laughs> I'm not afraid of Providence. I'm not afraid of anything tonight. I'm going to marry Tom Moonlight, and tomorrow I'll be Sarah Moonlight. Isn't it the most beautiful name? Hmm. Very beautiful. Edith, you like Tom, don't you? Whatever made you think I didn't? Nothing. Only sometimes when I speak of him, you seem to... Oh, nonsense. It's your imagination. You'd better come in now. In a little while. Tom's stopping by to say good night, but don't you wait up. My maid of honor must look her best tomorrow, too. My best is only a candle beside you. No one will even notice me. Edith. 
There's Edith Jones, the bride's cousin. What a pity she didn't inherit the family looks. Edith, what is it? Aren't you happy for me? Oh, you know I am, but perhaps I'm a little sad, too. Well, I'm going in. I don't like storms. Good night, Sarah. Good night. Sarah? Sarah? Yes, Minnie? What is it? I have a little something for you, Miss Sarah. Your wedding present. Oh, Minnie, how sweet. <laughs> you do love me, don't you? I've waited on you since you were three. People grow close with time, I suppose. <laughs> well, aren't you going to open it? My present? But I thought tomorrow... Open it now. It's more fitting somehow. Why? Well, it's a strange gift, child. It's called the dreard. The dreard? Oh, I'm sure it must be something very wonderful and very Scotch. It's been in my family for hundreds of years. Nobody knows where it came from first, but it's for you. <gasps> a necklace? Oh, Minnie, how lovely. But why is it called the Dread? I don't rightly know, but there's said to be magic in it. Magic? Aye, there's a legend. It's said that there's one wish granted to every owner. One wish that will come true. One wish? Sometime you may want something badly, Miss Sarah, with all your heart. It may be that you'll use it then. Sarah? Yes, Edith? Your Tom Moonlight is here. Tom! I got away as soon as I could, darling. Oh, I knew you would. Look, I've had a present already for Minnie. A necklace? Well, that's beautiful, Minnie. And there's a legend, Tom. It's not to be talked about. Oh. You must get to bed now, Sarah. It's growing late. I won't keep her five minutes. Five minutes, then. Or I'll come get her myself. Oh, Tom. Tom Moonlight. Do you know I'm very happy? My darling. So happy it frightens me. <laughs> Fasten my necklace. I want to wear it. So you'll be even more beautiful? There. Well, that was close, wasn't it? How still it is after. How unearthly still. Perhaps the gods are standing gaping. Surprised that any mortal could be so lovely. Tom, we must always be as happy as we are now. Nothing must ever change. It never will. Oh, if I could only be sure. You can. Our love will never change. But we'll change. We'll grow old, Tom. You won't like me to look old. I'll always see you just as you are now, Sarah. Just as I married you. As I am now. There, you see? What? Oh, Tom, if you ever stopped loving me, I should die. Stop loving you? When I die, Sarah, and not even then, our love is forever. Oh, it must be. It must be. It's late. Kiss me goodnight. The last time I shall ever have to leave you. The last time. Good night, my darling. Good night. One wish. One wish to every owner. Oh, Dread. This is my prayer, that I shall never change, that I shall never grow older. Oh, let me look always, just as I do tonight. It's my youth, he loves. Don't let me lose it. Let me keep it always for him. <laughs> to do that dusting right under my nose. If Mrs. Moonlight's cousin's coming, I can't have received it. Well, why didn't you do it this morning? I was busy elsewhere this morning. Well, if you finish, then run along. Well, don't stand there watching me. After nine years, surely I'm nothing to stare at. I was just thinking that a Scotsman wouldn't forget his wedding anniversary. I did not forget it. Mrs. Moonlight's gift is being delivered any minute. And why aren't you looking after my daughter as you're supposed to do? Do you mean Jane? Well, who in the world do you suppose I mean? She's with her lovely parent, she is. Do you mean Mrs. Moonlight? Who do you suppose I mean? Ah, Minnie, you're a disagreeable old woman. 
I've been thinking seriously of giving you notice. Ah, away with you. Consider yourself lucky to be living in the same house with us. With us? With Sarah Moonlight and me and we Jane. Oh, creature, answer the bell. <laughs> it's your poor wee gifty, I expect. And it isn't poor and it isn't we. Good afternoon, Millie. It's Mrs. Moonlight's cousin. Good afternoon, Thomas. How are you, Edith? Nicely, thank you. Where's Sarah? She's with Jane. Oh, Minnie, will you please inform Mrs. Moonlight that her cousin is here to go to the band concert with us? She doesn't have to. How are you, Edith, dear? Many happy returns of the day, Sarah. Here's my present. Oh, how nice. What is it? Mm, I'm afraid you won't like it. I'm sure I will. Oh, sure. Oh, I mean, but but what a lovely one. Yes, I knew you wouldn't like it. Oh, but I do, Edith. No, you don't like it because you think shawls are only for old people. Oh, how absurd. You think too much of your age, both of you. Do you think I do, Edith? Well, since you ask me, yes. You dress too young. Several people have mentioned it. Well, they're just envious. Sarah doesn't dress young, she looks young. Well, put it any way you like. But tell me this. Does Sarah look a day older today than she did at 21 or 20 or even 19? Well, no. But is that a crime? Well, I didn't say so. Do you think so? Well, I don't think it's a crime, but... But it is odd. What do you mean by odd? Just odd. I see. No, oh, please, please, Edith. Let's, let's forget it. Oh, of course. It was Sarah who asked me. Oh, uh, look, Edith. I got a letter last night from Maud. From your sister, Maud? What does she want? She wants to tell me she's just had a baby. Now, why does she think you'd care? She gave up her family when she ran off with that good-for-nothing foreigner. Now answer that, Minnie. Is it a boy or a girl, Sarah? A girl. They've named her Joy. Ironically, I presume. Do they still live in Florence? Of course. His work is there. He's an artist. <laughs> Here it is. Here what is? Where did you get that box, Minnie? That's a little present from me, my dear. Oh, Tom, what is it? Well, open it up and see. <gasps> a dress. Oh, and it's beautiful. It's the most beautiful dress in the world. <laughs> Edith, isn't it lovely? I mean, it's a very pretty frock. Oh, I'll be a queen in it. What trinkets will you wear? Yes. Oh, what jewelry? My crystals, Tom? It wants something with a touch of blue. I don't think I have anything blue. Yes, you have, dear. You know, the what you may call it, the, the dreard. No. Why, Sarah. What is the dreard? Well, it's a necklace made of turquoise. Minnie gave it to her for a wedding present. Then why not wear it, Sarah? No. But you used to like it when we were first married. She doesn't like it, no. Can't you let the bear on the lawn? Well, we'd, we'd better be leaving. I'll get my thing. What's the matter with her today? I don't understand her. She was perfectly all right until... Until what? Oh, Nothing. Only I wish you wouldn't talk about her looks, Edith. It always disturbs her. And well, it might. She ought to do something about it. Do? What can she do? She looks young, that's all. Well, all I can say is it's very strange. You seem very disappointed this afternoon, but for sure, well, even Edith might have known better. Tom. What is it, dear? I've been meaning to tell you. You must be very, very nice to Edith. Well, I am. Why? You see, she's... Edith's in love with you. Ah, oh, don't be silly. It's true. She always has been. That's why she seems bitter at times. Well, I don't believe it. She probably respects me, but I don't think any more than most other women. <laughs> yes, I suppose they're all in love with you. Except me. You? Why, you adore me, Mrs. Moonlight. I don't. I love you. Dear... Dear Mr. Moonlight. As much as ever. And after nine long years. As much as the first time. Do you remember the first time? Remember? Hmm. You were playing the piano. I was playing this. May I sit beside you, Mrs. Moonlight? No. <laughs> Tom, don't. But I must kiss you. I can't help myself. Oh, Mr. Moonlight, what a way for old married people to behave. Old married people. Why, go over and look at that old married lady in the mirror. I look my years, Tom. You don't, of course. Oh, Tom. And it's my belief that you never will. Oh, please don't say that. Oh, Sarah, you've got to get over that silly fancy. Oh, I can't. I'm frightened. Frightened? Supposing, Tom... Supposing someone should be born who never really did grow any older. 
What would happen? Well, she'd probably make a fortune in a freak show. Now, please be serious. Oh, how can I be serious about such nonsense? But just supposing, what do you think would happen? Well, in olden times, she'd probably have been burned as a witch. And nowadays? Nowadays, we have other ways of dealing with witches. Less crude, perhaps, but just as nasty. Why, Sarah, you're trembling. Tom, once I prayed above all things that I should never grow older, look older. I thought you'd stop loving me if I did. Now I think you'll stop if I don't. But you will, darling. Of course you'll look older in time. You'd rather I did? Well, yes, I think I would. But there's quite enough that's miraculous about my wife without that. Oh, it sounds foolish when I talk about it to you, but not when I'm alone. Sometimes I feel I'm going mad and can't stand it any longer. You see, it's growing stronger, not weaker. Every year for years, ever since we've been married. Sarah. Oh, do you think I'm just fanciful? That's all. And you'll always believe, whatever happens, that I love you, won't you? Yes, dear. But nothing can happen. In fact, I promise you that in the morning you look 102. Now, come, darling, I think it's time you went to bed. In a little while. I'm not at all sleepy. You'll come up soon? Yes, soon. Then kiss me goodnight. Good night, my darling. And remember, I love you, Mr. Moonlight, very, very much. going at this time of night? Minnie, Minnie, I'm never going to look any older. What fool's talk is this? Your necklace, the dreard, and the legend. I know of no legend. I wished, Minnie, it was the night before I was married. I wished that I might never look any older. That legend, Minnie, it was true. No. Can you look at me now and say that? Oh, Miss Sarah. I suppose it was wicked of me to wish. Vain and unnatural. Now, I'm a kind of freak, a witch. We have new methods for burning witches. We burn their dear ones too, Minnie. What is it? What are you going to do? I'm going away, out of their lives. Tom's and Jane. What foolishness is this? Tom growing old beside me. And Jane, a young lady with a mother who didn't change... Oh, I couldn't stand it, nor could they. You'll break their hearts. I'd break them if I'd stay. Where will you go? To Maud, in Florence. Tom Moonlight will find you. He mustn't know, and you must never tell. He must think me dead. Promise. Poor Tom Moonlight. Promise? I promise, if that's the way it must be. Thank you. Goodbye, Minnie. Goodbye. Sarah Moonlight. You'll take care of them, won't you? I... Tom and little Jane. Take good care of them. For me. The curtain falls on Act One of Mrs. Moonlight, starring Janet Gaynor and George Brent. During this short intermission, we meet the Brownings getting ready to go to their summer cottage on the lake. Come on, girls. Help me finish this list. What list, Mother? Things we've got to get on our way through the village before we reach camp. Okay, let's see what you've written down. Oh, I see something you've missed. Matches. Oh, please, Mother, put some marshmallows on the list, too. Well, Midge, we can't toast marshmallows right away. We'll have a lot of cleaning up to do. Dishes to wash. Everything will be dusty. Oh, dear, a big dishwashing job. Hmm, that means Lux. Is it on the list? Yes. It won't take long with Lux. Gosh, wouldn't it be awful to be stuck at camp with no Lux? And have to fool around forever with pokey cake soap. Or ruin our hands with wash day soap. <laughs> then you wouldn't have those rose petal hands Archie Smith raves about, would you, Dot? I don't mean that at all. Anyhow, you know perfectly well Lux is the nicest way to do dishes, isn't it, Mother? Of course it is, dear. I want you girls to have nice hands, so don't worry. 
There'll always be plenty of lux in the house. Wise Mother Browning. People notice red, rough hands right away. They certainly rob a woman of charm. That's why it's so important to wash dishes with Lux. There's an amazing difference between Lux and harsh wash day soaps. Your hands feel it when you touch those soft Lux suds. And your hands show it, too. They soon look so much softer and prettier. Did you ever realize this? Lux flakes are as gentle as the finest toilet soap. They haven't any of those alkaline suds builders that sting and irritate your skin. And yet, Lux for dishes costs almost nothing. Why, a lot of women find that just one big box will do their dishes for about 60 meals. So be sure to get the thrifty big box of Lux Flakes right away and use it for dishes every day. And now, here's Mr. DeMille. Act two of Mrs. Moonlight, starring Janet Gaynor in the title role and George Brent as Tom. <laughs> Seventeen years have passed since the night Sarah Moonlight fled from her family because she knew she could never grow old. Unable to find a trace of her, Tom Moonlight has picked up the broken threads of his life. He's been married for many years to Sarah's cousin, Edith, and is enjoying a middle-aged happiness. Jane, the young daughter Sarah left behind her, is now a woman old enough for marriage. One of her suitors, Percy Medling, has come to call. In the living room of the Moonlight home, he leans toward her, a desperate look in his eyes. You're not listening, Jane. Of course I'm listening, but can't you tell me some other time, Percy? I'd rather tell you now, Jane. But we're expecting a guest. Minnie's gone to the station to meet her. Yes, I know, but... It's a brand new cousin. You mean a baby? Oh, no, silly. She's only a year or two younger than I. They've lived in Italy for years. We've never even seen her. Jane, I'm sorry to interrupt, but if you have a guest coming, I must say what I have to say quickly. Now, as to my present occupation, engineering is quite a respectable occupation, and the firm is well-established and an old one. Furthermore, my father would be regarded by many people as being, so to speak, in a very comfortable position. Percy, are you proposing to me? Well, yes, I was coming to that in a moment. May I advise you, Percy, the next time you want a girl to marry you, just say, Jane, I love you. Unless, of course, her name is Mary. You mean it's... No good, then. I'm afraid not, Percy. You see, I don't love you. Oh. I'm very sorry, Percy. Jane, there isn't any other. I mean, you're, you're not in love with someone else, are you? I don't know. But you must have some idea. I mean, well... Willie Rag is coming over a little later. Willie Rag. Oh, I see. That's your guest, Minnie. Only one getting off. Nice looking young woman, too. Yes. That's her. Sarah. Miss Sarah. How are you, Minnie? Sarah Moonlight. Let me look at you. Come into the light. No. I haven't changed, if that's what you mean. Still young. Still a girl. Only in looks, Minnie. Not in my heart. Oh, my poor darling. Was I right to come? I had to see them again, Tom and Jane. But they won't know me. You promised. They'll think that you're Maud's daughter, Joy, who resembles her aunt, Sarah Moonlight. To them, Sarah Moonlight has been dead for 17 years. And ghosts don't often come back, do they? No. The carriage is over here. How is he, Minnie? Tom Moonlight? Oh, he's well. Happy enough, I dare say. Edith makes him a good wife, doesn't she? Mm, yes. Yes. She was always in love with him. Tell me about yourself. Where do you live? In Vienna now. I was seven years in Florence, then eight in Paris. People begin to wonder after a few years, so I have to keep moving on. You, uh, you have money enough? Mm, money enough for me. My music helps. Pupils and concerts. And it's good for me. There's no time to feel sorry or to think of him and Jane, Minnie. What is she like? 
My Jane. Like you, mostly. I suppose you'll be marrying soon. Very likely. There are two young men. Very nice young men, I hope. Percy Middling is. And uh, Willie Rag. Well, <laughs> him you can judge for yourself. He'll be at the house, most likely. You're late, Willie. The third time this week. Late again. Willie left his little Jane, but Willie soon came back again. <laughs> I made that up on my way. Jane, you haven't kissed me yet. You haven't asked me. Please, Miss Moonlight, may I kiss you? Yes, you may. Twice. Once. Twice. <laughs> Where have you been? I've been to Newmarket. Oh, have you got the job? No, but I probably shall, or something else. Oh, Willie. Now, there's nothing to worry about. Oh, but there is. You know how Father feels. He says you're irresponsible. Irresponsible? I? It's blasphemous. Oh, I say, he can't hear me, can he? <laughs> no. Good. And if he won't give his consent, I'll marry you without it. Oh, Willie, please be serious. But I am. Oh, we thought you were alone, Jane. Come in, Father. Come in, Mother. How are you, Mr. Vag? Very well, ma'am. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Has many returned yet, Jane? No, Father. Well, I think I'll meet her on the road. Oh, please, sir, if I might have a word with you, sir. A word with me? I think you know what it's about. I have an inkling. I'm going to marry your daughter, sir. Oh, yes? Oh, uh, Father, Willie doesn't mean it quite like that. Mr. He... Rag is a bit blunt. I believe in speaking out, sir. A fine quality, and I believe in it, too. I also believe, young man, that at the present time you have no position or any prospect of one. Under those conditions, I don't quite see how you can speak of marriage. I regret your disapproval, sir, but I must tell you that I won't let it stand in my way. Really? Willie, don't say any more. Father, you don't understand. Mm, evidently not. Tom, wait. Minnie is here. I'll speak to you later, Mr. Rag. Well, why doesn't she come in? Minnie! Your visitor is here, Mr. Moonlight. Come in, Miss Joy. Good evening. Oh. Why? Why, she's... She's the image of... Tom, don't. How are you, my dear? I'm very well, thank you. I am your Aunt Edith. And this is... This is... Mr. Moonlight. Yes, we're... We're very happy to see you, George. Thank you. This is my stepdaughter, Jane. I've been looking forward to your coming. Jane. But... What's the matter, dear? Well, Mother, she's so pale. Well, she's tired out. She's had a long journey. Yes. Yes, a, a very long journey. Sarah? Yes? It's almost time for your train, Sarah. I know, Minnie. The days have passed quickly, Sarah. Too quickly. Oh, there was so much I wanted to do. And now it's all slipped away from me. Oh, Minnie. She must be happy. My Jane must be happy. If I knew she was going to be, I could leave in peace. You're talking of Willie Rag now. Yes. Why can't she see, Minnie? Why doesn't she know? And why am I so powerless to help her? I'm her mother, Minnie. And I can't lift my hand. A half an hour past nine. It'd best be making ready. The night train is always on time. The night train. I left once before at night. Long ago. Hush, my darling. You'll come again. After another 20 years. Oh, what's the use, Minnie? If only to see us all. To see you all growing old without me. To feel left behind. Sarah, my darling. Joy. May I see you? Jane, of course. Come in. It's rather private. Minnie, will you leave us alone? Very well. What is it, Jane? Well, it's about Willie. I want you to talk to Father. Tell him what you what you think of him. But what I think of Willie is really very much what your father thinks of him. Joy, but can't you see what Willie is? Yes. I've been worried that you can't. Oh, really, Joy? I thought you at least would be on my side. My dear, I am on your side. Well, that's what Mother says. But middle-aged people have forgotten what love is. Not always, Jane. Are you very disappointed in me? No, but I thought you'd understand, that's all. Jane, will I see you before I go? Of course. Why do you ask? Well, it's a late train. I thought you might be tired. No, I'll wait up to see you go. Thank you, Jane.
Hello, Jane. Is that you? No. Oh, Miss Joy. Do you want her, Mr. Rag? I'll call her down. No, 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 no. Not, not yet. Come down yourself. Oh, this is a bit of luck. Finding you alone, I mean. I'm afraid I'm rather busy. Oh, I say, I've been waiting three weeks for a chance to talk to you. You mustn't dodge me now. Not on your last night. Do you know, Joy, do you know that you're a very beautiful creature? You really think so? Oh, now, don't be modest. If I didn't have Jane, I might go clear over my head. Oh, thank you. May I sit beside you? Certainly. Why? Well, why does a fellow ever want to sit beside a pretty woman? Usually because he wants to kiss her. That's why. Why did you do that? I don't know. I've been wanting to ever since I first saw you. Are you angry? I'm not sure yet. Have you forgotten, Jane? Of course not. I adore Jane, but... But what? Well, hang it all, I'm not married yet, you know. And if you are angry about my kissing you, I can only say... I'm sorry. I didn't say I was angry. I may not be angry at all. You know, Joy, you're a strange girl. Yes, I am. You're not like any of the girls I've known. You're different. You... I want to see you again, Joy. You must let me. Well, I'm going to Paris. I'll follow you. Where will you be? What address? Please tell me. Numero 82. And the rest? Rue d'Alger. Rue d'Alger. Hadn't you better write it down? Do you think I could forget it? Joy, listen. I can't leave tonight, but I'll follow you. Look for Would me. Would it be rude uh, if I asked to come in? Uh, uh, Jane, I didn't hear you. Perhaps I walked too softly. Believe me, I didn't mean it. Uh, uh, I was just telling Joy goodbye. Was that it? Of course. <clears throat> well, I really must run. Goodbye, Joy. And goodbye, Jane. Darling. Uh, see you tomorrow. Night. Jane. Jane, dear. Don't come near me. Don't touch me. You're vile. Jane, don't say that. You are. You're vile. You're unclean. I heard you. I heard everything you said. Now go on. Go to Paris. Wait for him there. He'll make you very happy, I'm sure. But at least he hasn't the chance to make you unhappy. You see don't now... Don't speak to me. I hate you. I hate you. Jane. Father, make her go. Make her leave. Get her away from here. Jane, what is it? I can't bear the sight of her, I tell you. Are you mad? She wanted Willie. Well, she may have him. And you needn't worry any longer about me, Father. I'll marry Percy just as you wanted. I'll marry Percy Middling and be miserable all my life. Now are you satisfied? Joy, I'm sorry for this. I'm sure she's just upset, that's all. Oh, please don't be polite. Well, I'd better leave. I'll miss my train. Are you disappointed in me? I don't even know the facts. Jane told you. I've stolen her young man. But I didn't want him. I'd rather have Jane's love than anything in the world. Then why did you do it? You were against the marriage. Certainly I was. I knew they'd never be happy. So did I. Did you? And there's talk about Paris. He wanted to follow me. I gave him the wrong address, a made-up one. I only wanted Jane to see what he was really like. Why, you... you funny child. When Jane is over this, will you tell her what I've told you? Of course I will. Promise? I promise. Mr. Moonlight, are you happy? Yes, of course. Why? Oh, I knew you were, really. I just wanted to hear you say it. What a strange, strange girl you are, Joy. You're the second person who said that tonight. Oh, there's my carriage. I don't want to go back. I don't want to go yet. You may stay if you want to. No, I can't. Goodbye, Mr. Moonlight. Goodbye. I shall miss you very much, Joy. You're very much like... Like someone I once knew. Someone I loved. Dear Mr. Moonlight, will you kiss me goodbye? Goodbye, dear. Come soon again, won't you? Soon, perhaps.
will pause for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. have just heard Act Two of Mrs. Moonlight, starring Janet Gaynor and George Brent. During the intermission, we present a very famous guest. But first, a piece of news about a penny. Do you know what a penny a day can do for your hands? Here's what I mean, and see if you don't think it's a beauty bargain. About a penny's worth of luxe will do a whole day's dishes. Yes, for about the price of a penny postage stamp, you can use gentle lux, as beauty experts advise, to help your hands stay soft and white. If the water is hard... Just a little extra lux will soften it and give you an abundance of suds. How foolish to use harsh soaps, since it costs almost nothing to use lux for dishes. So keep that thrifty big box handy. Use it for dishes every day. Remember, you're often judged by your hands. Make them speak well of you. Mr. DeMille escorts our guest to the microphone. Columbia University has on its faculty a memorable personality in Professor Walter B. Pitkin. Academic duties occupy only a part of his prodigious energy. He's also famous as an author. Professor Pitkin has passed the age of 40 far enough to uh, know what he's talking about. He decided that middle age and old age were nothing to dread. So he wrote a book about his discovery with the challenging title, Life Begins at 40, which held a place among bestsellers. The author of this book should have some interesting comments on the problem of Sarah Moonlight. So from New York City, we hear Professor Walter B. Pitkin. Mrs. Moonlight in our play tonight is indeed a very unusual character. Yet her wish is the secret wish of every man and woman since the beginning of time. The desire for perpetual youth lies deep in the hearts of every one of us. We think it's the road to perpetual happiness, and yet... How wrong we are in our wishful thinking, and how pitiful the consequences. Think of the matron of 40 who tries to be 20. Think of the dowager of 60 who tries to be kittenish. If they only realized, each age has its own special loveliness. How delightful is the charm of a five-year-old. But would you want to be five forever? And how rich and beautiful the charm of a 70-year-old grandmother... I agree with Samuel Butler that youth is a greatly overrated season, like spring. Occasionally sunny, but usually full of raw gusts. Youth is lovable, but immature. But middle age and old age are as deep as character. And character can be as deep as the universe. Nature is always moving forward. If you attempt to stop the march... You die, mentally and spiritually. Life insists that we grow, that we live each new day as it comes, reaching out to accept new responsibilities and new experiences. And it is those enriching experiences that give us beauty and charm and keep us young and alive. People who keep up with the times, people who never try to stop the clock, People who refuse to be perpetually 20. They are the ones who know that life is just beginning at 40. We cannot condemn youth and its lack of wisdom, but we do condemn age, which refuses to accept its own rich rewards. And now let us return to Mrs. Moonlight. I don't know how this play turns out, but I do know that Mrs. Moonlight is basically a splendid woman. And I have faith that somehow she will be able to discover a solution to her problem and that she will find happiness. Mm, you show us that autumn has beautiful colors, Professor. In Hollywood again, we continue our play, Mrs. Moonlight, starring Janet Gaynor and George Brent. <laughs> Years have passed. Long years, which have gradually dimmed the remembrance of Sarah Moonlight and Joy. It's the present day, and many changes have come to the Moonlights. Edith is dead, and Jane and Percy Middling, married for 20 years, live on with old Tom Moonlight. 
Meanwhile, in the cities of Europe, a strange figure moves silently, always alone, always young, never changing in a changing world. In a music school in Bucharest, this strange girl, known only as Miss Sarah, faces the master in his room. Miss Sarah, how long have you been with us now? Twelve years. Twelve years. Yeah, had not realized it was that long. Miss Sarah, what I have to say is not easy. But some of the other teachers, they, they feel... They feel there's something strange about me. Yeah, of course, I know that it is ridiculous, but... Uh... Oh, don't say any more. I'll leave in the morning. Oh, oh no, no, Miss Sarah, you... It's happened before. It'll happen again. What is it about you? What is it? Uh, where will you go, Miss Sarah? Oh, I don't know. To Paris, to Berlin, Naples. It is not easy to find work in strange cities. They're not strange to me. And you want to work here, Miss Sarah? Uh, Miss Sarah, haven't I seen you somewhere? I don't remember. Uh, it's a long time ago. I don't remember. I am sorry, but I have nothing for you. Good day, senor. The concert season in Paris is well booked, mademoiselle. If will you go name? I am called Miss Sarah. Miss? Of course I remember you. You played here in 1904. You... What? That is impossible. Yes. Yes, you've mistaken me for someone else, monsieur. But you say you are... No. Good day, monsieur. And you want to teach my daughter? Yes. I can give your daughter lessons every day. Just as you gave them to me? What? You gave me lessons, too? No. You did? And I was a girl. Oh, no. You... I remember. I remember. Miss Sarah. No. 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 <laughs> And the ticket was to Vienna, Fräulein? Yes, to Vienna. I... No. No, I want to go to England. To London. Yeah, Fräulein. First class? No, third, please. Third class to London. See you tomorrow, Peter. Right you are. Thanks for the lift. Oh, it's a pleasure. I say, Peter, is that somebody waiting for you? Where? Uh, that woman by your steps, looking up at the house. I don't know who she is. I've noticed her hanging around the house several times the last few days. Well, why don't you ask her what she wants? I believe I will. Goodbye, Greg. <laughs> Bye. I beg your pardon, but, but are you looking for someone? No, not exactly. You look ill. Uh, would you like to come in for a moment? Uh, this is my house. Your house. What is your Christian name? Why, why, Peter. Peter. Peter Middling. Your father is Percy Middling, and your mother is Jane. How did you know that? And your grandfather. Is he dead? No, he's not dead. Oh. Oh, here, here, here wait a moment. Uh, don't go away. Why, you're cold and ill. Come inside and get warm. Oh, no. No, no, I mustn't. Nonsense. Well, a hot drink will do you good. Come along now. Will you wait here a moment, please? Thank you. Mother. Peter, come in. I, I say, Mother, I've, uh, I, I've brought a woman into the house. Peter. Oh, no, no, listen. I, I think she's ill. She looks it. Who is the woman? I haven't the faintest idea, Father. But she knew my name and seemed to know all about me. She knew your name? Oh, hello, Minnie. Why, yes. Who do you suppose it is, Minnie? I, I don't know. How could I? I'll go and have a look at her. I suppose she's a very beautiful Peter. No. She's rather ragged and, and young like a girl. But her eyes are too big and... Well, there, there, there's something strange about her. Come in, please. Thank you. Good evening. How do you do? Come and sit down by the fire. Are you my... Are you Peter's mother? Yes, I am. Yes, I thought you were. You're very lovely. 
Would you like something hot to drink? And that is Percy nibbling. How do you know that? You mustn't ask me questions. Please sit down. Thank you. Well, I'm all right, really. It's just that lately I've had a kind of pain here in my heart. Peter, come and sit near me. You've got to tell me all about yourself. Are you at Oxford or Cambridge? Oxford. Like your grandfather. How did you know that? Who are you? Poor, puzzled Jane. I'm just an old lady, my dear, who's rather come down in the world. Old? Why, you're a girl. That... that picture on the table. It's Tom Moonlight, isn't it? Yes, it is. Was it just taken? This picture? That? Oh, that was taken a good ten years ago. May I see him? I'm afraid not. He's very feeble. His memory's gone, and he really doesn't recognize people. He hasn't recognized any of us for months. Poor Mr. Moonlight. He hasn't really been the same since my grandmother died. You... your grandmother. You mean Edith? Yes. Oh, I say, if, if you're an old friend of grandfather's, perhaps you could come tomorrow and see him. She can see him now. Minnie, you brought him down? Father... Tom. Tom Moonlight. Who? Who is that over there? Father. He doesn't know you, Mother. He's staring at her. Oh, my dear. I've been asleep. Yes, Tom. Has Edith gone? Edith? Yes, dear. She's gone. Well, that's good. I'm worried about Edith. Worried about what you told me this evening. I've been thinking it over, and I believe you're right. Edith is in love with me. Of course she is, darling. We all are. Ah, uh, including you, eh? A little while ago it was all except you. Was it, Mr. Moonlight? Perhaps I've grown older since then. Have you indeed? Well, I'll tell you a secret. I never believed you. You love me very much indeed. Clever Mr. Moonlight. Grandfather, who is she? Who is she? Why, that's my wife, young man. Who are you? I? I'm Peter. Well, I don't know you, sir. And I don't much want to. Grandfather, what is your wife called? She's called Sarah, of course. Sarah Moonlight. Percy, he thinks it's his first wife. What are they saying? Don't they like my Sarah? Well, of course they do. Especially me. I think she's lovely. Well, she is, too. And what's more, she doesn't change. Did you know that? She doesn't change. Now, what's that about changing? She's worried about that. I don't like that. I've forgotten it. Tom... Shall I play for you again? Huh? Yes, yes. You always like this. May I sit beside you, Mrs. Moonlight? I'm a very lucky man, Mrs. Moonlight. And a very, very happy man. Yes, dear. And you're a very happy woman, Mrs. Moonlight. Very happy. I think I've never been so happy in my life as I am now. And I'm certain of this. Mrs. Moonlight, I could never, never be happy with any woman but you. That's what you think, Mr. Moonlight. It's what I know. Uh, Sarah, I think I'll go to bed now. I'm feeling tired and sleepy. Yes, dear. I'll take him upstairs. So tired, Sarah. So very, very tired. Father. Uh, Peter, get some brandy. Oh, my darling. My darling. Percy, you and Peter get him upstairs. No. Stay here, all of you. He'll want her. I know. Come along, please. Thank you. Thank you, Minnie.
She's been up there with him a long time. Over half an hour. Percy, I'm nervous. Oh, it's all right, my dear. Well, there's nothing to be nervous about, Mother. Why does Father think he knows her? After all, my dear, your father hasn't known anyone for months, and it's just as reasonable that he might think he knows this girl. No, there's something else. But I won't say it. I, I'm afraid. Wait, here's Minnie. Minnie, how is Father? Your father... Your father is dead. Minnie. Oh, Minnie. She was with him. He was in her arms. Minnie, who is that girl? She's someone Mr. Moonlight knew a long time ago. Minnie, come in, dear. Peter, get her a chair. I'm quite all right. All right, thank you. I'm not unhappy. It was really very, very beautiful. It would be wicked to be unhappy. I'm only, only very tired. I wonder why I'm so tired. Please sit down. You'll feel better in a minute. Thank you, Peter. He just said to me, I love you, Mrs. Moonlight. Very, very dearly. He just said that. He looked happy, too. Jane. Yes? Give me your hand. I'm so pleased with you, Jane. I've always liked your nice Percy Midland. And you've done well together, haven't you? A nice boy and a nice home. Oh, I... I'm so tired. I love you, Mrs. Moonlight, very, very dearly. Jane, do I look happy? Very happy. Are you? Oh, oh, so happy. It's funny to be so tired here in my heart. Perhaps, perhaps, oh, Oh, how lovely. Now, Lord, let us, thou, thy servant, depart in peace. For mine eyes have seen, mine eyes have seen. Mother, look at her. She, she's... She's at peace with Tom Moonlight. Mother. It's all right, Peter. I'm sure she's happy. See how she's smiling. Falls on Act Three of Mrs. Moonlight, starring Janet Gaynor and George Brent. In a moment, our stars return for their curtain calls. But first, a timely word. Here we are at the beginning of summer, and that means vacation time, doesn't it? Vacation time for you, but not for your hands. Did you ever think of that? You're right, Mr. Roy. My hands work harder in the summer than in the winter. But with gardening, swimming, tennis, and... And housekeeping? Oh, yes, housekeeping, of course. My hands show it, too. Well, you're just the person I want to talk to. Now's the time your hands are busier than ever. They need special care. They can't spend hours in the dishpan with harsh, biting suds drying them up and then do a right-about face and look nice when company comes. You need Lux for every single soap and water job you do, and especially for your dishes. Do you know why? Because Lux has none of the alkaline suds builders found in many laundry soaps. Lux contains nothing to dry and roughen your skin. That's why beauty experts recommend it for dishes. And remember, a little goes so far. Lux is thrifty. Buy the generous large size box and start now to save your hands. Mr. DeMille. The moonlight of our play has faded, so suppose we get back to the world of reality. Miss Gaynor, I've heard some whispers about you that I'd like to pin down right now. Well, uh, what are these whispers, Mr. DeMille? Well, they're about painting and... Uh... Oh, I'm sure it was an exaggeration. 
But if you're looking for a hobby, there's George Brent's. A gentle pastime called polo. The question was about paint, not ponies. There's really nothing to it. Something around the house always needs paint. Kitchen table, the lawn chairs, a cupboard. A landscape or a still life. I'm afraid my watercolors are pretty amateurish. But the furniture painting, well, now that's quite professional. Mm -hmm. Could George and I persuade you to do a sketch of us, say, with me sitting in a chair and George standing behind with his hand on my shoulder? <laughs> I'd be delighted to, but I'm afraid portraits are beyond me. If you draw a picture of an orange and it doesn't look like an orange, you can always say it's impressionistic. That doesn't go with portraits, at least not when the living originals do the judging. Why hasn't somebody seen one of these pictures? Mm, I keep them locked up. Yeah. But you can look at the lawn chairs I paint at any time. Huh. I used a special weatherproof paint. We could have used some of that and the rains came. I doubt if there has ever been so much rain in California before. <laughs> <laughs> and photographing rain is a difficult operation, too. It has to be done on a clear day to get enough light. Yes, yes. Well, if it was a cloudy day and looked like rain, we made sunshine scenes indoors on a soundstage. Now, that's not so crazy as it seems if you think it over. Mm. Well, I'll figure it? it out on the way home. <laughs> and I think it's time to leave now. Well, I recognize a gentle hint. Good night, C.B. Mm. I hope the man in the moonlight and Mrs. Moonlight shine long in clear skies. All of you, I'm sure, will want to join us again a week from tonight when you hear the announcement of our stars and play, which Mr. DeMille brings you in a moment. Assisting in our cast tonight were Janet Young as Minnie, Jane Gilbert as Jane, Ted Osborne as Willie Ragg, Claire Vadera as Edith, James Eagles as Peter... Eric Snowden as Percy Midling, Lou Merrill as Heinrich, Frank Nelson as Bonelli, Jane Morgan as Frau Muller, and Eddie Kane as ticket agent. The play Mrs. Moonlight was written by Ben W. Levy. Louis Silvers appeared through courtesy of 20th Century Fox Studio, where he directed music for Second Fiddle. Don't miss the Lux Daytime Radio program, The Life and Love of Dr. Susan. This human and gripping story of a young, attractive woman doctor is brought to you every afternoon, Monday through Friday. For the time and station, see your newspaper. The Life and Love of Dr. Susan comes to you in addition to the Lux Radio Theater. Your host, Mr. DeMille. Scattered along the boundary between the United States and Mexico are colorful, exciting jumping-off places called border towns. To such a place we take you next Monday night in a melodrama of a disillusioned man who crushes his ideals in a scramble for money and power. Into his life come two girls, and the mark they leave upon it is told in our adaptation of the hit picture, Border Town. And bringing Border Town to our microphone are three stars, outstanding in popularity and talent. Donna Michi, Joan Bennett, and Claire Trevor. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Donna Michi, Joan Bennett, and Claire Trevor in Border Town. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. The announcer has been Melville Roy. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Charles Lawton, Ella Raines, and Rosalind Evan in The Suspect. Ladies and gentlemen, your guest producer, Mr. Thomas Mitchell. Thank you. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Two nights a week in a veteran hospital not far from here, wounded and battle-worn soldiers gather around a visitor. This visitor keeps them enthralled with magic words delivered in an almost magic voice as he reads from Shakespeare, Milton, Shaw, and Dickens. For no one can surpass Charles Lawton in bringing life and warmth and color to the English language. He's standing in the wings tonight, and he's ready to bring us Universal's thrilling mystery, The Suspect, 
with Ella Raines as his leading lady. You know, the last time Miss Raines was on this stage, about a year ago, we called her a brand new Hollywood discovery. Tonight, we changed that title to an established Hollywood success, a star whose meteoric rise is happily supported by sincere and brilliant talent. And also in our cast tonight is Rosalind Eva, the gifted English actress, whose ability to portray shrewish wives is in contradiction to a very gentle and delightful personality. All three appear in their original screen roles in a fateful triangle of marriage, love, and murder that makes for one of the season's most exciting and suspense-packed melodramas. In a minute, we'll take you to London in 1902, but while we're traveling, let's look in at Arabia in 1945. Perhaps you read in a recent copy of Life magazine an account of the King of Arabia's visit to an American destroyer on his way to Yalta. Well, the king brought with him a convoy of small boats carrying cattle, food, and personal belongings just to make sure his majesty was served in proper Arabian style. But there was one important occidental touch. One night, after a sumptuous state repast, the king's servants passed among the guests a huge and magnificent metal bowl filled with rose water. In the center of the bowl, resting on a little island, was the final touch of luxury, a case of Lux toilet soap. We always knew Lux toilet soap was fit for a queen, but we're happy to note that it also to the king's taste. Now, down go the lights, and up goes our coast-to-coast -coast curtain on the first act of The Suspect, starring Charles Lawton as Philip Marshall, Ella Raines as Mary Gray, Rosalind Evan as Cora, and Dennis Green as Gilbert Simmons. <laughs> In the spring of 1902, down a respectable side street, Mr. Philip Marshall comes home from work. His face is lined, his shoulders slightly stooped from years of service to the firm of Fraser and Nicholson, purveyors of tobacco. But Philip Marshall carries himself with the dignity of an honest British tradesman. At his gate, he greets his next-door neighbor. Good afternoon, Mrs. Simmons. Done wonders with your tulips. I have a green thumb, as they say in heaven. Would you like some balls? Oh, thank you very much, but I'm afraid my wife hasn't much heart for gardening. It was so good of you to bring my husband home last night. Oh, I was glad to do it. I'm sorry Gilbert carries on so when he's drinking. It must be a great trial to you. Well, Oh, there's a cab at your gate. Cab? Oh, excuse me. Are you the one who called the cab, Governor? No, there must be some mistake. Orders, boss, they come to number 26. Well, this is 26. Just a minute, I better go in and see. Well, Mr. Philip Marshall, no loving greeting for your wife? What's the cab for, Cora? What do you think? The penny bus is good enough for me. Did John send for that cab? Right as a button, aren't you? That's just what young Hopeful did. He's clearing out bag and baggage. The selfish, ungrateful, good for nothing. What did you do to him? What did I do to him? All I did was bring him into the world, nurse him, make myself a doormat for him to walk on. That's right. Go on upstairs. Go to him. And tell him from me that when he leaves his house, he needn't think he can come clawing back. He's hurting his own mother. You can tell him. Oh, hello, Dad. Done packing? Oh, I'm sorry. I'd, I'd stick it out here on your account. Well, but... it's bound to come. What happened? Oh, she was at me all day. I was trying to get those reports finished. It's... It's been a race at the office, you know, and I'd give my right arm for that job in Canada. Well, she got into one of her rages, grabbed the report and threw it into the fire. Twenty pages, a week's work. Have you got another place to stay? Oh, I'll stay at Jimmy Estabrook's. I'm sorry, boy. Let me help you with those bags. Oh, no, thanks. I can manage. Hey, watch out for that broken step. I'll keep in touch with you, Dad. Yes. How's Sybil? Oh, oh, fine. I haven't seen her all week, though. She's a nice little thing. Is it serious between you two? Well, I... Well... It's a pity this house isn't good enough for you, John. Goodbye, Mother. Goodbye, Mother, you mealy mouth hypocrite. Two of a kind, that's what you are. I'll see you soon, Dad. I shall miss you, son. Goodbye. Well, Philip. Philip, come here. Don't you go sneaking off upstairs. 
running off right when I'm talking to you. Just as if I were a common servant. I know what's mine to you, even if you don't. Cora, I'm moving my things into John's room. Well, of all the insulting... We're married, aren't we? Yes, we're married. Then how dare you? I forbid it. No, Cora, that's all over now that John's gone. I'm moving out of our room, and there's nothing you can do about it. What's got into you? What are you thinking Much about? better that you don't know, Cora. It might frighten you. <laughs> Here's your chain, sir. Excellent tobacco. Fraser and Nicholson's best. And thank you, sir. Good afternoon. Mary Dew. Mary Dew. Yes, sir. Mr. Marshall wants to see you. Go on now into his office right away. Yes, sir. Mary Dew, sir. Come in. Mary Dew. I have a very serious matter to bring to your attention. Yes, sir. I regret to say there's a penny missing from the stamp box. It... It was for a sugar bun this morning. And the tuppence yesterday, what was that for? Acid drop, sir. But I'll put it all back on payday. That's what all embezzlers plan to do. But I'm not an embezzler. Yes, but you started that way. It's the first step that counts. After, after that, it all becomes very easy. Sixpence tomorrow, half a crown the day after. Oh, but I... Yes, I know you mean to pay it back, but you may finish by paying it back in the Portland prison quarries. Don't send me to the prison quarries, please, Mr. Marshall. Well, uh, not this time, Mary Lou. Now, stop sniffling. Here, take my handkerchief and wipe your eyes. A young lady to see you, Mr. Marshall. Oh, uh, run along, Mary Lou. Won't you come in, Miss, um... Gray. Mary Gray. Miss Gray, what can I do for you? I, I'm seeking employment. Work? Here? Selling tobacco? I mean office work. I can take dictation. We are quite satisfied with our young men. Why, some of our young men have been with us here for 30 or 40 years. I see. I'm so, well, I'm so sorry. I think you might have better luck at a draper's establishment. I, I, I've tried. I... Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Oh, Stanton. Yes, sir? Might as well lock up. Six o'clock. Six o'clock. The days are getting longer now. Yes, I've got a good mind to walk home. It'll be nice walking through the park at this time of day. Good evening, Mr. Marshall. Oh, good evening, officer. We're going to have a lovely sunset. Yes, be a fine evening. I thought... Hello. What's the matter with her? Her, sir? A girl on the bench. She's crying. <laughs> so she is. I usually let him cry it out. He does him good. Evening, sir. Evening. I beg your pardon. Is there anything I can do? No. Go away, please. Leave me alone. Why, hello, Miss Gray. Oh, oh Mr. Marsh. I don't mean to intrude, but I... Oh, you're very that... kind. I'm afraid I... Behaving rather badly. Oh, now, now, now. Come, come, come. It can't be as bad as all that. You know, I'm really sorry about the work in my office, oh, Miss Gray. It wasn't just that. I was feeling a bit down. All at once it came over me how terribly alone I am. You see, my father died in the winter. And there were just the two of us. Well, I know how it is to be lonely, and I know that it can be faced. Does that make you feel any better? Ever so much. Where were you going? Home. Oh, I see. A cup of tea, a sixpenny novel, and a good long cry. I'm afraid you've been looking in at my window. Hmm. Shall we pool our loneliness? What do you mean? Oh, go somewhere and have a bite of dinner and a talk. You know, I'm sure that I know someone who needs a clever young lady to take dictation. Well, I... Why don't you join me just for this evening? You might enjoy it. It'd be a great kindness to me. Well, I'm sure it would be to me. But aren't you on your way to someone? Someone? No. No, there's no one. I know a nice little Chinese restaurant on Malvern Street. Now, come on and get a cab. You know, it was really good of you to take me on trust. Oh, not altogether on trust. I overheard you in your office with that little boy. Married you? The one you're not going to send to prison. He's a desperate character, don't you think? Oh, so desperate I wanted to hug him. That's the danger with his type. They get round you, huh? You were so gentle with him. Gentle? My dear Miss Gray, you will discover in time that I have a heart of stone. Did you enjoy the dinner? I loved it. But I'm afraid I'll never learn to eat with chopsticks. Well, you know the answer to that one. Practice. We must eat here off now for this. Programs. Programs for tonight's play.
two tickets, please, and stalls. Philip, aren't you being frightfully expensive? You forget, we saved sixpence sitting in the pit last night. Oh, Philip. <laughs> he plays beautifully, doesn't he? Beautifully. It's been so long since I've been to a concert. We'll come again next week. Well, here we are. My rooming house, Philip. Good night. I've had such a good time. These have been the happiest weeks I can remember, Mary. Oh, you say the nicest things, Philip. You do the nicest things. What have I done now? Have you forgotten that you got me my job at Winwood's? I don't remember a thing about it. All I remember is we're having dinner tomorrow night. Oh, Philip. Philip, I can't. Why not? Mrs. Packer, I've told you about her. She works at Winwood's. Oh, she's been frightfully nice. I've asked her and her husband to have dinner with me. Oh, I but, see. But listen, why don't you come along? I'd like so much to have you I'd meet like me. to, Mary. Oh, now, come along, now, Philip. Now, Mary, listen. You and I are pretty good friends, hmm? The best. We've had a lot of fun together. Can't we go on just like this, just the two of us? Why is it, Philip, that you don't ever like to meet anyone? Oh, I don't know. A chap my age has a right to a few peculiarities. And... I know there's something if you'd only tell me. Nothing to tell. Well, as you wish. Good night, Philip. Mary. What about the night after? You know I'll say yes. Good night. Good night, Mary. Cora? Cora? You awake? Cora, I know you're not asleep. I saw you lie down from the street. Cora! It's you, Philip. Come in. <laughs> Flattered, I'm sure. I like the key to my bedroom, Corey. You've locked the door. Where have you been? My key, please. Answer me. You were out with that good-for-nothing from next door, weren't you? Cora, please. Don't try to deny it. I heard him staggering home just now, and you were with him. Yes, Cora, I brought Gilbert Simmons home. I ran into him in front of a pub. He was drunk as usual and causing trouble. And what business is that of yours? Cora, hasn't his poor wife enough to put up with as it is? His poor wife? Huh? What about your poor wife? How much longer do you think I'm going to stand for this coming in at all hours? For the whole street's beginning to gossip. And I'm not going to be made an object of pity in front of my friends, do you hear me? I'm sorry, Cora, if people choose to embarrass you. Oh, a I... lot you care. What have I ever done to deserve this? What ever possessed me to tie myself up to a poor stick like you? Walk through the forest and pick the crooked tree. That's what I did. A fat, ugly, crooked tree. And I don't care if I never hear an ugly voice again. Cora, don't you know the neighbors can hear every word you say? I don't care. I've nothing to be ashamed if of. If we could only talk quietly, come to some sort of understanding. Cora, now look, we've never been happy together, not once, in all the years that we've been married. And whose fault is that, I'd like to know? It isn't anybody's fault. Over and over again, we've tried but when two people are shut up together and they don't love each other. Everything they do becomes hateful just because they do it. Oh, so that's it, is it? You hate me. You've always hated me. Cora, I did not say that. Will you please listen to me? All I say is that we've got some good years ahead of us, both of us. Why can't we live them happily, apart from each other? Apart? What do you mean? Let me go, Cora. Divorce? Yes. Divorce? Never in my life have I heard of anything so immoral. Divorce, indeed. Oh, no. I'm not going to be laughed at. A woman who couldn't hold a husband. Just for that, you'd ruin both our lives. We are married. And we'll stay married till death to us part. You hear me? Well, my mind's made up, Cora. If you won't divorce me, I'm going to leave you. Oh, you are, are you? Well, you just try it. Just you try it. I'll go down to your precious shop and I'll tell your noble customers what sort you are. I knew it was no use talking to you. There's no way out, is there? Oh, yes, there is for you, Mr. Philip Marshall. Out of your shop. Out of your job. Ha! Won't I love seeing their faces when I tell them that their very respectable manager, Mr. Philip Marshall, wants to desert his own wife. And I will tell them, so help me! Philip, Philip, you haven't eaten a thing, aren't you, Well? Oh, I'm all right. Did anything happen on your way here? You were so late. No. 
you not like yourself tonight? What is it? I've been wanting to tell you all evening, Mary. After tonight, we can't see each other anymore. What did you say? I said we mustn't see each other ever again. Oh. Don't look like that. Philip, we're such good friends. It's meant so much to me. It's meant everything to me. Well, then, don't you think I deserve to know? Tell me, Philip. I've behaved very badly, Mary. Do you remember the first time that we met, I told you that I had no attachments and no ties of any kind? Philip, you're married, aren't you? Yes. It wasn't very fair, was it? No. I was afraid you'd never see me again, and I was so sure that my wife would give me a divorce. Won't she? No. This is our last time together. You've risked too much already. But, Philip, please, we're only friends. We're hurting no one. Is there anything wrong just seeing each other? She followed me here tonight, or she tried to. Your wife? Yes. I managed to shake her off finally, but sooner or later she'll find out, and I'm... Well, I'm not afraid for myself what, what she might do to you. She must... I'm much too fond of you, Mary. What a pity this had to happen now. I hope your Christmas will be happier than mine. Christmas? It's only two weeks away. Well, we can still drink a toast. Mary, my dear... To you. My dear. My very dear. Cora, come here. I've got something to show you, Cora. It's a Christmas tree. Well, couldn't you find a better way to waste your money? Oh, it'll help to cheer us up. Christmas comes but once a year. And where will you hang the mistletoe? Mistletoe? What? Aren't you going to kiss me under the mistletoe? You could shut your eyes, you know, and pretend I was somebody else. There's no one else, Cora. No? Wouldn't it be better if we try to make things a little pleasanter? Try to make this place a little more like home? Oh, I heard from John today. He may be going to Canada soon. Always thinking about your family, aren't you, love? No more evenings at the pub. No more office work to keep you out late. A real little family man. You'll help a bit, won't you? There's no place like home, is there? Now, since that creature threw you out... Cora. And don't tell me there was no such person. Winwoods, that's where she works. Melbourne Crescent, that's where she lives. And Mary Gray, that's her filthy name. Well, why don't you try to deny it? It's true, Cora, but it's all over and done with. Is it? Not for me, it isn't. I'm going down to a filthy shop and show you up for what you are. Cora, no. And I'll do the same for her. I'll go to the house where she lives. I'll go to the place where she works, and I'll let them know the low creature she is. Cora, you're driving me... I'll drive you both into the gutter where you belong. And as sure as the sun rises tomorrow, I'll give her a merry Christmas she'll never forget. <laughs> Afraid now, aren't you? <laughs> Afraid. <laughs> no. Not afraid for her. Not for her. Why, Mr. Marshall? Mrs. Uh, Simmons, please. It's my, my, my wife. W would you go for the doctor? Your wife? What's wrong? Well, there's been an accident, I'm afraid. I'm afraid she's dead. In just a moment, Thomas Mitchell and our stars will return in Act Two of The Suspect. I believe everyone will recognize this game. Gosh, Mary, that's good bowling. Beginner's luck. I'll probably never do it again, but here goes. Oh. Oh, never mind, honey. Gosh, you look cute with your cheeks all pink like that. Say, don't worry about your score. You sure bowled me over. Yes, Lux girls are winners when it comes to romance. Smooth, radiant skin never fails to charm. These clever girls take their complexion tip from Hollywood. They do what famous screen stars do. Depend on active lather facials with fine white Lux toilet soap every single day. Lovely Jean Tierney tells you how she takes her Lux soap beauty facials. I cover my face generously with a creamy lather and work it gently in. I rinse with warm water, then cold, and pat my skin dry with a soft towel... 
It's the way to really lovely skin. It's a fact. Hollywood's active lather facials really do make skin softer, smoother. In recent tests of Lux Soap facials, actually three out of four complexions improved in a short time. Why don't you try them? Begin tomorrow to give your skin this gentle, cherishing care nine out of ten screen stars, lovely women everywhere, find so effective. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Two of the Suspect, starring Charles Lawton as Philip, Ella Raines as Mary, Rosalind Even as Cora, and Dennis Green as Gilbert Simmons. It's several hours later, while the neighborhood buzzes with the tragic news of Mrs. Marshall's sudden death, an early morning visitor fills out a routine report. I've hated to ask these questions, Mr. Marshall, when you're so upset and all. That's all right, Constable. The police department has its regulations. Everything you've told me checks with the doctor's story. The deceased was coming down the stairway. She tripped on the broken step, suffering fatal injuries when her head struck the ballast. Yes, yes. Thank you, Mr. Marshall. That's all I need. Another day has passed. The funeral is over, and departing callers mumble sympathy to Philip and his son, John. Last to leave is their next-door neighbor, Mrs. Simmons. I don't know what we would have done without you, Mrs. Simmons, these past two days. No, it's been nothing, Mr. Marshall. After all you've done for Gilbert and for me. Take good care of your father, John. I will. He looks so tired. Have you slept at all? Oh, I think perhaps I'll sleep tonight. You must. And I've brought you this. It's Dexter's anodyne, a sedative. Sedative? Rather afraid of drugs. Nonsense. Dexter's anodyne. Just five drops in a glass of water puts you right to sleep. It isn't dangerous, is it? Not if you're careful not to take too much. Just five drops. I'll try it, Father. It might help That's you. It's very good of you, Mrs. Simmons. Good night. Good night, John. Good night, Mrs. Simmons. Well, Father? Well, boy? I, I wish there was something I could do. Oh, I'll manage. You've borne up wonderfully. I, I'm proud of you. You run along, John. It's getting late. You sure you don't want me to stay? No. I'll get along fine. Poor mother. I I just want you to know, Dad, that you've nothing to reproach yourself with. No one ever tried harder than you. It might rain. You'd better take an umbrella. Maybe I'd better. I I say, Dad, where's your walking stick? You know, the one with the heavy handle? I don't know. I must have left it somewhere. Doesn't matter. Good night, Dad. Good night. Mr. Philip Marshall? Yes? I'm sorry to intrude at such a time, Mr. Marshall. I'm Inspector Huxley, Scotland Yard. I'd like to ask you a few questions. Come in. Questions about what? The death of your wife. Oh, I answered all those questions. Yes, I read the reports quite thoroughly. The coroner called it accident. Mr. Marshall, there was some insurance in your wife's name, 3,000 pounds. Yes, we both took out policies some years ago. Lots of people do that. Is this the stairway where the accident occurred? Yes. Do you mind if I look about? Not at all. Oh, this broken step. This is the step she tripped on, I suppose. Yes, that's right. You should have a thing like that repaired. We meant to have it repaired a long time ago. And that's the room she came out of? No, that's my room. Hers is on the other side. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Well, it's much clearer now. It's much better than trying to visualize things from the written report. Imagine it must be. Oh. Hmm? Is this where she struck her head? Yes, the baluster was broken. So you had it replaced with a new one? Yes, I couldn't bear the sight. Why do you make a point of that? Oh, no particular reason. Only it seems curious. We find the broken step unrepaired, but the baluster is replaced immediately. What are you trying to suggest? Suggest? Nothing. But let's suppose, purely from my point of view, that it was not an accident. That someone had made up his mind to do away with his wife, for reasons only he knew. But it had to be done. 
Now, let's suppose he took one of these canes, the heaviest. Then he went up these stairs, very quietly. He came to this broken step. Perhaps he pulled the carpet loose a little to make sure that it looked broken. Now he's in the darkness of the upper hallway. He puts his hand over his mouth so that his voice seems to come from a distance. Cora, he calls, and again, Cora. A door opens. For a moment she stands there, grumbling and wondering why the whole light isn't burning. Maybe she cries sharply, what's the matter? He holds his breath. She stands so near. A voice called once more, Philip, are you all right? His hand tightens on the stick. She passes him. She goes downstairs one, two, three steps. It's now or never. He raises the stick. The blow falls, and he follows her as she crashes. She isn't dead yet, but she has to die. Slowly, he raises the stick. Stop and... it! How dare you say I killed my wife? How dare you? I'm sorry, Mr. Marshall. I merely said if your wife was murdered, it could have happened that way. It could have happened that way, but it didn't. You haven't a shred of evidence. But it is an interesting point of view. Now, now, if only we could find something, some, some little something as a motive. You understand what I mean, Mr. Marshall? No, I don't. No? Well, good night, Mr. Marshall. <laughs> It's been such a long time, a whole month since you wrote me, that you, since you told me of your trouble. I didn't dare to meet you, Mary. Even tonight, I'm afraid they may be watching me. They may have followed me to this restaurant. But can't you see how frightfully unfair it is to let the outrageous suspicions of stupid policemen keep us apart? Mary, I couldn't have you mixed up in this sort of thing. But what are people for, people you love? Can't you see that if you were in trouble, I'd want to share it? Not that kind of trouble. Just to be suspected leaves a mark. All right. Let it leave a mark on both of us. Because I don't intend to let you go again. Mary. With the compliments of the house, sir. Our best wine. Well, it's very good to see you again, sir, if I may say so. Thank you. It's very good to be here. Shall I pour it? By all means. This is an occasion. You see, Philip? They missed us. Mary. <laughs> My dear... My very dear. Good afternoon. You wish to see me? Miss Gray, I'm sorry to bother you at your home. I'm Inspector Huxley, Scotland Yard. I'd like to talk to you about Philip Marshall. Go on. We know you've been meeting lately. In fact, he left you at this doorway last night. How long have you known Mr. Marshall? Since last May. Well, surely you knew he was married, yet you continue to meet him frequently. What are you driving at? What are you trying to find out? It's quite possible that Mrs. Marshall was murdered by her husband. Philip Marshall, a murderer? Nonsense. I think you're making a fool of yourself, Inspector. Well, what you think isn't evidence, miss. But you've admitted meeting Mr. Marshall, and that's very valuable evidence. In finding you, we found the motive we've been looking for. You'll be called as a witness for the Crown, Miss Gray. Not Miss Gray, Inspector. Mrs. Philip Marshall. We were married this morning. Oh, I see. <laughs> a very shrewd move, wasn't it? A wife can't be made to testify against her husband. You know, it's a very funny thing, but we never thought of that. Didn't you really? No. <laughs> and it's just coincidence that you silence the only witness whose testimony might hang you. Philip, must we listen to this? No, we mustn't. Inspector, you're getting rather tiresome with your accusations. We don't intend to listen to them any longer. Is that clear? Well, don't you think that an innocent man might be more understanding? I think an innocent man might behave precisely as I have. Well, I'm sorry. I can't agree with you. Well, then here I am. Why don't you arrest me? I'd like to, believe me. Yes, but you've run into a blank wall. You take my advice and don't beat your head against it. Please understand, Mr. Marshall. I have a job to do. It's completely impersonal, and I might have been wrong about the whole thing. If I have, I'm very sorry. Very well. Let's forget it. May I wish you a most successful marriage and a long one? Thank you. <laughs> Darling, you must hurry. John and Sybil are here. They're waiting downstairs. Sybil, what's she like, Philip? She's a little bit on the light side, possibly, but she's very pretty. 
Anyway, she's John's first girl, and I hope you'll like her. Oh, I'll do my best. But John's like you, a very precious prize for any woman. Now, that's enough of that. You come along now. Your train for Margate leaves in 40 minutes. Oh, what a pity you aren't coming with us. I'll be down tomorrow morning. Hope the weather clears. Well, if it doesn't, we'll come back tonight. I hate the seashore when it's raining. Well, I've got to run along to the shop. Have a good time. Goodbye, darling. Don't forget to feed the cat. <laughs> Margaret? Margaret? Another cherry tart, please. Another cherry tart, Mr. Marshall, and you on a strict diet? I know, but it's Saturday and my family's at the beach and I must, I've got to work in a stuffy shop. I need some consolation. Very well, another cherry tart. Oh, hello, Marshall. May your, your dissolute neighbor sit down? Oh, hello, Simmons, I suppose so. Thank you. Well, since you press me, I'll have a spot of whiskey. Oh, uh, miss, a double whiskey and soda. Yes, sir. You can forget that cherry tart, Margaret. Oh, don't tell me I've spoiled your appetite. Since you press me, you have. Yeah. You are not irresistibly drawn to me, are you? No, I'm not. I saw your wife this morning. She said she'd cut her eye stumbling against a door. Well, wives get tiresome at times, you know. I know this. You've got to stop knocking her about. Oh, no, it's easy for you to talk with a nice new wife and a very pretty one. All beer and Skittles now, isn't it? I'm very happy, if that's what you mean. And by the same token, I'm not. It's your own fault. Oh, I quite agree. It, it so happens I'm a rotter by nature, a complete rotter. Why can't you get a hold of yourself? You're still young. You have a charming wife. And no money. Uh, uh, you couldn't let me have a fiver, could you? Uh, just until my wife's allowance comes due? Not a brass farthing. At least not until you go to work. Work? My dear Marshal, work is for the working man. There, that'll pay for your drink. Goodbye. Thanks. <laughs> Shopkeeper. Miss, where's that drink? Coming, sir. In changeable weather, isn't it, Mr. Simmons? Filthy. Huh? Who are you? Inspector Huxley. Oh, miss, bring the gentleman another drink. Thanks. Are you the police chap who came asking questions after Mrs. Marshall's death? That's right. Who are you stalking now? Your neighbor, Mr. Philip Marshall. I beg your pardon? What was that? Did it ever occur to you that Mrs. Marshall's death might not have been an accident? Do you mind saying that again? You interest me. You don't know how much you interest me. Pussy, puss, 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 puss. Come on, pussy. Puss, 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 puss. Nice, Bella. Oh. Well, Marshall... Left all alone to mind the cat, eh? I found your back door open, so I thought I'd come in and continue our chat. Chat with you is something I could do without. I've got a pack. I'm going to market in the morning. With the weather turned this beastly? Well, clear by morning, so if you'll no, excuse me. No, 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 no. Come, got... surely. Surely you've a moment for a reformed character. Hmm? I've decided to go to work. I've got an idea, and I'd, uh, I'd like your opinion. Yes? It's a good idea, with a bit of luck. Luck is important, don't you think? No, I don't. A man makes his own opportunities. Well, you ought to know. What do you mean? Oh, nothing. Only your wife died most conveniently. Wasn't, uh, wasn't that luck pure and simple? Now, look here, Simmons. Mrs. Look, Marshall uh... dies and you come into a pot of money and the coroner says, unfortunate accident. Now, I call that lucky. Get out! But Inspector Huxley doesn't seem quite satisfied that Mrs. Marshall's death was accidental. Huxley... Huxley thinks that you, uh, shall we say, helped your wife to a better land. But he can't prove it. He needs a witness. Tussie. And I need ten pounds. You are a swine, aren't you? In these houses, the walls are very thin, you know. That's how I, how I happened to hear you and your wife arguing that night. You heard nothing. But suppose I were to swear that I did. Suppose I were to swear that I heard her cry out. You didn't. That I heard the blow. You're lying. That I heard her say, Philip, don't. No one had ever believed Possibly, you. but... It might put you in a very awkward position if uh, I were to give evidence for the crown. Hmm. Yes, it might. You're quite right. It might put me in a very awkward position. Well, here's five pounds. It's all I've got with me. Well, the banks will be open on Monday. On Monday, I'd like 25 pounds. Another 25 next week? Mm hmm. I'd think that reasonable. And the week after that, and the week after that. Oh, I'll let you down as lightly as I can. 
Uh, I say, have you got such a thing as a, as a spot of whiskey in the house? Whiskey? Mm-hmm. Uh, yes. Should be a bottle somewhere in the pantry. I'll go and fetch it. Now, the bottle. Bring the bottle. <laughs> you know, Marshal, you're taking this very sensibly. Well, you won't regret it. After all, you, you've got a lot to lose, even if you do have to stay at home and mind a filthy cat. Marshal! Yes? What the devil are you doing, measuring out that whiskey? Bring it in here. I'm sorry, I had a little trouble finding it. Here you are. Help yourself. One glass? Aren't you going to have a... Oh, well. Oh, that's pretty foul whiskey. Did it ever occur to you, Simmons, that blackmail might be dangerous? Not if you know your man. And I know you, Marshal, like a book. I say, don't you ever show any fight? No, I've never been a fighter. (laughs) Soft, like that kitten. Turn the other cheek, reward in the hereafter. I like people, and I've never wanted to hurt them. That's a great mistake. Do you suppose I ever worry whether I tread on the other fellow's toes? No, I don't suppose you do. (sighs) There you are, and here I am, sweet and cozy for life. Or for as long as your life lasts. <laughs> this rotten whiskey, Marshal. <laughs> Shopkeeper's whiskey. <coughs> it's hot, isn't it? You see, Marshal, your lot were created to make life easier for my sort. Meek inherit the earth, and we inherit the meek. <laughs> Not bad. <coughs> Whiskey's bad, though. It tastes tastes like like Dexter's anodyne, perhaps. De- Dexter, <sighs> never heard of it. You're a coward, Marshal. That's how I got you. <coughs> no more fight than a sheep. You couldn't. Kill a, a fly. <sighs> oh, the, the whiskey, you, you, you poison. Oh, I can't, I can't. In just a moment, our stars will be back with Act Three of The Suspect. Meanwhile, here's Mrs. Smith getting some extra special help in her kitchen. Oh, Jim, you don't need to bother with those dishes. I want you to rest while you're home. These are a cinch, Mom, for anybody who's done KP. Hey, don't throw that fat away. Why? It's only a little scrap left on this plate. They wouldn't let you get away with that in the Army, Mom. Why, they even save the soup skimmings and render down every bit of leftover solid fat. All you have to do is melt it in the oven, you know. Is it really that important, Jim? They tell us there's enough fat thrown away right in this country every year to equal what we used to import from the Far East. And boy, we sure need that used fat. Yes, we do need that used fat desperately. And most of it will have to come from the kitchens of America. Our pre-war imports of a billion pounds a year have been cut off. We need fat for literally thousands of uses on the war front. On the home front, too. For instance... Used fats help to make munitions, medicines, military and civilian soaps, synthetic rubber, and coatings to protect ships, tanks, and fabrics. But with meat so scarce, how can I save more? By saving every single drop of used grease, no matter how burnt or black. Render down all scraps. That's very important. Keep a tin can handy on the stove. Rush it to your butcher when it's full. If you live in a rural district and have trouble in disposing of your used fats, call your county agent or home demonstration agent. And remember, for every pound you turn in, your butcher will give you four cents and two red ration points. Your government needs your help in this vital matter. Won't you save and turn in all you can? We return to Thomas Mitchell and our stars. Act Three of The Suspect, starring Charles Lawton as Philip, Ella Raines as Mary, Rosalind Even as Cora, and Dennis Green as Gilbert Simmons. Oh, 
Only a few minutes have passed since the lifeless body of Gilbert Simmons crumpled at Philip Marshall's feet. Calmly and thoroughly, Philip has started to remove all evidence. The whiskey bottle, the glass, the vial of Dexter's anodyne. But suddenly he freezes in terror. Voices he quickly recognizes are clamoring at the front door. has no time to think. Dragging Simmons' body to the parlor, Marshall hides it under the sofa, and then, collecting his shattered nerves, he opens the front door. Hello, Philip. Hello, darling. Hi, Sybil. Hi, John. Hurry in, all of you. We're so... Sorry I took so long. I was upstairs. Oh, our whole weekend spoiled. Oh, this miserable rain. Does it always rain at Margaret? Always when we go there. Let's go in the parlor. We can start a fire. Parlor? Yes, why not? A fire and, and a spot of something to warm us up. Yes, of course. A, a double spot to warm us up, eh, Sybil? <laughs> oh, John, you're awful. You know we have to catch that bus. You two just make yourselves at home. Philip, whiskey's in the cupboard, isn't it? Philip! Yes? Come on, help me find the whiskey. I'm sorry, darling, but there isn't any. Oh, Philip, is that what you do when my back is turned? How about some sherry? Fine. It's right here. It's a shame you had such bad weather. Oh, well, it was lonely without you anyway. Well, we'll try it again before long. Come now, help me take these glasses in. Oh, Sybil, I'm not going to bite you. Come on. <laughs> Look at those two lovebirds on the sofa. Yes, they're... Philip, what's the matter? Nothing. Ah, liquid sunshine to replace the real thing, eh? Sybil? Thank you, Mr. Marshall. John? Oh, I'll share Sybil. <laughs> no, you won't either. <laughs> now, John, this... <gasps> What's the matter? Oh, oh, something... Something touched me. Something's under the sofa. Oh, Sybil, what nonsense. Oh, but it did my ankle. What an imagination. Oh, but I'm sure of it. All right, now, don't get excited. Here, here, let me reach under. John. By... By Jove, there is. There is something under there. Oh, <laughs> and here's your spook. The cat. <laughs> A cat? How silly of me. Oh, oh Sybil, six o'clock, our bus. Oh, dear, I'm dreadfully sorry, but, but we must run. Of course, only come again soon, Sybil. Oh, it was ever so nice of you, Mrs. Marshall, Mr. Marshall. <laughs> come, John. Here now, take an umbrella. Thanks, Dad. Good night, Mary. Good night. Good night. Philip, I believe John's really smitten. I dare say she's a pretty little thing. Oh, but hardly a thought in her head. I should hate to see him throw himself away like that. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't I what? You weren't listening. Oh, I'm sorry. Philip, you look positively done in. Has anything happened? Of course not. Don't try to put me off. You've got something on your mind. Well, as a matter of fact, I... Oh, come on now. No secrets between us. All right, Mary, no secrets. How would it be if we packed up and went off with John? What do you mean? I mean to leave London, to leave England, go off with John to Canada. Canada? Might be fun, rather. The more I think of the idea, the more I like it. You haven't been happy here, have you? Well, it... I thought when we had the house done over that you'd forget. It's no use, is it? You mustn't blame yourself, Mary. I'd be happy anywhere with you. Thank you, darling. Do you want to know something? Nothing would please me more than to leave this house. We'd be much better off any place else in the world. You mean that? Let's go with John. It's a wonderful idea. I'm so happy I could dance. Now, look here, my girl. You're dancing off to bed. You've had a long, hard day. Oh, but I want to clear things up. I'll clear everything up. There's only these few glasses. Now, run along with you. All right, dear. Pleasant dreams. I'll dream about Canada. You won't be long down there. Well, don't wait for me. I've got a few things to do. Good night, dear. <laughs> Goodbye, Mr. Marshall. I don't know what the firm will do without you. Well, it's very nice of you, Stanton. You've all been so wonderfully kind with the walking stick and the inscription. And... Mr. Fraser himself composed it. You're sailing tomorrow, sir? Yes, I can hardly believe it. Well, I expect you're eager to get away, especially now. How do you mean, especially now? I mean, uh, with all that's been going on next door to you, mm. I read in the papers about your neighbor disappearing. Oh, Simmons, of course, it's not the first time that he's dropped out of sight. Been gone a week now, though. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife's cousin lives in the next street, you know. Uh, the police have been there. Uh, who saw Gilbert Summers come? Who saw him go? Who saw him last? 
I expect they've been seeing you, too. The police? No, no, not yet. That's odd. And you, his next-door neighbor? You'll say goodbye to marriage you for me, won't you? I'm so sorry to not oh, to see him. Oh, the lad's on an errand. He'll be heartbroken, but I'll tell him, sir. Thank you. Goodbye. And good luck to all your family. Oh, won't you come in? I just dropped in to say goodbye, Mrs. Simmons, and to thank you for giving our cat a home. But I've always loved animals. And now that I'm alone so much... Have you uh, had any news of Gilbert? Not a word. Oh, I suppose this latest disappearance is the talk of every gossip in the neighborhood. Well, you know, when you get the police hanging about, it does set a lot of tongues wagging. I wish there was something I could do. You've always been so very kind, but there's nothing anybody can do. Sometimes when Gilbert goes away like this, I, I almost wish he wouldn't come back. I'd go and stay with my sister and her children in Devon, but, oh, it's only a dream. He always does come back. I can't tell you how sorry I am, Mrs. Simmons, and I think we know each other well enough for me to say that I hope that someday soon you'll be able to go back to Devon. Five more minutes till we sail. I can't believe it. My heart's thumping so. Oh, where did John go? John's below in the purse's office taking care of the tickets. Mary, Mary, you're sure you won't regret this. Regret it? Oh, darling, we're going to be terribly happy in Canada. You and Mr. I Marshall. and John. I feel that, Mr. too. Marshall. Listen, isn't Mr. that for Philip you? Mr. Marshall. Mr. Marshall. Oh, Stuart. I'm Mr. Marshall. Oh, there's a gentleman here to see you, Mr. Marshall. Who is he? What's his name? I'm sorry, sir. Mr. I... Marshall, it's me. Oh, Mary, to you. Mr. Marshall, I didn't want you to sail, sir, without saying goodbye. Mary, this is my fellow worker, Mary, to you. I'm very glad to know you. I brought you a present, Mr. Marshall. A present? It's a sovereign remedy for mal de mer. Seasickness, Mr. Marshall. <laughs> I bought it with my own money. That was very thoughtful of you, Mary, to you, wasn't it, Mary? Indeed it was. We'll take good care of it. And I wish you the best of luck and help, Mr. Marshall. <laughs> and, um, uh, you, Mum? And, um... I'm very much beholden to you. And um, uh, Mother says how she hopes I'll grow to be as good a man as you are. Well, I don't know about being good, Mary Jew, but if you're half as happy as I am. Oh, well, I'd best be going, sir. Mary Jew, come here. Now, look at me. Would you promise me that you'll be a good boy? Always. And here's a present for you. Oh, thank you, sir. And, Mum, goodbye. Goodbye, Mary Jew. Hmm. Oh, here you are. Oh, are the ticket's all right, son? We're all straightened out. But the baggage, I never saw so many bags. They're all in your stateroom. Mm -hmm. And my pullover's in one of them, and I don't know which. I'll help you find it, laddie. Come along. Coming, Philip? I think I'll step down to the lounge and have a drink. Have one for me, too. Yes, sir? What's yours, sir? Scotch and soda. Scotch and soda, yes, sir. Well, well, hello there, Marshal. Inspector Huxley. Yes. Turn up everywhere, don't you? <laughs> yes, it does seem so. Are you sailing or seeing somebody off? Sailing. Good. Marvelous country, Canada. I came down to see an old friend off, name of Pennyfeather. Hope you meet him. I dare say he'll see to that. What do you mean? Oh, <laughs> you think he's one of our men? Of course I do. Oh, nonsense. Your wife's death was an accident. The case is closed. Well, goodbye and good luck. Oh, by the way, you seen the afternoon paper? No. That missing neighbor of yours, Gilbert Simmons. What about Simmons? He's turned up at last. You don't say so. Yes. Let's see now, what page is it? Ah, uh, here we are. See, a man's body found. A body identified as Gilbert Simmons of 28 Laburnum Terrace was taken last night from the muddy waters of a canal. While first indications pointed to suicide, police believe Simmons may have been murdered. Dear me. They sure it's Simmons? Oh, quite. It's him, all right. Oh, ghastly. Must have fallen in the canal when he was tight. No, he was thrown in when he was dead. You mean to tell me he was murdered? In cold blood. Poisoned. Oh, how shocking. You know who did it? What? You know who did it? Uh, oh, yes, yes. Who? Uh, his wife. No. Oh, yes. Perfectly clear case. She had a motive, you know. He was a first-class rotter. He used to knock her about. She admits it. 
And besides, the stuff they found in his stomach was identical with some sleeping drug that she had in the house, anodyne. But that's absurd. That woman couldn't have dragged the body to the canal. Well, why not? It's only a few feet to the end of the garden. She wouldn't have had the strength. Oh, my dear chap, when it's a matter of finding strength or swinging on the gallows... Oh, it won't come to that. No jury would convict her. They'll convict her without even getting out of the box. Do you realize she hasn't any alibi? Why, she was in the house the whole time. Oh, I say, I, I didn't mean to upset you. I didn't dream that... She's innocent. Oh, really? Uh, have you any proof? No, but you can't live next door to a person for eight years without knowing something about them. Oh, my dear Marshal, when it comes to knowing what's in other people's hearts... Oh, there's my man now. Oh, Penny Feather, coming. Well, goodbye, old chap. Now, don't let it worry you. It's no affair of yours, you know. Bon voyage. Your whiskey, sir. Well, there goes the ship, Inspector, and I must say, begging your pardon, I don't understand your methods. What methods? Philip Marshall kills a man in cold blood and we let him sail away. Just like that. Well, Sergeant, what else could I do? If Marshall killed Simmons, it must have been because he also killed his wife. He was afraid Simmons would testify. Of course. That's what we hoped for. Yes, but with Simmons dead, we haven't a chance to prove a thing. So he gets clean out of our hands. He never was in our hands. The other way around, if anything. There's only one thing that'll bring him to heel, and that's his own sense of decency. Decency? A murderer? Philip Marshall is not a killer, not by nature. He's a man just the same as you and I. Huh. That's the reason I gave him that cooked-up story about Mrs. Simmons. He believed every word. He thinks we really believe she killed her husband. I, I felt sure he wouldn't let an innocent woman suffer for a thing he did himself, but... Ah, but it looks as though I was wrong, doesn't it? I would have made a bet that you were wrong all the time. Sergeant, do you still want to bet? Look, it's him. It's Marshall. My hat's off to you, Inspector. Thank you, Sergeant. Shall I grab him? No. He's getting away. No, no, he isn't. He thinks he's done a pretty big thing. Let's leave him alone. He'll come to us when, when he's ready. Just keep on, an eye on him in the meantime. Camp, sir. Cab, sir. What? What did you say? Take you somewhere? Uh, take me somewhere. Oh, yes. Where to, Governor? Scotland Yard. Deserved applause for our stars who have made the suspects so exciting an experience. Charles Lawton, Ella Raines, and Rosalind Evan. You know, uh, Rosalind, you were so convincing that if Charles hadn't murdered you, I think I'd have stepped in and done it myself. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Although it's a sort of doubtful compliment. Actually, <laughs> Rosalind is a very sweet and sympathetic lady, Tommy. Oh, I'm sure of that. Oh, incidentally, Charles, I hear you lost weight making the suspect. You hear? Wouldn't it be better if you said, I see you've lost weight? <laughs> well, let's leave it the way it was. Actually, I did. It was a strenuous party motion. <laughs> <laughs> and Ella put on several pounds. How do you account for that? Well, you know women, they're always contradictory. <laughs> How did you do, Rosalind? Gain or lose? Oh, I held my own. Actually, it was a very great experience making that picture, wasn't it, Ella? Uh-huh. You know, as manager of a tobacco shop during the picture, Charles could help himself to all the cigarettes he wanted. <laughs> 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 Too bad it wasn't a drug or grocery store. Then you could have helped yourself to Lux toilet soap. You certainly slipped that in fast, Tommy. <laughs> well, that wouldn't have been necessary, Tommy. We have our own supply of Lux toilet soap, both Rosalind and I. <laughs> and use it regularly, I may add. Proving you're wise as well as charming. <laughs> and the best way I know of saying thank you is to tell you what we've got for next week, which is something rather special. It's the unusual and gripping universal screen hit Only Yesterday, and we're starring Ida Lupino, 
and Robert Young. This is the story of a man, a man on the brink of ruin, who remembers a girl he once loved long ago, a girl who has carried the torch for him through many bitter years of separation. And with that memory, his hand is stayed from suicide and his life rededicated to a new goal and an old love. Sounds like a fine play, Tommy. Indeed it does. I wouldn't want to miss it. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. And thanks to all of you. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Ida Lupino and Robert Young in Only Yesterday. This is Thomas Mitchell saying good night from Hollywood. Charles Lawton and Ella Raines appeared through the cooperation of Universal Pictures, producers of Walter Wanger's Salome, Where She Danced. Thomas Mitchell appeared through the courtesy of 20th Century Fox, who are celebrating their 30th anniversary. He can soon be seen in Captain Eddie. Heard in tonight's play were Dennis Green as Gilbert Simmons, Lester Matthews as Huxley, and Truda Marson, Norman Field, Anthony Ellis, Eric Snowden, Tommy Cook, Alec Harford, Charles Seal, Claire Verdera, Gloria Gordon, and Tom Collins. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. This program is broadcast to our fighting forces overseas through cooperation with the Armed Forces Radio Service. And this is your announcer, John M. Kennedy, reminding you to tune in again next Monday night to hear Only Yesterday with Ida Lupino and Robert Young. It's spry for cakes, spry for pies, spry for all you bake and fry. Yes, spry is top-notch for baking and frying. But have you tried spry in white sauces for enriching vegetables? Save butter for table only. Use spry for all your cooking. Remember, there's a word for pure all-vegetable shortening at its creamy best. Spry. S-P-R-Y. Be sure to listen in next Monday night to the Lux Radio Theater presentation of Only Yesterday with Ida Lupino and Robert Young. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall in... To have and have not. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. We've had many premieres on the Lux Radio Theater. And tonight, on our 12th anniversary, we bring you one of Hollywood's most fascinating couples, together for the first time on the air. They are Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, co-starred in Warner Brothers' thrilling screenplay, To Have and Have Not. To Have and Have Not is a story of intrigue and action, with Lauren Bacall in the sultry and romantic role that won her instantaneous acclaim. To bring the Bogart family to rehearsals, we had to lure them from their brand new mountain home where, along with a dog, 14 chickens, and eight ducks, they are still in the process of getting settled. No phone as yet, no tables, and no drapes. But if you should drop in on a friendly visit of inspection, as I did, you'd find Lux Flakes doing their part in washing curtains, bedspreads, blankets, etc., etc., etc. When I commented on this fact, a bogey assured me that on his 54-foot yawl in Newport Harbor which is the Bogart's home away from home, Lux Flakes are a standard part of the equipment, making this family loyal to Lux Flakes on land and sea. It's curtain time, and here's the first act of To Have and Have Not, starring Humphrey Bogart as Harry Morgan and Lauren Bacall as Mary Browning. In 1940, following the fall of France, 
the rule of the new Vichy government stretched to a group of islands due east and south of the tip of Florida, the French West Indies, among them the island of Martinique. It's early evening. At a little town on the Martinique coast, a boat has just come into port. All right, Eddie, tie her up. That's what I'm doing, Harry. Tying her up good. Well, Mr. Johnson, want to go out again in the morning? No, I'm fed up with this kind of fishing. Yeah, I can see how you would be. You hook a couple of marlin that any good fisherman would give his life to tie in when you lose them both. Yeah, Mr. Johnson, you're just unlucky. Shut up, Eddie. Uh, about my bill. Sixteen days plus the rod and reel you lost overboard. The fishing tackle's your risk. Not when you lose it the way you did. I paid for the rent of it every day. Well, look, if you hired a car and ran it over a cliff, you'd have to pay for it. Well, that's entirely different. Not if you was in it. <laughs> that's a good one, Harry. Yeah, that, that's a good one, Eddie. Now, look, I'm not trying to... lost that gear through carelessness. It cost me 275 bucks. And then there's 16 days at 35 a day. That's a total of 835 bucks. Well... I'll go to the bank in the morning. I was figuring you'd pay me off tonight. I don't keep cash like that at the hotel. Okay. Well, let's go up and have a drink. Yeah, why not? I right, lock up, Eddie. You mean I can't go with you? That's just what I mean. That drunken old fool. Hey, look, Mr. Johnson, Eddie's my worry, see? Now, don't you worry about Eddie. Well, are you coming or not? Yeah, I'm coming. <laughs> Well, monsieur, what luck today? Uh, not so good, Frenchy. Couple of bourbons straight. Well, what are you doing behind the bar, Frenchy? Oh, a small hotel like this, Harry. The proprietor does a little of everything. So, uh, the fish would not bite, eh? Uh, maybe tomorrow you do better, eh? Not me. I'm through. This is my last day. Oh, that's too bad, eh? Yeah. Well, here's to you. I'm going to wash up. Oh, uh, that bill was 800 and... Uh, 835 uh, bucks. 835. Oh, Johnson. Yeah? What time tomorrow morning? Oh, uh, after the bank opens, around 10.30. I'll be waiting. Harry, you are free after today? Uh, no more fishing parties? Why? There are some people who want to hire your boat. No, not a chance. They only want it for one night, Harry. They pay well. Well, I can't afford to get mixed up in politics. I would not speak it if I'm not in oh, You better not speak at all. Company's coming. Company? Oh, good evening, mademoiselle. Anybody got a match? Oh, yeah. Here's a match. Thanks. Hey, who's that? She came in on the afternoon plane. Oh. Well, about my boat, I know what your sympathies are, and it's all right for you, but I don't want any part of it. They are coming here tonight, Harry, to talk to you. Well, then get word to them. They'd be wasting their time. Oh, I am sorry. Yeah, me too. Harry, I've been looking all over for What's you. What's doing, Frenchy? Those men who wanted to see you. I was unable to reach them. Well, tell them when I get here. It is dangerous for them to come here at all, but to come here for nothing. Oh, you don't even listen. Well, I'm looking at my client, Mr. Johnson. What's that dame doing with Johnson? Dame? The one who was out of matches. Oh, 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 she's been with Johnson all evening. Her name is Browning, Marie Browning. Oh, she's leaving. Yeah, so am I. How are you? Who? Oh, hello. Going someplace? Just to my room, if you don't mind. Oh, I don't mind, but mine's much closer. It's right here. Say, mister, what's got into you? Come on, let's have it. Have what? Johnson's wallet. I want that wallet, Slim. I'd rather you wouldn't call me Slim. You see, Steve, I'm a little too skinny to take it kindly. I'll quit the baby talk and hand it over. I didn't know you were a hotel detective. Johnson's my client. He didn't speak so well of you. Well, he's still my client. Here. That's more like it. Johnson owes me money. You know, you ought to pick on somebody to steal from who doesn't owe me money. He dropped his wallet and I picked it up. And you were going to give it back to him. No. No, I wasn't. I don't like him. <clears throat> well, that's a pretty good reason. Besides, I need both there to get out of Martinique. That's another good reason. Well, what's in it? Sixty bucks a plane ticket, and $1,400 in traveler's checks. Did you expect more? Well, the bird owed me 835 bucks. 
And he said he'd have to go back to the bank tomorrow and all the time he's got a ticket and a plane leaving at daylight. Then I've done you a favor. That's right. And I'm entitled to something. See, what do you think is fair? 50-50? Well, or... company. Oh, please, Harry, I told him what you said, but I insisted on... It the... is not Gerard's fault, Mr. Morgan. I, I am Jean Beauclair. Come in, boys, and close the door. I told you, Gerard, I wasn't interested. Wait a minute, this girl. I'd better go. No, stick around. It's all right to talk in front of you, isn't it, Slim? Go ahead, I don't mind. We'll give you 2,500 francs. We'd offer you more, but we haven't got it. Sorry, my boat's not available. I thought all Americans were friendly to our side, Monsieur Morgan. Well, there's a rumor they put fellas on Devil's Island for doing what you're doing. I'm not that friendly to anybody. Who's that? Relax. In here, Eddie. Hiya, Harry. Say, I wanted to talk to you about the... Hey, who are these guys? I saw them hanging around the dock after you left. For one who drinks, you have a good memory. Drinking don't bother my memory. If I did, I wouldn't drink. Forget how good it was. Say, was you ever bit by a dead bee? I have no memory of ever being bitten by any kind of bee. Were you, Eddie? Was I? <laughs> Say, you were all right. You know, you got to be careful of dead bees if you go around barefooted, because if you step on them, they sting you just as bad as if they's alive. I bet I've been bit a hundred times that way. Well, why don't you bite them back? That's what Harry always says. <laughs> but I ain't got no stinger. <laughs> Please, must we listen to this? <laughs> all right, Eddie. <laughs> Hey, what do you want? Uh, huh? Oh, uh, I guess I forgot, Harry. Yeah, well, then I'll see you down at the dock later on tonight. See, Harry, could you let me have a couple Here. of... Here. Uh, thanks. You're all right, Harry. Well, just so long. Now, look, Beauclair, I don't care who runs France or Martinique or who wants to run it. You'll have to get somebody else's boat. You're leaving? Yeah. Make yourselves at home. Good night, gentlemen. Sorry, Beauclair, but I got a client waiting downstairs. Come on, Slim. I want to see Johnson's face when you hand him back his wallet. Well, there he is, still sitting at the same table. Hey, where have you been? I've been looking all over for you. You're a fine one, Morgan, running off with my girl. She's got something she wants to give you, Mr. Johnson. Go ahead, Slim. Hand it over. That's my... my wallet. Yeah. Where'd you get this? I stole it. Stole it? And just what are you going to do about it? The question is, what are you going to do about it? Maybe you'd better look it over. Oh, uh, uh, it's all right, I'm sure. Oh, you better be sure the plane ticket's still there. Goodbye, Mr. Morgan. You're not staying, huh? No, we're not staying. Excuse the interruption, Mr. Uh, Johnson. Now, look, I I was going to pay you off. Sure, you were going to sign some of those traveler's checks, weren't you? I wouldn't skip out on you. Yeah, well, here's a pen. Start signing. Uh, 835. That's right, 835. Oh, what's that? What's going on there? Police. Look, Steve, those men are just in your room. They're after Pipe down, baby, and duck quick. Harry, he's dead. Mr. Johnson is dead. Yeah, that's right, Frenchy. Stray bullet. He couldn't ride any faster than he could duck. How do you feel, Slim? Oh, I'm fine, Steve. Just uh, fine. Another minute and those traveler's checks would have been good. Has it struck you it might be an idea to get out of here? Oh, it is no use. The police are coming back. They were after your friends, huh, Beauclair? Yes. You, Gerard, stay where you are. Remember, you know nothing. Hey, they're, they're not regular cops. No, sur Ter National. Gestapo, huh? Yes, yes, quiet now, quiet. What happened to this man on the floor? Uh, a stray bullet, monsieur. His name is Johnson, an American. Unfortunate. Take him away. Your attention, everyone. There is no cause for alarm. Inspector Renard is only interested in those persons who have violated regulations. Monsieur Gerard. Uh, yes? Headquarters for questioning. And you. It's not nice to point, Lieutenant. The name's Morgan. Shut up. You, mademoiselle. Say, Steve, was you ever bit by a dead bee? You will come with us at once. Hello? No, I told you nothing new. Buckley and the others escaped. I don't know. Yes, yes, later. Now then, you were saying, Monsieur Morgan, you did not know those men. That's right, Inspector. What was your connection with the dead man, Monsieur Johnson? He chartered my boat. But he was leaving Martinique in the morning, eh? Oh, his wallet here. There is no money in it, only traveler's checks. Yeah, well, there was some money in it. Sixty bucks, I took it. Why? Because he owed me over 800. You will surrender it, please. Oh, wait a minute. And your passport. But do not be concerned. If your claim is just, it will be returned. That is all at the moment. Mademoiselle? Yes? Mary Browning, American, age 22. 
How long have you been in the city? I arrived by plane this afternoon. Residence? Hotel Marquis. Where did you come from? Trinidad. Alone? Yes. Why did you get off here? To buy a new hat. Why? To buy a new hat. Read the label. Maybe you'll believe me then. I never doubted you. It is your tone that is objectionable. I will ask you again. Because I didn't have money enough to go further. Where were you when the shooting occurred? I was in... You don't have to answer that stuff. Shut up, you. Don't answer it. I told you to shut up. Go ahead. Slap me. Monsieur Morgan, we wish merely to get to the bottom of this affair. Well, you never do it by slapping people around. It's bad luck. We shall see. If we need to question you further, you will be at the hotel? Well, you've got my dough and my passport. I'm stuck. By the way, what are your sympathies? Minding my own business. May I suggest... I don't need any advice about continuing to do it either. Let's go, Slim. How? How do you feel? I'm breathing fresh air again, but I don't understand all this. What's it about, Steve? Well, you, you see that character Reynard works for Vichy. You, you, you know what that is. Yeah, something you put in a drink, isn't it? Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's close enough. Well, well, the other fellas, the ones they were shooting at in the hotel there, they're free French. Most of the people on the island are, but they haven't been able to do much about it. You know, I could use a drink. Well, there's a cafe across the street, but... Uh-oh, I forgot no dough. Those guys cleaned me out, remember? Maybe I can do something about that. Another Mr. Johnson, maybe. Oh, uh, any objection? Well, if you're that thirsty, go ahead. You don't mind? I'll wait out here. If I get tired, I'll be back at the hotel. You're not sore, are you? Oh, why should I be? I won't be long. Come in. You didn't wait for me very long, did you? No. You're sore, aren't you? Why should I be sore? Well, I didn't behave very well, did I? <laughs> yes, you did all right, I see. You got a bottle. There was a naval officer. I asked for a bottle and he gave it to me. Just like that? Yeah, he was feeling good, but you're not. Now, look, I don't give a... I know, I know. You don't give a hoop what I do. But when I do it, you get sore. After all, you told me to, you know. I told you. Oh, you said go ahead, didn't you? Yeah, that's right. I guess I did. Would you rather I wouldn't do things like that? Oh, why ask me? I'd like to know. Well, of all the screwy... All right, I won't do it anymore. Now, look, I didn't I say... know you didn't. Don't worry. I know what I'm doing. Yeah, well, as long as you do, sit down. How long have you been away from home? This is about the time for it, isn't it? The story of my life. I got a pretty fair idea already. Who told you? You did that slap you took from Reynard, you hardly blinked an eye. It takes practice to be able to do that. The next time I get slapped, I'll be sure to do something about it. Hey, you forgot your bottle. I don't want it. Who's sore now? I am. Who is it? It's me. The door's unlocked. Here's your bottle. I said I didn't want it. Oh, you are sore, aren't you? I asked you a question, you didn't answer me. I said you're sore, aren't you? Look, I'm tired. I'd like to get some sleep. What's made you so mad? I've been mad ever since I met you. Well, most people are. One look and you made up your mind just what you wanted to think about me. Well, go ahead. Keep going. You don't know me at all, Steve. It doesn't work, Steve. I brought that bottle up here to make you feel cheap. And that didn't work either. Instead, I'm the one who feels cheap and I... I've never felt that way before. I, I wanted to... Well, I thought that... Get out of here, will you, before I make a complete fool of myself. How long have you been away from home, Slim? None of... Home about six months. Going back? How? Oh, what are you going to do here? I don't know. Get a job, maybe. Jobs are hard to get. Hmm. Nice perfume. Remind you of somebody, Steve? No, this is a brand new one to me. Would you go back if you could? I'd walk if it weren't for all that water. Good night, Steve. Good night. And quit worrying. You'll get back all right. Could I see you for a minute? What the... Oh, all right. Open the door. Here's that bottle again. Yeah, that uh, <clears throat> bottle's getting to be quite a problem, isn't it? Well... You want a drink? 
No. I thought you were so tired. I am. But you gave me something to think about. You said you might be able to help me. That's right. You're going to take that job with those men Frenchy brought up here? Yeah, if I can find what's left of them. But don't get the idea I'd take that job just to help you. I need money, too. Wait a minute. Here, can you use this? Oh, now, that's great. She carries her dough in her shoe. And I thought you said you were broke. Oh, you're awful good, Slim. I'd walk home if it weren't for all that water. Who was the girl, Steve? Who was what girl? The one who left you with such a high opinion of women. You think I lied to you about this money, don't you? Well, there's $32 here. Not enough for boat fare or any other kind of fare. But you can have it if you want it. I'm sorry. I still say you're awful good and I wouldn't... I know. You wouldn't take anything from anyone. You know, Steve, you're not very hard to figure. Only at times. Most of the time, I know exactly what you're going to say. The other times... The other times, you're just a stinker. What'd you kiss me for? I've been wondering whether I'd like it. What's the decision? I don't know yet. Do you know now? Well, that was better. Uh, you're sure you won't change your mind about the money? Uh-huh. The money belongs to me and so do my lips. I don't see any difference. Oh, I do. Okay. You know you don't have to act with me, Steve. You don't have to say anything, and you don't have to do anything. Not a thing. Oh, maybe just whistle. You know how to whistle, don't you, Steve? You just put your lips together and blow. You just put your lips together and... Since escaping the Vichy police, Jean Beauclair of the French underground has been hiding out on the outskirts of town, a bullet wound in his leg. It's early morning now, and Beauclair has two visitors, Gerard, the hotel proprietor, and Harry Morgan. Last night, Mr. Morgan, you definitely refused to have anything to do with us. Why have you changed your mind? I need the money. Last night I didn't. What's the job? You will talk, take your boat to Angela. About three kilometers from the point. The cove and little jetty. Uh, you know it then? Yeah. You will go at night. When you're off the jetty, flash a light. It will be answered. There will be two people to take aboard. I know the name of only one. Paul de Brissac. Uh, how about landing him back here? Oh, not here. Uh, you know Cape uh, St. Pierre, Harry? Uh-huh. I will have a rowboat and we'll meet you there offshore. Okay, I'll leave around noon. With luck and no patrol boats, I'll be back at St. Pierre a little after midnight. Well, I won't be carrying lights, Frenchy, so keep your eyes open. If it weren't for, the, for this leg of mine... I'm glad you're on our side, Morgan. No, I'm not. I'm getting paid. Oh, uh, I'd like my money now. There, that envelope. Thanks. How is the leg? Please, I'd feel better if you were on your way. All right, good luck. You need the luck now. You and de Bersac. Oh, that girl, Morgan. The one you call Slim. Well, she's leaving Martinique on the afternoon plane. We can both forget about her. Morning, Steve. Have some breakfast? I had mine two hours ago. What have you been doing? Arranging so you could get on the afternoon plane. Can you make it? Sure. Frenchy here will see you get the ticket. Uh, gladly, if you wish. You took that job, didn't you? Yeah. I figured this way you wouldn't get your feet wet. You want me to go, Steve? Yes. I want you to go. Okay. Uh, help her get on that plane, will you, Frenchy? Yeah, I will. Well, I've got to get down to the dock. I probably won't see you again. If I ever do get up your way, I'll... Yes, do that. I'll leave my address with Frenchy. Yeah. Yeah, maybe I'll know how to whistle by then. So long, Mr. Morgan. Well, it was nice while it lasted. Perhaps it is better this way, Miss Browning. A strange man. Very strange. Yeah. Come out of there. Come on out of there before I... Eddie. Put down the gun, Harry. It's just me. Well, now, how'd you get aboard? I thought I told I you to... I sneaked on at the dock while you was working on the engines. Oh, well, if I thought you could swim, I'd dump you overboard. You're an old joker, Harry. You and me's got to stick together when there's trouble. How do you know there's trouble? You can't fool me. Say, where are we going? Eddie, 
What would you do if somebody took a shot at you? Took a shot at me? With a gun? Who's going to shoot at me? Well, if you're lucky, nobody. Harry, where are we going? I'll tell you when the time comes. Uh, oh, uh, put on a sweater. It's getting cold. Say, what's going on? What's all the darn guns for? Two rifles and... In case we run into a shark or something. Hey, what do you mean, or something? We're going on a job. Can you shoot one of those things? Anybody knows how to handle a rifle. All you got to do is work the lever and pull the trigger. What do I got to work a gun for? <laughs> I just wondered if you could. Sometimes you act so stupid, Harry. Sometimes... Is it going to be that bad? It all depends. That's why you didn't want to carry me. <laughs> you was afraid I'd get hurt. You was thinking of me. <laughs> what are you laughing at? I was just wondering whether you're going to hold together or not. I'm a good man, Harry. You know I am. Yeah, well, we're going to pick up a couple of guys, Eddie. Now take this gun and get aft. If there's any trouble, start shooting. Yeah, but don't shoot me. Yeah, but supposing something happens to you, what do I do then? Well, how do I know? You invited yourself on this trip. We'll make an agile in about 30 minutes. <laughs> There they are, Harry. Standing on the jetty. I see them come out of the shadows. Turn off that flashlight. Yes, monsieur. All right, get aboard. There's a strong tide here. We are coming. Who are you, please? The Beauclair sent me. My name's Morgan. It's all right, Elaine. Quickly now. now. Wait a minute. Beauclair didn't say anything about a woman. Don't meet me, Captain. This is my wife. How do you do? Now, what do you want to bring her? Well, it's your funeral. All right, Eddie, let's get out of here. What happened to Beauclair, Captain? Well, he ran into a little trouble. Monsieur Morgan, who are you? I own this boat. Beauclair hired me to pick you up. You're on our side? No. I don't understand. Well, I don't understand what kind of a war you guys was fighting, lugging your wives around with you. You're being paid for this. That's what I said. Then I suggest you stop talking and get us to Martinique. That's just where we're going, sister. We'll hit the cape pretty soon, Harry. You want I should store the rifles? I said you want I should store... Shut up. There you go again. I ask a... Turn puppy. the motors off. Huh? Turn them off. See anything? Do you hear anything? No. Nope. Listen. There's a ship out there. A patrol boat. Take the wheel, Eddie. Why did you shut off your engine? Keep quiet. What is it? It is a patrol boat, ain't it? Hey, give me that gun. You can't fight them guys. Oh, what's the matter, Eddie? This is where you ought to be telling me how good you are. Well, I can do it, but what do you want me to do? What does this mean, Monsieur Morgan? You and your wife get down on the deck and stay there. You'll try to resist them with a rifle? They've got a searchlight. They see get us. Get down on the deck. You save France. I'm going to save my boat. Stand by! Stand by! Fire! Harry, get the searchlight. Shoot it out. Well, I can try anyway. You got it, Harry. Hey, you want me to shoot too? Stay on that wheel. Full speed, Eddie. All she's got. Hurry. Oh, they're shooting at us. Don't shoot. Don't shoot. Save your breath, mister. They'll run us down. They'll sink us. Yeah, they might. That's a chance we'll have to take. Get down. Stop. Oh, oh, oh. Got him, huh? Yeah. He should have laid down. Well, he's down now something. Please do something. I am, lady. I'm getting this out of here. They're coming in on the Cape, Harry. Yeah. Yeah, take over for a while and watch for Frenchie's boat. Well, how's your husband? Please, help me get him on the seat. Now, we'll leave him where he is. It's just his arm. Besides, I don't want him bleeding all over my cushion be so heartless. That's something I ask myself at least once a day. Now, we'll be picking up Gerard any minute. He'll take care of both of you. Where will he take us? I don't know. There he is, Harry. Okay, slow down and watch the drift. Can't I get a drink now? Just one. Sorry, Eddie. I need one worse than you do. Steve. Huh. That all you got to say? Oh, what's the idea, Slim? What happened to that plane? I missed it. Why? Didn't you like the accommodations or I didn't you? I just decided to stay. Oh, now look, well, I've, been how... to... I've been to a lot of trouble to get you out of here and... That's why I didn't go. Not sore, are you? Well, it'd be all right if I had any dough, well, but... I got a refund on the ticket. Here. 
Oh, that's going to help a lot. I'll be all right, Steve. I've got a job. Frenchy seems to think I can sing. Well, it's his place. Sometimes you make me so mad, I Harry, could... You could what? Harry, Harry, I need your help. The Bursac is badly wounded. Well, the bullet hit the gun first and is practically spent. All you got to do is get somebody to take it out. We don't dare call a doctor. You could... Me? Do. I'm hotter than any doctor right now. Don't you think they recognize my boat? All I got to do is walk out of here. You don't have to go out of here. The Bursac is in the cellar. Oh, why didn't you put him in a goldfish bowl in the lobby? We had to do something. They're watching every road out of town. Well, Slim, you see what you got yourself into sticking around here? I'm ready to leave any time you are. Oh, Harry, please. Not a chance. Uh, uh, Harry, uh, my wife tells me your bill is overdue. 6,356 francs. Oh. We will be glad to dismiss the bill if you will do this for us. You'll, uh... You'll throw her bill in, too, Slim's? Yes, hers, too. Uh-huh. Okay, you'll find a medical kit inside, Slim. Bring it down to the cellar. Sure. And bring some boiling water, too. Get away from him. Tell not to touch my husband. Well, that's all right with me. Oh, Harry, please. She's not herself. Now, look, lady, they can't get a doctor without giving the whole show away. I won't let you do it. Well, he's not badly hurt. He's unconscious because he's... Oh, come in, Slim. Hello. Miss Browning, this is Madame de Boussac. Who are you? Nobody, just another volunteer. What'll I do with this water, Steve? I'll drop these instruments in it. You better get out of here, Mrs. de Boussac. You may not like this. I'll be all right. Well, then hold this can of chloroform. If he comes to while I'm probing, pour some on this cotton and give him a whiff. Uh, don't open it until I tell you to. His arm. Look at it. How can you... Oh, fine, fine. She's out. Like a light. Uh, madame, madame. Oh, now, let her alone, Frenchy. Slim, any chloroform left? Some, enough maybe. All right, fan those fumes away or we'll all be out. Hey, hey, wait a minute, not towards her. Well, keep your fingers crossed. Let's have that dressing, Frenchy. Uh, here, Harry, here. Bandages? Now, you and Frenchy can do that. Adhesive tape in the box. I'm afraid the patient's going to recover. Well, I better get Nursey up off the floor. She may catch cold. Oh, she's all right. Just fainted. <sighs> I've got her. What are you trying to do? Guess her weight? Well, she's heftier than you think. Maybe you'd better just look after her husband. He's not going to run out on me. Neither is she. Yeah, when you're finished, go upstairs and get some sleep, sleep and thanks for your help. I'd rather stay here. You heard me. No, oh, for the lover. Now, what did I do? You know, Harry, before I told Miss Browning, you are a very strange man. Now I tell you, she is a very strange girl. Yeah. Huh, funny. That is what she said. Yeah. How do you feel now? Very stupid. I'm not in the habit of fainting. Huh. Well, your husband's okay. I just put him to sleep again with a pill. I, I'll stay here with him. Tell me, uh, why did you tag along on a trip like this? I wanted to be with him. Well, that's no reason. I was also told to come. They said no man was much good if he left someone behind for the Nazis to find and hold. Mm-hmm. Well, that makes sense. I told them I'd be no good, but I was afraid. Now I've made Paul that way, too. Now he's afraid. Well, he didn't invent it. Invent what? Being afraid. Thank you, Mr. Morgan. Mr. Morgan, I... Uh, you're not going to faint again, are you? No. I'm I'm just having a hard time trying to say something. Well, I won't bite you. I, I'm sorry for the way I behaved. You're just sorry you made a fool of yourself. You don't make me angry when you say that. I don't think I'll ever be angry again with anything you say. Another screwy dame. Now, how can you... Hello. I hate to break this up, but I thought you'd want something to eat. Thank you. How's the patient, doctor, or haven't you looked lately? He'll be all right. I hope you have everything you need here, Mrs. Tabersack. The eggs may be a little hard-boiled, Oh, they're but... fine. I like them that way. You're lucky, isn't she? Well, I'm going up and get some sleep. If you need me, tell Gerard. I followed you up here, Steve. Do you mind? Oh, suit yourself. 
Thanks. For what? I'd like a match. Here. Now I need a cigarette. Well, help yourself. Thank you. Uh, Steve, aren't you hungry? Nope. Let me help you take your shoes Look, I'll off. I'll take my own shoes off. All I want to do is get some sleep. Then I'll fix you a nice hot bath. You'll sleep better. Look, Junior, I'm not hungry. I'll take my own shoes off, and I don't want a nice hot bath. You mean there's nothing I can do? Uh-huh. You can get out. You know, Mr. Morgan, you don't make me angry when you say that. I don't think I'll ever be angry again at anything you say. <laughs> How am I doing, Steve? Does it work a second time? Uh, look, you want to do something for me, don't you? Yes. Okay, then, uh, try this. Walk around me. Hmm? No, go ahead, walk around me. I don't get it. You find anything? <laughs> no. No, Steve. There are no strings tied to you. Not yet. What do you mean, not yet? Come here. Hmm, I like that. Except, uh, except for the beard. Why don't you shave, Steve, and we'll try it again sometime. Harry, Harry. Yeah, Frenchy? He's here. Inspector Renard, you better come right down. Oh, no, not now, Frenchy. I gotta shave. Harry, he's got your men. He's got Eddie. He's got... Eddie? Yes. He's giving whiskey. He's asking questions. Well, I'll be right down, then. Oh, Slim, I've got no strings. Only a rope right around my neck. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Act three of To Have and Have Not, starring Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall in a moment. Being discovered by a talent scout doesn't usually mean immediate stardom. Months of training in diction and acting may precede a starlet's introduction to the public. Our guest tonight, lovely Miss Carrie McCord, is training at Fox right now. And it looks as though big things were in store for her. Do you spend much time on the sets, Carrie? Yes, indeed, Mr. Keeley. When I first signed, Fox was just finishing Daryl F. Zanuck's The Razor's Edge, and I watched Gene Tierney every chance I could. Mm, an excellent way to learn technique. Well, I liked her own powers, too. Well, they were both perfect casting for Somerset Maugham's novel. I'd love to be in a picture that called for a stunning wardrobe like Jean's. You're naturally interested in clothes. Oh, yes. I used to be a model, fashion shows especially. Well, Gene Tierney was also a model. Oh, that's encouraging. We're alike in something else, too. What's that? Our clothes get the same kind of care. Lux flakes? Naturally. I found out from the wardrobe mistress that the beautiful blouses and sweaters Jean wears in the razor's edge were washed regularly with Lux. I've used Lux for my own nice things for years. You'll find Lux is the favorite of Hollywood Studios, Carrie, because it takes such good care of colors and nice fabrics. Well, that's been my experience, Mr. Kennedy. Actual tests support that, too. Carefully supervised washing tests were made by a famous laboratory on dozens of different fabrics and colors. In case after case, those washed the luxe way were still lovely, when those washed the wrong way were faded and drab. In fact, the luxed ones stayed color fresh and new looking up to three times as long. With the high cost of clothes these days, keeping them attractive longer is important to any girl. And that's one of the reasons Lux is worth waiting for if you can't get it the first time you try. Just keep asking for it. More is on the way. Here's Mr. Keeley at the microphone. After the play, we'll bring our stars back for their customary curtain call. Here they are in Act Three of To Have and Have Not. Humphrey Bogart as Harry Morgan, Lauren Bacall as Marie. It's a few moments later... In a corner of the hotel bar, Harry Morgan finds Inspector Renard and Sergeant Coy of the Secret Police. Seated between them is Eddie. We are buying your friendly drink, Captain Morgan. 
We find Mr. Eddie very entertaining when he drinks. You hear that, Harry? He called me Mr. Yeah, what were you boys talking about? Yeah, I was telling him about the big marlin you and me hooked onto last night. Oh, yeah. Uh, that fish was so big, it, me and Harry could hardly budge him. Yeah, that's right. Must have weighed a thousand pounds. Every time he takes a drink, the fish grows larger. <laughs> Judging from what's... From what's left in this bottle, he must have started with a macro. And how did you finally manage to land such a great fish? Oh, didn't Eddie tell you? We didn't land him. We ran into a German submarine. Oh? A German submarine? Well, whatever it was, it opened fire on us. I didn't stick around to find out. I do not think anybody could give a more logical explanation for refusing to obey the challenge of our patrol boat. Patrol boat? Oh, so that's what it was. Now, Eddie kept saying it was a patrol boat, but I wouldn't believe him. Now we get down to business, eh, Morgan? What about your passengers last night? What passengers? The ones you brought over from Angela. Would $500 refresh your memory? Oh, my memory's pretty good. For instance, I can remember you're the guy who lifted my passport and all my cash. And if your passport, the money will return. Including the 835 Johnson owed me? Why not? Now, where are they? Your passengers. Well, if these people are as important as you seem to think they are, they're going to be pretty hard for me to find. For a man of your resourcefulness? <laughs> Not too difficult. Think it over. Let me know, Morgan. Come along, Coyote. Goodbye, Mr. Reddy. See me again when you get thirsty. <laughs> Them guys don't think that I'm wise, do they, Harry? They was trying to get me drunk. They don't know me, do they? Well, hey. what happened? What did they want? The Bersac. I heard you arranging a deal. That now thinks you will turn them in, eh? Well, that's what you want them to think, isn't it? What will happen? Well, uh, Renard hasn't searched this hotel yet, has he? No, not yet. Well, here's your answer. Renard doesn't want just Dubasak and his wife. He wants the whole setup. And what shall we do? Oh, it's not we. It's you. And you can't do anything until Dubasak is strong enough to move. Now, how about some breakfast? Sure, sure. I thought you didn't want any breakfast. Oh, how are you, Slim? I asked you before if you were hungry. Sit down. Hey, you know, Harry, them guys, they were trying to find out something. What do you suppose it is? Well, you don't know? No, I ain't got no idea. Well, that's a good way to leave it. Say, uh, you got the hiccups. Have I, Harry? <laughs> oh, yeah. Don't you think you'd better take a drink of water? <laughs> water? I'm getting out of here. <laughs> and don't you worry none about me, Harry. <laughs> yeah, well, you stay away from the police. You know, they're not going to believe that story you told them a second time. What story was that, Harry? I forgot. Well, just, uh, just beat it and keep out of sight. Sure, Harry, sure. Well, I'm starting work tonight, Steve. You're a singer now, huh? I'd be interested to know what you think. Uh, will you be there? I don't know, maybe. decided to drop in, huh? Yeah. I do my song in a few minutes. Like my dress. Well, you won't have to sing much in that outfit. You know, Steve, sometimes you make me so That's mad. That's why I do it. You haven't seen Eddie, have you? Not since noon. Why? Well, he left the boat and he hasn't come back. Anything wrong? Plenty. They don't look now, but there's a guy by the door I've been following me. Keep an eye on him, will you? I'll be down the cellar. Give Mrs. Diversak my love. I'd give her my own if she had that dress on. How's your patient? That's what I'm going to find out. Much better, Harry, you see? There has been no bleeding all afternoon. I am very grateful, monsieur, believe me. Uh, well, you won't need me anymore, de Bissac. Uh, Frenchy, I'm pulling out. Uh, when? As soon as I can find Eddie. Missing? Yeah. You wouldn't go without him? No, I don't think Eddie liked that. Now, look, Frenchy, as soon as I'm gone, Renard's going to turn this place upside down. You better start figuring how and where you're going to move our patient here. It would be best if my wife and I went with you. Oh, I'm still trying to get out of the jam I got into bringing you here. Just why'd you come in the first place? Did you ever hear of Pierre Villemar? Villemar? Yeah. Hey, he was quite a guy. Vichy got him, didn't he? Didn't he? He's dead, isn't he? No, monsieur, he's not dead. He's on Devil's Island. They sent me here to get him. He's a man whom an oppressed people will believe in and follow. And just how are you going to get him off Devil's Island? You don't think much of me, do you, Monsieur Morgan? You are right. 
I am not a brave man. Well, I'd still like to know how you're going to spring Bill Mars. We will find a way. If it fails, if I die, someone else will try again. There always will be someone else. Yeah. Originally, we planned to do everything from here, but now, because of my clumsiness, it is impossible. That's the reason we have to go with you. Well, they've got the docks covered. They're all over the place. How will you go? Well, they're watching me to find you. As long as I haven't got you along, I can get on my boat. There'll be a fog tonight. I can drift out beyond the breakwater before I start my engines. I'll have trouble enough without you. Harry, if only you... No, Morgan is right, Gerard. This is not his fight yet. Oh, Gerard told me of your refusing Renard's offer. How do you know I won't take it? There are many things a man will do, monsieur. But betrayal for a price is not in your makeup. Well, good luck. I hope you find your friend. Thanks. Oh, I'll be around, Frenchy. There are a few things I want to talk to you about before I blow. Hey, I'll be up presently. <laughs> Any sign of Eddie? No. Your friend's still at the door. Yeah, so I see. I've got a hunch the whole thing's going to blow up, and soon. Any plans, Steve? A few. We're going to pull out of here tonight. We? Yeah. As soon as I can find Eddie, and don't look so happy about it. It'll be rough. I'm broke. If we do get out, it'll be with a couple of hundred gallons of gas and a few francs, just enough to get us to Port-au-Prince, maybe. I've never been there. I don't know when you'll get back home. It could be a long time. Could be forever. Or is that what you're afraid of? I'm hard to get, Steve. All you have to do is ask me. How long will it take you to... Oh, no. Wait a break it up with being watched. I'd better give out with another song anyway. I'll see you later on. Yeah, later on. <laughs> Harry. Harry. She wants to see you. Madame de Bursac. Now, look, Frenchy, that's all over. <laughs> I just took her to your room. Your what? Please, Harry. She has to talk to you. Okay. And tell Slim I'm... And I'll come to think of it, don't tell her anything. You shouldn't have come up here. It's too much of a chance. I had to see you. It's about this jewelry. I'd like you to take these. They're all Paul and I have left. Save them until we can come for them. What if they get me before I get out? And throw them overboard. At least they won't have them. Well, suppose I never see you again. Then let it be a part payment for all you've done for us. Miss Browning. I keep barging in, don't I? Renard just came in, Steve. He's on his way up. Did he see you? I don't think so. All right, get in the other room, both of you. Go on, hurry. But suppose he... And keep quiet. As soon as I get rid of Renard, take her back down to the cellar. Okay, Steve. Are you looking for me, Renard? Do you mind if we come in? No, not at all. And any friends of yours... Shut up. Search him. Keep your hands up, Morgan. Okay, relax. I don't carry guns. Now, what's on your mind, Renard? The whereabouts of Monsieur and Madame de Bersac. Well, how would I know? Well, I thought perhaps you... Hmm. Perfume. Very nice. You like it, huh? Yes. So do I. All right, Slim. Come on out. Good evening. Mademoiselle. Well, now we are all here, except your friend, Mr. Eddie. You've got Eddie? Yes, we've got Eddie. What are you going to do with him? Oh, if you will not give us the information we want, perhaps he will. We made the mistake this morning of giving him liquor. This time we will withhold it. Oh, he couldn't stand that. He'd crack wide open. All of which you could prevent. Yeah. Yeah, I could. Um, you got a cigarette, Slim? Here. Thanks. Can't you make Eddie talk, Renard? When necessary. Uh, got a match, Slim? Sorry, I... Uh, there's some over in that drawer. You could save your friend a great deal of, uh, shall we say, discomfort? I don't see any matches, Steve. Well, there's a whole box of them. Uh, never mind, I'll, I'll get them. Uh, how much money did you offer me, Renard? Eight thirty-five and five hundred, wasn't it? Except now I don't believe I will pay anything. Yeah. Yeah, you're probably right. Eddie will talk. He'll have to talk. There's nothing else I can do but... But what? But this. Look out, he's got the gun! Oh. Oh. Sorry, Renard. Coyo shouldn't have shot first. When somebody shoots at you, you got to shoot back. All right, Slim. Yes, Steve. 
You know, I'd, I'd forgotten all about the gun in the drawer. Thanks. Listen to me, Morgan. I've listened to you long enough. Now get him up. You forget we still have that drunk. So you were going to drive Eddie nuts, picking on a poor old rummy that never... and slapping girls around. That's right. Go for your gun, Renard. Your boy on the floor needs company. No, Harry, don't, don't. Get the gun, Frenchie. Uh, yes, Harry, yes. Now, get over that couch, Renard, both of you. <laughs> don't bother me, Frenchie. I'm getting mad. All right, Madame de Bissac, come on out. Uh, let me introduce you, fellas. This is Madame de Bissac. The other one's down the cellar, her husband. Take her down, Frenchie. Get some help. Are them both ready to leave on the boat? Then come back here. Slim, you pack. We're shoving off as soon as we get Eddie out. And just how do you think you will get him Shut out? Shut up! At the telephone in the hall, Renard. You're going to tell someone to let Eddie out? Oh, yes, you are. One of you. Because you're both going to take a beating until someone gets on that phone. That means one of you is going to take a beating for nothing. I don't care which one it is. But I'd like to start with you, Renard. <coughs> where? Where is the phone? I'll, sh I'll show it here just as soon as you tie up your partner here. Yes, you hear me? I said you will release him immediately. Tell him he'll explain later. I will explain it later. Do nothing till you hear from me. Then I'll take the responsibility. Goodbye. Thanks, Renard. Now back to my room. You've got some harbor passes to fill out. Everything is ready, Harry. The Bursac and Madame, they're waiting. Yeah, we'll take them down to the wharf. Here, these passes will get them through the guards. Where will you take them, Harry? Well, maybe Devil's Island. Huh? What? Well, it was just a short stop to pick up your friend Vilma. He's still there, isn't he? Oh, Harry, do not joke. Well, that's what you wanted, wasn't it? Oh, Harry, you should tell more que you first had for Madame. Well, that's all right. Just, just don't kiss me. Oh, now, Harry. Uh, uh, why, why are you doing this, Harry? I don't know. Maybe because I like you, and maybe because I don't like them. Oh, um, you'll have to take care of those guys, Renard and his pal. They're in my room. We will give you plenty of time. If you let them go, they'll come back here and burn this place down. It will be a very small fire. When Vilmar comes back, we will start a bigger fire. Okay. I'll see you at the boat, Frenchy. How's everything been going, Harry? Well, everything is all right now. You look glad to see me. You know, a funny thing. Yeah, uh, I know. At the police station. I've been at the police station. Yeah, we're shoving off, Eddie. Ready, Slim? All ready. They're down in your cabin. Hey, what is this? She going with us? Yeah, it looks like it. She and those people we picked up. But, Harry, you mean... Oh, what's she got to... Who are you? Was you ever bit by a dead bee? Uh, was you? Yeah. You know, you got to be careful of dead bees. They can sting you just as bad as live ones, especially if they was kind of mad when they got killed. I feel like I was talking to myself. I bet I've been bit a hundred times that way. Why don't you bite them back? I would, only I haven't got a stinger. Now I remember you. You're all right. She can come, Harry. It's okay with me. Uh, thanks. <laughs> now, I'll have the two of you to take care of, won't I? Yeah, that's right, Eddie. Throw off that line. Sure, Harry. All clear. Well, here we go, Slim. Yes, here we go. You don't have to act with me. That's what you said, remember? You don't have to say anything, and you don't have to do anything. Oh, maybe just whistle. Yeah, well, I've been practicing. Oh? Listen. You feeling happy, Slim? What do you think? Our stars will return to their curtain calls in a moment. Grandmother is sitting quietly in the living room. That is, until young Jane bursts in. Mother! Your mother's out, Jane. What is it? Oh, oh, hello, Grandma. Look what I just bought. A ducky new slip. Do you mean to say your mother allows you to wear things like that? Well, why not? What's the matter with it? Silk and lace. Why, in my day... But it we... isn't silk, Grandma. It's rayon. And I've looked all over town for a blue like this. We wore sensible clothes when I was young. Oh, but, Grandma, pretty undies make you feel so wonderful. Hmm. 
sheer extravagance. <laughs> Not really, Grandma. I've got lots like this, and they wear and wear. You see, I use locks. You take care of your own thing. Well, I should say so. On my clothes allowance, I can't afford to have them wear out fast. With Lux Care, they look simply swell. Sensible Jane. Lux Care really does keep pretty undies lovely longer. Up to three times as long, in fact, color tests show. I've seen identical slips. One washed the wrong way with the wrong kind of soap, and one washed the right way, the Lux way. And you'd be amazed at the difference after 30 washings. One was faded and drab. The Luxed ones were, were still lovely looking. So, if you value your pretty things, lux them after every wearing. If you don't find Lux Flakes at your dealers, try again soon. More is on the way to him. Lux Flakes are worth waiting for. We return you now to William Keeley. Back for a well-deserved curtain call come the stars of To Have and Have Not, Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall. Lauren, all our heartiest congratulations on your first appearance on the air. I'm sure there'll be many more. Thank you, Bill. Hey, see, that wasn't so bad now, was it? What if you do make a slip on the air? There's only 30 million people out there ready to jump down your throat. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Lauren... No, I... just a minute, Bill. The name she answers to is Betty. You only call her Lauren when you're sore at her. <laughs> okay, Bogey. As I said earlier, Betty, we've had many premieres in this theater... But tonight, I'd like to bring our audience a world premiere, something never before heard on the air. But I'm not sure Bogey would approve. But think, Bogey, 30 million people waiting breathlessly to hear it. Yeah, but think of me, my nerves. Every time I hear it, I jump. Yeah, but in spite of personal sacrifice, the audience must come first. Now, how about it, Betty? Oh, oh shall I, Bogey? Okay, honey. Thank you, Bogey. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, for the first time on the air, you're about to hear an <laughs> instrument made famous by tonight's play. Immortalized by the line, whenever you want me, whistle. It's Betty Bacall blowing the special whistle which she carries for that special purpose. Ready, Betty? Ready, Bill. Blow. <laughs> uh, well, Bogey, I, I can see how you'd find that whistle irresistible. <laughs> <laughs> Incidentally, Betty, I, I notice you don't use it in your current Warner Brothers picture, The Big Sleep. No, she doesn't need to. She has me hooked right from the beginning of that picture. <laughs> well, both of you do a splendid job in bringing Raymond Chandler's mystery to the screen. Thanks, Bill. What do you have coming up on Lux next week? Uh, next Monday night, we bring our audience a household full of humor, drama, and romance. It's Paramount's recent screen success, Miss Susie Slagle's. Starring Joan Caulfield, William Holden, and Billy DeWolf. One of the newest and brightest stars of Hollywood, Miss Caulfield plays her original screen role, as does Billy DeWolf, in this poignant story of a group of students in pursuit of fame and happiness and love. Oh, that ought to make a great hit with your audience, Bill. Good night. Good night. Good night, and many thanks to both of you. Our sponsor, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater brings you William Holden, Joan Caulfield, and Billy DeWolf in Miss Susie Slagles. This is William Keeley saying good night to you from Hollywood. Suppose you had to do without a month's supply of soap. That could happen if used fats aren't turned in by the housewives of America. Scores of major industries need oils and grease, yet there's a shortage of oils all over the world. So if they're going to keep going, they must boost their supplies with used fats or cut into the supply of fine soap-making oils. And that would mean less soap for you. So don't throw a single drop of used fat down the drain. Your dealer will give you four cents for every pound. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
Hollywood, California, Monday, June 14th. The Lux Radio Theater presents Anne Harding and James Stewart in Madame X. Lux presents Hollywood. Madame X comes to you through courtesy of the makers of Lux Flakes, the most popular fine fabric soap in the world. It is your regular use of Lux that makes the Lux Radio Theater possible. And we want you to know that we appreciate your patronage. Our stars tonight are Anne Harding, James Stewart of Metro-Golden-Mayer Studios, and Conway Turl. Our guests, the former first lady of the tennis courts, Mrs. Helen Wills Moody, and from New York, a Madam X and her son from real life. Produced each week by Cecil B. DeMille with Louis Silvers conducting, this program comes to you direct from the Lux Radio Theater on Hollywood Boulevard, where we bid a hearty welcome to you all. Before we hear Anne Harding, James Stewart, and Conway Turl in Madame X, may I remind you that summer is practically here with its cool, comfortable cottons, its wash suits and dresses and sport things. These clothes can look so fresh, so crisp and immaculate that it makes you cooler just to see them. And I don't have to tell you how comfortable they feel. There's no reason why your summer things should ever lose their cool, crisp, new look. Lux is especially made to protect them. These delicate flakes are free from the harmful alkali too often found in many ordinary soaps. Any color, any material that's safe in clear water alone is safe in gentle Lux. Make a note to order Lux tomorrow. You'll find the large size box most convenient. And now, the Lux Radio Theater presents its eminent producer, that outstanding pioneer of motion pictures, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Anne Harding became an actress because she wanted to write. Employed by an insurance company in New York, she spent her spare time reading novels and plays for famous players Lasky, of which I was director general, helping our studio in its search for picture ideas. When she decided to study stage technique, she visited the Provincetown players. They offered her the lead in their next production. Following came five offers from Broadway along with an ultimatum from her father, the late General George Gatley, commanding her to give up the stage or her home. Anne chose the stage. And eight years passed before the general admitted that an actress in the family, especially an actress like Anne, was no discredit to the Gatleys. Several months ago, Anne went abroad, made a picture in England, and triumphed on the stage in Canada. She returned last month to Hollywood with her husband, the distinguished conductor, Werner Jansen. Tonight in Madame X... She plays the title role. With the same speed that he displayed on the track while attending Princeton University, lanky James Stewart has vaulted into picture popularity. At Princeton, he studied architecture when he could tear himself away from playing the accordion. One summer, he worked as an assistant to a magician, but there is no truth to the rumor that he became a lady killer by sawing a woman in half. From college, he went into summer stock, was stage manager for Jane Cowell, and soon after was acting on Broadway. Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer brought Jimmy to Hollywood, and he's heard tonight as Raymond. In the role of Alan Cartwright, we present Conway Turl, an outstanding personality on the stage and screen for more than 20 years. Out of the limelight for a while, Mr. Turl made a remarkable comeback on the stage in Dinner at Eight, and is currently seen in Romeo and Juliet. Now for our play. Our stars make their entrance as the curtain rises, and the Lux Radio Theater presents Anne Harding and James Stewart in Madame X with Conway Turl. The year is 1918. It's late at night. And in the richly furnished library of his home in New York City, Alan Cartwright paces the floor anxiously, waiting for news of his four-year-old son, who tosses feverishly on a sickbed upstairs. As the door to the library opens, Cartwright crushes out a cigarette with nervous fingers and turns quickly to greet the doctor. How is he? Is there any change? 
He's much better, Alan. You mean that he'll, he'll live? The crisis is over. His temperature has started to drop already. Oh, thank God. He'll be romping all over the house in a few days. Youngsters come back fast. All he needs is rest and quiet. If anything happened to Raymond, he's all I have left. Nothing's going to happen to him. Now pull yourself together, Alan. I've left a prescription with the nurse. And something for you, too. For me? <laughs> I don't need anything. I'm as fit as a fiddle. Your nerves are raw, Alan. You've been working too hard. And now, with this, you need a rest yourself, man. A rest? How can I rest? I have a law practice to attend to. Your law practice doesn't demand that you kill yourself, does it? Take things easy. You've done nothing but work all your life. It's the only thing you know. It's the only thing worth knowing. And one thing more, Alan. I don't like to mention this, but I'm your physician and your friend. Well? Jacqueline has been gone for two years now. She's not coming back. You've got to begin to accept that fact. You think that's what's got me down? Well, I... Well, it hasn't. I've no intention of ever allowing her to come back. She's been calling here all day. Jacqueline? She heard Raymond was sick. Wanted to see him. You're going to let her, of course. No. But Alan, she's his mother. She left him and she left me. Life wasn't gay enough for her here. Well, very well then. But I make her own life. Make it or wreck it. She's young, Alan. Much younger than you. Has it ever occurred to you that uh, perhaps you were to blame, too? For what? You were so absorbed in your work. You had so little time for her. It wasn't gaiety Jacqueline wanted. It was companionship, love. She... She left Raymond, her own baby. There's nothing more to be said about it. Sorry, Alan. When are you coming to see Raymond again? I'll drop in later on my way from the hospital. Good night, old man. Good night. Just a moment, please. Oh. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening, Bessie. Is, is Mr. Cartwright in? Why, yes, ma'am. Uh, that is, I'm not sure, ma'am. How is Raymond? I'm sorry, Mrs. Cartwright, but... But Mr. Cartwright said that... Did he leave orders that I was not to be admitted, Bessie? Is that the trouble? Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Is that the doctor back again, Bessie? Let him in. Don't keep him... Oh. Good evening, Alan. You may go, Bessie. Close the door. Yes, sir. Well? I've come to see Raymond. How is he, Alan? I told you not to come here. Oh, please. How is Raymond? Is he any better? The danger is over. Oh. Oh, may I see him, please? No. All I want to do is open the door and look at him. He mustn't be disturbed. I won't disturb him. I'm sorry. But I'm his mother, Alan. I have a right to see him. You forfeited that right when you left him two years ago. I'm sorry, Jacqueline. I didn't leave him, Alan. I left you. I had to. It was a mistake, I admit it, a great mistake, but I only meant it to be for a little while, just, just time enough to think things over. Why didn't you answer my letters, Alan? I sent you money. Why didn't you answer my letters? I was busy. You were always busy, weren't you, Alan? That was always the trouble. I reached out for you again and again. I could never find you. You knew what you wanted, Jacqueline. Now, now you've got it. You left Raymond and you left me. And there's no returning. It's too late for that. You want a divorce, Alan? No. No? But you... Oh, I see. It isn't a good thing for a man to be divorced if he wants to be a judge. You'd sacrifice your whole life for that and mine too, wouldn't you? It's my career, not yours. I'm sorry, but you'll have to leave now. I've come here to beg your forgiveness, to ask you for one glimpse of my own baby. And... Too much excitement. I and, won't and... excite Raymond. I love him. But you won't let me near him. Clients, courts, the judge's robes. That's what your life is and all it will ever be. You don't know what love means. Get out. Opinions, decisions. Human beings aren't bound in leather and filed with your law books. They live. They make mistakes. 
We forgive and love and keep on living. Oh, please, Alan, let me see him. Let me see my baby. No, Jacqueline. You say I'm hard. Well, perhaps I am. But it's for his good, too. I don't uh, trust you. You've made me too unhappy. You've ruined my life. You're not going to have a chance to ruin his. I should hate you for this, Alan, but I can't. I can't feel anything at all for you, except pity. You don't know what you're doing. You don't know what it means. But someday you will. And you'll never forgive yourself, Alan. Never. Now light the candles on the cake, Betsy. <laughs> Hurry up. We'll surprise him. Ten candles. Ten years old today. It seems only yesterday he was a baby, Mr. Potter. Letter from Raymond Allen? Yes, and listen to this. When my sophomore year is over, I'm planning to switch to pre-law. <laughs> pre-law, Perry. Well, what do you think of that? And it is my privilege this day... To award them their diplomas. May they practice their profession in uprightness and in honor. Will the men step forward, please? Albert Ainsworth, John Butler, Howard Bridges, Raymond Cartwright, James Carvel, Gerald. John Butler, Howard Bridges, Raymond Cartwright. There you are, Dad. My name in the newspaper. <laughs> I see it, son. Uh, you can just about see it, yes. Yeah? Pretty small print, isn't it? Well, it'll be larger someday. Well, not as large as yours, I'll bet. Did you see that story on the record this morning? Alan Cartwright sworn into the state Supreme Court. I got a real kick out of that. Yeah, so did I. You've been working for it long enough. All my life, son. Now it's here. You must feel pretty good. Yes. Yes, I I suppose I do. Well, I don't see you throwing any hats into the air or anything. You know, if I ever just get one case, I'll be a success, you know. Well, success isn't everything, son. You'll find that out as you get older. There's more to life. Oh, much more. Such as what? A home, friendship, family, a clear conscience. Do you have those, Dad? Mm, I have. Most of them. You've been my family, Raymond. I guess I haven't been much help. I might have been different if Mother had lived. But... What was she like, Dad? I thought we were never to mention your mother's name. Oh, I, I know. I promised, but why not? It was such a long time ago, and everyone likes to know something about his mother. What she looked like, where she came from, what she did and said. You've never even told me her name. She, uh... She died when you were four. You were ill at the time. Where is she buried? What? Where is Mother buried? Oh, Oh, a long way from here, Raymond. I'll take you there someday. What was her name, Dad? Jacqueline. Jacqueline. Beautiful name. She must have been beautiful. Albert Ainsworth, John Butler, Howard Bridges, Raymond Cartwright. Raymond Cartwright. Who is it? Come on, open up. Just a minute. Oh, come in, Tony. Hey, you're getting kind of exclusive, ain't you, Jackie? Locking your door now, huh? I have a right to privacy in my own dressing room. Sure, but not when the customers are waiting for a number. Come on. I'll be ready in a minute. What have you been doing? Reading the newspapers. Why? New York papers, huh? What do you read them for all the time? The news is three days late. That's my business, isn't it? Sure. And maybe the San Francisco sheets don't carry the stuff you're interested in, huh? What are you talking about? Ah, Now, don't give me that, Jackie. I know you too well. Who is this guy Cartwright? If you'll get out of here, I'll get ready for my number. Come on, come on. Who is he? 
Why have you got a whole drawer full of clippings on them? How do you know that? <laughs> Don't be foolish. I looked. You're frank enough. Why not? Alan Cartwright, a prominent attorney, and son Raymond, vacation at Palm Beach. Alan Cartwright appointed to Supreme Court. Who is he, Jackie? Come on, loosen up. Now, what are you trying to do, shake him down? Get out. A Supreme Court judge, huh? He's a hot number if you got something on him. Did you hear what I said? Get out of here. <coughs> get out. Uh, there you see. You get yourself all worked up. You'll be pulling one of those feints of yours in a minute. You want a drink? No. Oh, I was just thinking. If you have got something on this bird, you ought to count me in. You know, for old times' sake. Oh, I may be pretty low right now. I may have stepped down pretty far to be working in a place like this and for a man like you. But I haven't reached your level yet. Now get out. All right. That's the way you feel about it. See you outside, Jackie. Hey, Nick. Nick. Come on, What do you want, boss? Run out and send a wire for me to Joe Harper in New York. Tell him I want some dope on a guy by the name of Alan Cartwright, Supreme Court judge. Okay. And look. Yeah? I want to know especially about his wife, see? Who she was and where she is now. Tell him to get everything he can. I'll meet him in New York a week from Saturday. Okay. the stuff you left here. Oh, it's swell. Just what I wanted. And oh, no, I can't see you now, Joe. Come around to the hotel tomorrow. So long. Who is it? Hello, Tony. Well, if it isn't Jackie. How are you, Jackie? All right. I didn't expect to see you here. Well, they told me you'd gone to New York, so I followed you. Yeah? What for? Just to make sure you didn't try anything that might get you into trouble. Thanks, but I don't need any advice from you, see? I got everything I need, Jackie, and it's a swell story. Is it? You see, I know who you are and who your husband is, and your son, too. And what are you planning to do with that information? I'm going to do with it what you didn't have the nerve to do. I'm going to use it. To blackmail him. Oh, no. I'm just going to tell him where his wife is and what she is. Oh, no, you're not. Huh? <laughs> and who's going to stop me? I am. You're not going to ruin my son's career, Tony. I'm not the type to stand by and see you wreck his life. Yeah? Well, what do you think you're going to do about it? It's very simple. Huh? Put that gun down. You don't scare me. I'm not trying to scare you. You know where you land, don't you? That doesn't worry me. I can't last much longer anyway, so I've got nothing to lose. You have. Sure. Sure, about 10,000 bucks if I let you bluff me out of it, but you can't, see? Because I'm going to see him right now, tonight. I'm not bluffing, I mean it. Stay away from my husband. Get out of my way. I'm warning you, stay away from my husband. I'll show you what I think of you and your warnings. Don't open that door. Well, why don't you shoot? Stay away from that door, I tell you. So long, bluffer. What's the matter? What's happening? He's in there, he's in that room. Stop. What's going on up here? Oh, she's killed him. Grab that woman. I'll get the police. Come here, you. Take your hands off me. I did it. I'm not trying to escape. I killed him. Before going on with Madame X, let's stop a minute in a bright and shining little kitchen near Glendale. Brother Bob is staying overnight with Walter and Sally. Walter has just gone out to put the car up. Sally is about to do the dishes while Bob leans against the cupboard near the door. Oh, Lux Flakes. So you use Lux for dishes, too? Indeed I do. No dishpan hands for me. Yeah, that's what Kay says, too. And she ought to know. Remember how she complained last winter about dishwashing making her hands sore? You bet I do. Just about the time you came out here for a visit. Honestly, I didn't believe a girl's hands could look so rough and red. All split around the nails, too. And all because she was using a harsh soap for dishes. Trying to save money, she said. Well, I got her to change to luck. Honestly, it was almost unbelievable how much better her hands looked in just the short time I was there. She says she finds luck isn't at all expensive. She sure is proud of her hands now. 
But I didn't know she had you to thank for it. Not me. It's the makers of Lux she should thank. Lux hasn't any harmful alkali, you know. It gets the dishes clean in no time at all. Look, I'm practically through already, thanks to... To me, as inspiration. But most of all, to Lux. Once again, Mr. DeMille. Anne Harding, James Stewart, and Conway Turl continue in Madame X. Arrested for the murder of Tony Phillips, Jacqueline is taken to police headquarters. In an office of the Homicide Bureau, she sits in the glare of a blinding electric lamp. Two detectives are cross-questioning her. Captain Keene leans close and wraps his hand sharply on the table. Come on, come on, come on. You admit that you killed a man by the name of Tony Phillips? You admit you went to the Hotel Trent for the purpose of shooting him dead? Now, who was he? What was he to you? He was nothing to me. And why did you kill him? I won't tell you. You must have had a reason. What was it? I won't tell you. All right, sister. But you're making it a lot tougher for yourself. You know that, don't you? You know what'll happen to you, don't you? Yes. Yes, I know what will happen to me. And why don't you come clean? Come on, give us the dope. We're only trying to help you. I have nothing to say. You're waiting for your lawyer, is that it? I have no lawyer. But you're going to have one. No. Uh, it's no use, Chief. Let her send her back till we get a chance to work on this thing. Wait a minute, wait a minute, Murphy. I'm going to give you one more chance, sister. I won't ask you who the man was. I won't ask you why you shot him. All I want to know is one thing. Who are you? What's your name? Where do you come from? Come on, come on. What's your name? You can tell us that, can't you? What's your name? Who are you? Who are you? All right, Murphy. Send her back. Lynn. Yes, sir. Take her back to her cell. This way, sister. Well, that was a nice waste of time. I don't see what you're so worried about, Chief. It's an open and shut case. She walked into a hotel room and drilled a guy. She admits it, even. Yeah, yeah, sure she admits it. But how do you know what she'll admit when she gets on the stand? That's what counts, Murphy. What she says in front of 12 good men and true. You say the same thing. She didn't even want a lawyer. Well, the court will take care of that for her. Yeah. They'll appoint someone to represent her. Some kid, probably, who can't even find his way to the witness chair. Uh, she sure is a sucker for him not talking. In the interest of justice, it is the duty of this court to see that the accused is ably represented by counsel. To that end, and to assure the accused of a just trial in accordance with the laws of this state, the court hereby appoints as counsel for the defendant, Raymond Cartwright. Hello, Dad. Well, come in, Raymond. Well, I've got it. You've got what? My first big case. Look me over. <laughs> Good boy. The first one's always the hardest, you know. Yeah, and don't I know it. Of course, there's not much glory attached to this one. It's uh, one of those assignments. Oh, well, well, it's a start, Raymond. Well, that's the way I look at it. Criminal case, I suppose. Yeah, she's charged with murder. Oh, a woman, eh? Mm-hmm. Any evidence? Well, that's the whole trouble, you know. It's all evidence. She admits everything. She won't talk about it. Won't even give her name. Oh, yes. I think I read something about it in the papers this morning. What is it the reporters are calling her? Yeah, trust them to give it a name. They're calling her Madame X. That's it, yeah. Well, they've handed you a nice one for your first case. How are you handling it? Well, I haven't decided that yet. Well, you have to get her to talk. Any luck so far? No, I haven't even seen her. She wasn't in the court when I got the assignment. I, I'm seeing her at the tombs at 4 o'clock. I, you know, I, I don't know what I can do for her if she won't give me anything to go on. And, well, if she admits everything now, it's, it's, it's sort of hopeless, I guess. Well, you can't tell. You can admit the murder and still get an acquittal, you know. Temporary insanity. Self-defense. Extenuating circumstances. Oh, it's been done before. Yeah, I know, but isn't that sort of drawing a little fire? Oh, not a bit. You see, justice is a funny thing. There's a district attorney on one side, a counsel for the defense on the other. Your job is to present your client's case in its most favorable light. Just as it's the DA's job to convict her, if possible. If you can dig up any fact that might conceivably influence a jury to vote to... Not guilty. It's your right and your duty to use those facts. A human life depends on it. Depends on you. Yes, I know. It's a big responsibility, isn't it? Yes. 
Anything I could do to help? Oh, no, no, thanks. I'd rather have a look at myself. I mean, <laughs> oh, of course, we'll go to it. And the best of luck. Thanks, Dad. You're a better man than the whole homicide squad. How long has she been in here? Ten days. You ought to come to trial pretty soon. No use in delaying on these open and shut cases. Have you questioned her since you brought her in? Every day. She won't talk. She won't even eat. She just sits there and stares at you. It's enough to give a man the creep. You still won't give her name, huh? No. She says her name is Williams. Laura Williams. She admits it's a phony. It's only for the records. Here we are. You've got a visitor, sister. Go ahead, son. Thanks. I, I'd like to see her alone, of course. Sure. I'll be at the end of the car there. Just yell when you want me. How do you do? What do you want with me? If you've been sent here to question me, you're wasting your time. I've nothing to say. I've told him that. Oh, no. I'm, I'm not an officer. I'm your attorney. I told him I didn't want an attorney. No, but you... You ha have to have someone to plead your case. You see, that's the law. I, I was appointed by the judge. Well? Well, if I'm to represent you, I've got to know something about you. Who you are, where you came from. Now, you'll tell me that, won't you? My name is Laura Williams. Oh, but that's not your real name. They asked me my name for the records. I told them my name was Laura Williams. That's all I have to say. But I... That's all I have to say. Well... You're not being very fair. You're not being fair to yourself or to me either. You? Yes, I... You see, this is my first case. Oh. That doesn't sound very encouraging, does it? But I, I think I can help you. That is, if you were just giving me the chance. Now, I did want to make a showing on this. And so if you don't want to do it for yourself, perhaps you'd be willing to help me. You're very young, aren't you? Oh, I'm 24. 24. I had a son. He'd be 24 now, too. And he's just... Then he's alive. I didn't say that. I'm sorry. I know it hurts to be reminded when you've lost someone near to you. Have you ever lost anyone? Yes, I... my mother. How? Oh. Well, she died some time ago. Oh, but we were speaking of your son. Now, he's still alive. I'd rather not talk about it. Has he anything to do with the man that was shot? No. Oh, let me alone. Please, just let me alone. But I've got to defend you. I don't want to be defended. I killed that man. I walked into his room at the Hotel Trent and I shot him. Is there anything more to be said? I'm perfectly willing to pay for what I did. But don't you see? There may be no reason why you should pay. That's all I'm trying to find out. Just what the motive was. You see, you, you might have had a good reason to kill him. I did. Well, did he threaten you in any way? No. It wasn't self-defense then? No. Did he threaten anyone near to you? No. Your son, perhaps? No. Why do you keep bringing up my son? Well, it's the only thing I know about you. That you have or had a son. I, I'm just groping in the dark, that's all. Just trying to help you. I, I, you can't blame me for that. It's just my job. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, too, that, that this had to be your first case. But you mustn't take it too much to heart. Everything's against you. Nobody expects you to win. Hello, Hotel Trance. What name, please? Just a moment, please. Hello, room service? Hold on a minute. Hello, Hotel Trance? Yes, ma'am. What name, please? Oh, one moment, please. Excuse me. What do you want? Uh, the manager said I could speak to you for a minute. Yeah? Take my calls, will you, Francis? Okay. Well? Uh, my name is Raymond Cartwright. Are you the girl that was on the switchboard the night the man was shot in 518? Yeah, why? Now, I want you to think hard, try to remember. Did he receive any calls that night? Yeah, he got a call about 8 o'clock. You're sure? Sure, it was a man call. I remember because it was just a couple of minutes before the fellow was shot. You didn't tell the police? Well, I didn't think it was important, was it? Oh, that's all right, that's all right. Now, look. When that man called, 
Did he mention his name? Now, come on. Think hard. Now, come on. Yeah. He said his name was... Uh, um, wait a minute now. Uh, Harper. Harper. That's what it was. Joe Harper. You're sure of that? Yeah, we always ask what name. And I remember because my boyfriend's name mm-hmm. is Harper. All right. And I thought All right. It... That's fine. Thanks. Huh. Uh, you keep this quiet, will you? Oh, oh sure. <laughs> Hello? Yes? Well, what did you find? Well, now, keep looking. Will you try the city directory? Try anything you can think of. Now, we've got to locate this Joe Harper before we go on trial. All right, all right, thanks. Good luck, son. Uh, Nothing yet. If I could just get this man Harper, I might learn something. I've got two men working on it right now. What about the woman? Have you asked her? She doesn't know him. If she does, she's not saying I, I can't get her to talk about this case. She's just not interested. They brought her the notice of the trial. She didn't even read it. You know, she doesn't even know my name, and I'm defending <laughs> When do you go to trial? Uh, Thursday morning. Doesn't leave you much time, does it? I tried a postponement, couldn't get it. You know, Dad, it, it's funny. I this, this thing's got me. Well, that's natural. Your first criminal case? No, no, that's not the reason. I, there's just something about that woman... Something I can't explain. You think she's innocent? No. No, but I I have a feeling somehow that that what she did, she had a good reason for doing. She she was protecting someone. I I'm sure of it. Well, silence seems a pretty good indication of that. I'd use that point in the summing up, if I were you. Oh, I'm going to. I'm going to. I don't know what good it'll do, but the only thing I've got to go on so far. She's uh, never given you. Anything else? No, except that first day about her son. She talks to me now, though. What about? Oh, not everything except herself. She sort of rambles on as if I weren't there. But every once in a while, I catch a glimpse of something in her life. Something dark and sordid, something that's been gnawing at her for years. And she's been through hell, that woman. It's in her eyes. But then... And there's something beautiful there, too. Something I've got to save if I can. I think you will, son. If you feel like that, I don't think there's anything can stop you. I'm going to see her once more, just before the trial. I'm, uh, I'm going to ask her if she'll go on the stand. You think there's a chance? Well, I don't know. I can only try. I think I'll be there to watch you, son. You know, I've got a feeling that I'm going to be very proud of you. Whether you win or lose makes no difference. Remember that, my boy. All right. I'll be ready for us in just a few minutes, sir. We're just waiting for the judge. You feel all right? I'm all right. I got... wish it were over, that's all. Now, before we go out there, I'm going to ask one favor of you. Now, please don't refuse me. What is it? Well, I want you to take the stand. Testify for yourself. No, I can't do that. Now, you won't have to tell them anything. I just I just want that jury to hear you speak. I'm sorry. I don't like to refuse you, but I can't do that. Well, I'm sorry, too. I've tried to help you. I... Now, don't feel badly about it. There's, there's nothing more you can do for me. I appreciate what you've already done. You've been very kind. You know, you've never even asked my name. Names? They don't matter very much. It's what you are that counts. And you've been kind. Thank you. You don't know what it's meant to have someone to talk to, someone who understands things as you do. I'd have gone mad just waiting there. Tell me, haven't you any friends at all? Oh, I did have one. I think I had everything that a woman could ask for. But I made one mistake. And I threw it all away. And it's so easy to keep on making mistakes once you've started. There's no turning back then. You just go on, step by step. Always a little lower. Till at last there's nothing left but memories and bitterness. And an ache in your heart for what you might have been. They say time heals everything. I don't believe that. I've never been able to forget. I've never wanted to. That's why I'm glad it's over now. 
I'll find peace where I'm going. Peace and rest. And I need them so. Come in, please. Almost ready. All right, thank you. I'll be right outside here when you want me, Mr. Cartwright. Cartwright! Is... Is that your name? Oh, yes, I'm Raymond Cartwright. Oh, God! What is it? Well, why do you stare at me like that? You... You're going to defend me? Oh, yes, yes, of course. Now, that... And that's why I want you to go on the stand, just to tell them... You don't know what you're saying. You don't know what it means. What's the matter? Here, give me your hand. Now, get a hold of yourself, please. All right. I'll be all right. Now. We pause for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. KMX Los Angeles, the voice of Hollywood. Anne Harding, James Stewart, and Conway Toll return shortly in Madame X. Tonight's play concerns one type of court. Now we hear from a young woman who's made history on another kind. Seven times Wimbledon tennis champion, seven times United States champion, and four times champion of France. An, in, an unequaled record. Helen Wills Moody, as one of the greatest of all women athletes. I introduce her tonight with the hope that she'll settle a question in the mind of everyone who follows this sport of king and commoner. Mrs. Moody, have you given up tournament tennis for good, or is there a chance you'll return? I should like to go on one more tour which would include Wimbledon and Forest Hills. It's difficult, however, to leave home for such a long time as is required for the summer tournaments. But there's something irresistible about tennis, and I find myself playing regularly at home in San Francisco four or five times a week. In a few days, the matches will begin at Wimbledon. That must be rather a hard call for you to resist. Indeed it is, but after all, it isn't Wimbledon or championships that make tennis such a grand game. It's the finest sport in the world because it's everybody's game, a sport for all ages. When I was in Stockholm, I played with King Gustav of Sweden, who's still on the courts in his late 70s. Here in Hollywood, you'll find many of the stars playing remarkably well, not only for exercise, but because they know tennis develops poise. Among them are stars like Errol Flynn, Clark Gable, Gilbert Rowland, Warner Baxter, Greta Garbo, Ronald Coleman, and Merle Oberon. I understand that now you're devoting a lot of time to designing clothes and painting. How does an artist's brush feel in a hand accustomed to a tennis racket? The fields are not so far removed as you may think, Mr. DeMille. The action of a tennis game... The sweep of the strokes, the graceful line, the rhythm of motion are qualities that lend themselves very readily to an etching or a pencil sketch. Look at a good painting and then at a good game of tennis and you'll find a kindred artistry. As for clothes, my interest in designing was stimulated when I once found myself with a match on my hands but no outfit. I was in a large city and yet couldn't find a store that had sensible sport clothes. Most of my designs have been for active sportwear, but I have also done some bathing suits and street dresses. Since I've been doing this designing work, my attention has been called to the problem of keeping up the attractiveness of sportwear, and I know that the answer has been found in the use of Lux Flakes. Sportwear lasts longer, looks better, and stays fresher when cared for with a splendid product responsible for this program. It's obvious, Mrs. Moody, that you believe in having a variety of interests. Yes, I believe if you have one main interest and a variety of lesser interests, it makes for greater happiness. In proof of which, I've also tried my hand at writing, and I've just completed a book. I've called it 15 to 30, because it deals not only with tennis, but with the experiences I've had and what I hope I've learned during those, year during those years. All my thanks, Mr. DeMille, for asking me to appear in the Lux Radio Theater. Hmm. I'm sure you'll be a champion among authors, too. And now, back to the story of Madame X, starring Anne Harding and James Stewart with Conway Terrell. The knowledge that her own son is to defend her seals Jacqueline's lips even tighter than before. 
We're in the courtroom, where the trial is almost ready to begin. In the enclosure near the judge's bench, Alan Cartwright sits at a long table. Beside him is his old friend, Dr. Chesney, who's come to hear Raymond plead his first case. Has Raymond any kind of a chance at all, Alan? Well, not on the facts alone, Ferry. But you make a good showing. He's convinced in some manner that the crime was justifiable. He's got his heart in it. That's always a help. He's a little young to be swaying juries on sentiment alone. Well, we'll see. The court will please rise. The court of general sessions is now in order. The Honorable Gerald M. Darrett presiding. Be seated, please. The case of the people versus Laura Williams. Now, there she is. She's just come in with Raymond. Hmm. He looks worried. I hope he... God, Perry! What is it? That woman. Look at her. Who is she, Perry? It does look like... Uh, but she can't be, of it course. Is. It's Jacqueline. Jacqueline here in this court. On trial for murder. Oh, sit down, Alan. I've got to speak to her. You can't do that. Not now. Besides, you're not even certain that it is Jacqueline. Not certain. My God. Don't you think I know her face? Haven't I seen it every time I've closed my eyes for the last 20 years? Oh, that you can't do anything. It's too late, man. It's in Raymond's hand now. Her son. Her own son. And he doesn't know. There's nothing to be done now, Alan. Nothing. Yeah, sit down right over here. Face the bench. Thank you. Feel better now? Yes. The state ready? Ready, Your Honor. Defendant ready? Ready, Your Honor. Proceed with the case, please. The state versus Laura Williams. The defendant is charged with the willful murder of one Tony Phillips on the night of May 4th, 1937. Oh, Jacqueline, you're here. And these, gentlemen of the jury, are the facts that the state will bring forward. By the defendant's own admission, she committed an act of murder. But the law of this state is such that we cannot force her to testify against herself. Therefore, the state will present its witnesses as rapidly as possible. Witnesses who were at the scene of the crime only a few seconds after its commission. The first witness, a woman who had the adjoining room, will swear to this. I was alone in my room and I heard a shout. I ran out into the hall and I... I didn't hear the shot, but when I got out there, there were about four or five people standing around the door of room 518. They were banging on it. I ran up to the door and tried to find out. And there she was, standing over him with a gun in her hand. The gun was still smoking. She said, I killed him. I'm not trying to escape. I killed him. That's all she'd say. And then I went downstairs to find an office. Came back to me. And that, gentlemen, is the case as presented by the state. The counsel for the defense has shown no flaw in any of the testimony he's heard nor has he offered to produce any witnesses to refute this testimony. Your Honor, gentlemen of the jury, the state rests. Oh, please, please, we can't let her just go with that. You've got to speak. You've got to tell no, me. No, don't say any more. Don't try to defend me. Let them send the jury out now. It can't make any difference, Raymond. Why do you call me Raymond? I don't know. You did it once before, too. I'm sorry. No, please... Please, but you say it as if it had some meaning to you. Do I? Will counsel for the defense present his case, please? No, don't say anything. Please, I've got to. Your Honor, gentlemen of the jury, you have just heard the state's case, and you have heard no denials by the defendant. The defense has no witnesses to present, and I am frank to admit that the defendant, in spite of my counsel, has repeatedly refused to take the stand on her own behalf. Now, this would seem to indicate that she has reason to be afraid, but we must look deeper than that. Now, this woman, gentlemen, whom you see before you, has admitted her guilt openly. She has nothing to lose by testifying. On the contrary, she has only to gain by it. But still, she refuses. Now, there must be some reason for this. And from my conversations with her before this trial opened, I am firmly convinced that she is keeping silent for one purpose and for one purpose only. To protect and shield someone near to her. Someone she loves. 
Yes, gentlemen, there, there is a mystery surrounding this woman that newspapers have called Madame X. Who is she? Where does she come from? Whom is she shielding? Whom is she protecting? Is it a husband, a daughter, a son? No, don't. Oh, what did she say? What did she, she told me she had a son of my age. And she refused to speak any more of him. But he lives. Now, perhaps he faced some great danger. I don't know what, but she knew and she killed to protect him from it. Now, you will say that this is supposition. Well, it is, gentlemen. It is supposition. But our law states that where there is a reasonable doubt of guilt, the defendant must be deemed innocent. Well, there is doubt here. Not, not as to actual fact, but as to motive. And the courts of our state have recognized time after time, case after case, that there is such a thing as justifiable homicide. Let me through here. Let me through. Order, order there. Your Honor, Your Honor, I'd like to speak to the counsel for defense, please. Counsel for defense is summing up his case. This is no time. Your Honor, if the court so pleases, this man is in my employ. Now, if he wants to speak to me now, I assure you it has direct bearing upon the case. Very well. Go ahead. All right, what is it? Joe Harper. I found him. What, is he here now? Sure. I served him with subpoenas as soon as I found All right, him. all right. Now, get him up here quick. Right. Your Honor. Your Honor, I, I ask the court's pardon for this interruption. I also ask the court for permission to introduce a witness for the defense. I object. The counsel has already begun his summation. A human life is at stake here. Objection overruled. Your Honor, I ask the court to call Joseph Harper. Joseph Hopper to the stand. Raise your right hand. Gentlemen of the jury, I have never seen this witness. Now, his testimony may act to the advantage of the defendant. It may act to her disadvantage. But regardless of that, I believe he knows something about this case. What's your name? Joseph Hopper. Where do you live, please? 618 West 74th Street. Now, I want you to look at the defendant. Have you ever seen her before? No. You, you don't know who she is? No. Now, tell me this. Did you ever know a man by the name of Tony Phillips? Did you? Yeah. Did you call him on the telephone at the Hotel Trent on the na- night of my- May the 4th? I guess so. No, no, did you or didn't you? Answer the question. Yes. Well, why did you call him? Well, he, uh, he asked me to. When was that? Well, a week before. He uh, he sent me a telegram. From New York? No, no, no. San Francisco. He wanted me to do him a favor. What was that favor? Well, he asked me to get some information for him. What about? Did I have to answer that? What about? Well, it was about a person that he was no, trying to... No, no, don't answer. Don't answer, do you hear? No, don't let him tell. Take him off the stand. Don't question him anymore. I'll do anything you want. I'll do anything. But please, please don't let him speak for my sake. Please. What you said. I was protecting someone. It was my son. The man I killed was going to blackmail him and my husband because of me. He was going to wreck my son's life and my husband's career because of what I was and what I am now. That's why I couldn't speak. That's why I can never speak. In God's name, please don't ask me to tell. Don't ask me to give up my life for nothing. I'm not afraid to die if I know that he'll be safe. He's my son. My son whom I've never known and who's never known me. You can take my life as a worthless thing anyway, but please, please let him have his. Oh, she's fainted here. Get a doctor, quick. How is she, Betty? Has she come around yet? Not quite. She's in pretty bad shape, Alan. Where's Raymond? Asked him to wait to the corridor. Did you... Did you tell him about Jacqueline? Yes. Yes. It wasn't easy, Perry. How did he take it? He wanted to come in to see her. I made him wait for the jury to come back. He'll get an acquittal. It's, it's almost sure. I wonder how much good it will do, Alan. What do you mean? Mm. Oh. She's mm. coming, too. Mm. Jacqueline. Jacqueline, do you hear me? Alan. Yes, darling. I saw you in the court. I was so afraid you'd tell. 
I wanted to, Jacqueline. No, no. Better. Better this way. Much better. I know everything you've done has been for me and Raymond. I, I, I can't tell you. Don't cry. You told me once that I'd never forgive myself for what I did. I never have, Jacqueline. I've tried to find you. Oh, so many times. But I'll make it all up to you. I swear I will. I'll make you happy again, Jacqueline. I'm happy now. So very happy. Come here, Raymond. Raymond, does he know? Yes, I know, Mother. Oh. Oh, Raymond. It's all over, Mother. The jury's come in and they've acquitted you. We can go home now. Home? I only wish I could. But you can. You're going to. Give me your hand, Raymond. My son. All these years I've been so proud of you. And all these years you thought of me as, as a dream mother who died long ago when she was young and pretty. Please, try to go on thinking that. For my sake. But I, I've found you, Mother. I, I can't lose you again so quickly. That isn't in our hands, Raymond. Well, I don't know what you mean. Now, you mustn't be sad. And you mustn't think too much about me. Because I'm not sad. I'm happy, Raymond. Happier than I've ever been in all my life. Mother? Mother? Dr. Chesney, what is it? We found her. T too late, my boy. Anne Harding and James Stewart step from their tragic roles and speak to us as themselves in just a moment. From a different part of the country, we now present another Madame X and her son, whose name also is Raymond. They will tell their own story, this time the actual story of a mother and son lost to each other for 18 years. Today they're reunited, but up until now have refused all requests to tell their amazing story to the world. This evening they consented to come to the Lux Radio Theater and tell it in person. It's my pleasure to introduce to you the young gentleman and his mother who present their proof of the adage that truth is often stranger than fiction. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Raymond Meir and his mother, who speak to you from New York. Thank you, Mr. DeMille. For the last 18 years, I have believed my mother dead. Every time I asked my father about her, the only answer I could get was that she had died when I was three years old. My father had remarried in the meantime, and two years ago, he died. A year and a half ago, I got a job ushering at the Paramount here in New York, where I am now assistant chief usher. Two months ago on my day off, I was in the neighborhood and happened to stop in at the theater, and there I was handed a message. It was sent by my stepmother, and all it said was, your mother is in town and wants to speak to you. I have read stories like that, and I have seen such things happen in the movies. Madame X is one, I remember, but I never thought it would happen to me. But you had known, hadn't you, Mother, that someday it would happen? Yes, Raymond. I just knew that you were alive. And even if I couldn't find you, I could hope I might someday. Do you know why my father would never let you see me? He had his ideas of how to bring you up, and I had mine. We couldn't agree. We separated, and he traveled a great deal. And once he took you with him, I never saw you again. But, Raymond... You tell the story. All right. I'd rather just listen to you. All right. My mother tried every means to find me for 15 years, but she never could. Finally, two months ago, she did discover a clue to where I had been working. She went to that firm in New York, and as it turned out, the woman she interviewed there was my stepmother. Neither knew who the other was. My mother asked for me, and my stepmother, not knowing her, was very cautious at first. They took a liking to each other, and finally, my mother revealed her identity. 
Then my stepmother did the same. The whole story came out then, and convinced of the truth of it, my stepmother sent that message to me at the Paramount. I went to her office immediately, and she told me to go to a certain address where my fa- mother was staying with friends. I went, and when I walked into the room and saw mother, I thought I must be looking into a mirror. We looked so much alike. Uh, Raymond, I never even asked you. How did you feel when you first saw me? I don't really know. I was so stunned that I don't know whether I felt anything, really. I can't even remember what I said. And I'm not sure I know what you said, do you? No, I just remember. All of a sudden, I couldn't see you. Uh, I guess I was crying. Very soon after my mother and I were reunited, we began checking over places we had been, where we might have met. We discovered that one month before she found me, she had been in New York, and some friends insisted that she go to the movies with them. They went to the Paramount, and as my mother still says, it was very dark inside. Maybe you are the young man who took me to my seat. And now, Mother, I think it's time we said goodbye. From Hollywood, we send our thanks to Mr. Muir and his mother and the hope that their newfound happiness will be with them always. Before Mr. DeMille brings Anne Harding and James Stewart back to the microphone, may I remind you that the Lux Radio Theater comes to you through the courtesy of the makers of Lux Flakes. The familiar blue box has a friendly place in most of the homes you know. These gentle flakes are made especially to safeguard fine silks and woolens. You'll find them kind to everything that is safe in clear water alone. Again, our producer, Mr. DeMille. Back to our microphone, come Anne Harding and James Stewart, giving us, among other things, a chance to learn from Miss Harding her impressions of the stage and screen in England. Well, I'm afraid I'm hardly the right person to ask about English pictures, Mr. DeMille. I did make a picture in England, but an American produced it, an American directed it, and the cameraman was an American. <laughs> Well, then how about the English stage, Miss Hardy? Ah, well, now, it isn't safe to start me on that subject. (laughs) Playing on the English stage was a marvelous experience. Isn't it rather strange that George Bernard Shaw's play, Candida, wasn't given a major production in London for 37 years? In fact, not till you went over to star in it. Well, I could hardly believe it when they told me that. It was pretty exciting to find that it was such a success. What have you been doing, Mr. Stewart? When I left Hollywood a year ago, everyone was talking about that amazing young actor who lived with Henry Fonda, owned 30 cats, and played the accordion. (laughs) (laughs) We know Henry Fonda married, but uh, what happened to the cats and the accordion? I don't know. Whatever attracted the cats in the first place, I don't know. They just seemed to come around. (laughs) They haven't caught up with me yet. Every night I play the accordion to sort of discourage them. (laughs) Are the neighbors in sympathy? Well, I, uh, I just asked them which they'd prefer, an accordion or a troop of 30 yowling cats. I guess it's a case of the lesser of two evils. <laughs> what do they say to that? Well, sir, I hardly ever get a civil answer. <laughs> <laughs> but, Mr. DeMille, I meant to ask you about this. In case you need an accordion player for the Buccaneer, you remember the Stuart's name. Uh, th- th- thanks, Jimmy. But after all, even the pirate can endure just so much. <laughs> Goodbye, Jimmy. (laughs) You're a very remarkable fellow. Thank you, Miss Harding and Mr. Stewart. This is your announcer, ladies and gentlemen, Melville Ruick. Next week's stars and play will be told shortly by Mr. DeMille. James Stewart appeared through courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer Studios, Mr. DeMille, Paramount, and Louis Silver's 20th Century Fox, where he was in charge of music for the new picture, This Is My Affair. Our play was based on John Raphael's adaptation of the original by Alexandra Disson. And here is Mr. DeMille. To the ever-popular Booth Tarkington, we're indebted for the story which comes to us next Monday night. A story whose suspense and delightful romance have ranked it as a classic of its kind ever since Richard Mansfield brought it to the stage many years ago. Its title, Monsieur Beaucaire. I'm especially pleased to announce that filling the title role will be one of the greatest artists of our time, Mr. Leslie Howard. And starring with him, Alyssa Landy. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Leslie Howard and Alyssa Landy in Monsieur Beaucaire. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. KNX, the Columbia Station, Los Angeles.
Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Betty Davis, Herbert Marshall, and James Stevenson in The Letter. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know which is more exciting to a producer, a play by Somerset Maugham or a performance by Betty Davis. But we have both in the Lux Radio Theater tonight. And the pulse of this producer is beating double time. For Miss Davis again proves her genius in one of Mr. Maugham's most powerful dramas, The Letter. And you'll hear more than one star performance. For with Miss Davis, we have Herbert Marshall and James Stevenson, who share honors with her in Warner Brothers' film production of this play. The Letter is the story of a beautiful woman fighting the heat and privations of a jungle backcountry who tears to shreds the lives of two men. It's a great part for a great actress. And we had no trouble in persuading Betty Davis to return from an eastern vacation to play it at this microphone. The result of her gracious gesture is the kind of bill that would mean standing room only in any ordinary theater. But, of course, this theater always has enough seats to go round, all the way around, the whole country. That's one reason it's a national theater. Tonight's performance comes to you with the best wishes of Lux Flakes. And just as you have made this theater a weekly custom in so many American homes, you've made Lux Flakes a daily custom in your homes, too. And that adds up to an all-American rating for both plays and product. And now get ready for a dramatic experience you'll never forget. The curtain rises on the letter, starring Betty Davis as Leslie Crosby, Herbert Marshall as Robert Crosby, and James Stevenson as Howard Joyce, with Sen Young as the lawyer's assistant. Just north of Singapore, on the Malay Peninsula, lie the great rubber plantations, kingdoms of commerce worked by native labor, ruled by a handful of white men. In the main bungalow on one of these plantations, a light burns dimly through shaded windows. The night is hot and humid. The soft breeze, heavy with the scent of flowers. A clouded moon hangs low in the sky, filtering slowly through the trees, making patterns of shimmering silver on the ground. There is deep silence. Suddenly, the door of the bungalow is flung open. I hear that man. That is Mr. Hammond. Is he dead? I, I, I think him dead. You shoot him, Miss Crosby? Do you know where the new district officer lives? Yes, Missy. Send someone for him at once. Say there's been an accident and Mr. Hammond's dead. Yes, Missy. And get word to my husband. He's out somewhere on the number four plantation. Yes, Missy. I try. <laughs> Mr. Crosby? Huh? I'm John Withers, the new district officer. Where's Mrs. Crosby? She locked herself in the room. She wouldn't see me until you came. Excuse me. Leslie, let me in. Leslie, darling, it's Robert. Leslie, what's happened? Didn't they tell you? They said Hammond was killed. Is he... Is he still out there? I had your head boy remove the body to a shed. Leslie, what happened? Tell me. He tried to... to make love to me, and I shot him. Leslie. Oh, Robert, I'm so glad you've come. Well, darling, Hold me tight. I'm so frightened. There's nothing to be frightened about. <laughs> It'll be all right. There, yeah, now, that's better. I'll... I'll try not to do that again. Mr. Withers, I, I hope you'll understand. I didn't want to see anyone until my husband came. Of course I understand, Mrs. Crosby. Howard, come in. 
I got your message in Singapore. Howard, how nice of you to come. Well, naturally, I'd want to be here if I can help. Oh, you will help, then? Of course I will, in every way I can. You're a dear. Mr. Withers, this is Mr. Howard Joyce, my attorney. How do you do? How do you do? How's Dorothy, Howard? Oh, she's very well and anxious to see you. Has her sister arrived from England? Adele? Yes. Charming girl. She came last week. Oh. Oh. Here. Here, you'd better be resting. I do feel dreadfully faint. Come and lie down, Donny. I'll get you a drink. I'm sorry to be so tiresome. Nonsense. You're being very brave. She's bearing up wonderfully, Mr. Joyce. Yes. Yes, she is. Um, how long have you been here? About an hour. One of the Crosby houseboys came to fetch me. Was Hammond dead? Oh, yes. He was just riddled with bullets. What? Here's the revolver. All six chambers are empty. Here, you two. You better have a drink yourselves. Thanks, but I'm afraid I shouldn't. I'm, I'm on sort of a duty, you know. I'll have one, Bob. Well, you feeling any better, Leslie? Oh, much better, thanks. Mrs. Crosby, I know it seems brutal, but I'm afraid it's my duty to um, ask you some questions. I think that can wait, Mr. Withers, until my oh, wife... Oh, it's all right, Robert, really. I feel perfectly well now. Then suppose you tell us exactly what happened, Leslie. I'll try. And take your time, Mrs. Crosby. Remember, we're all friends here. You've been so patient. Well, as you know, Robert was spending the night at number four plantation. Why, well, never mind being alone. A planter's wife gets used to that. My dear. I had dinner rather late, and I started working on my lace. I don't know how long I'd been working when... Suddenly, I heard footsteps outside, and someone came up on the veranda and said, Good evening, can I come in? Well, I was startled, because I hadn't heard a car drive up. Who is it, I asked. Jeff Hammond. Oh, of course, I said, come in and have a drink. Were you surprised to see him? Well, I was, rather. He hadn't been in the house for ages, had he, Robert? Three months, at least. I told him Robert was over at the number four plantation, getting out a, a shipment or something. Wasn't that it, darling? What did he say to that? He said, oh, I'm sorry. I felt rather lonely tonight, so I thought I'd just come over and see how you were getting on. Well, I put on my spectacles again and went on with my work. We chatted about one thing and another. He asked me if Robert had heard that a tiger had been seen on the road two or three days ago. He said he thought he'd try to get it over the weekend. Oh, yes, I know about that. Don't you remember I spoke to you about it yesterday? Did you? Oh, yes, I believe you did. Well, we went on chatting until... Well, suddenly he said something rather silly. What? It's hardly worth repeating... He paid me a little compliment. I think perhaps you'd better tell us exactly what he said. He said, you've got very pretty eyes. It's too bad to hide them under those ugly spectacles. Has he ever said anything of the sort to you before? Oh, no, never, and I thought it impertinent. I don't wonder. And did you answer him? Yes, I said, I don't care a row of beans what you think about me. But he only laughed and said, I'm going to tell you all the same. I think you're the prettiest thing I've ever seen. Leslie, let her finish, Bob. In that case, I said, I can only think you half witted. He laughed again and moved his chair up closer. But, Mrs. Crosby, I wonder you didn't throw him out there and then. Well, I didn't want to make a fuss. I, I think a woman makes a perfect fool of herself if she makes a scene every time a man pays her a compliment. When did you first suspect that Hammond was serious? The next thing he said. He looked at me straight in the face and he said, Don't you know that I'm awfully in love with you? Swine. Were you surprised? Of course, I was surprised. Well, we've known him for seven years, Robert, and he's never paid me the smallest attention. I didn't suppose he even knew what color my eyes were. We hadn't seen very much of him in the last few years. Yes, yes. Go on, Leslie. Well, he helped himself to another whiskey and soda. I began to wonder if he'd been drinking before. I wouldn't drink any more if I were you, I said. He emptied his glass and asked me in a funny, abrupt way, Do you think I'm talking to you like this because I'm drunk? I said, that's the most obvious explanation, isn't it? Oh, it's awful having to tell you all this. I'm so ashamed. I wish there were some way we could spare you, Mrs. Crosby. Leslie, it's for your own good that we know the facts, all you can remember of them. Very well. I'll tell you the rest. I got up from my chair. I was standing in front of the table, about here. He rose and stood in front of me. I held out my hand. Good night, I said. But he just stood and looked at me, and his eyes were all funny. I'm not going, he said. Well, then I began to lose my temper. You poor fool, don't you know I've never loved anyone but Robert? And even if I didn't love Robert, you're the last man I should care for. He answered, Robert's away. Well, that was the last straw. I wasn't frightened, just angry. If you don't go away this minute, I told him, I'll call the boys and have you thrown out. I walked past him to call the boys from the veranda. 
and he took hold of my arm and swung me back. Well, I screamed as loud as I could. He flung his arms about me and began to kiss me. I struggled to tear myself away from him. Oh, he seemed like a madman. He kept talking and talking and saying he loved me and he loved me. And... Oh, it's horrible. I can't go on. I'm sorry, Leslie, but we'll have to know the rest. Well, he lifted me in his arms. I, I struggled to get free, but he was too strong for me. He started to carry me and then, well, he stumbled on those steps. And I got away from him. Suddenly, I remembered Robert's revolver in the drawer of that chest. He got up and ran after me, but I reached it before he caught me. Oh, it was all instinctive. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't even know I'd fired. I heard a report and saw him lurch toward the door. I followed him out to the veranda. He staggered across the porch, grabbed the railing, and slipped through his hands as he fell down the steps. I don't remember anything more. Just the reports, one after another, until there was a funny little click and the revolver was empty. And suddenly I looked down and saw him lying there. Lying in the moonlight. It was only then that I knew what I'd done. My poor darling. Mrs. Crosby, may I say that I think you behaved magnificently? I'm terribly sorry that we had to put you to the ordeal of telling us all this. You were all very kind. It's quite obvious the man only got what he deserved. Uh, Withers, if you'll come with me, I'd like to see the body. Oh, yes, I'll take you to the shed. We'll only be a few minutes. My poor child. Oh, Robert. What have I done? You've done what any woman would have done in your place. Only nine-tenths on it wouldn't have had the courage. And yet I'd give almost anything if I could bring him back to life. It's so horrible to think that I killed him. Leslie. Why, there isn't a man or a woman in the colony who won't be proud to know you. Darling, we have been happy, haven't we? You've been the best wife a man could have. I'm grateful for all the time we've been together. Don't say it that way, darling. It sounds so... so in the past. Nonsense. We've got most of our lives ahead of us. Oh, if only there was something I could do to help you right now. You can love me. That's all I need. I've always loved you. Yes, but now. Leslie, darling, if I could love you any more, I would now. Robert. Indulgent towards my cooking, gentlemen. I can't vouch for it. Well, I can and will. Funny. The head boy running off tonight. Yes, it is odd. Well, he couldn't have done better than this, my dear. It's delicious. It certainly is. Thank you, gentlemen. I think we should start for Singapore as soon as we've finished. Right away. Why, well, it's still dark, Howard. Well, it'll be eight o'clock by the time we get there. We'll ring the Attorney General and find out when we can see him. I think that's the first thing to do, don't you, with us? Uh, yes, yes, I think that's the best thing to do. Would I have to be... Arrested? Well, you see, Mrs. Crosby, as a matter of fact, I... I think you're by way of being under arrest now. It's purely a matter of form, Mrs. Crosby. Shall I be imprisoned? That's up to the Attorney General. It's possible that after you've told him your story, he'll be able to accept bail. He's a very good fellow. I'm sure he'll do everything he can. How do you mean, be able to accept bail? Well, my dear, it depends on what the charge is. What? What do you mean by that? I think it's not unlikely that he'll say that only one charge is possible. And in that case, well, I'm afraid an application for bail would be useless. What charge? Murder. Leslie. Oh, I'm quite all right. More coffee, darling. No, no. As a matter of fact, if we're going to leave, I'd better put a few things together. It won't be long. Uh, let me do it, Robert. Don't bother, dear. Oh, Leslie. Yes? There's just one question I'd like to ask you. Yes, what is it, Howard? When I was looking at Hammond's body... Oh. Yes? It seemed to me that some of the shots must have been fired after he was lying on the ground. I'm afraid it sounds very cold-blooded. But I was so terrified, I didn't know what I was doing. Everything was confused and blurred. Well, there, Leslie, I shouldn't have brought it up tonight. Put it out of your mind. she saying? Mr. Crosby, to see you, sir. Oh, ask him to come in. Mr. Crosby. Thanks. Hello, Bob. Howard, how is she? Sit down, Bob. Have you seen her? If I can be of any assistance, sir. 
I shall remain within call. Not at the moment, Ong, thanks. Ong's been of great help on the case. He finds out everything. The perfect confidential clerk. I try to catch you at the house. I have to see you, Howard. Well, you needn't hesitate about coming to the office, Bob. You know you're always welcome. How is everything? Everything's fine. In fact, Leslie's much better than you. She hasn't turned a hair. She's worth ten of me. I don't mind confessing. I'm all in. It's the first time we've been separated for more than a day since we were married. Oh, you mustn't let yourself go to pieces, Bob. I've tried to work, but it's no good. The estate can go to blazes for all I care. I hate the house and every tree on the place. Then why not stay in town with us? Dorothy's for it, and so am I. Thanks, I think I will. I won't be so lonely. Oh, you better get some sleep and after your plant is closed before you see Leslie. You don't want her to have to cheer you up. She's a plucky woman. It's monstrous they should have kept her in that filthy prison all this time. They had no choice. Anyway, it's only a week now before the trial. The whole thing's a farce. Why subject her to the ordeal of a trial? Of course she admitted killing a man in a civilized community. A trial's inevitable. She shot him as she would have shot a mad dog. You don't have to convince me, Bob. It's curious that Hammond was able to keep his life so hidden. That gambling house he owned, and especially the Eurasian woman. Could she be one of the witnesses? I shan't call her. I'll just produce evidence that Hammond was married to her. He managed to keep that marriage a secret, too. Oh, I know you're busy, Howard. I can't tell you how grateful I am. Oh, nonsense. Now stop worrying about the trial. That's your lawyer's job. Thanks, old man. I'll... See you up at the house. Yes? Mr. Joyce. Well, on? If you are not too busy, sir, might I trouble you for a few words in private conversation? No trouble at all, on. It has to do with the case of the Crown versus Crosby. Yes? A friend has brought me information, sir, that there is in existence a letter from the defendant to the unfortunate victim of the tragedy. Well, that's not surprising. In the course of seven years, I've no doubt Mrs. Crosby often had occasion to write to Mr. Hammond. But the letter, sir, was written on the day of the late Mr. Hammond's death. Well? You will no doubt recall that Mrs. Crosby has stated that until the fatal night, she had had no communication with the deceased for several weeks. In my opinion, this letter indicates that her statement is not in every respect accurate. Have you seen the letter? I have with me a copy, sir. The original is in possession of a woman who happens to be the widow of Mr. Hammond, deceased. May I read it? Oh, certainly, sir. Of course, as I said, this is but a copy in my handwriting. You can understand it, sir? Perfectly. Ong, it's inconceivable that Mrs. Crosby should have written such a letter. May I suggest, sir? that it would be well to make sure, since my friend is of the opinion that the letter might be of some interest to the prosecutor. I'm obliged to, Ong. I'll give the matter my consideration. Very good, sir. Do you wish me to communicate that to my friend? Might be well if you kept in touch with him. Yes, sir. It might be very well. You may stay in the visiting room as long as you want, Mrs. Crosby. The warden's orders. That's very nice of him. Thank you. Howard, how good of you to come. I wasn't expecting you today. Good morning, Leslie. You're looking very well. Thank you, Howard. Well, the trial is only five days off now. I know. Each morning when I awake, I say to myself, one less. Just like I used to at school with the holidays coming. Leslie. Oh, don't feel sorry for me, Howard. Time has really passed quite quickly. I've read a great deal and worked on my lace. And... But I'll... I'll confess something to you, Howard. I'm not looking forward to testifying in court. Well, Leslie, one of the things that's impressed me is that each time you told your story, you've told it in exactly the same words. You've never varied a hair's breadth. And what does that suggest to your legal mind? Well, it suggests either that you have an extraordinary memory or... Or? Or that you're telling the plain, unvarnished... I'm afraid I have a very poor memory. I suppose I'm right in thinking that you had no communication with Hammond for several weeks before the catastrophe? Oh, quite. I'm positive of that. Let's see, the last time we met was at a tennis party at the McFarren's. I don't think I said more than two words to him. And you hadn't written to him? Oh, no. Well, one time you've been on fairly intimate terms with him. How did it happen that you stopped asking him to anything? Well, we hadn't anything much in common. and He was very popular, you know. Had a good many calls on his time and... Well, there didn't seem to be any need to shower him with invitations. 
Are you quite certain that was all? Well, I may as well tell you. We heard about his, um, his wife, and once, just by chance, I actually saw her. Oh, you never mentioned that. What was she like? Horrible. Covered with gold chains and bangles and bracelets. And a face like a mask. And it was after you knew about her that you stopped having anything to do with Hammond? Yes. Leslie, I think I should tell you that there is in existence a letter in your handwriting from you to Jeff Hammond. Oh, well, I've often sent him little notes to ask him something or other. This letter asks him to come and see you because Robert was going to be away. Oh, but that's impossible. I never did anything of the kind. You'd better read it for yourself. This is not my handwriting. I know. It's said to be an exact copy of one written on the day of Hammond's death. Well, Leslie? What does it mean? That's for you to say, Leslie. I didn't write it. I swear I didn't write it. If the original is in your handwriting, be no use denying it. It could be a forgery. It's difficult to prove that. It would be easy to prove it was genuine. Well, well, it's not dated. It might have been written years ago. Oh, if you'll give me a little time, I'll try to remember. Leslie, the prosecution could cross-examine your house, boys. They would soon find out whether someone took a letter to Hammond on the day of his death. I swear to you that I did not write this letter. Very well. And there's nothing more to talk about. I'll be going. Howard? Howard, wait a minute. I, um... I, I did write it, but I was afraid to mention it. I thought none of you would believe my story if I admitted that he'd come there at my invitation. Go on. You see, I, I was preparing a surprise for Robert's birthday. I knew he wanted a new gun, and I'm so dreadfully stupid about sporting things. I thought I'd talk to Jeff about it and get him to order it for me. Perhaps you've forgotten what's in the letter. Will you have another look at it? No, I don't want to. Then let me read it to you. Robert will be away. I absolutely must see you. I'm desperate, and if you don't come, I won't answer for the consequences. Don't drive up to the door. Leslie, I shall have to talk to you very plainly. I told Bob today that I was certain of your acquittal, and I didn't say that just to cheer him up. I don't believe the jury would have retired at all. But this letter alters the case completely. I won't tell you what I personally thought when I read the letter. The duty of counsel is to defend his client, not to convict her, even in his own mind. I don't want you to tell me anything but what is needed to save your neck. Oh. They can prove that Hammond came to your house at your urgent invitation. I don't know what else they can prove, but if the jury comes to the conclusion that you didn't kill Hammond in self-defense... Oh, no, they... they Hello. Leslie. Matron. Matron, quickly. Yes, sir? Call nurse. Mrs. Crosby's ill. <laughs> Mr. DeMille will return in just a moment with our stars, Betty Davis, Herbert Marshall, and James Stevenson for Act Two of the letter. Well, Sally here looks as if she wanted to say something first. What is it, Sally? I just want to look into the future for a moment, Mr. Ruick. Yes? What do you see there, Sally? Good news. A hundred years from now, there won't be any spring house cleaning. Hmm, you don't say. Why not? Because everything in the house will be waterproof. You just hose down a room, and presto, it's clean. Hmm, very simple indeed. But it won't help women who are doing their spring house cleaning right now. Oh, but I know something that'll make things awfully easy for them. So do I. New Quick Lux Flakes. Right. And I've heard loads of women say they've never seen anything like it. They love the way it bursts into suds at the touch of water. Yes, and it's amazing how rich those suds are, too. All fine, pure soap. No harmful alkali of any kind. And new quick lux goes so far. Yes, and it gives more suds, ounce for ounce, than any of ten other soaps tested. And that's true even in hard water. It's thrifty. It's so safe, too. There's nothing to hurt any color or fabric. That's safe in water alone. It's wonderful how nice curtains and blankets and bedspreads look after a dip in new quick lux. And that goes for dozens of other things, too. Everything safe in water alone. Ladies, now that you're busy with your spring house cleaning, get the fast, easy help new quick lux gives. Ask your grocer for a thrifty big box of new quick lux flakes tomorrow. It comes in the same familiar package at no extra cost. And here's more news. Right now, thousands of grocers are featuring new Quick Lux Flakes in their spring house cleaning sales. 
It's a grand time to stock up. Use New Quick Lux for all your soap and water tasks. To help keep your things new looking longer. To save your hands. We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Letter, starring Betty Davis as Leslie Crosby, Herbert Marshall as Robert Crosby, and James Stevenson as Howard Joyce. In that split fraction of a moment before her mind slipped into the blackness, Leslie Crosby realized that the letter she had written to Jeff Hammond was damning evidence, enough to hang her. Now, a few minutes later, in the first aid room of the prison hospital, she leans wearily back in her chair, her eyes half closed. I'm afraid I've made rather a mess of things. I'm sorry. For Robert, not for me. You've distrusted me from the beginning, Howard. That's neither here nor there, Leslie. Who's got the letter now? The Eurasian woman who was Hammond's wife. Oh. Howard, are you going to let me be hanged? What do you mean by that, Leslie? You could get hold of the letter. Do you think it's so easy to do away with unwelcome evidence? But surely nothing would have been said to you if, if the owner wasn't quite prepared to sell it. That's quite true. But I'm not prepared to buy it. Oh, but it wouldn't be your money. Robert has saved some. I wasn't thinking of the money. I don't know if you'll understand this, Leslie, but I've always thought of myself as an honest man. You're asking me to do something which is no better than suborning a witness. Do you mean to say you can save me and you won't? What harm have I ever done you? You can't be so cruel. I want to do my best for you, Leslie, but a lawyer has a duty to his profession and to himself. I can't do what you ask. Oh, poor Robert. He doesn't deserve it. He's never hurt anyone in his life. He's so kind and simple and good, and he trusts me so. I mean everything to him, everything in the world. And this will ruin his life. Oh, I know what you're thinking. You despise me. You think he's well rid of me if they do hang me. I don't despise you. It isn't important what I feel about you, do you understand? But I'm going to do what I can. Oh. Bob will want to know what the money's for. Will it be a very large sum? I imagine this woman has a pretty shrewd idea of the letter's value. You won't have to show Robert the letter, will you? I'll do everything possible to prevent him from seeing it. He'll be an important witness, and he should be as firmly convinced of your innocence as he is now. And after the trial... I'm going to try and save your life. Oh, if Robert loses his trust in me, he loses everything. It's strange that a man can live with a woman for ten years and not know the first thing about her. Do you think your friend could be induced to part with the letter? I believe so, sir. But my friend has not got the letter. The woman has it. She did not know its value. Until my friend told her. What value did he put on it? Ten thousand dollars, sir. Only ten thousand? <laughs> Why not fifty or a hundred? For the reason, sir, that Mr. Crosby has in the bank of the British Malaya Company a savings account in the amount of only ten thousand four hundred and fifty dollars. Ten thousand dollars is a good deal of money, Ong. Yes, it is a good deal of money. Well, I'll speak to Mr. Crosby. Have the woman come to my office. I was about to mention, sir, she made two conditions. She insists that the money shall be brought to her. I can take you to the house whenever you are ready, sir. What's the other condition? That Mrs. Crosby shall bring it to her personally. You must be mad. Good heavens, man. Do you suppose Mrs. Crosby can just walk out of a prison cell whenever she feels like it? My friend thinks you could arrange to have her stay at your house until the trial. I believe... The judge will permit it if you are responsible for her, sir. Ong Chi Seng. Yes, sir. What are you getting out of this? Two thousand dollars, sir. And the satisfaction of being of service to you and our client. Sit down, Howard. I've taken the liberty of ordering for you. Oh, thanks. Well, you're looking more cheerful, Bob. I feel better since this morning. I guess you finally convinced me we've nothing to worry about. 
Well, as a matter of fact, Bob, something's come up. Uh, oh, it's nothing very much, but I thought I'd better have a talk with you about it. Yeah? Uh, it seems that Leslie wrote a letter to Hammond asking him to come to the bungalow on the night he was killed. Why, that's impossible. You heard her say she'd had no communication with him for weeks before it happened. Nevertheless, she did write the letter. She, she wanted his advice on something she was buying you for your birthday. Your birthday was about then, wasn't it? Yes, the end of April. In the excitement, she forgot the letter at the time and then later was afraid to say she'd made a mistake. But that's not like Leslie. She isn't afraid of anything. Well, this was a pretty serious mistake and she realized it. Who has the letter? Hammond's widow and she threatens to turn it over to the prosecution. Well, what if she does? Leslie can explain it in court just to explain it to you. <laughs> yes, but don't you see? It might alter things a good deal in the minds of the jury if Hammond came to your house by invitation. Well, what's to be done about it? I think we must get hold of that letter. I want you to authorize me to buy it. I'll do whatever you think is right. Buy the letter. I'll pay you back whatever it costs. Good. Now I'll put the matter out of your mind. Oh, uh, by the way, Leslie will be at the house tonight. I arranged to have her release pending trial. Leslie, don't tell me that's the same lace I saw you working on at the McFarrens. How can you go so fast? Well, I haven't had anything else much to do this past month. What's it going to be? It's too fine for a tablecloth, surely. It's a coverlet for our bed. Oh, uh, uh, Dorothy, Leslie and I have some work to do this evening. Look here, Bob, why don't you take the girls to a picture? Well, well it won't take all evening, will it, Ron? Well, there's a lot to go over. There's no use with three hanging around. You'd much better see a good film. Yes, darling, go ahead. It'll take your mind off tomorrow. I want you to. All right, then. I'll bring the car around. Come on, Adele. I can see the legal mind is anxious to get rid of us. <laughs> Night, Leslie. Good night. Where do we have to go? Chinese Quarter. Some sort of a shop, I believe. Well, I always wanted to see the Chinese Quarter. I hear it's a bit creepy. Of course, I'd have chosen other circumstances for a visit. Be flippant about your own crimes if you want to, but don't be flippant about mine. Oh, I'm sorry, Howard. I didn't mean to be flippant. Really, I didn't. Maybe it's my own sense of guilt, but I have an unpleasant feeling that I'll have to pay the piper for what I'm doing tonight. I'm jeopardizing my whole career, and I have to rely on your discretion. Whatever else I am, I'm not ungrateful. Oh, forget what I said. When did you first start doing that lace work, Leslie? Oh, a few years ago. How did you happen to take it up? Well, I wanted something to do, and it appealed to me. But it must take enormous concentration and patience... I find it soothing. You mean it takes your mind off other things? Is that a legal question? You're not an ordinary client, Leslie. You've been watching me, Howard. I've felt it all evening, trying to read my thoughts. I'm trying to understand you. Why? Because I'm so... so evil. That's it, isn't it? Some time ago, I saw a volcano erupt. An island south of here, Guadi. It had been dormant for years, and then suddenly the crest blew off. It was terrifying and beautiful. Fire turned the sea and sky crimson, and three villages melted into ashes. It's time we were starting. Ang Chi Seng will be waiting for us. Come in. Please come in. This is the shop of my friend. If you will wait here, I will return in just a moment. Let's not be too long about it, Ong. I will speak to the lady at once, sir. Well, they seem to have a little of everything to sell here. Most of these shops do. That looks like good jade. And this dagger. See the workmanship and the ivory handle. Imagine all that on a knife. He who kills with an unworthy tool commits two crimes. One against himself. Will you follow me, please? The lady will see you now. You said she'd be here. She is coming, sir. Well, what's she standing there for? Ask her if she has the letter. Yes, sir. Nei go feng sun. Ai shi ma. Feng sun. Yu ke zhe ke de ang mo. Ngo sun de gong hou le. Yu ke zhe ke de ang mo. Mrs. Crosby, I regret 
But the veil that you wear over your head, Mrs. Hammond requests that you remove it. Of course. You can Mrs. Crosby, Mrs. Hammond has a further request. She wishes you to walk over to her. Now, look here. Tell her this oh, is enough. Oh, it's all right, Howard. I don't mind. May you need soon. soon. What does she say? Mrs. Hammond, you may have the letter if you will pick it up at her feet. Thank you. Jury, have you agreed upon a verdict? We have, Your Honor. The prisoner will please rise and look upon the jury. You find the prisoner at the bar, Leslie Crosby, guilty or not guilty? We find the defendant not guilty. And from that day on, I made a solemn vow that I wouldn't make another cocktail until Leslie was acquitted. So if these aren't up to my usual high standard, remember, I'm out of practice. <laughs> Dorothy, darling, they're wonderful. Never been better. Robert Crosby, right now you wouldn't know what you were drinking. I guess that's right. I can't taste or think or feel. All I can do is keep saying to myself over and over, Leslie's safe. Darling. Well, anyone planning to bathe, shower, or sponge before dinner should be getting at it. A shower for me. I've laid out some things for you, Leslie. Thank you. Darling, I'm going to tidy myself up a bit. No, don't go, Leslie. Why well, shan't be a minute? There's something I particularly want to talk to you about. And, Howard, I want to see you, too. I want your legal opinion. Oh, you do? What's up? Well, I want to get Leslie away from here as quickly as possible. I think a bit of a holiday do you both good. No, no, I mean for good. But how could we? You can't very well throw up your job. But I've got something in view that's much better. It's in Sumatra. We'd be away from everybody, and the only people around us would be Dutch. We'd start a new life. The only thing is that you'll be awfully lonely, darling, at the start. Oh, I wouldn't mind that. I'd like to go, Robert. I don't want to stay here. That settles it, then. I'll go straight ahead and we can fix things up at once. Is the money as good as here? Well, I hope it'll be better. At all events, I'll be working for myself and not for a company in London. What do you mean? Why should I go on sweating my life out for other people? This plantation belongs to a Malacca Chinese planter who's in financial difficulties, and he's willing to let it go for $30,000. He can get the money the day after tomorrow. How on earth are you going to raise $30,000? Well, I've saved about ten, and the bank is willing to let me have the balance on mortgage. Uh, Robert, darling, I... Well, I shouldn't like you to take such a risk on my account. I'll be perfectly all right here. Really, I shall. Nonsense, darling. You just said you wanted to go. Oh, no, but I'm not sure it wouldn't be a mistake to run away. Everyone's been so kind, and they'll all help to make it easy for us. I think the thing to do is to stick it out here. Well, anyhow, it's not a thing you want to rush into. Let's wait and see. Why what... should I wait? It's a good thing. I don't want to lose it. Look... I've got all the papers in my briefcase. I'll go and get them and you can see for yourself. And I have a couple of photographs of the bungalow to show Leslie. I don't want to see them. Please, Robert. Oh, calm, darling. That's just nerves. That shows how necessary it is for you to get away. But, Robert... I... Leslie, darling, in this case, you must let me have my own way. I won't be a minute. Howard. What are you going to do? What can I do? Oh, don't tell him now. I can't bear any more. You heard what he said? Wants the money at once to buy the estate. Can't. He hasn't got it. Give me a little time. I can pay it back. Leslie, I can't afford to let you have a sum like that. I've mortgaged everything I own. I was glad to advance it, Where but I can't... Where is the letter? I have it in my pocket. Oh, it will break his heart. What shall I do? I don't know, Leslie. If I tell him he'll want to see the letter, of course. Here we are. He's coming. What shall I do, Leslie? It's up to you. Well? Tell him... Tell him and have done with it. The lights come up in the Lux Radio Theater as the curtain falls on Act Two of The Letter, starring Betty Davis, Herbert Marshall, and James Stevenson.
Will everyone remain very quiet, please? Because in this brief intermission, I've asked one of our audience to help me in a little test. Here she comes to the microphone now. Her name is Mrs. Lee Millar. And your home, Mrs. Millar, is... Oakland, California. Well, we are delighted to have you with us, Mrs. Millar. Now, do you see what I have in my hand? Why, two rubber bands. Yes. Will you take this one and stretch it as far as it will go? That's right. It stretches, then snaps right back, doesn't it? Yes, Mr. Roy. Well, now do the same with the other. Why, it's broken in two. Yes, because the second rubber band was all dried out. It lost all its elasticity, so it broke under strain. Now, the reason I asked Mrs. Millar to make this test was because the very same thing can happen to stockings. You see, when stockings are new and live and supple, they have great elasticity. They can stretch as you walk or run or stoop down, then spring back into shape with each motion of your leg. Yes, that's true. But if the threads get all dried out and lifeless, why then... They break when they stretch. Right. Now, one way to weaken elasticity is to use a soap that contains harmful alkali. This dries out the fibers. Another way is to rub with cake soap. This weakens the fibers, makes them less elastic, and more apt to break under strain. And you have a run. Well, I always lux my stockings, Mr. Roy. Good, because lux saves elasticity. New Quick Lux Flakes have no harmful alkali. And with lux, there's no rubbing. That's why lux keeps soap elastic and cuts down runs. No wonder it's America's favorite stocking care and recommended by over 90% of the makers of both silk and nylon stockings in the United States. Why not save your stockings by washing them every night with new Quick Lux Flakes? Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. The curtain rises on the third act of the letter. Robert Crosby has returned to the room. His thoughts full of plans for the purchase of the new plantation. In silence, Leslie and Joyce watch Robert, brimming over with enthusiasm, arrange his papers on the desk. This is really a handsome estate. We'll be stealing it for 30000 Bob, I, I don't like to throw cold water on your plans, but hasn't it struck you that the costs of uh, what we've just been through will be pretty heavy? Costs? Oh, yes, the legal expenses. Oh, you know, I couldn't charge you anything for my services, but there are certain out-of-pocket oh, expenses that... that's awfully decent of you. I'm not sure I could accept that. But what do these other expenses amount to? Well, the principal item is that letter of Leslie's I mentioned to you. Oh, yes, yes I'd almost forgotten. You see, you were going to... I had to pay a great deal of money for it. Well, if you thought it necessary, I'm not going to grouse. How much was it? Ten thousand dollars. Ten thousand Dollars? Well, you must have been mad. You may be quite sure I wouldn't have given that if I could have got it for less. Oh, that, that's every cent I have in the world. Why didn't you let them bring the letter in and explain it to the jury? I didn't dare. Well, you mean it was absolutely necessary to suppress it? If you wanted Leslie acquitted. What was there in the letter? I told you at the time. It was very stupid of me, Robert. I, I remember now you wrote to Hammond to ask him to come to the bungalow. Yes. You wanted to get something for me, didn't you? Yes, I wanted to get you a gun. He knew all about that sort of thing, and you know how ignorant I am. Buying that letter was a criminal offense, wasn't it? Well, not the sort of thing a respectable lawyer does in the ordinary way of business. It was a criminal offense. Yes, it was. I might be disbarred for it. Then why did you do it, you of all people? What were you trying to save me from? Leslie, you knew I was buying a gun from Cameron. Why did you want to make me a present of another? But how should I know you're going to buy a gun? Well, because I told you. Well, I've forgotten. I can't remember everything. You hadn't forgotten that. What do you mean, Robert? Why are you talking has, to me like who this? Who has the letter now? I have. Where is it? Bob, it's not your letter or mine. It's... I've got to pay $10,000 for that letter. I'm going to see it. Let him see it. Thank you. Robert will be away. I absolutely must see you. What does this mean? It means that I was in love with Jeff Hammond. No, you couldn't. We've been in love for years. It's not true. I used to meet him constantly, once or twice a week. Every time we met, I hated myself for it. It was horrible. I loathed myself. I was like a person who was ill. Then came a time about a year ago when he began to change toward me. I didn't know what was the matter. I was frantic. I made scenes. I threw myself at his feet. Leslie! Then I heard about that 
That native woman. Oh, I couldn't believe it. I wouldn't believe it. At last I saw her. I saw her walking in the village with those hideous pangles and that chalky face and eyes like a cobra's eyes. But I couldn't give him up. I sent for him. You've read the letter. I would always been so careful about writing before. But this time I didn't care. I hadn't seen him for ten days. He came and I told him I knew about his marriage. Oh, at first he denied that I was frantic. I don't know what I said to him. I hated him because he'd made me despise myself. I insulted him. I cursed him. At last he turned on me. He told me he was sick and tired of me. That it was true about the other woman. That she was the only one who really meant anything to him. He said he was glad I knew because now I'd leave him alone. I knew if he went out that door, I'd never see him again. I seized the revolver and fired. He gave a cry and I saw I'd hit him. I ran after him and I fired and fired and fired until there were no more cartridges. That's what happened. And I have no excuse for myself. I don't deserve to live. How could you do this to me, Leslie? How could you? I'm sorry. I shouldn't have let myself go. I've got to think. Leslie. Well? He's going to forgive you. Yes. He's going to forgive me. And the fifth couple of the Prescott. Oh, yes. Robert's told me about them. You'll adore them, Leslie. Now, both of you get a good sleep because it'll be a late party. Good night. Good night, Dorothy. Good night. Robert, it's lucky you brought your dinner coat. You'd hardly fit in one of Howard's. Now, let's see what else you'll need. Oh, how about your studs? They're probably still in the bureau at home. Home. Robert, it's no use, is it? We can't make it go, can we? I don't know. I'm not sure. Robert, you're so kind and so generous. You should have had the sort of wife you really deserve. And through no fault of yours, I've failed you. Wrecked your life. I can't ask you to forgive me. If you love a person, you can forgive anything. But what about you? Can you go on? Oh, I'll try. I'll really try. That's not what I was asking I'll do everything to make you happy, everything in my power. That isn't enough. Unless, Leslie, now, this minute, do you love me? Yes, I do. Kiss me, then. Kiss me. As if... Robert. No. No, I can't. I can't. I can't. Leslie, tell me, Leslie, what is it? With all my heart, I still love the man I killed. Leslie, let me in. My dear, they're all waiting for you. This is your party, you know. I'm sorry, Dorothy. I took rather long to dress. Leslie, isn't that your lace work? Yes. Were you working on it just now? A little. I'm anxious to finish it. Leslie, please come downstairs. Of, of course, dear. In a few minutes. Very well. When did you first start doing that lace work, Leslie? I find it soothing. You mean it takes your mind off other things? I couldn't give him up. I sent for him. At last, he turned on me. He was sick and tired of me. She was the only one who meant anything to him. She was the only one. I hardly know what happened. I seized the revolver and fired, fired, and fired, and fired until there were no more cartridges. I have no excuse for myself. I don't deserve to live. I don't deserve to... Who's out there? Who is it? You, I see you there. Mr. Crosby! Come here. What are you doing out there? I don't want to come. She, Maggie, may come. She tell me I come here. She? Mrs. Hammond? Yo, Mrs. Hammond. She tell me I come here. Bling dagger. Leave it outside window. Yes. Dagger, Missy. 
She say, bling dagger to you. She's here then. Miss Hammond on path by gate. You no go in garden, Miss Crosby. She kill you. She wait there. That is what dagger me. She kill you. You go in garden. Missy, you no tell the police I come. You no tell the police I come. You no tell the police I come. got to do something about Bob. He's behaving very strangely. What is it? I don't know. First I thought he was drunk, but it's worse than that. I'll be right down. <laughs> but where will you ship from, Crosby? Oh, it's near a good harbor, only five, six miles away. And I can ship my rubber for less money. I ought to get ahead fast. In 10, 15 years, I can live in London, travel, <laughs> do anything I please. Uh, Robert, will you come outside with me, darling, please? Not now, darling. Maybe later. I'm telling the boys about my new plantation. Sounds like quite a place. Of course, we'll miss Singapore. Our friends are here. We've had some mighty fine times. No English people in that part of Sumatra, only Dutch and natives. It's going to be a little lonely at first, maybe. But we'll get used to it. Robert, I... There'll be just the two of us. But my wife's a good sport. Always can count on her. She's not afraid of anything. And we'll have each other. That's the important thing. Stop it! Stop! Stop it! I can't stand anymore. I can't stand it. Give me a drink. I want a drink. <laughs> Howard, where is Leslie? Where did she go? She ran out into the garden. The garden? I'll find her. No, let her alone. There's nothing you can do for her. What does the She say she kill her. It was right. She died. Leslie! 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 Bring to a close tonight's performance of The Letter. In a moment, our stars return for their curtain calls. But while we're waiting, listen to this. Hear that clock? Morning, noon, and night. Three times a day, seven days a week, the dishes have to be washed. You can't get around it, but you can make it pleasanter the way thousands of women have. That's with new, quick, luxe flakes. It helps do away with one of the things women hate most about dishwashing, the red, rough housework look it gives your hands. Yes, new, quick luxe is kind to hands. This was recently proved by hundreds of dramatic one-hand tests made in a laboratory under conditions similar to home dishwashing. Five different soaps frequently used for dishwashing, including Lux, were tested. Three times a day for weeks, 
Hundreds of women dipped one hand in Lux suds, the other in suds from another soap. The results were amazing. The Lux hands looked so much softer and smoother than the other hands. Now you know that lovely hands are such an important part of a woman's charm. You want yours to stay soft and smooth, of course. So why not try new Quick Lux flakes in your dishpan tomorrow? Will you do that? It's in the same familiar box, and it costs you no more. It's fast, thrifty, and so kind to your hands. Here's Mr. DeMille with our stars. Back for a curtain call come the stars of the letter. Betty Davis, Herbert Marshall, and James Stevenson. Mr. DeMille, I know Herbert Marshall and James Stevenson joined me in thanking every member of the fine cast which appeared with us tonight. Mm -hmm, and so do we. Tell me, how was your vacation, Betty? Oh, I always have a wonderful time in New Hampshire. We've been reading about the big celebration they had of the premiere of your new picture, The Great Liar, Littleton. Your birthday, too, wasn't it, Betty? Yes, Jimmy. We were trying to raise some money for local charity... And Warner Brothers very kindly came through with the premiere of The Great Lie to help us raise the money. After that birthday party, Hollywood must seem like a ghost town. Well, it seems restful for the first time. I've enjoyed very much coming back to the Lux Radio Theater tonight, Mr. DeMille. And I'd like to know what you plan for next week. Next week's play, Betty, is the delightful comedy, Wife, Husband, and Friend. And who's in the cast, Mr. DeMille? We're going to have George Brent, Priscilla Lane, and Gail Patrick. You'll hear George Brent as a perfectly normal businessman whose wife, played by Priscilla Lane, is ambitious to become an opera singer. The solution to this domestic problem comes in a surprise twist that made the 20th Century Fox picture a hit on the screen and gives us a gay and exciting prospect for next Monday night. That's a show I certainly don't want to miss, C.B. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs> You've written your names in red letters here tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, we have just learned that the Lux Radio Theater has again been selected by the readers of the Movie Radio Guide magazine as the best dramatic program on the air. It's the third consecutive year that this theater has received the Movie Radio Guide Award. And to all who participated in the poll, we express the gratitude of our sponsors and of the entire staff of this theater. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents George Brent, Priscilla Lane, and Gail Patrick in Wife, Husband, and Friend. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. <laughs> Herbert Marshall will soon be seen in the Columbia picture, Adventure in Washington. James Stevenson appeared through the courtesy of Warner Brothers Studio and will soon be seen in their production of Shining Victory. Now, an important announcement. As you know, many localities switch to daylight saving time next Sunday. If your community is one of those changing to daylight saving time, you will hear this program at the usual hour. If your community remains on standard time... Tune in one hour earlier. Check your newspaper or radio magazine for the correct time. Included in tonight's play were Richard Davis as Withers, Charlie Lung as head boy, Gloria Holden as the woman, and Suzanne Caron, Wally Mayer, Eleanor Stewart, Eric Snowden, and Leela Hyams McIntyre. Our music is directed by Louis Silver. Our Lux Radio Theater production of The Letter has come to you with the good wishes of the makers of new Quick Lux Flakes, the tissue-thin soap flakes used by smart housewives everywhere and by the great picture studios here in Hollywood to protect the million-dollar wardrobes that you see on the screen. Your announcer has been Melville Roy, and this is the Columbia Broadcasting System.
From Hollywood, California, the Lux Radio Theater presents Joan Crawford and Basil Rathbun in A Doll's House. Lux presents Hollywood. It's your purchases of our products, Lux Toilet Soap and Lux Flakes, ladies and gentlemen, that make this program possible. For the splendid loyalty you show us, our sincere gratitude. Last week, we announced an offer of a beautiful compact. So many of the ladies in our audience have taken advantage of this offer. We are making it again tonight at the end of our program. So please listen carefully and have your pencils ready. Starred tonight are Joan Crawford, Basil Rathbone, Sam Jaffe, Netta Harrigan, and Vernon Steele in A Doll's House. As special guest, Miss Frances Manson, head of the story department of Samuel Golden Productions. Our orchestra is conducted by Louis Silvers. And now, the producer of the Lux Radio Theater. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight's play is the work of one of the loneliest figures in literature, Henrik Ibsen. Poverty-stricken as a boy, Ibsen exiled himself for many years from his native Norway because of the lukewarm reception that country gave his plays. First produced many years ago, a doll's house provoked a storm of angry criticism because the playwright dared express the belief that a happy marriage must have a foundation of truth, freedom, and intellectual companionship. Like all masterpieces, a doll's house has a deathless quality and has brought fame to a score of world-renowned actresses, to which list we add tonight the name of Joan Crawford. And no one is less conscious of her success than Joan herself. She tackles each new job with the same I've-got-to-make-good attitude that she had when she first arrived here, fresh from a Schubert chorus. A Metro-Golden-Mayer star, Joan is seen next in The Shining Hour and is heard tonight as Nora Helmer. Co-starred as Torvald Helmer, a part more sympathetic than his usual roles, is that master of glistening villainy, Basil Rathbun. One of Hollywood's more gentle and considerate citizens, off the screen. This splendid actor is currently flaunting his darksome deviltry in the adventures of Robin Hood. And is with us this week, straight from the set of Paramount's If I Were King. Sam Jaffe, who gave such a remarkable performance of the ancient llama in Lost Horizon, plays Krogstadt. The same role which brought him unstinted praise when a doll's house played on Broadway this season. Netta Harrigan plays Mrs. Linden. And Vernon Steele is Dr. Ronk. And now, the Lux Radio Theater presents Joan Crawford and Basil Rathbun in A Doll's House. The year is 1890. We're in a little town in Norway on a gray September afternoon. Along the windy street in a quiet section of the city, a young woman walks hurriedly, her long dress whipping out behind her, her face half buried in an old-fashioned muff. She glances frequently over her shoulder, as if to assure herself that, that she's not been noticed. Then she stops, and after a final nervous glance, darts quickly into a doorway. Well? It's I, Mrs. Helmer. Oh. Come in, please. Sit down, Mrs. Helmer. Thank you. Uh, wasn't it a little indiscreet of you to come here, I mean? Oh, I was very careful, Mr. Krogstad. I'm quite sure no one saw me. I hope not. Did uh, you think it over, Mr. Krogstad? The matter we spoke of yesterday? Yes. The lending of money, Mrs. Helmer, is a serious business. Oh, I know it is. It's even more serious when the loan is to be made to a wife without the consent or even knowledge of her husband. Oh, but he mustn't know. He mustn't even dream that I've borrowed the money. That's why I came to you. You've known him at the bank. Yes, at the bank and at school. But we were never very friendly. Well, you worked with him. You must know how he feels about being in debt. He has a dread of it, Mr. Krogstad. He, <laughs> he thinks debts are immoral, almost criminal. 
He'd never allow me to owe the butcher or the baker a single krona. And now you wish to borrow a great many kronas. Because he needs it. Oh, you know how ill he's been. And now the doctors say that he must go away to rest. A long rest in Italy. And if he doesn't go, he'll never be well again. I want to save my husband's life, Mr. Krogstad. Mrs. Helmer, I wish I could help you. Does that mean you won't? Oh, but I'll pay it back. I promise I will. I'll, I'll save him. And I could make money other ways. I'm very clever at copying. Mrs. Helmer, and... is there anyone you could get to sponsor the loan? Sponsor it? To sign the note with you and act as surety. I mean a man, of course. Well, I don't know. There's no one I'd like to ask for fear Torvald would find out. And... Well, you have a father living. My father? What would he do? If he'd sign the note with you, yeah. Oh, then he will. I, I'm sure he will. Very well. Oh, thank you. Now, here is the note. Yes, when you come back to me with the note signed by you here and your father's signature down here, I'll let you have the money. Oh, how wonderful. It really isn't difficult at all, is it? Oh, I almost wish Torval could know. Then perhaps he'd see how clever I really am. Oh, but he mustn't. All he must know is that we have money from somewhere and that we're going away to Italy. Sit down, Nora, please. Oh, Torvald, isn't it wonderful? I feel as if I belonged here, as if I'd lived in Italy all my life. Oh, and now I've learned to dance the tarantella. Yes, and you dance it beautifully, Nora. Oh, it's so easy to dance here, where your heart is light. Aren't you glad I teased you until you brought me? <laughs> Very glad. Oh, and the rest has been good for you, Torvald, so good. Oh, nonsense. I never needed a rest. Oh, no, of course you didn't. It was just for me. And I love you for it. Oh, you can hardly thank me. I could never afford a trip like this. It was strange, your father leaving you that money. Strange, Torval? I always thought he was rather improvident. I, uh, I was sure that he'd die quite penniless. <laughs> well, he, he must have had some put away. Yes. Yeah, nevertheless, it's almost gone, my dear. We'll have to be leaving for home soon. Oh, I know. But I'm so anxious to see the children again. Ellen, you can put these flowers in water. Oh, flowers too, ma'am. Oh, yes, Ellen, and so awfully expensive. Oh, uh, did the Christmas tree come here? Yes, ma'am. I put it in the kitchen so the children wouldn't see it. Is that you, Nora? Oh, Torvald, I'm so glad you're home. Come and see all the presents I have. Look, Torvald. You mean to say you've bought all these? <laughs> oh, just a few little things for the children and Ellen and Anna and, and Dr. Ronk. And... Mm -hmm. I suppose you spent every penny I gave you. Oh, no, I, I did have some left and then I... I saw those heavenly roses. Oh, but that's so extravagant. Oh, I know, Torvald, I know, but I, I just couldn't resist. Them. And what did you buy for yourself? Oh, I don't need anything. Nonsense. Tell me, what did you like? Something useful, something sensible. Well, hmm? if you really do want to give me something, you could give me money. Now, Nora. Oh, and then I could buy myself something, just what I needed. But there's no Christmas spirit about cold, hard money. Oh, yes, there is. But you're so extravagant, Nora. On that trip to Italy last winter, we simply can't afford to go on... Throwing money about you now. Oh, but you'll be making lots of money now, and we could always get a little credit. Credit? Nora, have you ever known me to borrow money? No, but it ought to be easy enough now. I want no creditors in my life, thank you. We've held out all these years without ever owing anyone a penny, and we're certainly not going to begin now at the last minute. Yes, darling. Of course you know best. At the same time, we're, uh, we're not exactly paupers. Look, what do you think I've got here? Oh, Torvald, Money? Oh, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. Yeah, yeah, give that oh, back. Oh, Torvald, darling, thank you. This will go a long way. I should hope so. <laughs> no one would believe how much it costs a man to keep a little thing like you. A lady to see you, Mrs. Helmer. A lady? Well, ask her to come in, Ellen. Yes, ma'am. Well, I must get back to the bank for a while. Goodbye, darling. Come home early tonight. I'll try. This way, please. Who is it, Ellen? Oh. Nora. How are you? You... You don't remember me, do you? No, I... I don't think I... Why, yes! Christina, is it really you? It really is. Christina. And 
to think I didn't even know you, but you're so changed. Yes, I I guess I am in in nine or ten years. Oh, good heavens, has it been as long as that? But what are you doing in town? I arrived on the morning boat. Oh, yes, to spend Christmas. How wonderful. Oh, oh what a thoughtless wretch I am. Oh, darling, how can you forgive me? Forgive you? Oh, Christina, I forgot that you... That your husband... Yes, my... My husband died three years ago. Yes, I saw it in the papers, but... Well, you know how it is. Did he, uh, leave you anything? Nothing. Not even any children? No. Nothing? Not anything? Not even a regret. Oh, darling, you must tell me the whole story. I never would have dreamed it. It must have been awful. And to be absolutely alone afterwards. Oh, you know, I have two of the sweetest children. Just wait till you see them. They're out with their nurse now. So there's nothing to disturb us and you can tell me all about it. No, dear. You tell me. No, really, darling, I won't be selfish today. Oh, uh, but uh, I must tell you one thing. Have you heard of our wonderful luck? No, what is it? My husband has been appointed manager of the savings bank. He has? Oh, how splendid. It is. Oh, Christina, can you imagine how it makes you feel to have lots of money? Not only what you need, but just heaps of oh. money. <laughs> oh, Nora. <laughs> Nora, you haven't changed a bit. You're... You're still the same old Spencer. Oh, don't be ridiculous. I've had to work. You work? Oh, but why? Well, Torvald was ill, you know, and... Of course, you mustn't tell, Christina. Tell what? Well, we needed money, and... Of course, we didn't have any. So I went... So Torvald thinks we inherited the money from my father. Nora, wasn't it a, a little rash of you? But it saved his life. But won't you tell him? Oh, after a great many years, perhaps, when I'm not so young. Oh. <laughs> well, don't laugh, Christina. I mean, when Torvald isn't so much in love with me. When it isn't fun for him any longer to see me skipping about and dressing up and acting. Well, then it might be good to have something in reserve. <laughs> oh. <laughs> now, now, what about you? What are you going to do, Christina? Oh, I wish I knew, my dear. I'll have to find work, I suppose. I, um... I was wondering a while ago, Nora, if... What, Christina? Well, with... With your husband a bank official? You mean he might be able to do something for you? Well, I was hoping... Oh, darling, that's a wonderful idea. Nora, do you really suppose... Oh, just you leave it all to me. I'll give you a note to, to him, and you, you go to the bank and see him. Oh, I know he'll give you the position if I ask. Oh, Nora, you, you don't know how much this means to me. Oh, poor Christina. I'll, I'll write the note at once. Darlings, Mama's here. Mama, he threw a snowball and hit me. I did not. I hit him back. Oh, my baby. Mmm, such cheeks. Darling, you've been out for hours. Aren't you frozen? I'm warm. I saw a dog, Mama. He ran after a man and he growled. I saw the dog, too. Oh, did you, my sweet? And the man picked up a stick and the dog ran around biting people. Really? Oh, I know he didn't bite you, though, did he, darling? I'd like a dog. I'll just take their coats, ma'am. Oh, yes, Ellen. Can we play now, Mama? Of course, darling. Any single thing you want is Christmas Eve. I want to play Blind Man's Buff. Blind Man's Buff? All right. Now, you know what you do first. I know. Oh, I know, Mama. Oh. It's a man, Mama. What do you want, Mr. Crookset? You see, the door was open, and I thought... My husband's not at home, Mr. Crookset. Yes, I, I know. Children, go to Ellen. Come on, Emmy. Wait. What did you come here for? It isn't the first of the month, Mr. Crookstead. It isn't that. I wanted to ask you something. An hour ago at the bank, a lady asked to see Mr. Helmer. She said she had a note from you. Well? Would you mind telling me if that lady was a... a Mrs. Linden? Yes. Do you know her? I... I haven't seen her for a great many years. Naturally, I was surprised when I heard her inquire for your husband. It isn't surprising. She's going to be given a position at the bank. She is? Why, yes. But... But how? Well, you see, sometimes a little influence with the right people, Mr. Cook. You mean you had something to do with it? Well, naturally, I did what I could for my friend. Why? Come now, Mrs. Helmer. You know very well whose job it is your friend is getting. What are you talking about? So I'm just to be thrown out, am I? What? Oh, you needn't pretend you didn't know. How dare you talk like that to me? I didn't know. My husband doesn't tell me his business. Mrs. Helmer, I must ask you to use your influence for me. But I have no influence, whatever. But you just said you had, That's Mrs. Helmer. That's quite different. If someone is to be hired, and if Mrs. Linden is capable, being an old friend of mine might help with my husband. But this, 
Well, this is different. Do you expect me to be able to tell my husband what to do? I'm truly sorry for you. Now, now, I don't want your pity. I want your help. You're trying you really to can't refuse me. You're trying to fight me, but I'm not afraid of you anymore. In a little while, I'll have paid off the note, and I'll be through with the whole business. Please listen to me, Mrs. Helmer. Try to understand that it's vital for me to keep my job at the bank. I'm sorry, but really, I'm quite helpless. I tell you, I've got to keep it, that's all. I've got children, and they're growing up. They need to have a father who's able to hold up his head in a respectable position. I tell you, my job at the bank is the only chance I've got to get anywhere. I'm sorry, but I just can't listen. You've got to listen. Mr. Krog said you're threatening me. I don't care what you call it. Would you tell my husband I owe you money? I don't know. Why, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. When it's all my own secret and I'm so proud of it. Why, if he heard about it that way, there's no telling how unpleasant it would be. Unpleasant? Mrs. Helmer, I'm afraid there are some things you don't understand very well. Let me make them clear up for you. You needn't bother. When your husband was ill, you came to me to borrow a sum of money. I promised to find you the money in exchange for a written agreement which I drew up. Your father was to sign this agreement. Was to? He did sign it. Did he, Mrs. Helmer? Well, you know he did. Anyway, haven't I made my payments on time? Mrs. Helmer, your father was very ill, wasn't he? Yes, he was on his deathbed. Tell me, Mrs. Helmer, do you happen to remember the day he died? The day of the month, I mean. It was the 29th of September. Ah, that's correct. But you see, I made a little investigation for myself. And I discovered a rather remarkable fact, which I can't quite explain. What remarkable fact? The remarkable fact is, or seems to be, that your father signed this paper three days after his death. I don't understand. I... Well, uh... neither do I, Mrs. Helmer. Here your father dies on the 29th of September, and here he signs his name on October the 2nd. There's the date, don't you see? Now, isn't that remarkable? Perhaps you can explain it. Your father really did write his name here himself, didn't he? No. No, I wrote it. Do you realize what you're admitting? That was a very dangerous thing to do, Mrs. Helmer. But why? You'll have your last payment in a few days. Mrs. Helmer, you really don't seem to understand what you've done. Do you know, Mrs. Helmer, that I did something just about like that once, and it ruined me? You mean you took a risk to save someone's life? The law, Mrs. Helmer, takes no account of motives. Then the law must be very bad. Bad or not, if I take this paper to court, the law will condemn you exactly as it did me. I don't believe it. As if I didn't have the right to save my father from worry when he was dying. As if anyone should tell me that I hadn't the right to save my husband's life. I don't know very much about law, and I don't want to if that's the way it is. But I'm certain they'd let you do that. Why, the idea of not knowing they would when you're a lawyer... You must be a very poor one. Maybe I am. But I do understand something about this business you and I are in together. And now, Mrs. Helmer, you can do exactly as you please. But let me tell you this one thing. If I'm thrown off into the mud again, there'll be others to keep me company. No, 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 not yet. It's Christmas Eve. Well, I, uh, I don't hear Nora persuading me. Oh, what? Oh. oh, yes, please say, Dr. Ron. No, no. I have patients waiting for me in the morning. People are as sick on Christmas Day as any other day. Then, then you must come again tomorrow. I will, if I'm still alive. Oh, what a way for a doctor to talk. Good night. Good night. Good night, Doctor. Ah. <sighs> Well, I still have a little work to do before bed. Oh, no, Torvald. I, I want you to talk with me. Now, what would that be about? By the way, was anyone here this afternoon? No, just Christina. You gave her the position, Torvald. Oh, yes. Yes, but uh, when I came home, I thought I saw Krokstad leaving the house. Krokstad? Well, he really was here, but just for a minute. Nora. Well, it wasn't just for a minute. Nora, look at me. I'm very, very much surprised. Krogstad has been asking you to put in a good word for him, hasn't he? Hmm? Are you going to be angry with me? And you were supposed to do it just as if you'd thought of it yourself. Well, yes, but I... No, Nora. And you could stoop to that, to speak to such a man, to, to make a promise, and then to, to lie about it, to me. Now, you... You won't do that again, will you, dear? Will you? Well, well, we won't say any more about it. Torvald, tell me. 
Was it really something awful this Krogst had gotten to trouble over? Oh, forgery, that's all. You know what that means. But... Don't don't you think he might have been forced to do it? Hmm? Perhaps. And I'm not so hard-hearted as to condemn a man for a single slip. Oh, no, of course not. And a man can redeem his character if he admits his crime and takes his punishment. Crime? But Krogstad didn't. He dodged and used all kinds of tricks. He was disbarred, of course, but he, uh... Well, he should have been sent to jail. But do, don't you think he had responsibilities? Children? After all, he might have done it for their sake. Yeah, that's the worst of it. It's like a poison. Especially for the children. How do you mean? Oh, I've seen it time and time again. It's really amazing to see how criminal tendencies in children can be traced to lying parents. This Krogstad has been contaminating his children for years. But how? Oh, by his life of lies and deceit, of course. They're all drawn into it with him. Sad, isn't it? I can sympathize with you when you feel sorry for him. But you'll promise not to say any more about it. Hmm? Well, I'm going to my study. I won't be long... Oh, dear God. Mrs. Helmer. Uh, Mrs. Helmer, the children want to come and say goodnight. What? The children. Shall I bring them in to you? No. No, not now, Ellen. the first act of A Doll's House, starring Joan Crawford and Basil Rathbun. Before they return in the second act, we want to present to you, in verse, our own version of a few historical love affairs. We must admit we've improved on history a little, which is just another way of saying that you'll find our verse historically inaccurate. Anyway, we think you'll find it amusing. Our first subject is the devastating Helen of Troy. Greek Helen of Troy had a way with a boy that caused the upheaval of nations. To buy her a cloak, Menelaus went broke, and an army went short on its rations. But her jewels counted not, her robes were but aught, we've learned from historical data. We'll give you the dope. She used Lux toilet soap, and her face was what launched the regatta. We jump now to colonial times and to the comely maiden, Priscilla. Priscilla was fair and had smoothly brushed hair when John came to woo her for Standish. But she wanted John with no pro or con, why the idea of Miles was outlandish. She got her own way, and her confidence lay, not in clothes so demure and colonial. It's easy, why shucks? It's because she used luck. It's a passport to things matrimonial. And now we come to Miss 1938, in whom we're all most interested. The girl of today wears a suit and beret. She ponders on color selection. But though fashions vary, they are still secondary compared with a lovely complexion. And she knows it still pays, as it did in past days, to keep her skin clear and attractive... And, of course, if she's clever, she'll do it forever with Lux, for its lather is active. The famous beauties of history understood the relation between lovely skin and romance. The famous beauties of our own day, the lovely stars of Hollywood, understand it, too. Nine out of ten of them use Lux toilet soap to protect their beauty. Its active lather removes dust, dirt, and stale cosmetics thoroughly. Guards against choked pores that cause cosmetic skin, dullness, tiny blemishes, and large pores. Protect the loveliness of your skin the easy Hollywood way. Use Lux toilet soap before you renew makeup, always before you go to bed. May I remind you that an important announcement comes at the end of our performance tonight. I suggest that the ladies have pencil and paper ready. Now, our producer. Joan Crawford and Basil Rathbun continue in a doll's house with Sam Jaffe and Nedda Harrigan. Christmas Day finds Nora in a state close to hysteria. Under the influence of her husband's stern philosophy, she's fearful of contaminating her children with her presence. And so, she's not seen them for almost 24 hours. Now, late in the afternoon, she knocks timidly at the door of her husband's study. Come in. Well, Nora? Am I disturbing you, Torval? Oh, uh... Well, just a little, but um, what do you want, dear? Torvald, if I were to ask you for something, to beg you for something very prettily, would you do it? Nora, you can't mean what you were hinting at yesterday. Oh, yes, for my sake, Torvald, you must let Krogstad keep his place in the bank. My dear Nora, it's his place that I'm giving to your friend, Mrs. Oh, Linda. Oh, yes, darling, and that's so good of you, but 
Instead of Krogstead, couldn't you just dismiss some other clerk? Dismiss some other clerk? What's the matter with you, Nora? Just because you were impulsive enough to promise to put in a good word for him, I'm to... No, it's not that. It, it's not that I said anything to him. But it, it's for your own sake, Torvald. I'm so terribly afraid of him. Why? Well, I... I hear he's rather malicious, and there's no telling what he might say. That's why I beg yes, you... Yes, and the more you plead for him, the more you make it impossible for me to keep him on. Oh, darling, please. Now, there's no use going any further with this. The matter's closed. I've just sent a messenger out with a letter. What letter? A Krogstadt's dismissal. Oh, call it back again, Torval. There's still time for my sake, for your own. Oh, listen, please, Torval. You don't know what might happen because of it. Now, come, Nora. What do you expect me to do? What are you about being slandered or blackmailed by a wretched fellow like Krogstadt? Really? I can forgive you only because I know it's proof of your love for me. And that's as it should be. Let what will happen when it comes to the pinch... I think you'll find my shoulders are broad enough to bear the burden. No, no, you'll never do that. I won't let you. Well, well, we'll do it together then. We'll share it. Man and wife. How would you like that? Now, 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 now. Stop worrying. It's just your imagination. I'll tell you what. Take your tambourine and practice your tarantella. Tarantella? Yes. You're going to dance it at the Stenbogs' party tonight. You haven't forgotten, have you? Um, no, no, I, I remember. <laughs> Mrs. Helmer. Is Dr. Ronkin? Why, yes, come in. Come in, Nora. Thank you. Well, sit down, Nora. I was just about to leave for your house. Dr. Ronk, there's something I want to ask you. I'm, I'm not disturbing you, am I? I always have time for you, Nora. I always will have. Just as long as I'm able. As long as... What does that mean? Does that frighten you? Well, I think it's an odd expression, isn't it? Do you expect anything to happen? Oh, something that's no surprise. Is there something you've really discovered? I've been auditing my life account, Nora. Oh, you've discovered something about yourself. Yes, and it looks as if I'm bankrupt. Before very long, my poor carcass will be rotting in the churchyard. Oh, what a dreadful way to talk. Dreadful? Well, it's a dreadful business. There's one final test to be made, and then we'll know exactly when disintegration sets in. Oh, Dr. Rank. As soon as I'm certain of the worst... I'll send you my visiting card, and then you'll know that really serious things have begun. I won't listen. You know you're exaggerating. You just like to talk this way. You mustn't think of dying and leaving Torvald and me. You're our oldest friend. Oh, you will get over it. The absent are soon forgotten. Do you think so? People make fresh ties. Although I... I do hate to leave it all. Oh, nonsense. You shan't leave us. And without leaving behind as much as a little token of gratitude. Nothing but some space... The first person that comes along can fill that. And just suppose if if I were to ask you for... For what? For a great proof of your friendship. For a very, very great service. Would you, for once, make me so happy? Oh, but you don't know what it is. Then tell me. Don't you trust me? Oh, oh I do, Dr. Ronk. It, it's something you must help me prevent. You know how deeply, how really deeply Torval loves me. He wouldn't hesitate a moment to give his very life for me. Nora, do you think he's the only one? What, what do you mean? Who'd gladly give his life for you? Oh. I wanted to say it to you once, before I... before I go away. I'll never find a better moment. Well, I've told you. Now you know you can trust me as you can trust no one else. <laughs> Dr. Brown. Well? How could you be so... Why did you say that? It was all so nice before. Nora, oh, I can't tell you anything oh, now. You mustn't punish me, not that way. Let me help no, you, No, you can't do anything for me now. Besides, it's not... Oh, I, I really don't want any help. I, I have to leave now. Goodbye, Dr. Ron. Oh, I'm glad you've come home, ma'am. There's a man here to see you. Mr. Krogstad. Here? Ellen, where's Mr. Helmer? He's out, ma'am. Gone over to fetch Dr. Ronk. Oh. Mr. Krogstad's in the library, ma'am. Thank you, Ellen. What do you want here? I want some information, Mrs. Helmer. Be quick, then. What is it? You know, I've been dismissed. I couldn't prevent it, Mr. Krogstad. I fought and I stood up for you, but it wasn't any use. Oh. Is that all he cares for? Oh, please, you? you won't tell. Think of my children. Why should I? Did you and your husband think of mine? 
However, I've come to tell you that you needn't take this matter too seriously. I'm not going to use this information I've got. Not for the present, anyway. Oh, Mr. Cook, said I knew you wouldn't. In fact, no one need know. It can remain just between us three. Oh, no. My husband must never know. Why? Are you ready to pay off the balance? Well, no, not, not at the moment, but it won't be long before it's no. all paid in the... I'm going to hold on to that note. Why? What would you do with it? Just keep it, Mrs. Helmer. Don't worry. No one else will ever know anything about it. So that if you had any desperate scheme in mind, put it right out of your head. We all think such things at first. I did too, Mrs. Helmer. But I didn't have the courage. No, nor I. No. You wouldn't have the courage either. Would you, Mrs. Helmer? It would be very foolish. Very, very foolish. Now, I've written a letter to your husband. To my husband? Sparing you as much as possible. But he mustn't ever see it. Tear the letter up. I'll get the money somehow. I'm sorry, Mrs. Helmer, but I think I've told you I don't want it. Well, then what do you want? I'll tell you what I want. I want to regain my foothold in the world. I want to get back to where I belong. I want to rise. And your husband shall help me. Oh, he won't. He will. I know him, Mrs. Helmer. He won't dare put up a fight. And when he and I are together there, you'll see. Yes, within a year, I shall be his right-hand man. It won't be Torvald, Helmer. It'll be Niels Crooks that runs the bank. No. No? Who will stop me? Somebody who has the courage. Oh, you can't frighten me. A petted, pampered creature like you. Oh, you'll see. You'll see. Under the ice, perhaps? Down in the cold, black water? The next spring to come up again, ugly? Unrecognizable? <laughs> no, no. People don't do that sort of thing, Mrs. Helmer. And anyway, what will be the use of it? I've got your husband in my pocket, no matter what you do. Not after I'm gone. Not after... You forget. I... Your reputation is in my hands. You can think of that when you're planning to do something foolish. I'll drop this letter in the mailbox on my way out. No, please. I expect to hear from your husband very soon. I'm trying to get the mailbox open. But where's the key? I haven't one. Christina, look. There's a letter in there, and it's from Crokestad. Crokestad? Yes, and now Torval will know everything. Oh, believe me, dear. It will really be best for both oh, of you. Oh, but you don't understand. I forged a name. I forged Papa's name. No. Listen, Christina. You must witness. Witness? What is there to witness? If anything should happen, if I should go out of my mind, if, if anything should happen so that I wouldn't be here. Nora, you've, you've lost control of your If anyone thoughts. else should try to take the whole blame on himself, you are my witness that it was all my doing. No one else knew anything Nora. about it. Nora! Oh, I'm not out of my mind, Christina. I know what I'm saying. I did the whole thing. You will remember, won't you? Of course I'll remember, but I don't know what you mean. Oh, no. No, how could you? Because a very wonderful thing is going to happen. A miracle is going to come. A miracle? Yes, a very wonderful thing. But it's so terrible to Christina. Oh, it mustn't happen. Don't. Don't, dear. I, I shall go to Krogstad right now and talk to him. You? What can you do? In the old days, he, he would have done anything for me. Krogstad? I knew him very well. Nonsense. You must come tonight. No, I'd better not. Oh, listen. But everyone will it's Torvald, Dr. Rank. They're coming up the stairs. Torvald mustn't see Go inside. I'll try to find Crockett. Don't you give up hope, Nora. A miracle. It must happen. Oh, it must. Come in, Rank. And I still say you're quite mad. <laughs> Perhaps. Well, Nora. Home again? Yes. How do you do, Dr. Rank? Good evening, Nora. Oh, what's the matter with you, Nora? You're quite upset. Have you been practicing too hard? No, I haven't practiced at all yet. But you'll have to. Oh, yes, I must. I, I must practice a great deal. But, Torvald, I can't without you. I know I've forgotten everything. Oh, well, when you've worked on it, it'll come back to you. Sit down, Rank. Where are you going, Torvald? Uh, just have a look at the mailbox. Oh, no, no, don't. Don't do that. Oh, why not? Torvald, I'm sure there are no letters there. Well, just let me look Oh, at no, it. if you don't rehearse with me, I won't be able to dance tonight. What? You're really as nervous as all that oh, about it? Oh, terribly, Torvald. Let's rehearse now. There's time before dinner. 
Sit down and play for me, and you can direct me. You know the way you used to do. All right, all right. What a creature. Play, Torvald, play. Lower, lower. I can't do it any slower. Not so violent, Nora. But I must. Oh, Nora, that will never do. Oh, Torvald, please. I, I told you I needed to practice. Let me play for her. Perhaps we can do it slower. Oh, yes, please. Now, now look, Torvald, sit here, and then you can watch me. All right. Now try to calm yourself. Yes, darling, I will. How's this, Torvald? Is it better? Nora, Nora, there's no need to dance as though it were a matter of life and death. Right, stop. This is all out of control. Stop, I say. Nora, I don't see how you could have forgotten everything that way. But I told you I had. But, Torvald, you must practice with me right up to the last minute. Promise, Torvald. Well, certainly, if you wish. Well, you're to think of nothing but me. Not a letter, not a paper. You mustn't even look at the mailbox until after the party. Very well, my dear. But you seem so... so overwrought. Now, uh, let's all go in and we'll have dinner and... Uh, then we can practice again later. Thank you, Torvald. Come along, Rock. Thanks. Seven o'clock. Five hours until midnight. And the Tarantella will be over. Five hours to live. Nora! Nora, are you coming? Coming, Torvald! Station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Curtain falls on Act Two of A Doll's House. Before we hear Joan Crawford and Basil Rathbun in Act Three, we spend this brief intermission with another personality from backstage Hollywood, Francis Manson, chief story editor of Samuel Goldwyn Productions. Miss Manson came here from Columbia University, where she taught short story writing and advertising. Today, she's one of that highly important group who, seeking for good motion picture stories, wade through the vast mass of material turned out by the world's authors. And now, Miss Manson, what's your story? A complaint, Mr. DeMille. We've had a very definite lack of story material. If good stories were only half as plentiful around Hollywood as Lux soap, I'd be a lot happier. There's a cake of Lux in practically every dressing room in Hollywood, but there are only about ten good motion picture ideas in every 1,100 stories in spite of the fact that about half the letters that come to producers are from people claiming they have great ideas for film stories, we're still screaming for new material. Many of these unsolicited stories may be great, but every unknown writer who sends us one is certain of receiving it back promptly and unopened. Mm, we can't give them a chance because we can't take a chance. That's it. A lot of people think we're just waiting for the opportunity to steal their ideas. Obviously, that isn't true, and here's a typical example. We received a letter from a man who said, I have a great idea for Gary Cooper. Make him a cowboy in his next picture and let him fall in love with a society girl. Please send me a check for $1,000 immediately as I am going on my vacation next Tuesday. <laughs> I assume he went on his vacation without your assistance. Right. You, may, you know as well as I do, Mr. DeMille, that such a vague suggestion doesn't mean very much. An idea like that is so obvious that it had already occurred dozens of times to writers at the studio and hundreds of times to people outside the studio. As a matter of fact, in reference to this particular case, Mr. Goldwyn had already started work on a picture called The Lady and the Cowboy with Gary Cooper and Meryl Oberon. Imagine how embarrassing it would be if we read every manuscript we received. Without a doubt, a manuscript would be bound to contain an episode somewhere in it that might slightly resemble part of our movie script. And human nature being what it is, we would never convince the would-be author that we had not stolen his play and changed it around to suit ourselves. The safest plan for all concerned is the one we follow, namely not to open any manuscript which comes in unsolicited. This is the firmest rule in Hollywood. Then what outlets are open to the would-be screenwriter, Miss Manson? My advice is this. Prove your ability first, write for the magazines, for the book publishers, or the play producers, and we'll grab you without further delay. 
In other words, if you want to write for Hollywood, don't write for Hollywood until we ask you. Well, what do you think of the ones we've already asked? As a rule, the important screenwriters are quite as temperamental as actors. But at times you can't blame them because the producers they work for are temperamental too. Oh, heresy, Miss Manson. That requires explanation. I can recall one producer who summoned in his writers and said he wanted the scope of the story to be much bigger. This isn't big enough, he said. I want it to be great. I want it to be infinitesimal. And the producer was not Mr. Goldwyn. <laughs> then there's the producer who reluctantly agreed to read a certain writer's story. All right, he said, I'll read it with an open mind, but I may as well warn you, I think it's terrible. <laughs> but writers, in turn, are often something of a problem to producers. For instance, Robert Riskin has to write every line of a screenplay in longhand. S.K. Lauren has to go away and do his creating in a shack. Joe Swirling will spend weeks at wood carving and not write a single line, then suddenly appear, call for a dictaphone, and give forth a complete shooting script without having put a word down on paper. Still, in my opinion, the screenwriter is entitled to every bit of individuality he cares to assert. The fact remains that he delivers the goods and contributes what, to me, is the most important phase of pictures, the story. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Manson. Act Three of A Doll's House, starring Joan Crawford and Basil Rathbun with Sam Jaffe and Netta Harrigan. Later the same night, with Christina gone to use her influence with Krogstadt, Nora dances at the party. Faster and faster she whirls about the room, her cheeks two spots of crimson, her eyes burning, and then the tarantella ends. Nora! Nora, come here. Oh, Tom, did I dance well? You were magnificent, my dear. You remembered everything I told you. <laughs> come now. We must go home. Oh, no. Not yet, darling. Just a little longer. But it's late, Nora. And you're tired. Yes. Yes, I am tired. Come along, dear. We'll say good night. So slowly, Nora. Let me help you. I'm even more tired than I thought. There we are. You see, I was perfectly right not to let you stay any longer. Yes, darling. Everything you do is right. Torvald, what are you doing? I want to clear out the mailbox. It's so late, Torvald. Won't tomorrow do? Look at all the letters that have collected. Why? What's this? What? Dr. Rank's visiting card. It was right on top. He must have just put it in tonight. I wonder what this means. What is it? This black cross over his name. What a ghastly idea. You'd think he was announcing his own death. He is. What? How do you know? Has he told you something? That card is his farewell. He's going to shut himself up alone and die. Oh, poor old Runk. Of course, I knew we couldn't hope to keep him long, but so soon. And to go off alone, like a wounded animal. When one goes, it's best to go silently, don't you think? I just can't realize that he's gone. He'd grown into our lives so. Oh, well, perhaps it's for the best, at least for him. And for us, too, because now we have to depend entirely on each other. Go in, dear. Oh, it's a relief to be home again. Come here, Nora, you enchanting creature. Carver, don't, please. Why not? Oh, I know what it is. You have the tarantella still in your blood. And it makes you all the more tempting. Read your letters, Torva. Oh, but a moment ago, you asked me to wait. Oh, my darling, I... I can't hold you close enough. You know, I wish sometimes that you were in some great trouble so that I could do something really marvelous for you, risk my body and soul, everything. Please, you must read your letters, Torva. <laughs> what an insistent creature. Very well. Let me see. Hmm. This is strange. A letter from Krogstad. I wonder if he's going to ask... What's this? Nora, do you know what's in this letter? Yes. He says that, that you're a forger. That you forged your father's name. Is it true? I loved you, Tova. Answer me! Is it true? It was all because I loved you. Stop saying that! Yes, it's true. You fool! What have you done? Torval, you're not going to take this on yourself. You're not to try to save oh, me. Oh, don't be melodramatic. Do you understand what you've done? Yes. You've ruined my future. 
Do you know that? You've put me in the hands of a scoundrel. From now on, he can do whatever he likes with me. Demand what he chooses. Domineer over me as much as he likes, and I... I must submit to everything. When I'm out of the world, you'll be free. Out of the world? Oh, this is no time for fine phrases. What good would it do if you were out of the world? He blabbed the story just the same, and people might even suspect me of having been a part of it. Did you ever stop to think of that? They'd say that I was at the bottom of it, that I'd egged you on. And it's you I have to thank for all this. You, whom I've petted and spoiled all our married life. Now do you understand what you've done to me? Yes. I... I just can't believe it. I... I've got to keep him quiet somehow. That's it. People simply mustn't find out that there's anything at all out of the way. Well, we'll, uh, we'll make things look as though uh, nothing had happened between us and... Uh... Oh, what can that be at this hour? What is it? A letter for you, sir. Mr. Krogstad asked me to deliver it. Krogstad, give it here. Oh, what more can he do to me now? Torvald, Be I... quiet! Why? What? Look. It's a promissory note. It's your note. He's returned it. I, I don't understand. What does, he, what does he say? Returning your wife's note. I regret my actions in this matter. Mrs. Linden has convinced me that... Oh, Nora! Nora, thank God! I'm saved! I'm saved! And I? You too, yes, of course, darling. We're saved, Nora. It's all over. I'm... It's finished. I'll, I'll tear it up. I, I won't even look at it. The whole thing shall just disappear like a dream. Oh, Nora, Nora, these must have been terrible days for you. Yes, they have been. Yes, I see now. You did it because you loved me. It was just that you, well, you, you went about it in the wrong way, dear. You, you didn't have the experience to know how. But the next time you see, dearest, you, you must come to me. You do realize that, don't you? Nora, Nora, you're not going to remember the things I said, are you? Why, why the whole world seemed to be falling to pieces around me. It's all going to be forgotten. I forgive you. Thank you for your forgiveness, Torval. Thank you. Is that all you have to say to me? Why, why do you look at me so strangely? Now, uh, dear, you'd, uh, you'd better go and get some sleep. I shall not sleep tonight. But it's late. It's not so late. Sit down, Torval. Nora, what do you mean? Your face is so cold and set. Sit down, Torval. Nora, you frighten me. I don't understand you. That's just it. You don't understand me. And I've never understood you until tonight. What do you mean? Doesn't one thing strike you as strange as we sit here? Nora, what are you talking about? We've been married eight years. Doesn't it occur to you that this is the first time we two have talked together seriously? Oh, my dear child. What have you to do with serious things? I've had a great injustice done me, Torvald. First by my father and then by you. By my... By your father and me? Yes. When I was at home, father used to tell me all his opinions... And I always agreed with him. <clears throat> he used to call me his doll child and play with me, just the way I played with my dolls. And then I came to live in your house. Oh, what a way to talk about our well, marriage. Well, I mean, I changed hands from his to yours. And I heard your opinions and agreed with them, or pretended to. Nora. I've been living here like a beggar, by performing tricks for you. But that's the way you would have it. You and my father are responsible. It's your fault my life has come to nothing. Uh, Nora, haven't you been happy here? No. Only Mary. You've always been kind to me, but our house has been nothing but a nursery. I've been your doll wife, just as I used to be father's doll child. And in the same way, my children have been my dolls. That's what our marriage has been, Torvald. Well, well, perhaps there is some truth in what you say. But, Nora, from now on, it will be different. Yes, very different. I'm leaving you, Torval. What are you saying? I can't stay with you. You've lost your mind. I won't allow it. I'll spend the night with Christina, and tomorrow I'm going home. You mean that you propose to leave your home, your husband, and your children? And have you considered what people will say? I don't care what they say. From now on, I must think things out for myself. Oh, you talk like a child. Desert your home, you can't. These things are your duty, your sacred no, duty. I have other duties equally sacred. Name them. My duties toward myself. Before all else, I'm a human being, just as much as you are. And if I'm not, then I must try to become one. Nora, Nora, you're ill. I almost think that you're out of your senses. I've never felt so clear or so certain. Clear and certain enough to forsake your husband and children? Yes. Oh, then there's only one possible explanation. You don't love me anymore. Yes, that's just it. Nora... 
I'm sorry, but I can't help it. I don't love you anymore. You're clear and certain of that, too? Yes. And can you explain to me at what moment you, uh, you cease to love me? Yes, I can. It was this evening when the miracle that I expected to happen didn't happen. It was then I saw that you were not the man I'd imagined. I don't understand you. For eight years now, I've been waiting for a certain wonderful thing to happen. To happen between you and me. And I've been waiting patiently because I, I know that really wonderful things can't happen every day. And when I saw that this, this catastrophe was hanging over me, I said to myself, it's coming. The miracle is coming. When was this? Toval, when Crookstead's letter was lying in the box... It never occurred to me that you'd think for a minute of submitting to that man's conditions. I was certain that you'd say to him, All right, tell everybody, publish it to the whole world. And I was certain that after that... After that what? When I'd covered my wife's name with shame and disgrace? Oh, then I was sure you'd come forward and take the whole thing on yourself. You'd say, I'm the guilty one. I? But not. Oh, I'd never have accepted such a sacrifice. Of, of course not. But what would my word have been against yours? That was the miracle I hoped for and dreaded. And to prevent that, I, I wanted to die. Nora, I would gladly work day and night for you. I'd bear any sorrows and want. But no man sacrifices his honor, even for the woman he loves. Millions of women have done it. Oh, you talk like a child. You think like a child. When you got over being frightened, not for me, but for yourself, and you knew there was nothing more to fear, then it was as if nothing had happened. I was your doll again, and you would take twice as much care of it in the future because I was so weak and fragile. Torvald, it burst on me in that moment that I'd been married for eight years to a man I hardly knew. But you're, you're still my wife now and always. Torvald, when a wife leaves her husband's house, as I'm doing, I've heard that in the eyes of the law he's free from all duties to her. At all events, I release you from all duties to me. Here's your ring. Give me mine. Here are the keys. Tomorrow when I've left town, Christina will come and pack up the things I've brought from home. I'll have them sent after me. Is everything over? Nora, will you never think of me again? Torvald, I shall often think of you and the children and this house. May I... May I write to you, Nora? No, never. You must... But I must send you... No, I say... Can I never be anything more than a stranger to you? Perhaps, someday. Oh, Torval, for that, the miracle would have to happen. What's that? Both of us would have to change so that... Oh, but I no longer believe in miracles. Perhaps I do. Tell me, Nora. So changed that, that our marriage would be real, with a real love to hold us together. Goodbye. Nora, wait. Goodbye, Torval. Nora! A miracle. Perhaps someday. Yes, that miracle will happen. It's got to happen. And so we take our leave of Ibsen's play. A little later, Melville Ruick brings you the important announcement mentioned earlier tonight. But now, we meet the two principal tenants of a doll's house, Joan Crawford and Basil Rathbun. Basil, you're such a scoundrel in pictures, so persistently. How did it feel to take off the whiskers and play a less villainous role? Well, C.B., getting into a doll's house was like getting out of a dog's house. Uh, I've played villains on the screen so long that every time the steam radiators hiss at my house, I take a bow. <laughs> But what's particularly interesting to me is that I've never been a villain on the air. I've often wondered, Basil, what type of letters the fans write to you men who put the menace in the movies. Oh, I get a lot of letters, Joan. <laughs> the only trouble is that they all seem to have the same idea. They just hope that someday I'll get the thrashing I deserve. <laughs> <laughs> but the more disliked you are by the audience, the better the producers like you. Well, that's comforting anyway. Um, I've been perforated by swords so many times, I now train on a bed of nails. Rather sad, don't you think? I never know just how to save my skin from lunging heroes. Did you ever try uh, Lux Soap? <laughs> Nine out of ten stars protect their skin with it. <laughs> yes, but, but Lux Soap makes me look so completely lovely, John. I'd soon be out of work. 
Yes. I'd get to look like you, and that would... Oh, I mean... Oh, all... that's all right, Basil. I understand. And until I want to look like your partner in crime, I'm going to continue using Lux Soap, because I don't think there's anything nicer for a lovely complexion. And now, having disposed of Basil's problem, Mr. DeMille, my sincere thanks for bringing that doll's house to the air and allowing me to play Nora. And my appreciation, too, to Mr. Rathbone and to Mr. Jaffe, who made a special trip from New York to be here. And to Miss Netta Harrigan, Mr. Steele, and all the others in our cast. Thank you, and good night. Thank you, Joan. Good night, C.B. Good night, Joan. Good night, Basil. There's another real treat in store for you next Monday night. In a moment, our producer, Mr. DeMille, will be back to tell you all about it. But while we are waiting, I want to tell you about our offer of a compact for the ladies. The response to this offer last week has been overwhelming, and it is repeated tonight so that no one need lose out. If you have not already sent for your genuine Van Style double compact, by all means do so tomorrow. Or if you have obtained one and want one or two more for a gift or for a bridge prize, you may have it now. It's difficult for a man to describe this compact and do it justice. All I can say is that it's swell. Perhaps I could help you describe it. Oh, would you please? Just tell the ladies in our audience how this compact appeals to you. Well, this is really the sort of compact every woman wants. Thin and lightweight, a delicate horseshoe shape of graceful design, curved in the front and square at the back. And, of course, there's no advertising on it. The top is finished as an in-gold effect and set in gleaming black enamel. The bottom, richly tooled in a harmonizing pattern. It will remind you of a piece of fine old antique jewelry, and it's just as smart as it can be. The black and gold color combination makes it harmonize with any costume. It's a double compact with two compartments, one for loose powder and the other already filled with a cake of fine neutral shade rouge. And it's so easy to get rouge refills to match your own complexion. The clear, gleaming mirror is the full size of the cover. In many stores, this type of compact usually sells for a dollar. Well, thank you very much, but this compact does not cost our listeners a dollar. For the time being, our Lux Toilet Soap friends can get it for three Lux Toilet Soap wrappers and only 25 cents in coin. Send for yours at once. Now, let me repeat that. You need only three Lux Toilet Soap wrappers and 25 cents in coin. Hold the coin into the wrappers and enclose in an envelope with a slip of paper on which your name and address is printed clearly. Don't send stamps. Address Lux Toilet Soap. Box number one, New York City. Your compact will be mailed to you promptly. This offer is good only in the United States. So, buy three cakes of Lux Toilet Soap tomorrow. Send three wrappers and only 25 cents in coin folded into them, together with a slip of paper with your name and address printed clearly, to Lux Toilet Soap, box number one, New York City. This offer is good only in the United States. Mr. DeMille. From the stern drama of a doll's house, we turn next Monday night to the gay romance of Columbia's highly successful comedy, Theodora Goes Wild. Starring in the title role will be the same delightful comedian whom you saw in the picture, Irene Dunn. And co-starred with Miss Dunn, the seasoned sensational comedy find, one of the most versatile stars in Hollywood, Cary Grant. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Irene Dunn and Cary Grant in Theodora Goes Wild. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. Our cast tonight included Celeste Rush as Ellen, John Russell as Ivar Helmer, Jackie Horner as Emmy Helmer, Frank Nelson as a messenger, and Eleanor Mitchell as Via. Louis Silvers appeared through courtesy of 20th Century Fox Studios, where he directed music for Joseph. Your announcer has been Melville Ruick. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.
Good evening. This is Peter Tobin introducing... Lux Radio Theatre. Tonight and every Monday night at this time, Lux Radio Theatre presents for your entertainment the finest in radio drama. This week we bring you A Well-Dressed Man by Frederick Raphael. When John Joseph Jenks was charged with murder, he pleaded as an alibi that he was drinking with a well-dressed man about five feet nine inches tall who answered to the name of Phil. A plea that was to lift Phil Mallard from out of his obscurity as a dispenser for a, for a suburban chemist into the limelight as chief witness for the defense at the Old Bailey. It was to do more. It was to bring together shy, lonely Phil Mallard, whose only real contact with his fellow human beings was a chess-playing opponent in Australia, whom he had never seen, and self-confessed gangster, tough, brutal John Jenks, in a situation that builds up to a horrifying climax. Frederick Raphael lives up to his worldwide reputation as novelist and film scenario writer with the brilliance of his character portrayals and his ability to create a climax that will astonish you despite its seeming inevitability. Listen in a few moments to A Well-Dressed Man, adapted and produced for Lux Radio Theatre by Michael Silver. Wherever... Now, Act One of tonight's Lux Radio Theatre presentation, A Well-Dressed Man. Here's your prescription already made up, Mrs. Lewis. Oh, thank you. I see you've got a new radio set. <laughs> yes, one of these new kind of transistors. Uh, here. The solicitors acting for John Joseph Jenks are particularly anxious to contact a man Jenks says he met in a public house in Putney on the evening of the murder. The man was well-dressed, about five feet nine inches tall, and is said to answer to the name of Phil. Yes, nothing but murders and murder trials. Uh, well, good day to you, Mrs. Louise. Good day. Oh, excuse me. Good morning, Mr. Levin. Good morning. I feel I'm a couple of minutes late. There was a queue outside the football ground. I had some difficulty in getting through. One gets punched about. Well, you don't look as if you've suffered any damage. Oh, no, no, not at all. Forgive me asking, Mr. Leyburn, but was there any post by any chance? Have you been applying for jobs again? It isn't that. I mean, I, I shouldn't like you to think Mr. that I would... Mallard, how many times have we been over this ground during the last, what, uh, ten years? It isn't a reflection of... I know, Mr. Mallard, I know. I quite appreciate your motives. I've often felt much the same myself. One doesn't enjoy being in a backwater. No, one doesn't. But quite frankly, wouldn't you do better to reconcile yourself? Reconcile myself? No one is going to take up the references of a not very young dispenser working for a not very successful branch of a not very famous firm of suburban chemists. Now, really, are they? Mr. Mallard, wouldn't it be... Wiser, I speak now as one who has been your colleague for a period of years. Would it not be wiser to accept the situation and not waste your threatenses on stamped addressed envelopes which never get used? You don't think I'm the man they're after? Frankly, no. I don't think you're the man they're after. The thing is, I... You feel that you're wasting yourself. I know, Mr. Mallard. I always... I had a picture of yourself discovering a cure for some rare disease and receiving the homage of a grateful nation. We all, all did, Mr. Mallard. Saving someone's life and basking forever in the sunshine of his gratitude. Where... Most of us driven to take up our careers with the idea of performing some magnificent service to others, and we stay in them because by the time we discover what drudgery they are, we're too set to move. There wasn't any post, I take it. 
there was not. Morning, Mr. Lebo. Huh? Oh, good morning. Packhurst, Paris Cosmetic Preparations. Uh, How are things? Well, uh, I thought I'd just give you a look in. We've got our new skin enhancer, the one we're having the big success with. The one with even spread dispensing actions. <laughs> you haven't... Uh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, excuse me, I... I just... Uh, your newspaper caught my oh, eye. Keep I guess... it, keep oh, no, it. Please, no. no, do have it. I've done with it, please. Oh, oh thank you. It was just that... <laughs> Well-dressed man, that business. <laughs> don't believe in him, do you? If the police arrest someone, they've generally got the reason. You don't often get the police making a mistake. Now, two sizes of these come in. The five and nine tube and ten and three the handy can with the luxury diffuser. Yeah, well-dressed man. <laughs> Obvious red heading. He might turn up. You never know. You think so? Uh, looking for something, Mr. Mallard? No, no, no. Oh, smell it a mile off. The red heading, I mean. Smell it a mile off. Well, I'll take uh, six and six. That's uh, six big and six small. Six and six. Very much obliged to you, Mr. Lebo. They always have some sort of red heading, the defence does. They're their job, though, isn't it? It doesn't exist, you can be sure of that. Well-dressed man. <laughs> Answers to the name of Phil. Could be anyone. Well, I... I, I must say. depart. Good morning to you, Mr. Lebo, and many thanks. Hey, next Friday, Friday week, if that's the meaning. Oh, yes, yes, indeed. Yes? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Can I help you? Don't you recognize me, Vivian? Philip! Oh, good gracious me, no, I did not at first. Well, how are you? I'm all right. Are you going to come in? Thank you. Uh, I wondered if well, you might... We are expecting people in a little while, but... I just wanted a, a word with Basil, if I might. I, I'm sorry if it's a bad time. Oh, well, it's always a bad time these days, I'm afraid. Life's one long rush. People, people, and more people. If it isn't American editors, it's local flower shows. You can imagine. Yes. Well, um, I'll go and see if Basil's about yet. Thank you. That's about it, I think. Uh, uh, the usual piece about inquiries for stamped addressed envelopes, Brigade. Oh. Sorry to disturb you, darling. Uh, Only uh, Philip's here. Philip? Your brother. Philip? <laughs> What's he want? Well, he didn't say. He wants to see you. That's all. Uh, I suppose someone must have died or something. Oh, dear. Oh, well. Olive, call Dennis Bob. Tell him I'd love to lunch on Friday. Oh, and get hold of that man from Vacation Magazine. Tell him I'm on for the Chateau country and how many words do you want and when. Oh, and uh, call the Maison Provençale. Tell them I want a table for eight for tomorrow and make sure they know who we are. I don't want limp game, chips and empire cough mixture at 22 and a head, all right? Yes, Mr. Mallard. <sighs> Philip. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh, Philip, my dear old boy, this is a surprise. <laughs> I'm sorry, I seem to have come at a bad moment. Well, you weren't now. Oh, what have you got there? Oh, only this... <laughs> it's your scrapbook, I was... Uh, uh, oh, one of our scrapbooks, have you? Silly, really, keeping all that nonsense. <laughs> Very impressive. Well, it's a living. Well, you're looking at as proofs as ever, Philip. Uh, how are things? Still the same. Time you found yourself a wife. I shan't ever do that, I don't suppose. Not now. Well, um, I'm going back upstairs to finish getting ready. Do excuse me, Philip, will you? Yeah, of course. It was nice to see you again. Oh, lovely to see you. Oh, um, Basil, the caterer, will be here in half an hour, darling. He knows where everything is if you let him in. I will. You've done more for her than I ever could have. Oh, I don't know. Oh, yes. She's not like the girl I used to know, not now. <laughs> it all changed. You've been very successful. We've worked hard, you know. Oh, yes, I know. You always did. Mother always had faith in you. Said you'd be someone. Oh, one has to take one's opportunities. I was lucky, at all. Well, it uh, has been a long time, hmm? Yes. We haven't met since the funeral. Mother's. Poor Mum. No, no, we have. Never fault you on a date, eh, Philip? No. You're still in Hilton, eh? I am. Oh, this is a nice place. Nice enough, terribly cramped, of course. Luckily, we get about a good deal, or we should feel like birds in a gilded cage, all dressed up and nowhere to stretch out. Hmm? Yes. 
I gather you're abroad a good deal. Well, we have to be. Needs must when the bank manager drives. <laughs> uh, well, Philip, uh, is there something? I mean, what can I... I want your advice. Problem? Yes, sir. I have rather... Well? No, I'm in rather a quandary. Quandary? What kind? Need money? No, no, I... no. It's just that I... I rather think I'm the missing Phil. The missing Phil? The man they're looking for. You mean you've done something? Haven't you seen the paper? It's been all over the paper uh, about this murder. Murder? They're looking for a man, a man called Phil. Oh, no one's ever called you Phil, have they? Uh, yes. Uh, and unless I come forward, they'll hang him. Looks as if they'll... Hang him, uh, unless I... Hang who? Uh, this man, Jenks, they've accused of the hammer murder. Unless I tell them he was with me. With you? Yes. You see how important I may be? Uh, how important? You say you were with him. Where was this? In the pub in Putney. Sometimes I go out. I, I go out to pubs, it's allowed. And you met this chap they want to hang? Yes, I, I think I did. Strange company for you, Philip. A man like that. You're positive. I'm not like you, Basil. I didn't have your advantages. I didn't go to university. I, I don't have famous friends. I, I take my company where I can find it. <sighs> so why exactly have you come here, Philip? To get your reaction. Well, to what exactly? My problem, of course. What should I do? I must do it, mustn't I? Come forward. I mean... Uh, I, I don't want to, heaven knows, but... Uh, You'll get the most appalling amount of publicity. Exactly. Newspapers, interviews, all that sort of thing. But I can't see you enjoying the experience. It's enough to unnerve the strongest of us. But if I'm the only person who can save him, the only person who can help him, surely... I dare I... say they'll come down on us like a ton of vultures as well. The very fact that I've even got a brother at all will be enough to start the gossip boys sharpening their poison arrows. The police seem pretty sure he did it. They are. That's why They I... must have their reasons. Well, I only think of you, Philip. The important thing is not to look foolish. I mean, if you were to come forward and then be proved mistaken, we should all... Well, you'd be made a fool of, that's all, and we should all regret it. Tell me, since when do people call you Phil? I never called you Phil, nor did Mother. My other friend does. The one I play chess with in Australia. Well, the one you... We play chess by correspondence. He calls me Phil. That's what started it. Well, I... Uh, I don't really feel I've been much help. The thing is, I might be very important. Yes. I can see that. Well, perhaps you should go and see somebody... Somebody connected with the case. Have a word with them. Yes. Well, thank you, Basil. Sorry if I've disturbed you. Not at all. Not at all. The prisoner knew, and you may think was in an excellent position for knowing, that Mr. Hammond was in possession of substantial sums each Friday night when the takings from the garage which he owned and where Jakes had sought employment were put in a safe to be taken to the bank on the Saturday. Jakes in the view of the prosecution, returned to his place of work, knowing Hammond would be there, and still up behind him, intending to strike him down and take the money. Hammond suspected something, turned and resisted, and was then callously struck repeated and terrible blows on the head, as a result of which he shortly died. Jinks took the money and went on his way. He was not seen again until he was arrested in Belfast. There, he claimed first that his name was O'Shea, and afterwards that though he was Jinx, he knew nothing of the murder and had simply decided to leave the garage. Later still, he said he knew of the murder and said he feared he would be charged with it. Now, we have heard of an alibi. The defense claims, as claim it clearly must have any hope of success, that Jinx was elsewhere on the night of the murder. Just what this story adds up to, or whether indeed it will be continued with at all, uh, we shall see presently. Meanwhile, I shall, with my Lord's permission, call the first witness. Alfred Dean Ali. I said they wouldn't find him, didn't I? And for why? Because there isn't such a bloke. 
He'll swing, all right. Oh, uh, maybe, maybe. Oh, well, no question. Now, they tell me, how to get on with the two towns? Do well, did they? Uh, clearing slowly. They'll come back for more, that I can promise you. A dozen? Half. Uh, make it half. Half this week, fair enough. I'll bet you the other half dozen, Jinx is in the condemned cell come Wednesday next. Fair enough. <laughs> Central 0181. I think I can help you. My name's Phil Mallard. That's right, Phil. Now, will you tell the jury and my lord in your own words what you did that evening? I got home from work about half past six. Then after supper, as it was a fine evening, I decided to go out. I walked for a while, and then I caught a bus. Eventually, I found myself by the river, and I walked along from Putney Bridge towards, well, towards Richmond, that direction. I went into a pub after a while because I felt thirsty. It was quite warm. I ordered my drink. It was a shandy, actually, with lemonade. They hadn't any ginger. And I sat down and... There was a small table on the terrace. I, I sat there. We were watching some scholars. We? Uh, uh, the people out there. The river was very calm. One of the scholars had, had been exerting himself more than most, and he dived into the river. We all laughed. And that's where we began to talk. He and I. I used to scull myself at one time. He said he was keen on sport, too. We had some more to drink. Socially, as it were, and we talked. Reminisced, you might say. We went on talking till the pub closed, and then we walked to the bus stop, and I caught my bus. And you're sure that that was the man with whom you spent the evening? Positive. Yes. You've uh, left it pretty late in the day, Mr. Mallard. Well, haven't you left it pretty late in the day? I suppose so. You suppose so? Why did you not come forward before? I was... I, I was afraid to. Uh, I was afraid to. Well, of what were you afraid? I don't know. Notoriety? Notoriety? Being asked a lot of questions. Ah, well, I'm afraid your fears in that respect were more than justified. I shall indeed be asking you a lot of questions. Now, you say you are absolutely convinced, without the remotest possibility of doubt, that that was the man with whom you spent the evening of the 3rd of August last. I am. Had you ever met him before? Never. Have you ever met him since? I have not. Mr. Mallard, have you seen photographs of the accused in your newspaper at all? Yes, I have done. Ah, you have done. On how many occasions? Couple of so. You've seen photographs of the accused more often than you've seen the accused himself. That's true. Only one I... thing at a time, Mr. Mallard, if you don't mind. Now, let us go back to this famous evening. What made you go to Putney that evening? You live some distance from that place. Why did you go there? I was born there. I sometimes go back. To see people? Relatives? No, I just go there. I don't know anyone. A sentimental journey, if you like. Now, you see, you sat on the terrace. It was quite shady under there, I dare say. Oh, yes, it was shady. Yes, and you were looking out at the bright river, uh, the reflection of the setting sun. Uh, quite dazzling, I dare say. I don't think so. What did you talk about? Birds was one thing. Birds, did you? <laughs> what sort of birds? Uh, I like to feed them. I, I put crumbs on my sill. He likes birds, too. Oh, indeed. And what sort of birds does he like? He flew pigeons at one time. Where did you read about that? Nowhere. Do you swear you never read that Jinx was a pigeon fancier? I shouldn't be surprised. I, 
shouldn't be surprised. I, I, I may have. Afterwards, since, I mean. Mr. Mallard, how many times have you visited Putney during the last year? A few. A few. Three times? Thirteen times? Thirty times? Five or six times. Ah, five or six times. Can you give us the dates? Dates? Dates, that's right, dates. The dates on which you made these sentimental journeys. Uh, I don't know. Last year I, I went once in October, I think it was. Uh, again in November and Christmas time. I want the dates, the exact dates, Mr. Mallard. What day in October? Well, I'm not sure if it was October. It, it might have been the last week in September or, or the first in November. Or oh, the second in July, perhaps. No, no, I, I, I you don't... You don't know, do you, Mr. Mallard? Well, I can't swear. You can't swear, quite so. You can't swear. But you have sworn. You have sworn, Mr. Mallard. You've sworn that it was August the 3rd that you visited Putney and saw the accused in the dim light of a public house terrace and found the experience and the date so unforgettable that you have not the tiniest doubt about them. Yet you can give us no other date, Mr. Mallard? Uh, truthfully, can you stand there and tell us you have no doubt about it having been the 3rd of August? Really? Oh, yes. You see... Thank you, Mr. Mallard. It was my birthday, you see. I don't forget my birthday. <laughs> Philip, Philip, Philip. Paper's full of him. If he goes on this rate, they'll be holding over my column to make room for pictures of him. Oh, grisly notion. Ah. I had lunch with Dennis about this TV series, and all they could do was talk about Philip. He'll make us famous yet. Making such a fool of himself. And us. Needless to say, and us. Do you know, one of the people at lunch actually wanted to meet him. Meet him? What for? They thought he sounded interesting. Oh. Interesting. Philip. Well, uh, Basil, do you, do you think he's going to get that man oh, off? Oh, I don't know. If he's telling the truth, well, after all, why should he make it up? Philip, of all people, why should he? You may well think that Mr. Mallard is the most important person in this case. No one could occupy a more crucial position than he does. For if you believe his evidence, the whole case for the prosecution must fall to the ground. Jenks, even if he were equipped with the fastest motor car, could not possibly have been with Mr. Mallard and committed the murder. You've heard ample evidence on that score. Many things are possible, but one cannot be in Putney and in Hornsey at the same time. Either Mr. Mallard has wrongly identified the accused, or the accused must be acquitted. You've seen Mr. Mallard, and you must come to your own conclusions. Does he seem the kind of man who would claim notoriety? Is he the kind likely to suffer from hallucination or self-delusion? Is he the victim of a simple mistake? Or again, is he telling the truth? You may well ask yourself what possible motive he'd have in fabricating the story he has told us. Mr. Mallard is the only person who can claim to have seen the accused at the time of the murder. The evidence against Jenks is, you may think, very strong, but it's also very circumstantial. Against it, you must place the evidence of Mr. Mallard. It's as simple as members of the jury and as difficult as that. I can give no direction to you on this matter. It is you and you alone who must decide. Members of the jury, are you agreed on your verdict? We are. Do you find the prisoner guilty or not guilty of the crime with which he is charged? We find... We find him not guilty. 
Lord. And is that the verdict of you all? It is. I order that the accused, John Joseph Jakes, be discharged for the witness. Well, Inspector, there it is. I'll never believe he didn't do it. No. No, there's nothing we can do now. No, true. What about this man, Mallard? What do you make of it? Cracked. Must have been. It didn't seem cracked. Well, let's hope we manage to pin something on Jenks before he goes and does it again. Uh, well, that's your business, to ask. That's right. Yes? Hello, friend. Mr. Jenks, I... I Mind if I come in? No. But, yes, do. You'll find the place in a bit of a muddle, I'm afraid. Well, I must say, I never thought you'd do what you did. I, I never expected it. Quite a turn-up, really, that was, you coming forward. I like two spoons full of that coffee, if you don't mind. Oh, yes, certainly. I, I had to. I had to. I, I could never have borne it if they'd found you guilty and if they'd... Hang me? <laughs> they would have, too, you bet. Should have seen O'Dwyer's face when I come out of court. <laughs> Should have seen his face, O'Dwyer. What? The inspector on the case. Livid. Livid. Oh. Uh, there you are. Yes, sir. Well, I had to come and thank you. I mean, uh, in the circus, it was the least I could do, wasn't it? Very nice of you. Very nice of you, come to that. It's nothing. Nothing? Save me blooming neck, no fooling. No, I had to express my gratitude to you, didn't I? I mean, saving the life of a complete stranger like that. I mean, that deserves gratitude, that does, doesn't it? It, it was a pleasure. Pleasure, was it? Oh, that's nice. You, uh, live alone then, here, do you? Yes, yes, I do. Mm, very interesting, that is. Yeah, very interesting. All alone, do you? That's right. Wife dead, then, is she? No, I never had a wife. Don't worry, I've missed anything. Very interesting, though, that is. Never had a wife. You, uh, not like them? She married someone else. Did she? Oh, I see. Never had the urge since then, haven't you? No. Coffee all right? If you want some more sugar... Yeah, do with a spot, thanks. Oh. Yeah, sweet tooth me. <laughs> well, well. All alone, are you? Nice place you've got. All the amenities, very nice. It's simple, but... Yeah, simple. You should see some of the places I've kept in. <laughs> Luxurious, this is. No, I, I never realised you had a place like this. Never intruded, if I'd known. It's perfectly all right. No, I, I mean that night in the pub when we was watching the river and all that. I'd never have intruded myself if I'd known what sort of bloke you were. I had to come and thank you, give you my gratitude, didn't I? It's very nice of you. I'm glad you came. Lonely air, I dare say. Hey, all by yourself. Never been married. Well, well. Your birthday, was it? On the... The 3rd of August. That's your birthday, is it? Yeah, 3rd of August. How old are you, then? 45. Are you really? 45, eh? That's very interesting, that is. Got any biscuits, have you? Biscuits? I could do with something to eat, matter of fact. Oh, I see. Makes you pickish being tried for murder, it does. Nervous tension, think it must be, yes. Hanging about, you know. Yes. I've got some digestives and some cheese, if you'd like it. Well, that'll do. Yeah, you should have seen O'Dwyer's face. Funny people, coppers off. Never let you off the hook. You know that? Oh, I don't suppose you would, respectable bloke like you, but they never let you off the hook. I've cut the ride off. Furious, furious. Yeah. <laughs> It's like old times, this is, eh? You and me, eh? Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, go round to my digs, the place I used to live you. You'll find one of them there. One of them? You'll find a copper hanging round the door, waiting, hoping I'll do something else. Very interesting, that is, about coppers. One-track mines. What will you do now? Do? Now the case is over. Where will you go? Well, I don't know. I, I hadn't thought. Hmm. Nice place you've got here. There's not really too much room. They don't know me around here. That's the thing. The busies don't know me. I'm not known. I can leave me own life. I can't go back to Ormsey. They land me. Certain to. One track mind. That's why I thought I'll look that bloke up. Really? See if he can help me. 
No, no, I think it's very luxurious. I, I mean, you've got all the meannesses, haven't you? <laughs> Fancy you remembering me. That's what gets me. Really recognised my face, did you? Yes, of course. Amazing, that is. Uh, what's your racket, then? What do you do for a living? I work in a chemist. Oh, chemist, you. Very interesting. Big one? Reasonable one. Not large. Reasonable size? That's right. Yes. I have to be at work quite early in the morning. I have to get to bed quite early, otherwise... I can't do my work. Incapacitated, quiet, quiet. <laughs> don't mind me. I mean, if you want a kip, don't mind me. Whenever you want to, I mean, just, you know. Uh, hey. Play chess, do you? If you don't mind. Or something wrong? Uh, no, don't touch those chess pieces, if you don't mind. Oh, I beg your pardon. I do apologise. Important, then, that is, is it? It's an unfinished game. Well, why don't you finish it? My opponent's in Australia. Ah, why? Well, he lives there. He sends me his moves, and I send him mine. Oh, I see. Couldn't you find no one nearer, then? I don't happen to have done so. Ah. I suppose... What? You're not a chess player. No. no I used to play solo, but not anymore. In Australia, is he? Right, Stu? Yes. We managed to exchange moves once a fortnight. Do you really? Very interesting, that is. Once a fortnight, do you? Sometimes less, sometimes more. Oh, I know. Do you really? You're cracked, aren't you? I'm sorry? Cracked. Nutcase, aren't you? I, I think perhaps... Bonked, aren't you? It'd be better if you... <laughs> Playing chess with a bloke in Australia. Popping up out of the blue at the Bailey. I it was know. nice of you to come round, and now, if you don't mind, I'm going to bet. I'm not stopping you. I'd be very glad if... Would you care to come round again, have some coffee? I mean, you really deserve to be locked up, you do, don't you? Playing chess with a bloke in Australia. Fantastic, that is. I mean, just imagine if old muckface had got that out of you. Would I be wrong in thinking that you played chess with a man in Australia? I mean, all he had to do was ask you a question like that and I'd be playing drafts for the death watch, I mean. Straight. You're a pretty rum bloke, you are. Think so? Did run. Oh, never mind, never mind. This is a nice place, I must say. All the amenities, haven't you? I mean, you must come again. Short of company, then, are you? Lonely. It can be. Just think of being in the condemned cell, like. I should think that is lonely and all. Yes. People around you all the time there, though. Lonely. I suppose it would be. I mean, watching you. Horrible, that must be. Quite. Nerve wracking, that must be, I should think. Well, you got me out of that all right then, friend, didn't you? I mean, you looked after me, didn't you? Saw me all right then, didn't you? Oh, it was nothing. No, uh, no, I suppose not. Got your name in the papers? Yes. Both of us did. Both of us did, you're right there. You got something there all right? Famous we are. It's all over now. For them it is, but not for us. I mean, we're a, we're a famous pair, you and I. I mean, you've got your cuttings, haven't you? Got your scrapbook there, I see. Been pasting some new ones in, I see. Oh, stupid, I, I ought to get rid of them. It, it was stupid of me. No, no, no. I differ there. No, I don't think so. A man's entitled to his cuttings. That's an old story, that is. I got mine all right. Oh. <laughs> there we are. Got mine here all there. Got more than you, do. Naturally. Naturally, as you say. I mean, you didn't come in till late, did you? Sitting on the terrace watching the river, did you? No. Oh, that's a nice scrapbook, that is. How much that set you back then? Sixteen and six. Sixteen and six, did it really? Get me one, can you? Well, you can get one. Why well, don't I like to show me face? They're on sale in the stationers. It's the busies I'm worried about. As soon as they know where I am, I shan't be able to call me life me own. Like being under the death watch it'd be, promise you. One track mine. Next time you come, I'll have one for you. You see? They never give you a second chance, the busies don't. Get their tabs on you, you might as well take a running jump in the Grand Union Canal, I mean. I can't show me face, that's the truth. You know what I mean, don't you, Fred? Well, yes. No, I, I mean, this is a lovely place, this is you. Nice place you got here, I mean. If I can lie low here for a bit, all the amenities, haven't you? <laughs> well, I, I can get a second chance, like. Lie low? Look, you got me into this. I? You get me off, didn't you? Don't deny that, do you? If it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be on the loose, would I? But you can go anywhere. 
you were acquitted. You can go anywhere. You should have seen Dwyer then. Uh, livid, furious he was. Uh, I, I gotta be someone out of arm's way. I mean, you got me into this, didn't you? Meeting me in the pub, like you said. I mean, it's your fault I'm here. It's not anyone else's fault, is it? You're, you're welcome to stay tonight if, if you want to. I've got no choice. No alternative, friend. I mean, that's straight. I'll be perfectly straight with you over this. If you don't mind the sofa. Oh, not tonight, no, no. That'd do very nicely. I'm surprised you don't have a spare bed, though, for visitors. People who come to stay. I'm prepared, ain't you? I don't know people. No? You can have a rug and a pillow, if you like. Make yourself comfortable on the sofa. Yeah. All right? That looks very cosy. Very homey, that does. I'm afraid it's rather makeshift. Makeshift? Educated, are you, aren't you? Educated bloke. I went to school. I went to school. I didn't go to university. My brother... Educated bloke thought you were. There yeah, we are. I go to work about 8.15 and I have to catch my bus. Right, oh, right you are, 8.15. I have to be out of here. I'm with you. Well, I'll leave you. OK, Phil. Good night, Phil. <laughs> you are now listening to Drive, the hungry detergent. Only Drive, the new kind of washing powder, has Ensolve, the professional stain remover. That's why Drive, with Ensolve, eats stains like baby food, tomato sauce, egg, chocolate. Yet it's so gentle with fabric, so kind to colours. Just soak overnight in new Drive and stains vanish. Then wash in new Drive for astounding results. New Drive Eat Stains gets your whole wash so clean it's spotless. Now available throughout the Transvaal. It's here, new Dual. Yes, Dual is the new floor cleaner that really deserves to be called revolutionary. Because Dual actually cleans and polishes your floors all in one go. Dual is an entirely new floor cleaner that has its own built-in floor polish as well. Dual saves you hours of work. With Dual, you get all your washable floors spotlessly clean. And you get a magnificent, hard, non-slip, dirt-resisting shine. All in one go. And the more you clean with Dual, the more brilliantly your floors shine. Get new Dual right away. It's the revolutionary new floor cleaner that cleans and polishes all in one go. Remember, it's Dual. D-U-A-L. Dual. <laughs> Basil Mallard. Oh, Mr. Mallard, sorry to disturb you. Uh, my news editor asked me to get hold of you. I, I hope it's not a bad moment. Oh, not at all. What can I do for you? Well, we were just wondering if you were having a celebration at all this evening. Celebration? Uh, that is the Mr. Mallard, isn't it, speaking? <laughs> I hope so. Uh, the Mr. Mallard who gave evidence in the trial. No, that's my brother. Oh. Oh, I beg your pardon. I'm so sorry. I asked them to get me... <laughs> they must have got me the wrong one. Uh, would you have your brother's number at all? No, I'm afraid not. Jenks? Mm -hmm. Mr. Jenks! Mm -hmm. It's breakfast, Mr. Jenks! Mm -hmm. hey, what is hey. Oh, how is you? Never jog me, Phil. That's a jog. I don't like to be jogged. Breakfast is ready. Breakfast, is it? Oh, you woke me up. I was dreaming. You woke me up. We've got to be out of here in a quarter of an hour. We have to be out of here? I can't go out on the street half past eight in the morning. What would I do at half past eight in the morning, out on the street? Well, aren't you going to look for work? Hey, think they wouldn't get on my tail, the coppers? Think they wouldn't? Oh, I wouldn't have a chance. Nah, best thing I can do is lay up for a week or two. We well, could go and look for something suitable somewhere. Hopeless, hopeless. I told you, friend, I go out of that door and down into the street. And where am I? Hilston High Street, north side. I'm in trouble right away. I told you, I don't know how many times they'll hound me. 
Now, give us a break. What do you want to do? Stop here a day or two. Pals, aren't we, Phil? Hey, you and me. I'm your best friend, I am, remember? The sun on the water and all that, remember? We're pals. You don't want to let a pal down, do you? No, but... Of course you don't. Not made like that, are you? What am I, Phil? I, I don't... What am I? I? Who am I? John Joseph Jinks. And I'm an innocent man, aren't I? Yes, sir. Yes, I... yes, exactly so. Now, you got me into this and I came round here to express my gratitude, right? Yes, I, I'm very grateful. Then show how grateful you are, Fred, and help me out for a day or two. Okay. I must go to work. I shall be late. You never want to be late. You want to be punctual. That's good, that is, punctuality is. That's a virtue. Are you run along. Now, please, don't... What? Don't touch this. Move anything. Any of the chessmen. Right, oh, if you say so, right you are. Oh, by the way, uh, might bring some smokes when you get back tonight. I'm right there. Haven't got any, have you? No, I don't smoke. Sensible bloke. Don't forget, will you? And the scrapbook, Fred. <laughs> Cheers. Inspector Dwyer here, Doyle. Any sign of Master Jenks? I see. Has he indeed? In my experience, people don't vanish, Doyle. I want tabs on him. Now let me know as soon as you hear anything. He must be somewhere. He can't have vanished into thin air. <laughs> Don't. Oh, sorry. Bang too hard, will you? Oh, don't worry. I can handle an hammer. I was just putting a couple of nails in this picture. <laughs> you and me coming out of the Bailey. Good, isn't it? I thought we should put it up. Memento. Got the book, have you? The scrapbook? I managed to get this. Ah. Oh. Flimsy, isn't it? Flimsy, that is. Unsubstantial. Well, it was all they had. All they had. Go on. The shops were closing. It wasn't proper stationers. All they had. You want to watch it? It was a general store's on the corner. On that corner. You want to watch it? You telling the truth, are you? I couldn't get anything else. I have to do. Have to do? What do you mean? See about the baked beans. That's right. Only one they had. I don't believe you. Both tins. Well, I got hungry. I was hungry. You had no business to eat both of tins. You're changing the subject you are, aren't you? You're not telling the truth, are you? What? About the scrapbook. You're not, are you? It's the only one they had. If you and me are going to be friends, if we're going to stay friends, you're going to have to learn to tell the truth, I mean. I can't stand fibs. You're a liar, aren't you? If you can't be polite, oh. well, you just have to... No, I mean, you're, you're what they call a liar. I mean, a real liar, aren't you? Please don't... I mean to say, you're a case, aren't you? What they call a case, you are. Bonked, I mean, aren't you? No, straight. If you've had supper... I... I'll tell you something, if you like. Yes? I've had an offer. Offer? That's right. Bloke I made in a pub made me an offer. What are you trying to I'm do? I'm not kidding you. He did. What's for supper then? You ate both tins of baked beans, both. Well, it was parky like, you know. You'll have to have cornflakes. That's breakfast food, really, isn't it? Cornflakes. That's all there is. All right, then. Only what did we have for breakfast? Toast. He did. Made me an offer. Why do you tell lies? It was the only one they had. I can't trust you, Phil. That's the truth. I can't trust you. You can't believe a word you say. It's awkward, that is. I mean, I've got no basis of trust. A thousand quid straight, a thousand pounds. This bloke offered me. What for? My story. After the trial, this was. After you sprung me like. Then, in a pub afterwards, a thousand quid. Why did you refuse? I didn't. I said I'd think about it. Consider it. Said I would. I've got his number, you know, for when I decide. What story exactly? Not every day a bloke gives up a thousand quid. Sunday paper. Doesn't happen every day. I mean, a chance like that to have my own column like. Sort of thing you dream about, isn't it? Having your own column. I saw a picture once. Bloke had his own column. My brother. What's that? Hey, what's he done? My brother has his own column in a newspaper. Does he really? Oh, it's very interesting, that is. Make a lot of money then, does he? Got a nice ass and all that business? Oh, yes, indeed. All the amenities plus. It's very elegant. That's a word. Luxurious, am I right? Yes. He's done very well. He's got everything. 
travels a lot and everything. I like to see the house where he lives, your brother. Elegant, I expect to. Away a lot. A thousand quid I could have made. That's a lot of money, isn't it? Your brother make that much for his articles? I don't know. Well known, is he? Quite. Well known as Godfrey Wynn? I don't know. I dare say. Very interesting, that is. Well known as Godfrey Wynn. No, I'd like to see the house. I think they've moved from from where they were. I fancy they've moved. You find the address, Phil, eh? I don't know that I believe you about them moving. I don't know if I can trust you. Terrible thing, you know, living with someone you can't trust. <laughs> Five years you could get. Oh, uh, Inspector Dyer. Oh, certainly. Uh, Mr. Mallard isn't here at the moment, I'm afraid. He uh, stepped out for something. But I'll tell him you called. Oh, yes, I quite understand. Perfectly all right. I'm sorry, but you have to leave here. Yeah? No, don't start. Maybe the police. What about the police? What have they been up to? Here, uh, have you... I haven't done anything. Only they called at the shop this morning while I work. They wanted me to call them up. I haven't yet, but... You're not uttering threats. Uttering threats? Threatening me. You're not, are you? They're suspicious, that's all. You tell them where I... I, I haven't spoken to them at all yet. I, I was out getting some supplies. I, I wasn't in. Well, that's all right then, isn't it? If they didn't talk to you. Well, from what Mr. Laban told me, they were very suspicious. There's been a break-in and they're suspicious. Break-in? The tobacconist store bashed in. Oh, yeah. Two nights ago. You don't say. Mm. Want a fag? No, I don't, thanks. Got some cash, you said, have you? I'll give you money. Yes, cash. I've got a bit. Haven't made a note of the numbers or anything, have you? Haven't been educated about it or anything? Here we are. They're all odd ones. I, ah. I haven't even looked at them. Here. This is all on the up and up, I suppose. I mean, knowing what a liar you are, I wouldn't put it past you to be putting the wind up me. I mean, ones isn't much use these days now. I don't suppose your brother even uses ones, not nowadays. Fivers or nothing. I expect he's got drawers full, eh? Small change once is are to a bloke like your brother. Keeps all his money in the bank. Never has any in the house. I promise you. Found the address of it? There's nothing there, I tell you. It... You must get out of here. Why was it? You can get down to the bus station very easily. You, you could be in Manchester tonight. What do I want to be in Manchester for? What am I supposed to do in Manchester? A new life couldn't I have in Manchester? Yes. Got a suitcase? A suitcase? Under your bed? Oh, yes. Honey pyjamas. I'll give you a pair. Suspicious, Dwyer, was he? Well... I thought you didn't speak to him. I was going to say... Mr. Laban said... Uh, he had a toothbrush. He must have a toothbrush. He sounded... Uh, uh, Business-like. Uh, would do. That's why I thought he might come round, might call. This isn't a trick of yours, is it? One of your lies. No, no. He won't tell him when you would have gone. He won't even know you've been here. Get the case. Come on. Come on. <laughs> Thanks, Fred. Good luck. Turn right, right at the bottom, and you're at the terminal. I'll say cheerio, then. Cheerio. Looks like it's too late. I'd better get back into the bedroom. Only watch it. So much as one word and I'll be... I'll be on you. Mr. Mallard, may I have a word, Inspector Dwyer? Of course. Come in. I hope I haven't come at a bad moment. What can I do for you? Have you seen anything of your friend, Jenks, at all? Jenks? No, no, nothing. Why? Has he been in some sort of trouble? No, no. We've rather lost touch with Master Jenks, that's all. He must be keeping out of arm's way somewhere. What about this robbery at the tobacconist? I suppose you were thinking... Was I? Jenks? No, no, I don't think so. No one was coshed. For one thing, he makes Abbott a violence, Jenks does. Does he? Hmm. As long as he keeps his nose clean, we can't touch him. Only I'd like to know where he is. 
Goodbye, Mr. Malad. <laughs> You're a clever little lying swine, aren't you? Why I hadn't got a clue. Even when you tried to tip him off, he hadn't got a clue. Can't trust you an inch, can I? You're a shocker, you are, you know, shocker. Nearly had me in Manchester, didn't you? Shocking. Clever, I must say. Tricky. Educated, I must say, the way you've done it. Now, what about your brother's address, eh, your brother? Has there been any post today? Post? Letters. Expecting a letter, are you? Yes. Oh, yes, from Australia. Yes, has it come? Where is it? Steady, steady. Uh, and where is it? I want it. What have you done with it? I picked it up. You didn't want it trampled on, did you? Walked on, did you? Uh, please give it to me. Well, come on, give it to me! Watch it, watch uh, it! Uh, oh. Don't start oh. roughhousing with me, son. Don't start uh, roughhousing, uh, I wouldn't. Oh, I want my letter! Yes! Uh, uh, yes! You! You killed him! You killed him! Murderer! You're a murderer! You killed that man! That's what you did to kill Shut him! Shut up! Ah. Oh! You killed him! I told you to shut up now, shut up. Why did I? Why did you? I don't know, why did you? Because I, because I thought. Give the needle a shove. I thought you needed someone. I thought it was someone you needed them and they failed you. I don't know. Remember where they went to? The chessmen did? Of course. You are bumped straight. See what I mean, don't you? I could get a thousand quid any time I wanted, just like that. Stop messing about with them things, will you? Always messing about! Hey, you're a full-time liar, really, aren't you? I mean, that's really what you are. Terrible thing, that is, to be a liar. Shocking, that is. Please, may I have my letter? After you've made the copy. It's strong tonight. Hello. You've got a new jar for the sugar, haven't you? Haven't seen that before. Oh. Oh, yes. I have. Help yourself. Aren't you having none, sugar? Aren't you having none? No. I won't, actually. Not tonight. Good out. Hey, there we are. Nice and sweet. Way I like things. You killed him, didn't you? Don't start, Phil. Don't start. You're not going to have my brother's address, not as long as you live. Oh, we'll see about that. In due course, we'll see. Not as long as you live. So you had it all the time, did you? I mean, you was lying, saying you didn't have it. Telling an untruth, wasn't you? Not to be trusted, are you? Not trustworthy, I mean, are you? Not to be trusted. Come here. Not as long as you live. Come here. Uh, no! Uh, <laughs> Inspector Dwyer. What? Dead. I see. Yes. Yes, I'll be right over. Stay there. I'll be right over. I was afraid of something like this. Well? Body's over there, Inspector. Well, well. So much for John Joseph Jenks. How did it happen, Mr. Mallard? I couldn't stand it any longer. I realized... I realized what he'd done. I mean, the murder. I realized. Yes, yes, yes. But how did Jenks come to take poison? How did you... This particular poison has a molecular structure not dissimilar to sugar. He helped himself. I offered him the jar and he helped himself. It, it took effect quite rapidly. More or less painlessly. You see, I, I don't take sugar myself. Very lucky. You lied, didn't you? About being within the night Almond was killed? Yes. Yes, I did. I'm afraid I did. I thought there really was a fill, you see. Uh, who wouldn't or, or daren't, couldn't. I, 
I couldn't bear to think of anyone being hanged because someone wouldn't help him, so I helped him instead. I see. I only wish you'd called me before you killed him, not after. I knew that pub, that area. It could have been me so easily. I knew the area. Well, we'd better be off. Of course. Wonder if I might just post this on the way. It's to a friend of mine in Australia. Nothing about all this. I'm afraid I shall have to have a look at it. Now. Oh. Well, what's this mean? Why it resigns? Not a code, is it? No, it, it's just about, you know, our game of chess. I don't suppose I shall be able to go on with it now. No, I, I suppose not. I suppose this will make you quite famous, won't it? Important. I mean, after all, I'm a murderer, aren't I? Tonight's presentation of A Well-Dressed Man by Frederick Raphael. You heard John Hayter as Philip, Gabriel Bayman as Jenks, and Hugh Rouse as Basil. Sheila Holliday played the part of Vivian, and others in the cast were Donald Monat, Bill Brewer, John Whiteley, Stuart Brown, and Derek Royal. A Well-Dressed Man was adapted and produced for Lux Radio Theatre by Michael Silver. Next week, Lux Radio Theatre will celebrate its 1,000th performance and for this very special occasion takes pleasure in presenting four internationally known stars of stage and screen who are at present visiting South Africa. Richard Todd, Jean Kent, Vanessa Lee and Peter Graves in Canaries Sometimes Sing, a delightful comedy by Frederick Lonsdale. Canaries Sometimes Sing has been produced for Lux Radio Theatre's 1,000th anniversary by Anne Freed and directed by Henry Diffenthal. So until next Monday night at 8.30, this is your Lux Radio Theatre host, Peter Tobin, bidding you all good night. Enjoy brighter radio listening with Blaupunkt Radiogram's automatic pre-select tuning. Clock radio time, right time, exactly half past eight. Good evening. This is Peter Tobin introducing... Lux Radio Theatre. Tonight and every Monday night at this time, Lux Radio Theatre presents, for your entertainment, the finest in radio drama. Tonight we present Non-Stop to Victoria by Glenn Hamilton. It tells the tale of a young woman travelling alone on a fast train from Brighton to London and of her strange and unexpected companion in a first-class compartment, a prosaic backdrop to a bizarre and terrifying situation. Listen in a few moments to Non-Stop to Victoria, produced for Lux Radio Theatre by Victor Mackerson and directed by David Manley. Ursula Andress walks in, even a crowded Hollywood restaurant falls silent. She's been called the most beautiful girl in the world. And I happen to know that she cares for that marvelous complexion, 
with Lux Beauty Soap. Yes, Lux always. I love Lux because it's so mild and pure and gentle. It's the mildest soap I know, and I just adore such perfume. Ursula Andress, a famous star with a fabulous complexion. Why not do as she does and care for your complexion with Lux? You love Lux. Look, Mom, no filling. Lucky boy. But then your mother sees that you brush regularly with new Pepsodent, the toothpaste of which a leading dental authority says, brushing with new Pepsodent removes the biggest cause of tooth decay, the dangerous dulling film. So make sure you and your family brush regularly with new Pepsodent and help keep your teeth white, healthy, and free from decay. Then you'll know the happy feeling of hearing your child say, Look, Mom, no filling. For you and your family, new Pepsodent safeguards against decay. And now, Act One of tonight's Lux Radio Theatre presentation, Non-Stop to Victoria. Hurry along there, hurry along please, Non-Stop to Victoria. Hurry along, close them doors please, close them doors. Right! Oh, oh I'm sorry, is this the London train? Yeah, of course it is, Non-Stop Victoria. Leaving right now. Oh, wait, please. Oh, dear, I'll read it up then. You've got, you got half a second. First door you come to, hop in. Oh. Can't expect the London, Brighton and South Coast Railway to wait all night for one person, you know. Oh, I, I, I'm so sorry. I had such trouble in getting here. Ah, well, you're here now. And you'll still be here half an hour from now, waiting for another train if you don't hop it right smartly. I'm going to blow me whistle right now and that's it. I, I'm sorry. Thank you. I, I won't be a moment. Better not be, miss. Right, George! <laughs> Forgive me of bursting in like that on you. If you hadn't, in all likelihood, you'd have missed the train. I, I hope you don't mind. Not at all. Do sit down. The train's starting to sway already. You can't be comfortable standing there like that. Thank you. Oh, what's that? Paper pasted on the window just by my seat. This Apartment reserved from Brighton to Victoria. Train 908 non stop. And the date, today's date. Oh, oh my goodness. Uh, sir, th this compartment is reserved for you. Uh, yes. Yes, it is. Oh, and I, and I burst in upon your privacy, and after you've paid extra for it and everything... Oh, please, please, you mustn't think of it. It's no aggravation for me. I would change to another seat in another compartment at the next station, only... The next see... station will be Victoria, the end of the line. This is, after all, a non-stop train. Yes, you're right. Therefore, we must make the best of the situation, mustn't we? However, I, I repeat, I'm in no way put out by your, uh... Uh, intrusion? On the contrary, I rather welcome it. I, I really don't want to interrupt you or, or interfere or anything like that. I assure you, you don't and won't. There's no reason at all why we can't pass a pleasant hour together now that we're here, as it were, uh, compelled to each other's company, is there? Well, no. We can talk or be silent or anything you like. I'm not much of a conversationalist, I'm afraid. Splendid! I've enough chatter and anecdote for the pair of us. I'm an unquenchable enthusiast and egotist. It shall be my pleasure to entertain you, Ben. To cater to your whim and your wish. To fill your mind with visions of wine and peacocks, gold moidores, and the afternoon wind that churns dust devils upon the arid faces of eastern deserts. Is the thought not stimulating? <sighs> it's settled, Ben. It's settled, it's settled. The hour shall pass like the wind, even as our famous train rushes through the night. She goes well, too. Look here, through my window. We've already passed Preston Park Station. And there are the village lights of Patcham winking down there below the rails. Whoops! <laughs> Suddenly they're blotted out. Well, what's that? A greater darkness. A greater roar from the iron wheels, beating back from wet brick walls. Do you know this line well? Not 
too well. I've traveled back and forth from London to Brighton on occasion. <laughs> <laughs> I know every inch of it, my dear. Every inch. I must have traveled this line a hundred times. Perhaps a thousand. Yes. <laughs> that must have been very, very pleasant for you. Every sleeper. Every wheel click in the rail joints. Every rumble of crossover points. Every station with its flare of lemon gaslight racing past in the bright darkness. <laughs> I always travel on the non-stop at night. The sound and the motion excite me, thrill me. I love to see the rush through the length of the station. The blur of hunched, disappointed faces huddled into chilled, coated shoulders, facing the interminable wait until the signals turn green once more and the humble, apologetic stopping train chops in, shame-faced pick them up, <laughs> while I rush triumphant through the dark. It's exhilarating. Must be. You have a liking for speed? I have a liking for many things. Speed is but one of them. But I confess I do enjoy this 50-mile stretch of the railway. And I know it intimately, right down to its most humble fish plate. Yes. Ah, there you are, you see. You must be a perfectionist, sir. <laughs> I don't even know what a fish plate is. And every nut, every bolt, every ballast stone upon this right of way, all have their history. Did you know that? I'm sure they do have, but <laughs> I didn't know it. Did you know that even now we're rapidly approaching a place of great history and tragedy upon the London, Brighton and South Coast permanent way? Did you? Did you hear that rattle of the wheels just now? Feel the whole train sway slightly? I did notice something. Why? Those were the crossover points one mile south of the Clayton Tunnel. Those points were the key to the greatest tragedy this railway company has ever known. What happened? There. There, did you see that flicker of light going by out there in the darkness? Yes. Well, that's where it all began. There, in the signal box, lost in the chalk gloom down here in the great pike and cutting. That's where. Where or what began? What are you speaking of? Thirteen years ago it was. The winter of 1887, one of those cold, wet, miserable nights when the southwest gales beating up the channel drive the rain in sheets across the downs. And down there, alone in that signal box, warmed by his coke stove, surfeited with strong tea and kippers from his old blackened frying pan, lulled into drowsiness by the mesmeric beat of the rain upon the slate roof. One man. Just one man. What happened to him? Was he murdered? <laughs> murdered? He? <laughs> now, why of all things would you ask me that? No, no. No, nothing happened to him. Nothing at all. Then what is the point of all this. Picture it. Picture it in your mind if you can. Fifteen minutes before, a locomotive coming up from Brighton had been sent onto the down line from London. He had performed this deed upon receipt of orders from Brighton over the telegraph. The worthy signalman did as he was bidden and returned to his skipper. The locomotive steamed through the tunnel and into hassocks a few minutes later, where it was shunted immediately off the down line and into the siding, where it went peacefully about the task of putting together its little local goods train. What is the point of all this? What are you trying to tell me? <laughs> My dear, a story worth telling is worth telling well, is it not? And I have a great head for details. I should like you to hear them all. Do I have your attention? Yes. <laughs> I'm so glad. Our worthy signalman, picture him under the gaslight, engrossed with a kipper and an enamel mug of tea. And in the dimness, at one end of his signal box... Oh, stop it, stop! But why, dear, why? You're going to tell me something awful, I know it. Something terrible was going to happen. <laughs> no, my dear. The terrible thing had already happened. What do you mean? There, in the dimness, beyond his immediate range of vision, 
The great steel lever with which the signalman had opened the points so that the locomotive could change onto the down line for its brief journey lay open where the man had left it. He forgot about it entirely. What happened? Hard upon the heels of the locomotive came a night goods train to London Bridge. It rattled by the signal box, came to the points, and was shunted onto the down line. There was, even at that moment, rushing through Hassocks towards Brighton, a late express from Victoria, a non-stop running upon the down line. Oh. Suddenly, for some reason he never subsequently explained, the signalman rushed to the lever, saw the position it was in, and stood in helpless horror, glaring up the line through the tearing night rain. He stood poised upon toes in horror and heard the awful tearing smash a mile and a half away as the two trains met head on in the cold, sooty darkness. Oh, how awful. It's unbelievable. But true. Oh, there were very few survivors of the Clayton Tunnel disaster. A few badly shaken passengers and the guards from the rear of both trains. I see what you meant earlier about the line having a history. But such tragedy. Well, at least, touch wood, there shall be no recurrence of it this night on this train. Oh, I hope not. Rest assured, in the relating of the story, we've long since passed through Clayton Tunnel. <laughs> the train is going famously, is it not? Very fast, yes. And was I not right? The time, too, with stimulating conversation, rushes past as if upon gilded wings. Your description seems a little elaborate, but true. There was an interesting sequel to the Clayton Tunnel disaster that moved it, for myself at least, into the realm of bizarre coincidence. Really? What was it? Quite unwittingly, I became tied, connected, as it were, to the circumstances of the collision. How extraordinary. Would it be polite to inquire? Of course it would. I hoped you'd ask me that. <laughs> it's far more than polite. It's most acceptable that you should ask. I'm, I'm so glad. <laughs> I was a lad, just 15 at the time of the accident, living happily with my parents upon our estate in Hampshire. And when the accident occurred, there was among the passengers on the down train a man by the name of Burgess Felsham. You know, there's something quite familiar about that name. What could it be? I think in a few moments, if you'll give me time to complete my story, you'll recognize the name more readily. Oh, please go on. <laughs> Thank you. I shall. Felsham was nearing the end of a fairly lengthy train journey that had brought him from Lincolnshire across London and was carrying him to Brighton. Within eight miles of the completion of his rail journey from the eastern counties, Burgess Felsham was killed instantly when the two trains collided in Clayton Tunnel. <sighs> Oh, man, how, how horrible for him. <laughs> yes, yes, not a few people were saddened and put out by Tolsham's untimely demise. Not the least of whom were those who waited for him upon the arrivals platform at Brighton. His family, his friends. Oh, yes, I can imagine how ghastly they must have felt about it. Actually, no. Among his family and his considerable circle of friends, there was a feeling almost akin to relief when the news emerged. Whatever do you mean? How can you say that? And the people waiting for Burgess Felsham at Brighton Station were considerably shocked and put out by the news. Although Felsham, in truth, could count no friend nor relative among them. Why? Who, who were they? The Brighton police, my dear. A particularly large detachment. The police? <sighs> Whatever for? <laughs> they were waiting for good old Burgess, you see. <laughs> waiting to take him in charge, arrest him, <laughs> stick him in the nick, is the expression used, I believe. What had he done? Uh, nothing small, my dear. No, not by any means. <laughs> nothing less than murder. Murder? And not on a small scale either. Several of them. Many of them, in fact. <sighs> oh, yes. The police were keen to get hold of Felsham. They'd been on his tail for some time. Oh, Burgess knew it, too. That's why he was leaving the country so hastily. <laughs> yes. Ah, uh, Burgess Felsham had been slipshod. Very naughty in his ways. And really, he deserved to be caught. But the last laugh was his. 
<laughs> By the strange series of events that led up to the Clayton Tunnel disaster, he slipped out of the net once and for all. Rather drastically, perhaps, but certainly beyond redemption. Better for him, really. Better, I should imagine, to suffer one's demise thus, rather than kicking at the end of a length of stout English hemp. But it's horrible. What kind of murders did he do? Young girls. He used to strangle them. <laughs> That's all. That's all? <laughs> what can one say, really? Burgess Felchin was mad. Complete and incurable maniac. His madness drove him to murder. But, but he should have been detained in an asylum, being No, oh, yes, he was, yes, several times in appropriate institutions. <laughs> But in due course, he was always released, apparently cured. Once free, it was never long before he returned to his old ways. How can you treat it so lightly? The whole affair is horrible, to say nothing of pitiable. And yet to hear you speak of it, it sounds as if you're amused by it. <laughs> well, I must admit, I always admired old Burgess, dotty as he was. He was a decent old stick when he wasn't off about his funny ways. And he was always most kind to me. So when he dodged the police so well, and so finally, I confess I did find it rather amusing. Come to think of it, I still do. You knew this man? Oh, yes. Very well. How well did you know? Best possible circumstances. Burgess Falsham was my cousin. As a matter of fact, of all the members of our family alive today, he and I could be said to be the most alike in every way. What are you saying? <laughs> I always admired the old boy. As a child, unconsciously, I used to imitate him in every way possible. And since shortly after his death, you might say I've more or less taken up where he left off. Who is? And done very well at it, too. Well, I've been copped a few times, of course. But a little treatment at a very good private sanatorium in Brighton has always seemed to set matters right. As a matter of fact, I'm in the process right now of returning from one of these remedial periods. You mean you... you killed people? Oh, yes. Several. That's why I was so pleased when you got in here tonight. Oh, surely, surely you don't mean to kill me? That was Balkham we just passed through. Twenty minutes from Brighton. I say, this is a good train, isn't it? Running right on the nose. <laughs> Another forty minutes to Victoria. Splendid. What did you just ask me, my dear? I asked you if you mean to... Kill me. <laughs> I must admit the idea has been passing back and forth through my mind. And with each pass, it grows more attractive in prospect. Yes, my dear, I think I shall. <gasps> Somewhere between here and Victoria, I think, if you don't mind. I shall strangle you. Mrs. X and Mrs. Y are the women in this case. Mrs. X, you are alleged to clean your sink and no more. Well, I... I Do you kill germs? I, I'm not sure. Is I... your sink hygienically clean? Well, maybe it is. I... Precisely. Mrs. Y, you use Vim 99? Yes, I do. You get your sink sparkling clean and kill 99% of household germs? That's correct. You see, only Vim 99 contains powerful germ-killing microbands. So Vim 99 gets your sink, pots and pans, bath and stove hygienically clean. 99% germ-free? Correct. Ladies of the jury, what is your verdict? By Vim 99.
What is a mother? A mother is a friend, a comforter, and a tucker in of shirt tails. She's the one who makes the meals, downs the socks, and tells the bedtime story. When it comes to looking after her family, that's when a mother's care really shows. When she chooses new Radeon with Sunflex, because she knows new Radeon has the miracle of Sunflex to keep on whitening to the end of the wash. It makes the care a mother takes worthwhile. New Radeon with Sunflex washes whiter, and it shows. I'm also a Felsham. Graham Felsham. Possibly you wouldn't know of me under that particular name. Felsham, I, I do know that name, I do. I'm sure you do. You're really joking with me, aren't you? Nothing more? It's just a horrible joke. You wouldn't really kill me. You know, my dear, as I look at you now, I almost wish that I was joking with you. It really does seem a shame, doesn't it? Then why do it? Because I must. But why? Why? Well, you see, it's just something that happens to me. I'm quite dotty, you know. <laughs> it's been acknowledged by some of the best men in that field in the land. <laughs> it's what you call a compulsion of sorts. Yes, that's it. I, I have a compulsion to kill. And, and really, I can't control oh, it. But you could. You can. I, I've been watching you, listening to you. You have very good control of yourself. Actually, it may seem that way. But under this apparently calm exterior, I positively see. It's your neck, you see. My neck? Yes, that's it, your neck. It's unfortunate. If you were some revolting wizened harridan, or one of those pale, gross young creatures that one sees so sickeningly often, it would be easy to spurn you with the contempt that you would deserve. Notwithstanding my slightly irregular background, I'm a very particular man. You must understand that. It's important. I, I can't understand you. This is awful. It, it must be a dream. I'm afraid not. Let me tell you about your neck. Have you no idea what it's like? How glorious it is. Can you not imagine the attraction? The fatal attraction it would have for a man like you? No. No, I can't. Oh, stop it. I beg you, please. Please. You stop. hold your head proudly. This is cruel. It is. Oh, God, you stop. Unfortunately, no. That's the one thing I can't do. Oh, but please, please, let me tell you about your neck. So sad, really, that there's been no chance for an evaluation of its exquisite beauty until now, when it's almost too late. Or perhaps there has been a previous evaluation of it. There's been none before, ever. Splendid, my dear, splendid. It is fitting under the circumstances that it should fall to me, then, to be the one to do the job. <laughs> oh, I say, that was thoughtless of me. What an insensitive thing to say. Do the job, indeed. Oh, how you must feel the blow of that. Just now, suddenly, I see that you're insane. Either insane or a very good actor. An extraordinary actor. Somehow, the latter is too much to expect. <laughs> Hope should spring eternal, I am told. No. Suddenly, I have this feeling that you're not joking about this. There's the strangest feeling moving in me. What is that? One almost of disassociation. As if really I'm not here. And it doesn't matter very much. You feel that, eh? Hmm, it's bizarre. It would not have occurred to me that a mind so attacked could have responded in such a manner. You're depressed, my dear. That's it. Depressed by the prospect. Yes, I suppose I am. Can you blame me? 
<laughs> a very fair question, to which I can only answer, not really. You're facing a violent death in a matter of minutes, or even of seconds from now, depending upon my whim and choosing. Yet you react in this... this strange manner. How have the others reacted? Oh, in a variety of ways. But yours is the least expected and the most bizarre behavior of all. I wonder if your mood will endure until the ultimate moment. We'll have to see, won't we? You describe the others. There have been many. Very many. But <laughs> not yet, it seems, enough. You are depressed, aren't you? <laughs> Perhaps it would cheer you up if I went on talking about your lovely neck. After all, a woman and her vanity. Is it not true? Go on with your cruelty. You must. But it's not cruelty. Indeed, no. I mean genuinely what I say about your beauty. And in particular that of your neck. It's white, columnia and graceful. Simple, proud, rather long. Don't do that! <gasps> I saw the way you looked. The way you looked at the alarm cord. You were going to spring at it, weren't you? You were going to pull it. Stop the train. Try to evade the fate I've chosen for you in that way. I wasn't. I, I Don't lie to me! Uh, You're going to give the alarm! <laughs> but it wouldn't help you. Not at all. If I stopped the train, you wouldn't dare to touch me. <laughs> you think not, my dear? Then you're an imbecile, do you hear me? Pull that alarm cord. <laughs> You'll be doing me a service. Can't you see that? <laughs> How can you believe that? Have you considered the speed at which our train is rushing through the night? Look, look already, we're past Hawley. We're close to Red Hill. There are only the tunnels through the North Downs to be passed, and we'll be on the very threshold of London. Now, have you taken into account, in view of the speed, just how long it will take to actually stop the train if you pull that cord? No, but... Even with the finest brakes in the world, it takes time to stop hundreds of tons of steel and wood like this. <laughs> Quite enough time for me to administer the coup de grace to you and to escape into the night once the train has come to a halt. What would be the point of your escape? You would soon be captured. Perhaps, perhaps not. Although we're close to London, we're not far from the coast. My chances of escape to France would be very good, with the element of time and surprise on my side. Your cousin thought that as well, you tell me. But they were waiting for him at Brighton. And still he escaped. He died. He escaped, I tell you! He eluded them! Anyway, my dear, do you think I fear death? I, who have dealt in death so long? I wonder if you think in that way when they take you out into the prison guard to hang you. They do hang for the crime of murder in England, you know. I am well aware of it. But they won't hang me. I'm a certified lunatic. You told me that Burgess Selsham was mad too. You also told me that the law was prepared to hang him for his crimes. It was distinctly possible in poor old Burgess's case. Yes. Yeah. In mine, I'd be inclined to disagree. If anything, to the contrary. How can you be so sure? It's not difficult to foretell. Burgess was only a cousin from a branch of the family lacking influence in the land. My case is a different one. I am the scion of one of England's most prominent families. And that makes a considerable difference. You've committed murder. You'll hang. Don't you think they could have hanged me a dozen times already if they'd been so inclined? <laughs> Every case was proven and there was no defense. Oh, no, my dear. Pin your hopes upon any judge or lord of the land donning the black cap on my behalf. It would be like all the other times. Family pressures will be exerted in the right places at the right times. Everything will be hushed up very discreetly. Oh. And you? Where would you be? I? <laughs> Why, I should make another journey on the non-stop to Brighton. You do <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it delightful? But true as well. I would be discreetly whisked back to the quiet sanatorium on the Reen Parade, where I would pass a prescribed period in considerable comfort and not in considerable boredom. Then, in due course, cured and penitent, I would come quietly home again, even as I'm doing now. <laughs> <laughs>
to the welcoming arms of my sad but eternally forgiving mother, to the thunderous silences of my gout-stricken father, and the sidelong glances of my slightly mystified and rather envious elder brothers. <laughs> <laughs> but this is not the dark ages. These are modern times, England, the year 1900. These things can't happen in enlightened times. Uh, don't depend upon it, my dear. If you have the right influence and enough money, and rest assured, we do have, you can make anything happen, can create any age to suit your tastes. You say this has happened in all your previous cases? In all of them. Tell me about them. What did you do? Mm -hmm. Are you trying to play me for time, my dear? Is that it? I want to know. And I want to know why. <laughs> Do you see the lights of Red Hill going by out there? Is that it? Despite your claim not to be expert upon the London to Brighton line, do you know that we are scant minutes now from Purley and Crawley, from Porter Heath, Clapham Junction, the river approaches, and a slowing run across the steel bridge into the great cavern of Victoria? <laughs> Is that it? Tell me about... I shall! Your incredible nerve and courage merit such small consideration. Tell me. Oh, not all of them. No, no, we really don't have time enough for that. I shall indeed tell you of the first, which for pure unsullied experience was by far the finest, and in view of my personal involvement, definitely the most satisfying. And I shall tell you of the last time, the only time I've ever failed. Do you realize, my dear, that night in the fog upon Clapham Common? If I had succeeded, it's a certainty that you would never have come to be in the position you are in this evening. Odd, isn't it? How fate actually does seem to play into one's hands. <laughs> Oops! What's that? Ah, yes, 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 I can see. The first of the long tunnels leading us into Coolston. We're under the North Downs already, my dear. A splendid train. I shall write a letter to the company, I think. It's most commendable. London in just a little while now. <laughs> we really don't have much time, do we? And I do want you to derive the maximum benefit from my little stories. If you're comfortable there in your corner, perhaps we can proceed. Hmm? Thank you, my dear. I was going to tell you of my first and finest, wasn't I? Sublime experience. One that you, for all your exquisite loveliness, will not be able to live up to. It was the pity. Mm. It happened when I was 17. Just two years after poor Burgess had gone off along his troubled way through the next world. It was on our estate. A little milkmaid. Sweet and pleasing. My first true love, I believe in the days of my innocence. But she showed a side of her nature that was both stupid and overly ambitious. It was then that I knew I would have to do away with her. And when she threatened me, well, well you can understand, my dear. That was the end. Graham. I've got to talk to you. <laughs> oh, Graham, stop it. Stop playing around and listen to me. What would you tell me, my dove? I... I don't know how to say it to you, to put it into words hmm? like. It's not easy and... It's not nice what you've done to me. Oh, come now, dearest. I'm here. You have my undivided and sympathetic attention. You needn't guard your words with me. You know that. So tell me, what is this awful thing that I've done to you? Oh, Graham, you are sweet to me. All right, I'll try. It's not easy, but I'll try. I know you'll understand. Of course I will. Now go on, girl. Oh, Graham. Yes, what is it? Well, there's no need to bark at me. I was just going to tell you. I'm going to have a baby. Your baby, Graham. I see. Well, is that all you've got to say about it? Just, I see.
see. Then you sit there smiling and staring up in the sky. <laughs> I'm sorry, dearest. I was just thinking about this. It is momentous news, you know. Well, I, I don't want you just to think about it. I want you to tell me and tell me quick what you're planning on doing about it. That's precisely what I am doing. Planning. There didn't ought to be no need to think about it. It's plain and simple. Well, I haven't been going with no one else. Only you. I love you and, and you say you, you love me. Well, if that's true, there's only one right and proper thing to do as I see it. And what's that? You tell me. You got to marry me, that's what. Like you said before. And I shouldn't have to be the one to say it. You should ask me proper. That's it, Sally, darling. That's it. I was hoping you'd say that. Suggest it to me. It clarifies everything for me. It makes it all so wonderfully simple for me. Oh, you mean it's all right? You do it like... Like you said. And not like I said, Sally. Let's rather put it this way. It will be done like I say. Oh, Graham, my dear. <laughs> I knew you'd do right by me. I knew you was a gentleman. You couldn't let me down, could you? No, darling. I couldn't possibly let you down. However, I need a little time to think this out. What do you mean you'll need time? It's already settled. We are getting married, you and me. Of course we are. Uh, but you, you, you must remember my family. Just because I'm a farm girl, I suppose I'm not good enough for old Lord and Lady Muckamuck up at the hall. Is that it? Although, seems to me, I'm good enough for their but, son. But you must understand, we'll have to be uh, uh, delicate about this. The news will shock the family and there's nothing we can do about it. Well, that's just too bad for them. You should have thought about that before you done what you did. <laughs> it takes two, you know. Oh, Graham! Oh, calm down, dearest. If we're going to succeed at what we both want, we're going to have to be devious about it. That's why I'm asking you for time, until tonight at least, to devise a plan. Oh, well, all right. But just until tonight, mind. Then I want to know how we're going to go about it. Tonight, you'll know all about it. Usual time, usual place. I'll be there, Graham. Just slip out quietly. Don't let anyone know that you're going. We must be. Just like that, you killed that poor girl in cold blood. I suppose you could put it that way, yes. Oh, rather, I prefer to think that Sally departed this life at its happiest moment. She was very happy when we met, you know. Why, well, I, I did it very quickly. She could hardly have suffered at all. What a cruel monster you are. You could be right. There's something to do with maladjustment, I suppose. It's possible I didn't howl the devil out of me hard enough on the day of my birth. And that girl came to you in all innocence. You killed her. Yes. When I got back to our rendezvous at nine o'clock, she was already waiting for me. Pleading a sick headache, I'd retired early. It was ridiculously easy to slip away from the house. I was certain I wouldn't be gone more than 15 minutes of the outside. Sally? Sally, are you there? Over here. Just inside the gate. Hang on, I'm coming. Oh, Graham, you're late. I was so worried, I, I thought something must have gone wrong. Nothing's ever going to go wrong for us again, Sally. Oh, Graham, my dear. Did you work out a plan for us? Yes. Yes, I did. Tell me. I'll do better than that, Sally. I'll show you. Oh, Graham, what are you trying to do? Why... Why are you holding me like that? Be still, can't you? I don't cream. No! No! It's hurting! You made a bad mistake, Sally. You signed your own death warrant when you threatened me.
Mrs. X and Mrs. Y are the women in this case. Mrs. X, you are alleged to clean your sink and no more. Well, I... I... Do you kill germs? I, I'm not sure. Is your sink hygienically clean? Well, maybe it is. I... Precisely. Mrs. Y, you use Vim 99? Yes, I do. You get your sink sparkling clean and kill 99% of household germs? That's correct. You see, only Vim 99 contains powerful germ-killing microbands. So Vim 99 gets your sink, pots and pans, bath and stove hygienically clean. 99% germ-free? Correct. Ladies of the jury, what is your verdict? By Vim 99. Look who's here. The girl in black. She never worries about dandruff. She uses Clinic, the anti-dandruff shampoo with the formula that gives between shampoo protection. She can wear black and comb her hair and there's never a sign of dandruff. The girl in black uses Clinic. Give dandruff the Clinic treatment and it's gone. <laughs> Later? Apparently never. There was never a question asked me about the whole affair subsequently. What of your recent failure? Didn't you say something about Clapham Common? Oh, yes. Yes, that was a bad business. But I was overcome, you see. I was overcome upon the instant. Was it a woman? If you could call that kind of a creature a woman, yes. What kind? You know what kind. What kind of a woman would be upon the streets of Clapham in a fog at night alone? I saw her as I walked up beneath the street lamp. Hello, mister. Where you going then, eh? I'm walking alone and content with the arrangement. You wouldn't feel like a bit of company then? I would not. You talks like a gent. But under the skin, you're all the same. I wouldn't wonder as you and me could have a nice time. Visit a few pubs. See some nice friends. It's cold out here. You shouldn't be walking around alone. Come on, be a bit matey and I'll keep you company. I've already told you that I prefer my own company. Here, come hold on, what's yeah. this? The rich had actually linked arms with me and was attempting to walk along in my company. So you attacked her? I was berserk. To be accosted by such a creature was bad enough. But to, to have her odious company actually forced upon me, that was too much. I seized her by the throat, determined in that instant to put paid to her once and for all. Yeah. <laughs> what, you, what, what are you up to? Let, let go of me throat. Let, you, let go. Let go. Ow. Oh, please. Ah. I'll teach you to accost me. You'll never have the chance to further your aims again, I promise you. I'll kill you. Help me, somebody. Anybody, help. I'll get him by then. She fought me like a mad thing, and she was amazingly strong. Despite my best efforts, I was not able to prevail quickly as I had before. I'd almost decided to let the wretch live and make off hot foot when the matter was taken out of my hands completely. Help me! Oh, help me! Police! Murder! It, oh, it's Jack the Ripper! He's got me! I know it's him! Help! I released that awful creature and ran away into the fog. But my luck had deserted me. I blundered right into the arms of the police great heavy booted yokels who in their numbers soon quelled me. I was taken to Clapham police station, questioned and charged with assault with attempt to the cause, as the ponderous sergeant described it, grievous bodily arm. And what happened after that? I have declined firmly under all probing to give my name and address. And there were upon my person no papers to give me away. But during the night, lying sleepless in the police cell, a fit of mischief came upon me. I decided to reveal myself. Yes. No. What are you causing all this here fuss about, eh? I have reached a grave decision, Sergeant. Oh. Oh, you have, have you? Well, now, that's interesting. And uh, what may it be? 
I have decided to reveal my identity to you. Uh, very kind of you, I'm sure. Just tell us what your name is so as I can write it down and you can stop giving us all this bother. Certainly, Sergeant. My name is Graham Felsham. Graham Felsham. All right, now we'll have a... Here you Here you wait a sec. Uh, you having me on, are you? Uh, you say you're Graham Felsham? <laughs> One and the same, Sergeant. At your service. Uh, not that Graham Felsham. You do me honor, Sergeant. But as you so succinctly put it, I am indeed that Graham Felsham. Mr. Ruth, this is getting a bit too much for me. Uh, here, isn't there someone we can call in about this here? Oh, I'm sure there is. If you'll simply copy down this address and dispatch a handsome cab with a note that I shall write in the care of one of your constables, sound advice can be yours within the hour. I, of course, will be more than willing to bear the costs of these enterprises. To whom did you send the note? <laughs> to the address of one of the family solicitors in Temple Bar. And the results? <laughs> exactly as I could have foretold. Within 30 minutes, I was released into the care and custody of the solicitor and transported to his chamber. Everything was hushed up and the family name protected. And you went back to Brighton? Precisely. And there passed a restful and restorative six months. Rather strange coincidence, that. What are you talking about? Do you realize that as we wound up the story of my misadventure in Clapham, the train most appropriately tore through Clapham Junction Station. And this strengthens my resolve. What do you mean? It seems only fitting that I should achieve another outstanding success, almost within shouting distance of the place where my one shameful failure occurred. In such a way, I can redeem myself. You can't really be serious. That you can kill me here when, when we're actually arriving at Victoria. But why not, my dear? It's most appropriate, isn't it? So close to Clapham. How well that solves my still wounded pride. And with the bridge coming up to us in the night, how easy it will be to throw your freshly dead body from the train window and into the black swirl of the river. Oh, come. You do see it my way, don't you? You must see it my way. What recourse do I have? I promise you, I promise you, you have my word of honor as a gentleman. It will not hurt you. No, no, you mustn't, you cannot. You feel virtually nothing, my dear, just a slight pressure about your neck. Then it's, it's over, so quickly. Come on now, the train's slowing. There's no time left. Oh, let's do it, I beg you. Oh, can't you spare me? Let me live. Oh, let me step down from this train alive at Victoria. I'll go away from you at once. I'll forget everything that has passed between us tonight. I won't say a word, I promise you. I won't complain, but please, oh, please let me live. Don't kill me. I've done you no harm and I won't. Just let me go. You tempt me, you know. When I weigh this coolly, dispassionately, I find that I do not really want to kill you. But I'm driven on. Don't you see? And there's nothing, absolutely nothing, that I can do about this thing. And after all, how can I depend upon your words? Once your relief at being left alive is past, and you regain your balance, anger and indignation must inevitably follow hard upon their heels. I gave you my word. I wouldn't break it. You're a gentleman, despite your... Despite your sickness, you know the value of the given word. Oh, but that's what I beg you. I beg you, don't kill me. Oh, don't kill me. But it's time, you see. It is the time. And I have to know. I have to know about you. All about you. To the very last moment. The very last moment, you see. Only a few seconds more. Feel it. Feel it. The train. Slowly. Slowly. Slowly beneath our feet. The grind of brakes against the steel wheels. And there. There, just ahead, the bridge. The city. The dark flow of the Thames. 
and beyond the great lit mouth of Victoria Station, just go on the other side. It's time, my dear. Our time together has run out. The closing seconds and... Oh, believe me, I'm so sorry. But it has to be done. It has to be done. Perhaps you'd better step down now, my dear. Miss Victoria, can it stop? Yeah, but if the bright lights stop, and there are all those people. Inevitable as fate that it should stop. The line ends here. Did you let me live? You didn't kill me after all. You let me live. Oh, oh you couldn't do it, could you? you? You see, there is kindness in you after all. You're not as ill as you believe you are. You could be helped properly, because you could do it. That is so. I couldn't do it. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And I, I made a promise to you. You see, I'll, I'll keep it. I won't betray you to anyone, not a soul. It's a promise. We'll see. Good evening, your lordship. Nice to see you home again, nice and safe. Do you have a, a nice holiday, sir? Good evening, Shaw. Good to be back. A passable time. Not at all bad, thanks. Uh, excuse me, miss, if you don't mind. I have to get by you. Uh, help his lordship. His lordship? That's right, miss. Help? How must you help? Shaw is my man, my dear. He has to carry me from this corner to my wheelchair out there on the platform. I'm a complete cripple, you see. You? You're a cripple? I'm afraid so. Didn't you see the rug around my knees? But... And you couldn't... Attacked you? <laughs> <laughs> Never. Quite impossible. You could have pushed me away effortlessly with one of your small gloved hands. And why did you plan to... What's this, miss? Is his lordship been having you on a bit then, eh? Having me on? Shaw knows me of old, my dear. I have something of a reputation as a practical joker. You look upon it as a joke, then, to subject a person to such a shocking experience as that I have undergone in your company. What did I say of anger and indignation following hard upon the heels of relief? Oh. You made me a promise, you know. Your silence in return for your life. This certainly puts a different complexion upon things. Would you please tell me your name? Why should I? Please. It's very important that I should know. Well, it's Billy. Miss Mary Billiard. And, if I may ask further, your occupation, your profession. I'm an actress. Ah, oh, I should have known. It was so self-evident. Oh, really? The joke is on me, then. I don't see how Miss that... Miss here is my card. Please look at it while Shaw carries me to my wheelchair. Then, if you could join us for the short walk along the platform, I'd be most grateful. Here we are, then, your lordship. Uh, Oh, Sir Daisy. Oh, thank you. Hey, easy does it. Mm. Excuse me, miss. Lord Filsham, author, poet, playwright. 11 Cavendish Muse, W1. If you're ready, Miss Billier. And will you please tell me? have to know what was the purpose of this cruel and pointless deception. Cruel? Yes. Pointless? I think not. In actual fact, we played out a trial on an idea I have for a new play. What? A play which I now intend to set upon paper, thanks to you and your most encouraging performance tonight, Miss Billier. A play? Yes. I roughed it out in my mind while I was at Brighton. I was planning to write it anyway. Your arrival in my compartment this evening touched off the idea of trying, trying out the plot of it to see if it would hold water. I must say, I'm quite satisfied. But, but this is unspeakable. Yes, it was rather naughty, wasn't it? <laughs> Something came over me. A sense of wicked mischief, you might say. You could almost call it uh, a compulsion. Oh, please. 
Not that. Not again. Sorry, my dear. Tell me, are you employed right now? At the moment? No. Your being an actress is another of those delightful coincidences that add such sparkle to life. In view of my circumstances, I have to find that sparkle in bizarre ways. I wonder, would you be interested in the part? The part? When my play is written and goes into production, would you be interested in reading for the part of the young woman in the train? Just as we've done tonight? Precisely. I owe you something for what you've been through. As an actress, a leading part in one of my plays could further your career considerably. If you'll forgive my seeming boast, my reputation is extensive in the field. I'm aware of that. Now I know why. I don't think I could go through all that again. <laughs> Familiarity should, I'm sure, breed contempt. You do famously, you know. And you already know the part rather well. Uh, well... <laughs> Actually, it would be lovely. <laughs> Good girl. It's settled then. The part will be yours. You have my word on it. Please hold yourself in readiness. <laughs> and keep my card so that you'll know where to get in touch with me. What will you call this play? It occurred to me a good title would be Non-Stop to Victoria. Very appropriate. Say you'll forgive me. There'll be no recurrence. Please. All right. You're forgiven. This one. Splendid. Well, we must leave you here, I'm afraid, but we'll be in touch with you. Is that an address? They have a forwarding address for me at the Empire Theatre. Good. You'll hear from me within a week. Good night, Miss Villiers. And thank you for a most diverting journey. Good night. Good evening. This is Peter Tobin introducing Lux Radio Theatre. Tonight and every Monday night at this time, Lux Radio Theatre presents, for your entertainment, the finest in radio drama. This week we bring you The Sacred Flame, a gripping drama by W. Somerset Maugham. When crippled Maurice Tablet dies suddenly, no one questions the doctor's statement that he died of heart failure. No one, that is, except Nurse Wayland, who insists that he has been murdered. But who would want to kill Morris? His devoted wife, Stella? His mother, who adored him? His brother, Colin? Listen in a few moments to the devastating consequences of Nurse Whalen's bitter accusation in The Sacred Flame. Produced for Lux Radio Theatre by Anne Freed and directed by Henry Diffenthal. And now, Act One of tonight's Lux Radio Theatre presentation, The Sacred Flame. Speed 
is the essence of the game of chess, old fellow. <laughs> Don't let your son bully me, Mrs. Tablet. I think you're quite capable of taking care of yourself, Doctor. If you moved your bishop, you'd make things a bit awkward for me. Hmm. Morris, when I want your advice, I'll ask for it. Mother, is that the way respectable general practitioners talk to their patients in the days of your far distant youth? How on earth do you expect poor Nurse Wayland to read when you never for an instant hold your tongue? <laughs> I can't even hear myself knitting. I don't mind, Mrs. Tabret. Don't worry about me. After listening to my lively conversation and wheeling me around for nearly five years, Nurse Wayland pays no more attention to me than if I were a deaf mute. Well, who can blame her? I know, it's exasperating. It's worse than that, Nurse. It's inconsiderate. If you please, ma'am, Major Lee Condor wants to know if it's too late for him to come in to have a drink. Of course not. Ask him to come in, Alice. A very good man. You know him, don't you, Doctor? No, I've never met him. He's the fellow who's just taken that furnished house on the golf links, isn't he? Mm. Yes, we knew him years ago in India. That's why he came here. Is he a soldier? No, he was a policeman. He's retired now. Oh. He was one of Mother's numerous admirers. Oh, <laughs> nice chap. And I believe he's a rather good golfer. Colin has played with him once or twice. I asked him to dine tonight so that Morris could get a game of bridge, but he couldn't come. Major Leconda. Oh, good evening, John. Hello. How nice of you to come in. I was on my way home and I saw your lights on, so I thought I'd just ask if anyone would like to give me a Doc and Doris. Oh, help yourself. The whiskey's on the table. Thanks, Millie. How are you, nurse? Fine, thanks. And the patient? Bearing up pretty well, considering all he has to put up with. You're in your usual high spirits, I see. I don't think you know, Dr. Harvester. How do you do, Major? Don't let me disturb your game. It's finished. Have you beaten him? Hollow! I haven't come to stay, only to say I was sorry I couldn't come to dinner. I'll just swallow my drink and take myself off. There's no hurry. I'm not going to bed for hours. We're really waiting up for Stella and Colin. They've gone to the opera. Morris, why don't you let Nurse Whalen get you ready? Then you'll only have to slip into bed and Colin can help mm, you. All right. What do you say, Nurse? It's just as you like. I'm quite prepared to stay up until Mrs. Morris comes in and put you to bed after you've said goodnight to her. No, come on. You look tired. Put your shoulder to the wheel, Nurse, and gently trundle the wounded hero to his bedchamber. I'll be back in ten minutes. She seems a very nice woman, that nurse. Yes. She's extremely competent, and her patience is really wonderful. She's a jolly good nurse, and you're very lucky to have her. Oh, I'm sure we were. It's a pity she's so tactless. It never seems to occur to her that Morris wants to be alone with his wife. He likes to say goodnight to Stella last thing, and he likes to say it without anyone looking on. That's why he's staying up now. Poor boy. I suppose he's absolutely dependent on a nurse? Absolutely. All sorts of rather unpleasant things have to be done for him, poor dear. And he can't bear that anyone should know about them, especially Stella. Is there really no chance of his getting better, Dr. Harvester? No, I'm, I'm afraid not. He was terribly smashed up, you know. The lower part of his spine was broken and he was badly burned when the plane caught fire. What a shocking thing to happen. Yes, indeed. And when you think that he was flying all through the war and never had a mishap, it's so silly that this should happen just when he was trying out a new machine. It was so unexpected. His courage amazes me. He never seems low or depressed. Never. His spirits are wonderful. It's heartbreaking to watch him in dreadful pain and still forcing a joke from his lips. You know, I'm sorry Colin is going away so soon, Mrs. Tabret. I think his being here has done Morris a lot of good. Yes. As boys, they were great friends, which isn't always the case with brothers. Colin's been away so long. He went to Central America just before Morris crashed, you know. Does he have to go back? Well, he put his share of his father's money in a coffee plantation. Oh, it's doing very well. He loves the life out there. And it seems cruel to ask him to give it all up to help look after his crippled brother. I think it would be most unfair. One has no right to ask anyone to give up his own chance of making the best he can of life. Here yeah, we are again. Ah, mm. I'm fixed up and ready for any excitement. Aren't I, nurse? But what's that? What? I, I thought I heard a car. Yes, I did. It's Stella. She's in her new evening dress tonight, Doctor. Just wait till you see her. Which opera was on tonight? Tristan. That's why I insisted on Stella going. 
It was after seeing Tristan that we got engaged. Do you remember, Mother? Oh, of course I do. It was a wonderful oh, here evening. Is. Oh, here yes. she is. Tell her. Hello, my darling. Uh. Mm. Have you missed me? Mm. Why are you back so early, you bad girl? <laughs> you promised me to go and have supper. Why didn't you take her, Colin? <laughs> well... Good evening, Doctor. Well, darling, evening. I was no, so no, no, thrilled no, no, and excited no. by the opera, I felt I simply couldn't eat a thing. Hang it. Oh, oh, hello, Doctor. Hello, Major. You might have gone to Lucian's and mm. had some supper. <sighs> What's the good of my spending the earth buying you a magnificent new dress when you won't let anyone see it? But, darling, I wanted to show it off in the intervals, but it seemed so grand that I hadn't the nerve. <laughs> I kept my cloak on. Well, take it off now and show the gentleman. Oh. Come on. Oh, you are a bully, Morris. <laughs> Oh, there you are, then. Oh, you've made me feel shy now. <laughs> Stand up so we can all see. Ah, it's lovely. Mm. Oh, uh, uh, Stella, what, what's the matter? Catch her, Colin. She's going to fall. There you are. Come on. Sit down. Yeah, I'm all right. Nothing, just... Just a little faintness. Stella. Oh, it's all right, Morris. Don't fuss. Put your head between your knees, Stella. Mm. Let me help you. No, no, I... I'll be all right in a minute. Silly of me. My belief is that she's just faint from lack of food. Nurse, would you mind going into the kitchen and seeing if you can find anything for these silly young people to eat? Of course not. I'll make them some sandwiches. Colin can get a bottle of champagne from the cellar. All right, Mother. Is there any ice in the house? I've got a thirst I wouldn't sell for 20 pounds. Well, I'll say goodbye. I'm sorry you're feeling poorly, Stella. Oh, Mother's right. All I need is a large sandwich, preferably ham. You're looking better now. Mm. For a few moments, you're as white as a sheet. Good night, everyone. Oh, good goodbye. Night, goodbye. Good night, goodbye. It was nice of you to look in. Don't worry, I'll see myself out. If you're not in a hurry, Doctor, wait and have a sandwich with us. And in the meantime, let's take a turn in the garden, shall we? It's so lovely and warm. Good idea. Uh, the ham sandwiches, I hope Nurse Whale and there's a sense to use plenty of mustard. Stella, are you sure you're all right? Oh, my darling. I'm sorry I made such a fool of myself. You scared the life out of me. Why didn't you go on and have supper before coming home? Oh, I didn't want to. I wanted to get back. But, Stella, you go out so seldom. Oh, this is no life for you. Tied up to a cripple. You're young. Oh, darling, darling, don't. Please, uh, I'm not missing anything, I promise you. The fact is, you've lost the habit of going out and having fun. Well, nothing is fun if you can't share it. Now, don't be idiotic, my poor darling. I wish Colin weren't going away so soon. At least you've been able to get out and around with him. He only came home for six months and he stayed nearly a year. You promised you'd try to persuade him to stay on a bit. No, but he must, he must get back to his work. Hmm, I suppose so. I was thinking of you. Oh, now, Morris, darling, you must stop fussing because you think I'm having a thin time. I'm not. You never try to prevent me from doing anything I want to. I don't know what it is to be bored. <laughs> Why, I haven't time for half the things I want to do. Yes, you're wonderful, Stella. You always have been. You've made the best of a bad job, all right. I've had to, but why should you? Oh, my darling, don't talk like that. I married you because I loved you. It would be unspeakable if I stopped loving you now that you need my love more than ever. Oh, my dear, we can't love because we ought to. Love comes and goes, and we can none of us help ourselves. <sighs> Morris, what do you mean? Have I done anything to make you think I... I wasn't the same as I'd always been. Of course not, darling. You've been an angel, always. What's the matter? You, you suddenly went quite pale. You're not feeling faint again. No. No, I, I'm all right. Perhaps I seem to take for granted all that you do for me, but don't think I'm not conscious all the time. How much I owe you. But I've done nothing for you. I've never let you nurse me. Well, I couldn't bear that you should have anything to do with the sordid side of my illness. 
You know that I'm never going to get well, Stella, don't you? I don't indeed. It's a long business, we know that, but I'm absolutely convinced you'll get much better. No. They pretend they can do something in order to give me hope. I pretend to believe them because it's the easiest thing to do. But I know I'm on this invalid bed for life, Stella. Oh. Oh. Then let's take what comfort we can in the great joy we've had in one another. In the days when you were well and strong. I shall always be grateful for the happiness you gave me. And for your love. Do you think that's changed? I love you as deeply, as devotedly as I ever did. You're everything in the world to me, Stella. I, I ought to be frightened because I'm so dependent on you, but I'm not. Because I know, not just with my mind or my heart, but with, with every nerve in me, with every little feeling and every pain, how good you are to me. Oh, but darling, why, why are you saying all this to me tonight? Because I owe you so much. You know, Stella, when you're an invalid, you find out all sorts of interesting things. People are sympathetic, but you mustn't abuse their sympathy. You soon discover it bores them if you talk about yourself. You must make jokes, make them laugh, so they feel they needn't be sorry for you. Then they go away feeling relieved and kindly disposed towards you. Oh, oh, my darling, you break my heart. It's so cruel that you should have had to learn such bitter truths. My dear, they're not as bitter as all that. I shouldn't have mentioned it, only... I wanted to tell you that, it, that it's you who've given me the courage to carry on. I can stand anything as long as I know I shall see you tomorrow. And the next day, and the day after, and always. Oh, Morris, I'm unworthy of such love. I'm so ashamed. I'm selfish, thoughtless. Never. And you're so beautiful. You've never looked more beautiful than you do tonight. What is it that that gives you this sudden new radiance. I don't know why I should look any different from usual. I watch your face. I know every change in it from day to day. A year ago, you, you had a strained look, but now, lately, you've had an air that, that is strangely peaceful. You gained a sort of lovely serenity. Oh, Stella, if only we'd had a child. Someone I could see as part of you and me. And you would have had something to console you. You wouldn't have felt you'd entirely wasted your life. But Morris, darling, I, I, I don't feel I've wasted my life. Oh, look, you, you're not yourself tonight. You're, you're ill and tired. I love you, Stella. I want to take you in my arms, as I used to. I want to press my lips to yours and see your eyes close and your head fall back and feel your dear, soft body. Still, still, I, I can't bear it. Oh, hush now, my darling, please. <laughs> darling, don't. It would have been better for both of us if I'd been killed when no, I crashed. Darling. I'm no use to you. I'm no use to anybody. No, darling. Don't. Don't. Please. Please, darling. Oh, forgive me, Stella. Oh, what a complete fool I am. Oh, my dear. You frightened me. <laughs> It's what they call a nerve storm. It's a good thing Nurse Whalen didn't see me like that. Give me my handkerchief. Oh, yes, here you are. 
Whiskey and soda is what you want. I'll get you one. No, no, no. I'll... Uh... No, I'll have one later. Oh. In bed. Oh, yes. Sorry I've been so long. There wasn't any ham, so I made toasted bacon sandwiches. Oh, mmm, they, they look delicious. I, I'll call the others. Oh, Dr. Harvester, come and have a sandwich before it gets cold. Stella. Yes, darling. D darling, mm? if you don't mind, I think I'll turn in. Oh. I suddenly feel very tired. Oh, I, I, I'm sorry, Morris. Did I hear you calling me? Y yes, you did. Morris doesn't want anything to eat. He's going to bed. Oh, I'm so glad. It's very late. Good night, my boy. Sleep well. Good night, Mother. Bless you. Here, let me give you a hand, us. I can manage perfectly. I'm so used to wheeling the invalid bed, and he weighs nothing. Never mind. Let me push him. Look in on your way to bed, Stella. Yes, of course, darling. Oh, don't be long, Doctor. The sandwiches will be stone cold. I know. <laughs> Morris is rather nervy tonight. I'm sorry I went to the opera. Oh, my dear, you go out so seldom. I haven't the inclination, really. You're tired. Why don't you eat something? No. No, I'll, I'll wait for the others. Whatever happens, darling, I want you to know that I'm deeply grateful for all that you've done for Morris. Why do you say that? You don't think he's getting worse? No, I think he's just the same. I just wanted you to know that I realize what a great sacrifice you've made for him. After all, you didn't marry Morris to be the wife of a helpless cripple. Well, one must take the rough with the smooth. You're a young and beautiful woman. You have the right to live your life just as anyone else has. For five years now, you've given up everything to be the sole comfort of a man who is your husband only because a legal ceremony had joined you together. Oh, no, no, no. No, because love had joined us together. My poor child. I'm so desperately sorry for you. Whatever the future may have in store, I shall never forget your courage, your self-sacrifice, and your patience. But I... I don't understand what you mean. Don't you? Well, let us suppose that it is the anniversary of my wedding day and my thoughts have been much occupied with the ups and downs of marriage. Ah, here you are at last, Colin. You'd better pour us some wine. Right. Where's Dr. Harvester? Here I am. I've been with Morris. I'll just have a sandwich and swallow my wine and then be off. Is Morris all right? Oh, fairly. He's a bit down tonight for some reason. I, I don't know why. He was in great spirits earlier in the oh, evening. I expect he's tired. He insisted on staying up. And I've left a sleeping draft that he can take later if he wants it. And I'll go up and see him before I go to bed. If he can get a good rest, I'm sure he'll be his usual self in the morning. Well, I must get home. Good night, Mrs. Staverick. And thanks for a very pleasant evening. I'll see you to the door, and I'll go straight to bed. Good night, children. Good night, Good night, good night mother. mother. Good night, Doctor. Good night, Doctor. Stella. Stella, darling. Oh, Colin. <gasps> Poor darling. Oh, Colin, what have we done? Morris was so strange tonight. I couldn't make him out. It, it was almost as though he suspected. No, impossible. He must never know. Never. I'd do anything in the world to prevent it. Why did you ever love me? Oh, why did I ever love you? Stella, come here. My darling. No. No. Oh, I'm so ashamed. <laughs> Excuse me, my dear. Could you pass me a packet of Radeon? Why, of course. Here. Never use anything else to get my wash really white, do you? You know, uh, whoops, mind the trolley. Radeon is a wash out a white in. What? Radeon, an absolute white in, a clean up, a fresh in. And Radeon's so good in washing machines. My wash is whiter to the last sock. Pow! Radeon with sunflakes. Pure white power. Remember that. Now I'll be on with my shopping. Uh, mind the trolley. Well, I never. A white in. Radeon it is then. Pure white power. Pow!
Shield brings you the dry look. Shield brings you the dry look with Stay Dry, a formulation unique to the newest Shield aerosol deodorant. It keeps you cool, confident, and feeling poised even in the sheerest of fashions. And Shield's extra dry spray never stings or burns your skin, even if you use Shield right after a bath. Stay dry with Shield, the only deodorant with Stay Dry. Dear Colin, I've only just heard. I can't tell you how sorry I am. It was nice of you to come. I was at the golf club and old Blake came to me and said, I say, have you heard that poor Maurice Tabrit died last night? I couldn't believe it. Oh, I'm afraid it's true all the same. And Maurice seemed comparatively well last night and in such good spirits. Was he taken worse in the night? No. He just died in his sleep. I suppose so. He can't have felt ill, but he'd have run for Nurse Wayland. When did you find out, then? Well, you see, sometimes if he had had a bad night, he slept late in the morning. Stella insisted that no one should go in to him until he rang. It was the only matter in which there'd been any friction between her and Nurse Wayland. Oh, she was quite right. At least the poor chap was happy when he was asleep. We were just finishing breakfast when Nurse Wayland came in. I noticed she was very white. She said she had just been in to Morris. Stella was furious. I've never seen her so angry. Nurse Wayland was trembling. She looked all funny, scared, you know. I had the feeling something was wrong. Is anything the matter, Nurse, I asked. She gave a sort of cry and clenched her hands and said, he's dead. How terrible. Stella gave a sort of gasp and went into a dead faint. And your mother? Oh, mother was wonderful. I sprang forward to help Stella and I saw mother just sitting at the table. She was awfully white. And then she began to tremble. She never made a sound. Just shrank back into her chair and suddenly became an old, old woman. She just said you... Better go for Dr. Harvester. I shall never get the sound of her voice out of my ears. Oh, hold on, old man. Don't tell me any more if it upsets you. No, I'm all right. There's nothing more to tell. Mother and Nurse Welland attended Stella and I went for the doctor. He said Morris had been dead for a good two hours. Probably heart failure. How about Stella? She's all right now. And your mother? Harvester's with her. Oh, here he is. Uh, how is Mrs. Tabret? Very upset. I'm trying not to show it. She has wonderful self-control. Do you think she'd like to see me? I'm sure she would. Oh, Nurse Wayland, is my mother asleep? No, only resting, Mr. Collin. Then I'll go and ask her, Major. I won't be a moment. I told you to go and lie down, Nurse. I couldn't. I'm too restless. Oh, it's been a shock no less for you than the family. Yes, a great shock. He was always so brave and cheerful. Yeah, it was always on the cards that he'd go out suddenly. Like a candle that you blow out when you don't want it anymore. Where does the flame go then? My dear, I, I'm afraid you're taking poor Morris's death a good deal more to heart than his wife. Did you think he was only a case to me? Even a nurse is human. Strange as it may seem, she has a heart like other people. Of course she has a heart. But it doesn't do her or her patients any good if she allows her emotions to get the better of her common sense. What, in your opinion, Doctor, did Maurice Tabret actually die of? Heart failure. Are you going to put that on the death certificate? Certainly. You've told me half a dozen times that Maurice might have lived for years. He might have. I can tell you now that it's a blessing for everyone concerned that he didn't. Dr. Harvester, Maurice Tabret was murdered. It what are you talking about? Do you want me to repeat it? Maurice Tabret was murdered. 
Do you mean that you intended that statement to be taken quite literally? Quite. But my dear, why should anyone want to murder poor Morris? That at present is no business of mine. Now look here, nurse. You know perfectly well that everyone connected with him was devoted to Morris. No one was ever more surrounded by love and affection than he was. I, it's incredible that anyone should even have wished him harm. Whatever I may think or may not think, I'm at liberty to keep to myself. Oh, come now. You know as well as I do that Morris died of natural causes. What on earth is the use of making a fuss and getting everyone upset? If he died of natural causes, a post-mortem will prove it. And then I shall have nothing more to say. I am not going to have a post-mortem. It's quite unnecessary. I must warn you. If you sign the death certificate, I shall go straight to the coroner and protest. I should have thought the tablets have enough to put up with without your forcing such an ordeal on them. Major Laconda, you were in the police, weren't you? Tell me, what is the duty of a nurse who has reason to believe her patient has died by foul play? I suppose her duty is quite clear. But I think she should be sure that her reasons are valid before she exposed to distress and publicity a family that has treated her with unvarying kindness. Yes. Yes, you're right. Everyone in this house has treated me with the greatest consideration. I do at least owe it to them to make no charges behind their back. And does that mean you want them uh, sent for? Yes. In point of fact, I think I hear Mrs. Tabrick coming now. I'll go and fetch Stella. My dear Major, how kind of you to come. Oh, I felt I must come and see you for a moment. I'm sure you know how deeply I sympathize with you. If there's any way I can be of service. Thank you. I'm trying to put my own feelings out of sight and mind and think only that my son's martyrdom has ended. I won't weep because he is dead. I will rejoice because he is free. Good morning, Major Leconda. Dr. Harvester told me you were here. I came to say how much I feel for you and your great loss. Thank you. You know, Morris and I often talked of death. He, he was never afraid of it. He didn't even attach much importance to it. He asked me not to wear mourning for him, but to go about and do things exactly as if he were alive. He loved you so much, Stella. He put your happiness above everything. <sighs> Nurse Wayland, you'll be leaving us now, I suppose. I want to thank you for everything you did for Morris and to tell you how deeply grateful I am to no, you. I don't need gratitude. I only did my duty. <sighs> What's the matter? Stella, I've got something unpleasant to tell you. I would sooner not have to add to your present trouble, but I'm afraid it can't be avoided. But what is it? Nurse Wayland is not satisfied that Morris's death was due to his illness. She thinks there was some other cause. But I, I don't understand what other cause could there be. She says he was murdered. Oh, murdered? You must be mad, nurse. It's preposterous. However, I presume she has some grounds for her statement. What are they? Well, nurse? You all know that Mr. Morris suffered from sleeplessness. Dr. Harvester had prescribed a sedative, chlorolin. Will you repeat the instructions you gave me last night, doctor? Morris was excited and overwrought. I asked Nurse Whalen to give him a tablet and told him that if he woke in the night, he could take it. I dissolved the tablet in half a glass of water and put it by his side. There were five tablets left. This morning, the bottle was empty. That's very strange. Very. Would five tablets have been a fatal dose, Doctor? Six, including the one I left for him. Yes, there's no doubt the effect would have been fatal. It's incredible. Well, it's much more likely that... Someone took them for his own use. If so, they must have been taken after I went to bed. But no one went into Morris's room last night after that but me. I went in to say good night to him. You're not under the impression that I took the tablets, I suppose, Nurse Wayland? If you had, you could presumably produce at least four of them. Believe me, if you'd taken those five tablets at midnight, you wouldn't be sitting here now. The fact remains that five tablets disappeared last night. Where are they? Doctor, is it possible that Morris can have died from chloral poisoning? I have told you that I was satisfied that death was due to natural causes. I wasn't asking that. Yes, of course, it's possible. 
But I don't for an instant believe it. But I'm so confused. It's come as such a terrible shock. Nurse Wayland, do you really think that Morris died of an overdose of his sleeping tablets? I do. No, it's absurd. Who on earth would have thought of murdering Morris? It's out of the question. Oh, no, no. Nurse Wayland can't seriously think that anyone would deliberately give Morris an overdose. But I'm beginning to be desperately afraid that perhaps he took it himself. Suicide? Well, he wasn't... He wasn't himself last night. He was... He was very strange. I'd never seen him so upset. Oh. Did he speak of suicide? No. What did he say? Well, really, Nurse Wayland, there are some things I can't tell you. What passed between my husband and myself concerned only ourselves. I beg your pardon. I only thought it would be better for your own sake to be frank. What do you mean? Are you accusing me of holding anything back? I'm not accusing anybody. My dear, I won't ask you anything that is painful to answer, but there's this. If there is anything in what Nurse Whalen says, I suppose there'll have to be an inquest. The coroner will certainly ask you if your husband said anything at all that might indicate that suicide was in his mind. Well, he, he said it would have been better if the accident had killed him outright. But he wasn't thinking of himself, he was thinking of me. That's very important. Nurse Wayland, if poor Morris did take an overdose of something, can't you square your conscience to say nothing about it? He had so little to live for. Can't you let him go in peace and spare us the distress of a post-mortem and inquest? But you see... I don't believe your husband committed suicide. Why not? He was sometimes very depressed. And for that reason, I didn't think it wise to leave within his reach the means of putting an end to himself. I always kept the tablets well out of his reach. I never saw him depressed. I know you didn't. You never saw anything else. Well, what have I done to you? Why do you speak to me like that? Your face is, is twisted with hate. I, I don't understand. Don't you? Oh, I'm beginning to be frightened of you. What sort of woman have we had in our house for five years? There's nothing to be frightened of, darling. Don't give way to your nerves. Because he joked and laughed when you were there. Did it never occur to you that there were moments when he was overwhelmed by black despair? But why did he insist on hiding it from me? His one aim was to make his suffering easy for you to bear. Whatever pain he had, he hid from you so that you should never have the distress of being sorry for him. How can you say such dreadful things? Everything he had had to be hidden from you. When you were coming, the medicine bottles and the dressings had to be put away so that there should be nothing to remind you that there was anything the matter with him. I would willingly have done anything for him that you did. It was his most earnest wish that I should not concern myself with that side of his illness. That's true, nurse. I'm sorry you don't think Stella did all she could for Morris. As his mother, I'm perhaps no less competent than you to judge. I have only admiration for her unselfishness. Oh, Mother. I always think we do the best by people when we help them in the way they want to be helped. There's a lot in that. I'm sure Stella did Morris most good by answering him back in the same strain when he chaffed her. When he laughed, laughing with him. I was nothing. Only his paid nurse. He didn't try to hide from me the despair that filled his heart. He didn't have to pretend with me. He didn't have to be good-tempered or amusing with me. He could be morose and know I wouldn't mind. He could quarrel with me and know he couldn't hurt me. What are you telling us, Nurse Wayland? I'm telling you the truth at last. What a strange truth it is. But, Nurse, what you've been saying suggests that in one of his moments of despair, he must have thought of suicide. It was just one of those moments that I was on guard against. The sleeping tablets were kept in the bathroom on an upper shelf. I had to stand on a chair myself to reach them. Was it impossible, Dr. Harvester, for Morris to have crossed the room into the bathroom and stood up on a chair? Quite impossible. He had no power in the lower part of his body. His back was broken in the accident and his spinal cord was injured. Well, the matter can't be left like this. I'm afraid, Harvester, there'll have to be an inquest. But confound it, man. No one commits murder without a motive. No one had the smallest reason to wish Morris dead. How do you know? 
Everyone was devoted to him. Did you know his wife was going to have a baby? <gasps> you fiend! Stella! I suspected it last night when she nearly fainted. This morning I knew for certain. Are you accusing me of murdering my husband? Is it true what she says, Stella? Shall I keep luncheon back, madam? Is it one o'clock? No. You can serve it. We can't have lunch now, Mother. Why not? Lay the two extra, Alice. Major Laconda and Dr. Harvester will be lunching. Very good, madam. Mother, it's impossible. How can we all sit down as though nothing had happened? I think it's just as well. We have a great deal more to say to one another. It would do none of us harm to talk of other things for half an hour. No, I, I, I couldn't. Please let, let me stay here. I insist on your coming, my dear. I must go home, Mrs. Tablet. I'll have a bite there and come back immediately. Very well. Will you come, Nurse Wayland? No. I'll have something sent up to your room. I don't want anything. You may when it comes. Lunch is served, madam. Come, Stella. You know the pepsodent you've been using? Pretty good toothpaste, wasn't it? But now there's all new pepsodent. It's a toothpaste revolution. Get your teeth dazzle white without scratching tooth enamel. All new Pepsodent made with Erlium actually polishes teeth dazzle white. It doesn't scratch. All new Pepsodent, the greatest toothpaste discovery in your lifetime. But you don't have to believe that just because we say so. Extensive laboratory tests prove that it's true. If you'd like to see the results of those tests for yourself, write to Pepsodent, Box 909, Durban, and we'll send you documentary proof that all new Pepsodent gets teeth dazzle white without scratching tooth enamel. All new Pepsodent gives you the smile that dazzleizes. From the fertile fields of the eastern Transvaal come new flavor Oikos, farm fresh vegetable. Plump chickens come from lush Natal. Our beefsteaks are the beefiest, our herbs and spices subtle and delicate. So come home to Royco, made from the freshest and youngest. That's why Royco soups taste the best and cook the quickest in only seven minutes. New flavor Royco, warm, friendly, satisfying, made with the good things you would choose. Have you finished lunch already? More or less. Are you all right? Mm, yes. I'm sorry, I, I couldn't stay in the dining room. It was awful sitting there as though nothing had happened. I don't know what induced Mother to make us go through that farce. Oh, I dare say it was sensible. With the servants there, it was obvious that we had to hold our tongues. It gave us all a chance to collect ourselves. Stella, is it true? About the baby? Yes, it's true. Why didn't you tell me? I didn't want to. You were going to let me go away without knowing. I didn't want to spoil your last weeks here. Because I was worried didn't seem to be any reason why you should be worried, too. But what were you going to do? I didn't know. I was desperately trying to find a way out. I thought it would be easier when you were gone. Whatever happened, I wanted to keep you out of it. But, darling, this is something I must share with you. Surely you realize that. When a woman tells a man she's going to have his baby, it's important to her. She wants to be made a fuss of. I couldn't expect you to feel joy or pride, only consternation. Stella, you do realize, don't you, how much I love you? <gasps> Don't call him. Don't say anything that, that's going to upset me. I don't want to get emotional. If we've got to talk about it, let's do so as calmly as we can. What's that dreadful woman going to do now? Oh, I don't know. I don't care. Oh, no, that's not true. I'm frightened to death. Oh, God, what's going to happen to us? You do love me, Stella, don't you? Oh, yes. 
I wish I didn't, but I do. Oh, lunch oh. over already? Yes. Forgive me for coming through the French doors, but I walked through the garden. Mother and Major Laconte will be here in a moment. They're still having coffee. And Nurse Good. Welland had lunch in her room. Perhaps you'd better fetch her, Colin. Right, oh. Won't be a moment. I, uh, I hope, my dear, this is going to come out all right. <sighs> Doesn't look much like it, does it? Mm. Dr. Harvester, will you tell me something? Yes. Do you think it possible that Morris could have guessed uh, about the child? I, I shouldn't think so. Oh, I hope not. I couldn't have borne the thought that he died rather than expose me to shame and disgrace. He was capable of that, you know. My dear, I'm afraid that if Morris died of an overdose, he can't have taken it himself. But who could have given it to him? That is the question, isn't it? Oh. Yes, Nurse Whalen. Oh, yes. I can hear Mother and the Major. Well, you're back quickly, Doctor. Have we kept you waiting? I hope you had everything you wanted in your room, Nurse. Everything, thank you, Mrs. Tabret. Well, uh, well, sit down, everyone. Now, we are in your hands, Nurse Whalen. Have you decided what to do? Major Leconda asked your daughter-in-law a question before luncheon. She didn't answer it. I'm afraid you must have thought me very impertinent, Stella. Nurse Whalen said you were going to have a baby. And I asked you if it was true. It's quite true. And then another question inevitably rises in one's mind. It... It's difficult for me to ask it. I'll answer without your asking. Of course, it's quite impossible that Morris should have been the father of the child I'm expecting. Since his accident, he's been my husband in name only. I am the father, Major Laconda. You! Do you mean to say that it escaped your sharp eyes, nurse? That Colin and Stella were in love with each other? Oh, did you know? Nowadays, I find the young are apt to think their elders even more stupid than advancing years generally make them. Oh, Mother, what must you think of me? Do you much care? I suppose I ought to be terribly ashamed of myself. But I must be honest. I could no more stop falling in love with Colin than I, than I could help the rain falling. Oh, you're shameless. But you have every right to think that I treated Morris shamefully, Mother. He's beyond the reach of pain, but I bitterly regret the pain I've caused you. I have no excuses to make for myself. My dear, don't you remember what I said to you last night? I thanked you for all you'd done for Morris. Did you think I was talking at random? I knew then that you were going to have a baby and that Colin was the father. I blame myself. Not for loving Stella, but for not going away as soon as I find out. What, whatever you think of me, I ask you to believe that I didn't give myself to Colin to, to, to gratify any passing whim. I love him with all my heart. I know, dear. I, I struggled against it. I, I told myself that the only return I could make Morris for, for all the devotion he gave me was by remaining faithful to him. I tried to drive Colin away. I did everything except ask him to go. I couldn't do that. And Morris was so pleased to have him here. Yes, I understand. I don't understand you, Mrs. Tablet. You seem to be going out of your way to find excuses for your daughter-in-law. If you knew what was going on, why didn't you stop it? I'm afraid I shall shock you, Nurse Wayland. Stella is young, healthy, and normal. When Morris's accident made it impossible for him and Stella to ever live again as man and wife, I asked myself how long she'd be able to support such a false relationship. No one could say that you had much trust in human nature. I have a great deal. I knew that Stella's pity was infinite. I knew that she meant everything in the world to Morris. Everything. But I feared the time would come when she could no longer be content with a miserable life that was all that Morris had to offer her. If she wanted to go, I felt we had no right to prevent her. And I knew that if she went, Morris would die. I would never have left him, never. I was willing to shut my eyes to anything. As long as she stayed with Morris, I found myself wishing she'd take a lover. Mrs. Tabret! When Colin came back, and after a while I realized that he and Stella are in love, 
I was glad. I felt that this would make things right for Morris. She wouldn't go now. She was bound to this house by a stronger tie than pity or kindness. But didn't it strike you what great dangers you were exposing them to? I didn't care. I thought only of Morris. When they were children, I think I loved both my sons equally. But since his accident, I haven't had room in my heart for anyone but Morris. He was everything to me. For him, I was prepared to sacrifice Colin and Stella. I hope they'll forgive me. As if there were anything to forgive. You'll only laugh at me if I say I'm shocked. But I can't help it. I'm shocked to the very depths of my soul. I was afraid you would be. Well, with a baby on the way, you must admit that Morris's death has come in the very nick of time to get her out of a very awkward predicament. What a cruel and heartless thing to say. Are you sure your motive for causing all this trouble is anything more than your bitter hatred of me? Why should I hate you? Believe me, I only despise you. You hate me because you were in love with Morris. How dare you say that? You gave it away constantly. I could see that you were fonder of Morris than a nurse generally is of her patient. But it didn't strike me as serious until this morning. I know now that you were madly in love with him. And if I was, what of it? Nothing except that it's my turn to be shocked. In the circumstances, I think it was rather horrible and disgusting. Yes, I loved him. My love grew as yours faded. I loved him because he was so, so helpless, so dependent on me. I never showed my love. It, it would have meant nothing to him. He had no room in his heart for anyone but you. You think you were kind and considerate. If you'd loved him as I did, you'd have seen how less than nothing was all you did for him. I could think of a hundred ways to give him happiness, but they would have meant nothing to him. And you, whom he loved, could think of none of them. Nurse Wayland, I'm sorry for what I said just now. It was stupid of me and unkind. I suppose there is something beautiful in love, of whatever kind it is. Will you let me thank you for the love you gave my husband? No! It's an impertinence to offer me your thanks. I'm sorry you should think that. All you had for him was pity. But I loved him with all my heart. I never asked anything but to be allowed to help and serve him. What was he to you? What was he to his mother? To me, he was my life. And you killed him! That's a lie! Come, Nurse Wayland, you have no right to say that. How dare you stand there and insult Stella? The situation is perplexed. It's true, and you know it. I know nothing of the kind. I only know that you've worked yourself into a state in which you are saying all sorts of things for which you have no justification. My dear, I could no more have killed Morris than, than I could walk a tightrope. Doesn't it occur to you that there was nothing to prevent my leaving him? Who could have blamed me? I could have gone away with Colin. Yes, and heaven knows I wanted you. You'd have been afraid of the scandal. And you knew that your treachery would have broken your husband's heart. You couldn't face that. You preferred to kill him. After knowing me for five years, Nurse Wayland, how can you think me capable of such wickedness? Your husband loved and trusted you. He was bedridden. He was defenseless. If you were capable of being unfaithful to him, you were capable of killing him. Are you not falling into a rather vulgar error, my dear? Chastity is a very excellent thing. But it isn't the whole of virtue. There's kindness and courage and consideration. Are you defending her for having been untrue to your son? I'm excusing her. I know she gave Morris all she could, and the rest was not within her power. Oh, my dear, you're so kind and wise. No, darling, I'm only so old. Stella. I'm sorry, but Nurse Wayland has made a definite accusation. It must be met. If Morris died of an overdose of sleeping tablets, it was administered by somebody. It was not given to him by me. You appear to have been the last person who saw him last night. You said he was upset earlier in the evening. Why? Oh, must I tell you? It was very private. No, I, I've no right to ask you anything, but... 
If there's an inquest, you'll be asked. Oh. But he... He broke down because he couldn't love me as, as he wanted to love me. He said... He said he would have so liked us to have a child. But when you went in to say goodnight to him, he made no further reference to that? No, none. He seemed quite recovered. Did he ask you for anything before you went? The sleeping draft, for instance? No, Major Leconda. Morris did not ask me for the sleeping draft, and I did not give it to him. May I ask a question now? Certainly. Why were you so upset when I came in this morning and told you I'd been into your husband's room? I was angry with you for going in before he called. Are you sure you weren't afraid I'd gone in too soon? Oh. Supposing he'd been still alive and it had been possible to save him. You've made up your mind that I murdered Morris, haven't you? I know you did. You have done what you thought was your duty, Nurse Wayland. Well and good. It's obvious the matter cannot rest here and the responsibility is now mine. There is no need for us to take up any more of your time. I'll go. I'm just as anxious to leave you as you all are to get rid of me. But I can't go, Mrs. Tabret, without saying how... how sorry I am to have repaid your kindness by bringing this unhappiness upon you. I know you must hate me. It seems frightful, but I... I do ask you to believe that I... I can't help myself. Before we part, my dear, I should like, if I could, to release your spirit from the bitterness that's making you so unhappy. Bless you for the kindness you showed my poor Morris and for the unselfish love you bore him. Oh, I'm so desperately unhappy. Please leave your address, Nurse Wayland. Dr. Harvester will communicate with the proper authorities and they will want to get in touch with you. I shall go and see the coroner and put the facts before him. If you don't mind, Mrs. Tabret, I'll ring up his place from here and find out if he's in. Before you do that, May I say something? Of course. I'll try to be brief. Stella is mistaken in thinking that she was the last person who saw Morris alive. I saw him and spoke to him later. You! I couldn't sleep last night. There was no light in Morris's room, but I had a strange feeling that he was lying awake too. I opened his door quietly. But he heard me and called me in. What time was this? I don't know. Perhaps an hour after you left. He told me he'd taken his sleeping draft, but it hadn't had any effect. Then he said, Mother, be a sport and give me another. It can't hurt for once, and I do want to have a decent sleep. Yes, he was, uh, he was very nervy last night. I suppose his usual dose wasn't enough. Very early after his accident... I promised Morris that if life became intolerable to him, I would give him the means of putting an end to it. Oh, Mother, no. I said that if his suffering was so great that he couldn't bear them any longer, and he solemnly asked me to help him, I wouldn't shirk the responsibility. And sometimes he'd say, does that promise still hold? And I'd answer, yes, dear, it does. Did, did he ask you last night? No. What happened then? I knew Stella's love meant everything to Morris. And I knew that she no longer had any to give him because she'd given all her love to Colin. Poor Morris could not stand losing her. But Stella had done as much for him as even I, his mother, could ask of her. I was not so selfish as to demand from her the sacrifice of all that makes a woman's life worthwhile. Oh, why didn't you give me the chance? It was a lovely, lovely dream he dreamed. And I loved him too much to let him ever wake from it. For I loved Morris. He was everything to me. I gave him life, and I took life away from him. Mrs. Tappert, it's impossible. Oh, how dreadful. I went into the bathroom and climbed on the chair and got the bottle of chloraline. I took the five tablets and dissolved them in a glass of water. I took it in to Morris and he drank it at a gulp. Then I sat by the side of his bed, holding his hand until he fell asleep. 
When I withdrew my hand, I knew it was sleep from which he would never awake. He dreamed his dream to the end. Oh, Mother. Oh, what would be the end of this? I'm so frightened. Oh, my dear, don't worry about me. What I did, I did deliberately. Oh. And I'm quite ready to face the consequences. Well, it's my fault. How can I ever forgive myself? Oh, no, you mustn't be silly. You mustn't think about me or distress yourselves at what happens to me. You and Colin must go away, marry and have your child. And you must forget the past. You're young and you have a right to life and happiness. Oh, mother, darling. Oh, mother, you make me feel so ashamed. My son, I love you too. I have your happiness very much at heart. Oh, my dear, dear Millie, what can I say? Dr. Harvester, are you still willing to sign the death certificate? Yes. Then sign it. If there are ever any questions, I'm prepared to swear that I left the tablets on Morris's table by his bed. Oh, Nurse Wayland. We are very grateful to you, Nurse Wayland. So infinitely grateful. Oh, Mrs. Tablet, I've been so petty and revengeful. I, I never realized how mean I was. Come, come, my dear. No, don't let us get emotional. We're both of us lonely women now. Let us help one another. So long as you and I can keep our love for Morris alive in our hearts, he's not really dead. in the church where a wedding has been lives in a dream waits at the